Podium Publishing presents Rise of Mankind, Publishers Pact, Books 5 and 6, written by John Walker, performed by James Patrick Cronin. Pursuit Prologue A blast struck the side of their vessel, causing it to shake violently. The hit felt so much worse than in the simulators, and Clea on Tufal wondered how they survived it. Surely anything capable of moving the entire ship had to have gotten through the shields. Horror stories from the more experienced officers came back to haunt her. Of times when the enemy blasted a cruiser to dust in a single pass. At least that didn't happen this time. Clea focused on her work, trying to ignore the hammering of her heart and a rising sense of panic. This engagement, her first, seemed like a reasonable one. Eight Alliance ships took on four of the enemy. Outnumbering their foes two to one sounded good in theory, but analysis suggested their opponents actually thrived on encounters where they were outnumbered. Her hands flew over her controls, scanning the enemy vessels for any sign of weakness, any advantage the Keelans might take advantage of. They seemed like unstoppable titans, creatures intent on killing without remorse or chance for parley. Most forgot how they first met and what started the war. It barely mattered since no one had spoken to one of the enemies since long before Clea was born. The war itself didn't start for several years after contact had been broken. History books stated after cooperation became impossible, the Keelans moved on and didn't look back. Whatever they said or did at the end pushed these zealots to an extreme of war. The attacks, merciless and sudden, began and continued on year after year. Clea watched her screen for a moment as two Alliance vessels flanked one enemy. They hammered it with pulse cannons, taking some licks but tearing through the shields. As the enemy hull cracked and split, a cheer resounded in her department. She checked her scan and sure enough, they finished one off. Three to go. Fighters screamed by, engaging in dogfights throughout the area. Their chatter cluttered up scans, filling the area with white noise, which had to be filtered through. Clea wrote a program to do so when she was still in the academy, and applied it at the start of the battle. Piercing through the interference, she focused on one ship which seemed to be staying out of the fight. What are you doing back there? Their power readings were maximum. They'd taken no damage, and to her reckoning, hadn't fired a shot. They just sat there. Waiting. Maybe it's the command ship. They knew little about the enemy and how they worked. Rank hierarchy and even specifics about their vessels remained mysterious. The latter came from the fact few of their ships were exactly the same. Maybe their captains are allowed to personalize. Most of the information the Keelans had about the enemy came down to maybes and theories. Clea hadn't been in the service long enough to have as many as some of her fellow crew, but she started to form a few. This fight alone gave her ample cause to start guessing. An opponent with no face might be easier to kill, but it made it hard to know why they had to. One of the Keelan ships called out a mayday. Their shields went down and fighters hammered it from every direction. She checked just as their power core erupted, annihilating the small attackers around it. The suddenness of it meant no one escaped before it exploded. Every man and woman aboard had to be dead. I'm on survivors, someone shouted behind her. Good, I don't want the duty of scanning for bodies. Clea blinked hard, forcing herself to focus. She stared at her screen intently, trying to breach the interference of the enemy's drive core. Their shields fended off physical attacks, but their engines emitted so much noise they could only glean the most obvious details about their opponents. One of those was an assumption about communication. They believed to know when they tried to send messages afar, but that was based on pure energy casting away from the ship. They could even block it by causing enough interference themselves, but there was no code to crack. Not that they discovered. Furthermore, they could detect their power reserves, but even when they damaged one of their ships, they weren't suddenly granted a view of the internal values of the ships. They couldn't gather intel on ship layout or crew composition. 
Attempts at hailing them, more in the early days than recently, were always met with silence. Many believed the enemy could hear them, but refused to listen. Some suggested that was not the case, that they simply blocked all attempts at conversation because they had no intention of speaking to their victims. Many hoped to be able to force a conversation, to try appealing to any shred of conscience they may have. Some of the rank-and-file soldiers couldn't be totally brainwashed. They had to have families and friends back home, the same as the Keelans. Maybe internal revolt was possible, if only they heard the desperate cries of the people they so mercilessly killed. Another enemy vessel went up, this one by the combined efforts of fighters and one of the capital ships. They unleashed torrents of blaster fire in a concentrated section near the bridge. Clea checked the readings to see what she might learn from the assault. Her people pinpointed a specific area, no more than 80 meters around, and battered it. Excellent coordination. No survivors, someone called. A solemn cloud fell over their department. Clea sighed and continued her work on that lone vessel. Wait a minute. What's this? Clea noted a pattern to some energy emitting from the ship, something that seemed random merely because it took so long to repeat. One of her personal applications found the consistency and alerted her. She brought it up for further analysis, saving it to the ship's storage unit. It came from what might have been their bridge, connecting to the other ship. Communications, Clea hummed, trying to work quicker. The computer program continued to diagram the pattern, offering suggestions to what it might be for along the way. Remote control of the entire other ship? a constant line of voice communications specially coded, transfer of energy to provide bolstered shields and weapons. Then, the energy signal burst from the vessel as it had in the past, moving far off from the battle. Clea checked and grinned. The pattern was the same, only mired in interference. I found something. The data got saved immediately and she started a deep dive analysis to determine exactly what it was used for. Another blow to the ship caused such a violent tremor, Clea was tossed to the floor. Others in her department cried out as some maintained their seats and others collapsed. She pushed herself to her feet just as the alarm went off. Red lights overhead began flashing. A voice piped through the speakers. Alert, alert, all hands evacuate, repeat, all hands evacuate, hull breach on deck 7 through 13. Oh no, Clea thought. The engines are on deck 10. She climbed to her feet and went back to her station, tapping at the screen to download the data. Someone grabbed her by the arm. We have to go now? Clea tried to shake them off, but they wouldn't let go. That's an order, Xanthari. Move it. Clea cursed under her breath as something exploded behind her, sending sparks flying into the air. She rushed out of the room with the others, hustling down a hallway as hoses burst and the entire ship shook. When she sat at her terminal working, she could fight the fear. But now, in a blind run to the escape pods, full panic grabbed her stomach. They rounded a corner, 200 meters from their destination, when something hit them again. We're already done, you monsters. Why are you still shooting us? Another heavy shake sent her against the wall, her head bouncing off the metal panel. Queasiness overtook her and she couldn't feel her limbs. I think I'm dying. As she fell in slow motion, someone caught her, dragging her backward. The ceiling became dark, then red, dark and red, over and over, before consciousness slipped away. The last sound she heard came from the automated emergency system. Alert, alert, all hands evacuate, repeat, all hands evacuate. Chapter 1 Clea woke with a start, her heart racing in her chest. The dream remained fresh in her mind, gnawing at her as she climbed out of bed and moved over to her desk. Tapping the computer screen, it came to life and she began to write down the events so she wouldn't forget them. How did I forget all about that event? Indeed, she'd been in several battles, but that one in particular totally escaped her. Perhaps the injury 
She did remember being hurt for several days, but somehow glossed over how it happened. Maybe I didn't want to remember. If it was as bad as the dream, then I understand. I never wake up scared. A voice echoed through the halls of the behemoth, Ensign Agatha White telling everyone they would make Earth orbit in three hours. Clea's alarm would have woken her in an hour. She wanted to be on the bridge when they made orbit, to see them safely returned to where they belonged. They had a great deal to report, from the mining operation mission to first contact with a bristly new culture to a dramatic space battle. At least repairs didn't take long. Before they left, they needed to perform some minor repairs, but finished before jumping. Once they were prepared to go home, everyone remained on duty through the process. Not a single member of the crew wanted to be surprised by a second mishap, though Clea was certain nothing would happen. Maury Higgins remained in the medical bay recovering from being shot. The doctor said he would come out okay, but it would take time. When they arrived back at Earth, he would be transferred to another medical facility where he could mend properly. He already made it clear he wanted to come back immediately. You'd have to amputate everything to keep me away. Clea found the image disturbing, but the sentiment seemed good-natured. They were close enough to the Alliance ships for her to access historical records. She brought up a log of the battle in a mineral-rich sector some distance from their home world. Four enemy ships against eight Alliance vessels. That's what the log titled it. Not very compelling, but descriptive, I suppose. The overall result of the conflict was three Keelan vessels were destroyed and four of the enemy. Hers, the Tempered Steel, was the second of their ships to be taken out. Various people wrote logs about the affair, explaining the tactics used, analyzing the failures and successes of the mission. Clea frowned, trying to find her own log, but couldn't locate one. She did locate a roster of individuals who were injured or slain. Her name appeared on the list, near the bottom as Crew Transferred to Medical. This required a cross-reference check for more information. Her eyes widened when she found her file. How did I forget being in the hospital for six days? Clea remembered it being bad, but six days seemed excessive. The report stated she was unconscious for the first three days. Afterwards, she recovered quickly and moved on to the psychiatrists. There, she endured a number of conversations about her post-battle state of mind. She recalled not being too badly off, especially since she could not remember the destruction of her ship. Small blessing back then, but why remember now? They warned her the memories might come back at any time. She didn't think they would through a dream. She never gave much stock to the ramblings of nighttime fantasies, but this felt entirely too vivid to be a flight of fancy. This held information she could not believe she lost. What information did I find? And how much of what I just witnessed was made up? My mind may have filled in the blanks with something more interesting than the truth. Clea made a request for more information, sending it to the tech officer aboard the Keelan ship. Storage capacity was never a problem, so they would have access to the documents, even from all the way back then. She hoped to find more information than the cursory glance into the public documents. Her new rank might even afford her some priority to get her request finished. One can only hope but I doubt I'll find anything particularly exciting in what they send. I'm afraid my personal information is probably lost. Clea read back over what she wrote and felt thankful she'd done so. The dream already faded from her mind, disappearing into the ether. She decided to shrug it off for the time being and went to clean up. They had a full docket when they arrived at Earth, and she wanted to be fresh for the interrogation-like briefings she expected both from the humans and her own kind. Everyone wants a story, and considering how many we have, I'm guessing this'll take a while. Tim Collins and Amos Roper were set to be transferred from the ship to military authorities the moment the behemoth made Earth orbit. Military guard prepared a highly secure shuttle, which was destined for a maximum security facility. There, the two men would wait for their trial, which surely would not go their way. 
Captain Gray Atwell met with Commander Adam Everly and Lieutenant Colonel Marshall as soon as they made Earth space to discuss everything that happened. They penned an extensive report regarding their investigation and detailed the actions of the three traitors. Lieutenant Teresa Conway's final moments of violence were also documented, right up to her death while holding a hostage. When they were done, Gray insisted on speaking with Tim. Adam advised against it. What good will come from it, sir? He's going down for what he did. There's nothing he can say that would make any difference now, don't you think? I trusted that man, Gray replied. I considered him a fine officer and he betrayed all our trust. I'll look him in the eye before I turn him over, while he's still under my command, and see if I can tell why he did it. Because he had sex, Marshall replied. Conway turned him, but it wasn't hard because she used Jameson against him. She developed an asset with her body, and there wasn't a whole lot he could do about it. Smart as Collins was, he had enough naivety to be taken in by a pretty face. And a forceful one, too, from my analysis. So you're saying he betrayed us all over a chance with a woman? Gray shook his head. I don't buy it. He had to know they weren't going to succeed. His life would be over. And what if their tampering killed us all? I need to see him myself now that things are calmed down. Adam nodded. Yes, sir. Just don't be too disappointed with the lack of answers you're going to receive. I don't think he's going to have a good explanation. He can at least try. Gray went to the brig alone and let the guards know he wanted to speak with Collins, but to leave the man in his cell. They escorted him back and he dismissed them standing straight with his hands clasped behind his back. Collins reclined on the bed, staring up at the ceiling. He didn't look anything like himself, drained and pale, nothing like the vibrant officer who had served on the bridge since before they finished the ship. Now's your chance to talk, Gray said, if you've got anything to say to me personally. I don't think so, sir, Collins replied. He spoke in monotone, barely moving as he did so. Don't say anything, Roper shouted. They'll just use it against us. Guards. Gray spoke calmly, but he struggled to contain a surge of anger. Remove Ensign Roper to interrogation room two. The guards complied, and Roper did not act as placid as his co-conspirator. Even though he'd been shot in the leg, he still struggled, shouting at Collins to keep his mouth shut. Gray waited for him to be out of earshot before returning his full attention to the cell. He drew a deep breath and tried again. I think you've got plenty to say, and I expect to hear something. I trusted you, Tim. You were one of my finest officers. Even after the event, you stepped up and headed to astrogation. Was that you feeling some guilt over what you'd done? I want answers. How could you betray us all? Sir, Tim finally sat up, but stared at the floor now instead of the ceiling. I, Conway brought me the orders from Jameson and showed them to me. She knew I'd worked with him and made it clear he expected my cooperation. I tried to tell them they were insane, but they didn't want any kind of warnings. They wanted results. So you just went along with it? Gray scowled. Without any more pushback? At one point, Conway threatened to take the orders to her CO and say they were found in my quarters. She was with security, after all. There were other things, too. Such as... Tim sighed, rubbing his eyes. I'd never been with someone before. Gray knew his meaning and decided not to push. So she... helped with that? Tim nodded. I see. So it took Jameson, threats, and sex to push you over the edge? Let me ask you this. Why didn't you come to me or Adam? Why not tell us immediately about the plot? Roper talked about snitches and what happened to them on spaceships. Tim blinked several times. I shouldn't have listened, but it all sounded so reasonable back then. Now, after the fact, I don't know why I went along. I can think of a thousand things to have done differently but they don't matter now. I've already gone down the rabbit hole and there's no turning back. 
You're right. Gray turned away. You're quite right. I'm sorry it came to this, Tim. I hope you realize they'll throw the book at you for what you've done. With Conway out of the way, they'll hang as much as they can on the shoulders of you and Roper. If you don't get executed, you can look forward to a lifetime sentence on a mining facility. I know, sir. Tim stood up. May I personally apologize for betraying your trust in particular? Gray looked over his shoulder, considering the man for several long moments. He didn't feel entirely charitable toward the former lieutenant, nor did he lean toward offering him any comfort. He deserved to wallow in his guilt and think about what he'd done. Too many lives were risked for their idiotic agenda. I do not accept it. You broke your oath on your own and you can pay for it, without forgiveness from anyone. Gray left him there as he slumped back on the bed. Certainly a broken man. Adam was right. I probably shouldn't have bothered. Gray presented his findings concerning the new culture of the emancipated and founders, sending a full report to the council. They worked together with the Keelans to get a diplomatic vessel sent out there right away, someone to help them prepare for the coming war, much as Earth had when they encountered the enemy. Considering the combat effectiveness of their potential allies, hopes were high that they might contribute greatly to the war effort. The Earth Council exhibited hope on the subject, as did the Keelans, who were brought in immediately. If their shield technology worked so well without enhancement, bolstering them would prove a great benefit. Clea and Lieutenant Oliver Darnell were tasked with presenting their findings about the culture as well, sending their complete technical observations. Each of them were quite complimentary, especially concerning their communication protocols and security. It was primitive by comparison, but they felt some of the techniques would benefit the Alliance as well. Cultural data was transferred over, everything about the history the behemoth collected. This data gave a good idea of where they were coming from and some of the diplomatic challenges their people had to worry about. Ultimately, they would be approached with caution, but the Keelans had become quite good at indoctrinating new cultures. Tim and Amos presented their evidence to the Criminal Investigation Division in the Company of Legal Representation. They made a deal to testify against Admiral Jameson in exchange for life sentences. The whole process took less than a day for them to talk and sign the paperwork. Gray, Adam, Marshall, and Major Harrington Bean, who interrogated the men, provided a recorded testimony under the supervision of the lead prosecutor. They checked the Admiral's office, looking at every in-and-out message around the noted time frame. Several gaps were detected, intentionally deleted by a technician. This young man was questioned hard and gave up his part of the conspiracy as well. What helped even more was that he worried about his actions and kept a copy of some of the messages. This damning evidence helped them proceed up the pole. The orders sent to the behemoth came from Jameson's personal assistant, Major Alistair Trace. He was arrested at his home and questioned. He tried to take the blame fully on himself, but a search of his own schedule and computer archives suggested collusion with the Admiral. After another full day of grilling, he finally folded. The man had a family, and they brought up how miserable a lengthy trial would be for them. He didn't want to be responsible for causing undue stress to those in his own household, so his loyalty for the Admiral took second place to that of his wife and children. Once they had his testimony bagged, the CID was ready to move. They presented the data privately to Chief of Military Operations, Daniel Burke. It took nearly four hours to go through everything, and in the end, it was decided to bring the Admiral in and confront him with his crimes. The conversation took less than an hour before he admitted to wrongdoings, but would not name specifics. Often, high-ranking military men such as Jameson would have been allowed to simply resign and retire. The nature of his particular crime made Daniel loath to leave the man his total freedom. There was another factor to consider as well. An anti-alliance faction had grown amongst the people of Earth, and he represented their leader. Ultimately, they did allow him the dignity of surrendering his position, 
but insisted he live where he was told under guard for the rest of his life. He did not have a family, and considering the alternative, being dragged through the court and having his entire legacy besmirched, he accepted the deal. Daniel elected to have him moved to a military facility in Alaska, where none of the protests took place, nor did anyone particularly seem to care about what happened in space. They closed the case with Tim and Roper being transported off-planet to work on a mining vessel elsewhere in the system. Gray met with Daniel later to receive a briefing. The divisive factions on Earth were being dealt with through covert channels as the intelligence community stepped in to help break up their structure by removing leaders to their causes. Ultimately, they represented a small percentage of people. However, they had loud voices and demanded they be heard. This is none of your concern, Daniel said. We have another mission for you coming up soon. I hope we can have a little downtime before we head back out, Gray replied. My people are hoping to get some rest, and we need a couple of experts to help us with essential repairs. Yes, we fully intend for you to have the next week and a half free. Make sure your people get leave time and coordinate with the Keelans on the maintenance. Daniel grinned. Besides, I wouldn't send you away before we christen our new vessel. I'm told they'll be ready to fire up the pulse engine in the next few days. That's great news, Gray replied. Have you picked out a crew for her yet? The volunteers lined up, especially after news of your exploits out there. Every adventurous young person you can imagine from the Academy and other branches have come forward and want a chance to go into space. If you want to rotate any folks out, we're looking for training opportunities. Send me a list and we'll take a look. I'm sure we can accommodate some of that and help get people the expertise needed for their positions. Gray took a deep breath. So, what's the mission? We'll be sending you to the Keelan homeworld as an ambassador this time. Much like my Gora, we'd like you to address their council and accept Earth's full membership into the Alliance. That's a big honor, Gray said. I'm surprised you don't want to come with us. Take it yourself. There are a few reasons you were picked, Daniel replied. One, they requested you. After helping with the research facility and the mine, you've proven yourself to them. Two, you've earned it after all you've been through. It would be nice to have an easier assignment for a change. Gray held up a hand to interrupt him. Don't forget, that's what you said about the research facility. Daniel smirked. Yes, I know. Anyway, this is their home world. I can't imagine anything's going to happen there. So, three... And this one can come off sounding raw. The council decided sending any of us might not be safe. Which contradicts two. Gray smiled to offset the comment. I understand the meaning. But you're right. It makes us sound expendable. You know you're not, but... Well, this is a desperate time for the war effort. You'll be accompanied back by one of the Keelan vessels, and the other will remain. We're well on the way to a third ship, and they're going to help us with that, too. I think their cooperation has been stellar. I'm hoping we can prove that to the dissidents that say we should sever ties. Accepting membership with the Alliance should help a little, Gray replied. Either that, or they'll rebel harder. They might feel like they have no recourse but to take up arms. Leave that to the intelligence teams, Daniel replied. You worry about heading back to their home, getting us on their list, and getting home safely. I'll plan the mission and take some time off myself, Gray said. I definitely feel like I need some time on the ground. Good idea, Captain. Daniel stood and Gray followed suit, shaking the man's hand. Thank you for all you've done, Captain. I'll be writing commendations for all of your senior officers. Catch up with me before you're ready to depart and we'll speak again. Of course, sir. Thank you for your time. Gray left and established communication with Adam Everly. The commander answered a moment later. How'd it go? Good, Gray replied. We've got another mission, but we don't leave for a week and a half. Make sure we get a leave schedule going and give people as much downtime as possible. Tech crews from the Keelan ship will be helping with the maintenance. What's the mission? Diplomacy, Gray said. 
We're going to the Keelan home world to accept full membership into the Alliance. That's great news. Maybe we'll be able to take the fight to the enemy soon. Perhaps. Anyway, get that roster going. I'm going to plan the mission, check the resupply schedule, and get some time off myself. Well earned, sir. I'll see you soon. Gray took a moment to soak in the Florida weather, drawing a deep breath of fresh air. He'd been shipboard for so long, standing on solid ground felt odd. He intended to take as much time as he could outside during his time off. Maybe a camping trip. Anything without technology or starships. I need some distance to bounce back. This week will be fantastic. Then, back at it. Chapter 2 Clea took up residence in a hotel near the military base. Civilian amenities beat the military accommodations, and after the month she had, she wanted to enjoy some comfort. Once they made planet side, Gray disappeared into the bureaucratic side of the armed force, so she figured she wouldn't see him for a few days. She anticipated some trouble trying to get the room, but the front desk person didn't even look at her twice. Once she got into her room, she checked the internet for images of humans to see if any came with her hair color. Apparently, many of them used dye to alter their appearance, and some even wore contacts to change that as well. Vanity? Or just a desire to stick out? Florida in particular had quite a few people who visited high-end salons to get a unique look. They'll love the rest of my people, then. We come in all variety of colors. The thought came as ironic, considering the group of humans demanding distance from the Alliance. Keelans tended to be the easiest-going species in the galaxy when it came to other cultures. They helped dozens reach their potential. Several of those groups also treated them with suspicion, but few actively suggested they should be ostracized. After all we've done for the humans, too. What a shame. Clea ate a decent meal and watched a couple of films before preparing to sleep. The bed, a king-size affair, made her accommodations on the ship look like a plank. Crawling in, she immediately relaxed. The soft sheets and extra pillows provided a luxury she had not known since before leaving home for the military. Even on downtime during the refit of the behemoth, she stayed in Spartan apartments on base. This extravagance felt 100% worth every coin she had to spend. Her mind drifted until sleep took her, bringing her to a deep state of unconsciousness. She found herself startling awake, sitting in her quarters on board the tempered steel. The alarm ticked nearby, and she shut it off, checking to see she had 30 minutes to report to her post. Throwing herself through a quick refresh, she donned her uniform and rushed down the hall to the tech lab. In her haste, she bumped into a fellow Zanthari, one she attended school with. His name was Megs Dewiran, an engineer. Late for post again? Megs asked. Not really, Clea called back. But almost. Want to meet for dinner at the end of shift? Yeah, sounds good. See ya. Clea grinned, finding ease in her assignment and wondering about the strange memory prior to waking up. Was it a dream? Going to bed in that foreign world, living amongst another race? It didn't seem possible, and as she hustled into the tech lab, she felt far more at home than she had only an hour earlier. What an absolutely bizarre dream. I should probably talk to the ship's counselor about it. There must be a reason behind it. Welcome to the land of the living, Miss Antufal. The voice came from her commanding officer, Vinthari Trikasa. Sleep well? Yes, sir. Clea sat down. I'm not late, though, sir. That's why I'm giving you a hard time. The others around her chuckled. This must be a first. Sorry to impress? Clea gave him a sheepish look. I had quite the dream. I'm sure we don't need to hear about it, Zanthari. Trikasa gestured to her console. 
Get to work before you come up with any other stories for us to hear. He went about his business and she logged in, peering over the current workload. Most of her day was spent fixing computer problems throughout the ship and chasing down readings externally when that work dried up. The others around her had various specific duties, but they could bounce ideas off one another. Clea liked the team. They were solid performers, one and all. Some of them she attended school with as well, and like her, this was their first assignment. The nearest person to her leaned close, a woman her age named Rhea Maldoran. She looked back at the Vinthari before speaking. Why are you really on time? Rhea asked. Because my alarm woke me up for a change, Clea replied. I wasn't up as late as normal. No after-shift programming? Nope. What about you? Were you slumming for fellas in the mess again? Rhea blushed. Come on, Clea. That's not funny. Hey, I wasn't trying to be. More power to you if you find a guy on board. You telling me no one's struck your fancy? Rhea scowled. What about Megs? Ew. Clea shook her head. He's like my brother. We were in the academy together and the same secondary. I've known him forever. Some of those can turn into more. Not for me. I'm career. Clea shrugged. I've got to find something to set me apart, you know. Everyone in my family's done amazing things. My sister's at one of the research outposts. Oh, which one? Rhea's eyes widened. I don't know. A secret one, I guess. She couldn't tell us. Wow. No wonder you're working after hours so much. See? I've got huge shoes to fill. Both my parents are big names, and I'm just a technical person. Hey, you're a genius with code, though. Rhea patted her shoulder. Don't forget that. Yeah, thanks. Clea shook her head. I hope it's enough. A voice behind them interrupted their conversation. I just got a ping from the bridge. It seems we're moving in to engage a number of enemy vessels. Engage? Rhea sat up straight. As in, we're about to get into a fight? Focus on your terminal, Rhea, Vinthari Trikasa said. Let's do this by the numbers, folks. Our data can turn the tide of a battle. Only essential incidents should be focused on. Everyone put your attention towards scans and assistance. I expect to get some good data out of this fight, so let's keep our minds on the prize. Clea turned her attention to her computer and started running through her program list. The world felt strange, the situation surreal. She'd been here before. A sense of deja vu hit her. But where had some come up with the term? Gray told her, but that would mean this whole situation. The ship shook from an attack and she jumped, sitting up straight in the hotel room bed covered in sweat. That was vivid. What is going on? She got up and went into the bathroom, turning on the hot water for a shower. As the room began to steam, she peered into the mirror, watching her reflection vanish in the fog. I need to talk to someone about this. But who? Gray? The doctor? One of them might be able to help. But then again, we're all busy with our downtime. They may be off with family. I can probably deal with this alone. Or maybe I should speak with my Gora. He's still here, and might even have a better understanding. Maybe he remembers the fight. Clea sent Anthar Mygora a request for a meeting in the next few days before cleaning up. When she returned to bed, she hoped to make it through the rest of the night without another dream. She'd had enough of revisiting the past through sleep, especially considering how intense it seemed to be. I miss Rhea and Megs. I wonder how they're doing. I know they both made it out of there. They sent me congratulations when I took on the liaison assignment. Rhea's in particular stuck out. One line in particular remained in Clea's mind. You'll finally stand on your own in the family. Congratulations. You deserve this more than most. Good luck. 
That was the last time the two communicated, and it had been too long. She made a mental note to write her in the morning and inquire after how her life had been treating her. Maybe they could get together when Clea returned home. But for the moment, she wanted to enjoy the rest of the night in that fabulous bed. There may not be many luxurious nights in her future. She had to make the ones she was given count. The crew of the behemoth took their downtime gratefully. Megan Pointer spent the first day with Rudy, traveling with him to present the sad news about his lost pilot. They drank together and parted ways the next morning, each heading to spend the rest of their time with family members. Hoffner spent his time at the academy, relaxing with an old mentor who retired to teach. They kept it low-key, quiet evenings watching videos, drinking, and relating war stories. The behemoth's missions made for some great ones. Some of them might even end up in the infantry books for training purposes. Maury spent his time in the hospital recovering. Though his prognosis was positive, he was not likely to make the next mission. This really set him off, but considering where he'd been shot, he was lucky to be alive. Any protests fell by the wayside when he received that little reminder. Oliver and Paul spent time together playing games off base at the former's parents' house. Redding, Adam, and Agatha all visited their respective families. Gray went camping, using a cabin that his father bought when he was young. He kept his activities low-key, fishing and hiking in the days and relaxing by the fireplace at night. The silence appealed to him, but at the same time it felt unnerving for the first few days. By the time he got used to it, he wondered how he'd feel when he returned to the constant hum of the ship. All of them took their peace where they could find it, knowing full well it might be their last for a while. Each of them, in their way, knew they stood at a turning point in human history. Not because of their next mission, but their discovery of new intelligent beings, visiting solar systems on the other side of the galaxy, and the war with an enemy that wanted to destroy every other being in the universe. The pressure was great, but they'd proven up to the challenge so far. As they made their way back to active duty, none of them felt regret at going back to work. Excitement filled the shuttles heading back up topside, and as they settled back into the familiar quarters and duties of ship life, they looked forward to what fate might have in store for them next. Clea's meeting with Mygora got cancelled by one of his assistants. He sent his regrets and suggested they get together a few days after her leave ended. She replied with a polite thank you, but declined to reschedule. She had a feeling they'd be gone before he found the time. Instead, she busied herself with visiting engineering. Several technicians worked with the Keelan engineers to make modifications and repairs, resulting in a fully functional jump drive. She read through their changes and felt confident that any tampering would be much more difficult. All around, they did great work. Commander Janet Weatherby took over as chief engineer in Maury's absence. As his second, she was one of the only people he personally trusted. Clea had worked with her several times and also felt good about the choice. Security also increased around the technical areas, with armed guards standing by as checkpoints for anyone wanting to visit the engine room. The technicians grumbled about it, but not too loudly. After what happened to Tim and Amos, everyone understood the need for heightened failsafes. Clea saw she had a briefing just after lunch with the other senior officers. Gray mentioned they would be starting their next mission, departing Earth for a safe jump position before the end of third shift. She wondered what might be in store when a second meeting popped up for her to talk to Gray in private. I wonder if that's good or bad. I suppose I'll find out. Gray kept the group meeting quick and to the point. Command was sending the behemoth to the Keelan home world where they would formally accept admittance to the Alliance. Clea's heart leaped in her chest. I'm going home. It had been several years since she visited, and the thought of returning now thrilled her. Then, some reality kicked in. I have to face my parents after what happened to my sister. They already knew what happened and had written her back to tell her how sorry they were she had to endure the situation. 
Now they'd get the chance to lament together. It wouldn't all be negative, but what a sour way to return from a long tour. We'll make the best of it somehow. There's still a lot of good to talk about. I hope you all had a fantastic leave, Gray said. We'll be breaking orbit in the next two hours, so check in with your departments and get ready to go. Dismissed. Clea waited for the others to leave and close the door, returning to her seat. Gray grinned. How was your time off? It was good, Clea replied. I just rested. Tried to see my Gora, but he was too busy. Ah, anything urgent? Personal and professional, but not urgent. I wanted to talk to you about visiting your home, Gray said. First off, I hope you're excited. I am. It's been a long time since I've been there. Gray nodded. Good. Second, I'm hoping we'll have some time for you to show me around the way I showed you Earth. I don't want to take time away from your family, of course, but I'm anticipating we'll be there for a little while. Yes, likely. There are ceremonies to perform, of course. We'll be expected to follow them. Your people are to be welcomed into the fold, so to speak. That'll be good for everyone. Earth will have a say in galactic politics. I suppose right there, that's what the Council has always wanted, right? Probably. A chance to help decide our own fate. One thing we're particularly good at is being busybodies, too. We like to help, even when it's not wanted. I saw that with the new culture we encountered. You refused to leave them to die even after they attacked us. Gray shrugged. I won't leave helpless victims to those monsters. I've seen what they can and will do. We both have. Clea thought back to her dream and felt a film of sweat form on the back of her neck. I think you'll find my home to your liking, at least the capital. The weather is just as extreme as Earth. That is, the regions offer the full spectrum of temperatures. At the very least, I'll take you to the zoo. You'll certainly appreciate that. I can't think of a better way to see your culture. Gray stood up. We should get to the bridge. I just wanted a quick chat with you. I hadn't seen you since we left. Did you go camping? I did, and it was as soothing as I'd hoped. Ready for something to go wrong? Gray chuckled. You're reading my mind. Or isn't the saying, like minds? Great minds think alike. There you go. After you, Clea. I'm glad to be back, sir. Chapter 3 Clea received the logs she requested about the battle while she sat on the bridge. They'd started traveling to their jump point and been away from Earth's orbit for over an hour. She brought up the information and started reading, unable to fend off some hope that she might find something new. Unfortunately, the parts she was most interested in, her saved files, were not there. They'd been lost with the ship, supposedly. Other logs survived, indicating where the battle took place. Salvage teams deemed the area too dangerous to risk collecting left-behind technology. Many fights meant the area was dominated by considerable debris, and apparently, there was already a large asteroid field nearby. Any essential equipment was deemed destroyed. Whatever's left will not matter to the Alliance. Clea didn't feel as certain. A good salvage team would find something out there. In fact, she figured unsanctioned ships probably visited the area and took things all the time. Whatever was out there probably got stripped down a long time ago. However, if those people didn't know what a storage drive looked like, it may have been overlooked. Which would mean it could still be out there. The tempered steel did not actually explode. It was split down the middle and depressurized. Much of it probably remained intact. Why not visit the ship and see what happened? She wished she received the information in person so she could ask just that question. Surely some bureaucrat made the call after looking at the expense for an expedition. Captain, Clea turned away from her data. Can we speak for a moment in the ready room? Absolutely. Gray stood up. Adam, the bridge is yours. Yes, sir, 
Adam replied without looking up from his terminal. Clea and Gray made their way into the small office just off the bridge and had a seat. What's on your mind? Gray asked. It may be nothing, Clea began. But if we can get authorization, I think it'll be worth a look. On my first berth, we engaged four enemy vessels. My ship was destroyed, or at least rendered uninhabitable. We had to evacuate. Tough for your first time out, Gray said. I know how you feel. Clea frowned. Yes, I know. I don't mean to bring up poor memories, but this may have a silver lining. At the time of the attack, I was working on something. I believe I made a discovery, one which might help us a great deal. Do tell. I was analyzing the enemy throughout the engagement, looking for anything to help our ships get through their shields faster and cause more damage. In the process, I... I think I came up with a coded signal. Or something. Clea shook her head. I can only barely remember. There's a story there, Gray pointed out. Why are you just thinking of this now? Clea looked down, scowling. I'm not sure. I... I dreamt about the battle. You see, I took a head injury while we abandoned ship and ended up in the hospital for six days. The psychologist told me I might recover my memories, but I hadn't in years, so I guess I just shrugged it off. Now it's coming back to me, and it feels like we might find something there. Your teams didn't salvage the ship? No, it's dangerous. The area has a lot of natural debris and, of course, multiple ships worth of hazards as well. Clea shrugged. Our people felt it wasn't practical to go in there, but I'm of the opinion we should try. Again, if we get authorization, a quick investigation may turn something up, and if not, we wouldn't have wasted too much time. Gray nodded, looking thoughtful. So we have to hop out to this area you're talking about, perform some salvage to see if you find anything, and if you do, we can determine how it helps the war effort? Is that it? In a nutshell, sir, yes. Must have been some find if it's got you thinking about it. Clea sighed. I'm sure I should have remembered years ago. Back then, I might have just been lucky because I've done that job since then and never found anything I'd call a game changer. This feels big. Believe me, I wouldn't waste your time if I didn't think it absolutely necessary. Besides, we've proven to be pretty lucky so far, right? Good and bad in equal measures, I'm afraid, Gray replied. He smiled as he stood. I'll go back to my office and contact the council before we make the jump. Thanks for bringing this to me. Don't thank me until we've found something, Clea said. If I'm just crazy, or if it was all a hopeful dream, then I'll feel like a real ass. Sometimes hunches lead to great discoveries. Don't worry about it. We'll see what we can do, Clea. I just have to find a way to explain this that doesn't involve dreams. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, sir. Clea returned to her post on the bridge and directed her attention to the various technical reports throughout the ship. She made her case, and it was time to stop fixating on the past. Not that she could easily do so. A sense of urgency clung to her heart, one that made it feel as if she'd discovered one of the most important things of her career. Again. Though it's probably not even there anymore. It's been far too long. I'm leading us on a fool's errand but it could be so lucrative if I'm somehow right. Okay, there's a problem with the network links on Deck 7. Not exactly my job, but I can focus on that. Here and now, Clea, that's the important thing for the time being. Remain focused. Gray considered Clea's proposal as he headed for his office. She definitely wouldn't have brought it to him if she didn't think it was important, but he felt rational enough to question the situation. Memories could come back to a person through dreams, and that's why he was willing to make the request. If she was right and something important was hiding out there, they'd be fools to leave it. And what's it really going to do to our schedule? We'll be done with the ceremony and ready to go home soon enough. A quick side trip won't hurt anything. To sell the council, that was the important part of the equation. 
He believed he could do it, but needed to think specifically how he would. Maybe she discovered something in some logs that led her to believe we might want to look at the salvage again. The danger of it meant we should send a ship like the Behemoth. That was definitely one good story. What else can I try? Ultimately, he wanted to avoid surfaced memories and work towards something more tangible. Command allowed them considerable latitude lately, but this would be pushing it. If she found something in logs, then they'd likely want to see the records. Perhaps a little honest mixed with some omission would work best. Gray sat behind his desk and fired up the long-distance communication network. They were still within the solar system, so lag would be almost non-existent. As he waited for Daniel to pick up, he wondered what time it might be back home near the base. When Daniel's image appeared bleary-eyed, illuminated by the screen, he figured it out. Gray? Daniel sounded surprised. I didn't expect to hear from you soon. I hope this isn't terrible news. Not another attack? No, sir, Gray replied. I wanted to bring something to your attention and receive permission to append an objective to our mission. It should be little more than a minor detour, but considering what it is, we'll need permission. What's going on? Clea shared with me a major battle from their past, one which ended with four enemy ships being destroyed and three Alliance vessels meeting the same fate. The sector was incredibly dangerous at the time, so salvage crews did not go in. We have reason to believe there may be sensitive data, possible game-changing information we can extract. I see. Daniel rubbed his eyes. Any idea what it might be? I'd rather not speculate too much at the moment, but the Alliance ships were scanning the enemy vessels and may have discovered a vulnerability. Gray shrugged. Considering our capabilities, I thought it might be worth a look. We can always just leave it if it's too dangerous. And if you give me permission, I'd like to get the Keelans involved, too. Perform another joint operation. I like that idea, Daniel said. Somewhat safe, for the most part, and good for the political view. How dangerous is the sector, though? I don't know. We'll have to jump in on the edge, determine whether or not it's worth the risk, and go in from there. I don't like unnecessary risks at a time like this, Daniel said. Right on the verge of everything we're about to accomplish, it would damage relations considerably if you got yourselves killed. Considering our track record, I'd say losing the behemoth is unlikely to say the least. I'd rather keep this out of the hands of the Council. Can we call it a hunch and let me check? You can trust that I'll get us home safely. Daniel considered the screen for long enough that Gray wondered if he lost the connection. When the chief spoke again, he began with a heavy sigh. I want to give you this chance. It just could bite us both. Unofficially back me up. Imagine if we find what we're looking for, and if we don't, we'll just come home. Gray shrugged. We'll even find out if there's been any activity in the area before we depart. The Keelans keep record of that sort of thing. Daniel rubbed his eyes, again thinking about it. I would really rather say no, but you wouldn't be contacting me if you didn't think this was worth the risk. Exactly, Gray smiled. Think of it as recon. We're just checking out the area in and around the space we're about to share. After all, an ambassador is going to be moving out there soon. Wouldn't you think we should see how dangerous the surrounding sectors are? Daniel chuckled. You really are getting good at this explanation thing. I'm paying attention. Indeed, you seem to be. Daniel shook his head. All right, you can check it out, but do be sure that you're careful, Gray. This is literally a delicate time to be playing games. If we didn't have faith you might find something out there, I'd never allow it. Thank you, sir, Gray nodded. I won't let you down. You haven't yet. I'm going back to bed now. Keep me informed and let the Council know officially when you've accepted our membership into the Alliance. Burke, out. Gray leaned back as the screen went dark. That could have gone a lot worse. Permission granted, he headed back to the bridge. Clea looked up sharply as he entered. 
her eyes full of questions. He nodded in response, taking his seat. We have permission. Relief washed over Clea as she seemed to deflate in her chair. Good. I worried there for a moment. I played some games, Gray said. But all around I believe in you, so I think we should check it out. Even if it doesn't have the type of information we're hoping to find, then maybe we'll find something of equal value. Either way, I look forward to checking out the space around your home world. Should give us an idea of what's happened there since you guys went to war. What are we talking about? Adam asked. Sounds like a supplemental mission to me. It is, Gray replied. And I'll tell you about it over lunch. I'm starving, and we're not jumping for a while. Let's grab a bite to eat and I can explain, to both of you, how I got this permission. Then we can hop out of here and get some work done. Let's all hope for a very boring and safe trip this time out. Ensign Leonard Marcus took over as the new primary navigator aboard the behemoth. He'd been studying the position for months, but only came out of the academy and boarded the ship after the incident at the research facility. He worked in one of the computer labs while they reclaimed the mining facility. Taking a position on the bridge intimidated him, but Captain Atwell told him he'd been impressed by his work after he replaced Tim Collins. Also, relieving a man because he turned traitor didn't make him feel particularly good. Still, he'd been waiting his entire life to perform such an important job, and to do it before he even made lieutenant filled him with pride. Now to live up to the task. The Keelan ship accompanying them helped with the coordinates this time. He'd only plotted simulated courses and simply double-checked Tim's work before. So far, he relied on others to get the complicated work done, but he didn't feel too bad about it. The fact was, he considered it on-the-job training. When Captain Atwell came to Leonard's station and asked him to research a course to a set of coordinates outside of Keelan space, his pulse raced. He hadn't anticipated having to do anything until they wanted to come home, and for that, he'd already read up on several good places for them to jump back to. This was different. As he researched the area in the shared Alliance database, sweat began to form on his back. The place was considered extremely dangerous. Not only was there plenty of natural debris in the area, but a major battle had taken place some years back, leaving chunks of damaged ship to drift about. Couple that with reports of pirates using it as a staging location for raids in other parts of the system made him wonder what could possibly compel them to have to go there. And why hasn't the Alliance taken care of the criminals? If they know enough to recognize they're hanging out there, they should probably step it up and get rid of them. Leonard checked the military reports to see if he could answer his own question. Apparently, they had gone through there a couple of times, but nearly lost a ship in one of the patrols. Since then, they decided to try and find whatever haven the pirates had been using to choke them at the source. That makes sense, I suppose. Still, it didn't explain why the behemoth planned to go there and what they hoped to gain. Leonard wanted to ask Captain Atwell, but didn't dare. Mission parameters were need to know, and his job was to get them there, not quibble about why. This meant further research, which he tried to do before they jumped. Unfortunately, their information was out of date. The ship traveling with them, which shared the database, hadn't received an update in over two weeks. To make a jump into a place with debris and obstacles, Leonard needed something more current, or they'd have to show up well outside the area. Hours, if not a full day away from anything the captain might care about. He did look over the patterns based on the information he did have, just to get a feel for how the junk out there moved. It didn't seem to be all that erratic, and he could probably do some good math to get them there safely. Just for the exercise, he did the work and stored his proposed coordinates. He'd do it again when they had updated data and see how close he got. As he finished up his work, Redding spoke up. We've arrived at the jump point, sir. Leonard, are these numbers accurate and up to date? Um, one moment, ma'am. Leonard quickly checked to ensure nothing had changed. He looked out when he received an updated set of numbers from the Keelan vessel. Received new coordinates from our allies, 
I've updated them in the system, and we are green to go. Thank you, Ensign. Redding turned in her seat. Captain, shall we go? Let our friends lead the way, Captain Atwell said. It's their home. They can open the door for us. Leonard looked up at the view screen in time to see the Keelan vessel wink out in a quick flash of white light. Jump technology fascinated him, but in this particular case, he was just glad that the technicians gave their system a solid once-over before they tried again. The event in their last mission made him leery of doing it again. They're clear, Lieutenant Arnell announced. We're ready for departure. Get us out of here, Redding, Captain Atwell said. Leonard held his breath as she acknowledged and moved her hand to the controls. Weightlessness struck him, and a moment later, a single blink of the eye, he saw the Keelan vessel a few thousand kilometers away. That was the easiest our jumps have been so far. Wow, those guys really gave it some love. Nicely done, everyone, Captain Atwell said. I'm glad to not be waking up on the floor or feeling like someone tried to kick their way out of my skull. Anson Marcus, I believe we have an eight-hour flight to our destination, is that correct? Um, recalculating now, Leonard said. Looks like the flight lines are pretty clogged up right now, sir. They're asking us to take a different route? We're looking at closer to ten hours. Even better. I'm going to get some rest. Adam, rotate yourself and folks out as you can. We'll reconvene when we're closer. Thank you for everything you did today, people. Great, easy trip so far. There'll be a shipwide briefing before we depart, and after that, everything should be fine. Ensign Marcus, do make sure you get us those coordinates I asked you about before you leave shift. Everyone else, I'll see you soon. Chapter 4 Gray leaned back as their shuttle broke atmosphere over the Keelan capital of Alantha. Even before he saw their cities or the landscape, he found himself awed by the technology they put in orbit and throughout the sector. They definitely represented a culture that had been at war for many, many years. Defenses lined their borders, early warning systems and even weapons set to deter invasion. Ships patrolled the area, rapid response crafts, which could micro-jump anywhere in the system at a moment's notice. The various planets around their core world housed thriving colonies, each with different methods to make the surfaces hospitable despite their distance from the sun and atmospheric conditions. Three massive space stations made up checkpoints throughout their solar system. One resided near to the core world, while the others sat on opposite ends of the farthest reaches of their space. Each provided launch points, research facilities, and supplies for expeditionary forces heading out beyond their borders. Ali performed a scan as they arrived and provided some of the details, most of which went over Gray's head. He ultimately took away from the conversation that they built habitats Earth was only touching on, places much like the mining station they liberated, only better. The amenities alone made these facilities as comfortable as any small city on Earth. Their escort took the lead, getting them through all the challenge codes and stopping points. The ten-hour trip to reach their home world provided the senior staff a chance to get some rest before what promised to be a grueling political experience. Gray put on his dress uniform before taking the bridge, and when he boarded the shuttle, he brought a bag to stay the night. He'd been told the Keelans made efforts to ensure there was food appropriate to the human diet. Apparently, Clea had been making reports, so they were able to ensure they got the supplies delivered in time. Some entrepreneurs even started up human cuisine restaurants for those adventurous enough to try some recipes from their new allies. These came about a year after Clea started. Gray found it surprising they'd do so, but then he looked over a brochure for one of their food courts and understood. They offered a touch of all the cultures brought into their fold, but each was their take on the culture. Many of them could not be terribly close to accurate, but Gray felt curious about what they might have done with their knowledge of Earth. I hope they didn't adopt fast food. It couldn't possibly be good. As they broke the clouds, he gasped, leaning to look out the window to better take in the urban sprawl of the capital. 
Gleaming, smooth buildings climbed into the sky, and air traffic sped about at several different levels. The sky itself, where clouds didn't mar it, looked like the blue he enjoyed on Earth, only a little more purple, just enough to set it apart. Clea sat beside him, also looking out. He imagined she felt great relief at returning, considering how long she'd been gone. He turned to her, grinning. This is fabulous. I don't know what I imagined, but this exceeds my wildest expectations. I'm glad you like it, Clea replied, not taking her eyes away from the window. I can't remember the last time I saw this view, but it's been a very long time, even before I joined your crew. It's just as wondrous as I remember, maybe made more so by distance and longing. My parents are down there somewhere, getting ready to come to the ceremony. I can't wait to meet them, Gray said. What's that tall spire over there? That's where our leaders congregate to legislate. The whole building acts as an antenna so they can communicate with everyone in the system, each colony and ship we have up there. If they've got speeches or information to impart, they provide it from their council chamber. I'm surprised how tall it is. Nearly two hundred stories, Clea said, and fifteen below ground where the leaders would go if a disaster struck. People live there, government employees and such. The entire building is self-contained for the most part. If they are fully supplied, they can last without outside influence for a very long time. Interesting. So bunkers and such, like ours. Yes, and you can tour it as a civilian like yours as well. Clea sighed. Oh, it's very good to be home. Gray leaned forward to address Redding, who piloted their shuttle down. How are we doing? Our escort says another twenty minutes for landing, sir. Redding checked a reading. They've sent me information on all their lanes up here. Apparently different crafts take different altitudes when traveling from place to place. All the way down to ground cars, apparently. We'll be taking the top and landing at a docking bay near the capital where our ship will be searched and each of us checked to ensure we're not, you know, terrorists. Thanks for the update, Gray leaned back. Clea, how long do you think it'll take to get through security? No longer than an hour. They're really good about it, and we are diplomatic guests. They just have to confirm our identities and ensure we're not smuggling in a bomb or something crazy. Is this... Gray checked his computer. Ambassador Nifolsa going to be there? Clea nodded. Undoubtedly. He'll try to speed us through the process, but I can promise you security will ignore him. Gray chuckled. Sticklers? For safety, yes. Rules? Well, when it suits them. That works for me. I'm just thrilled to be here. I can't wait to show you both around. It's going to be amazing. Gray's party consisted of Clea, Redding, and four bodyguards. These were Marines of the best temperament, picked by Marshall himself. Each of them dressed in dark formal wear, armed with a pistol and their long-range communicators. Marshall and Captain Hoffner monitored the frequency from the behemoth, coordinating the visit. They were told the weapons would not be necessary by a text communication from the ambassador. No anti-Earth factions existed there, and no one protested the admittance of the humans to the Alliance. Still, military regulations were quite specific about the protocols of an officer like Gray leaving the ship. He was to be protected against the unknown parts of any sort of event. The air lane before them cleared out from other Keelan vessels, Gray fancied them as the equivalent of police back home. They had free access to fly between massive high-tech buildings where countless Keelans peered out at them as they passed. Their visit spawned a great deal of curiosity. They really turned out in droves, Gray said. Everyone does when a new culture joins us, Clea replied. There'll be a parade at ground level tonight as part of the celebration. They'll have done as much research as they can about Earth culture to give it some flair for you. 
I asked Ollie to pick up the broadcast and share it with the rest of the ship. They may find it interesting. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. Gray leaned to look past Redding again. They rapidly approached their destination where a totally empty landing pad waited. As she acknowledged some instructions he didn't hear, she spun their craft to the right and brought it in for a neat, gentle landing. Nice landing. Thank you, sir. I might not be in fighter condition right now, but I still hit the simulator three times a week. It shows. Gray disengaged the safety harness as the door opened. All right, everyone. Let's be sufficiently diplomatic. Redding grinned. I'll just follow your lead, sir. Gray chuckled. Thanks. Considering this is my first time, I'm sure we'll both do great. Clea knew security protocols with the Keelan Political Guard, and as she expected, they spent an hour going over their shuttle with sensor probes before checking them over. Ambassador Ni Folsa complained the entire time, asking them to hurry it up and reminding them how much of a poor impression they were making. Safety is never a bad thing, the captain of the guard said, and I'll ask you to wait by the door if you don't keep your mouth shut. Clea fought hard not to grin at the indignity of the man. she dealt with his type only a few times before being assigned to the behemoth, and they were pains. Never wanted to follow the rules, always had an agenda they felt more important than directives, and consistently threatened to escalate any request. Your supervisor will hear of this. The ambassador stomped over to the door to wait, and essentially sulk. And there's the threat. The captain probably doesn't care one bit. He'd take more of a tongue lashing if he waved us through. The marines let the guards check over their weapons and had a brief conversation with them all about protocol. Some accord was reached and they were allowed to return to Gray's side. For the people, they just ran a scanner over them and frisked them. Clea came up last and the guard actually turned to his captain. Do we need to check her? We check everyone, the captain said. He's the stickler for the rules. Just get it done and we can move on with our day. They ran the scanner over her and checked her for weapons. All she had on her was her data pad, which she'd already set on their table for inspection. Their luggage would be taken inside and brought to whatever rooms they were going to be allowed to occupy. She didn't plan on staying there and would be finding her parents as soon as the ceremony ended. Her father wanted to see the parade from ground level, and they had dinner reservations afterward. Finally, they received clearance to leave, and the ambassador rushed over with a heap of apologies. Forgive us our paranoia, he said, but we must be cautious in these times of war. One never knows how the insidious enemy will strike, I suppose. But the rest of your trip shall be pleasant, I assure you. We've picked out the finest suites for your rest, and the council chamber is ready to receive you in a couple of hours. Thank you, Gray said. We appreciate the hospitality. We need to check the rooms. One of the marines spoke up. Before the captain takes it? Oh, of course, Ambassador Nifolsa said. After our people performed their security sweep, you are more than welcome to follow whatever protocols you must. Perseverance and all. Please, take the lead with my assistant. She's going to lead us to the rooms, and you can check them out. Clea busied herself with her data pad as they boarded the elevator, sending a message to her father. We've landed and are heading to our suites now. The ceremony is in a couple of hours. I might be able to break away just to say hi if you're in the neighborhood already. Let me know. Before they reached their floor... She had a reply, stating they were in the building, and already through security, joining countless others to witness Earth's admittance to the Alliance firsthand. Come down if you can, but be prepared for quite a crowd. If it weren't for your mother's clout with the military, I doubt we'd have a seat, but we do. With an extra chair. At least for now. I'll see you soon. She felt anxious to get down there, and as the elevator opened, she had to fight not to hurry. So long away from family and friends, she hadn't realized just how much she missed them. Now that she had the chance to see them again, 
She practically wanted to jump out of her skin to get there as soon as possible. The Marines swept through Gray's suite, but she and Redding were allowed to go into theirs. Clea stepped inside, washed her face, and came back out to find the captain still waiting. Sir, if you don't mind, I'd like to go down to the lobby. My parents are already here. I'll be back in time for the ceremony. Gray gestured down the hall. Please, get going. I'll see you in a while. Clea smiled brightly. Thank you, sir. See you soon. She practically jogged down the hall and hit the button, suppressing an urge to bounce on the balls of her feet. As the elevator arrived, she boarded and tapped the lobby button several times before leaning back against the wall. She was alone for the first two floors, but by the time she got to her destination, people got on and left ten times. Nearly eight people stood in front of her as the doors opened to the lobby. Moving off with them, she shuffled toward a massive crowd, one of the biggest she'd ever seen on her world. Taking out her pad, she texted her father, I'm in the lobby, where should I go? We're about 20 meters from the monitors on the right side of the room if you're facing away from the front doors. I'll stand up and wave. Clea looked over the crowd and most of them were standing. She wasn't the shortest Keelan, but many of these folks towered over her. I doubt I'll see him waving. Okay, I'll just shove my way through the area and see what I can do. The monitors were mounted high up in the room, so everyone had a good vantage. She marked the one she needed and hurried off, excusing herself through the crowd. It took a good five minutes to locate their table, but when she saw her parents, her heart hammered in her chest. Hello, Clea cried out, waving over her head. Her mother, who she favored with the same silver-blue eyes and nearly black-purple hair, just appeared a bit older, extended her arms, and they embraced. I missed you so much. We've missed you too, her mother said. Oh, you look fabulous. And a Sue Anthar now. We're so proud of you. Clea blushed. Thank you. Her father clapped her shoulder before embracing her. He looked a bit older than the last time she saw him, with some additional lines around his gray-green eyes. His once vibrant, lighter purple hair lost most of its color, turning a striking white. You both looked great. Yes, well, it's been a less active few years for us than you, her father said. We've followed your exploits and you've been quite busy. No wonder you were able to secure your rank. You've been performing. I can't even believe all we've done so far, but I haven't told them about what typically happens when a culture's admitted to the Alliance. Her father's brows went up. They don't know you may be reassigned? Clea shook her head. No, but I looked and I have the authority to request I stay on and continue to serve with them for a time. You do, her mother replied. But will you? I believe so. I've done so much with them, distinguished myself. I think there's more to be done. But you'll be back at Earth, her father said. Again. I know, father, but it hopefully won't be much longer. And on a ship of the line, her mother pointed out. Very dangerous. It's dangerous anywhere but here, and even this place, I don't know. If the enemy decided to attempt a full-scale invasion. Intelligence suggests they don't know our exact coordinates, her father said. Though I'm not counting on that entirely. Exactly. I feel strongly that we need to take the fight to them if we hope to win. Clea thought back to her dream. She wanted to bring it up to them, but it didn't seem like the time. Maybe over dinner, when there weren't so many people around. I wanted to tell you how sorry I am about Vora. Her father's face turned grim and he shook his head. Don't be. It wasn't your fault and you did exactly what you had to. Vora made her choice. Her mother looked on the verge of tears. I still don't understand what she was thinking. She refused to see us when they brought her back here for trial. I'm hoping before the sentencing she'll want to talk. I doubt she'll have anything we want to hear, her father said. 
I wouldn't count on her being particularly forthcoming with motives that make any sense. I can attest she won't, Clea said. We talked a few times. She admits she was wrong now. Her reasons. She was always arrogant, but this, this went above and beyond. It was treason without logical direction. I understand the humans just had to deal with some betrayal of their own, her mother said. How do you know that? Her mother grinned. I spent nearly twenty years working with intelligence. I still get some of the briefings, especially about the ship my daughter's serving on. Clea smirked. Well, then you know more than I do, I assume. Two young men and a woman accepted orders from a superior to damage relations between the Alliance and Earth. They initially wanted to frame me, but it didn't work out. Deplorable behavior her father said. They could learn a few things about self-preservation. It should be part of the criteria to admittance. That right there should have been good reason to deny them another six months or year. Father, we need all the help we can get right now, and denial would have set things back on all sides. Giving a victory to their separatist faction wouldn't have done anyone any good. Perhaps not, her father replied. But I'm not entirely convinced they're to be trusted after this. Of course, we're far more forgiving of that sort of thing. It's the individual, not the culture, which makes a decision such as this. I just hope it does not bite us this time. From everything I've read, they're a fairly warlike culture. Historically true, Clea nodded. But they've got a lot of positive things, too. Their art is fabulous, and they care very much about their history. It teaches them how to fight better, her mother said. But not just that, Clea continued. They remember the glories of their scientists and creators as well. All around, the humans have a complex culture, one that we can learn from, just as they can learn from us. After serving closely with them for so long, I can say they have their faults, but their virtues far outweigh them. Her mother cupped her cheek. You truly have become the ambassador for them they needed. I hope they realize how lucky they are to have you. Clea winked. Sometimes I make it clear. Well, let's catch up on less serious matters, her mother said. I'm sure we can find something frivolous to talk about. For instance, I planted a new garden on the south side of the back lawn. Mostly spices and herbs. I think you love the way it smells. And your Aunt Vina just bought me a new weather station that's vastly superior to my old one. Clea let out a contented sigh and enjoyed the moment with her family. She knew she'd have a few days with them, perhaps longer, but their initial gathering felt perfect. This was what she needed, and didn't even know it. A chance to simply be with them and enjoy real time off. Later, they'd really get a chance to talk, but until dinner, this was exactly what she needed. Gray met with the ambassador and went through the semantics of the ceremony. He would arrive in the council chamber with his two attendants, in this case Redding and Clea, then approach by himself. The head councilman, Malin Doraval, would recite a passage. They would then hand him a ceremonial baton, a symbol of Earth's stake in the Alliance. The ritual of it seemed simple enough. Gray had been through enough military traditions to understand. He felt thankful all he had to do was say, thank you, and I accept. Once they finished, those gathered would applaud, and Gray would be out to watch the parade. When that finished... He had an invitation from the military councilman for dinner. Then he could get some rest. Clea planned to spend the evening with her family, and Redding planned to join him for the shop talk. Various minor details needed to be worked out before one of Earth's politicians and the real ambassador arrived to take their post. Then they'd be able to visit the discussion of claiming the salvage. I hope they get behind this. She's pretty passionate about what we'll find. Gray arrived at the council chamber a little early and felt tremendous awe as he peered inside. 
The room had a hundred-foot ceiling, and all around men and women gathered to watch the ceremony. All the leaders sat in an elevated dais some twenty feet above the floor. An attendant, the man carrying the baton, would be on the same level as the visitors. The metal appeared to be shiny gold, glimmering from subtle lights hidden in recessed tracks all about the room. He backed into the antechamber with the ambassador and checked his chronometer. They had a good ten minutes before the event started, but neither Clea nor Redding had arrived yet. They'll be here, Gray said. I'm sure the crowds have kept them. We should have had them stay with us, Nifolsa said. We do not want to delay things. You won't, Redding announced as she and Clea approached. The elevator was terrible, stopped on every floor. Thank goodness you made it. Nifolsa looked like he might faint, he was so relieved. This is a momentous occasion, one we do not want to mess up with tardiness. We understand, sir. Clea bowed her head. I look forward to participating. He went over the process again with them, and Gray noted he recited it the exact same way. Like an actor, I guess. This is all a show, after all. The others listened patiently, probably wondering why they needed to understand it all when they just needed to stand around. At least he made them feel included. Suddenly, the crowd fell silent. The council arrived to the sound of a massive gong. Gray peeked out and saw the five people take their seats on the dais. Their attendant positioned himself behind a podium, clasping his hands behind his back. Guards took up position around all the exits. Redding glanced at him, leaning close to whisper, This is intense. It really is, Gray replied. I can't wait to see how they give the speech. Don't forget, Nifolsa said. They will start in our language and then welcome you in yours. I hope I don't need to know what they're saying, Redding replied. You don't, Gray said. I've got an earpiece to translate. The gong sounded again. Nifolsa tapped Gray's arm and gestured. Go ahead, sir, go ahead. Gray paced out before the dais with Clea and Redding close behind. He stood at attention, looking up at the council as they prepared to address them. Though there were innumerable people watching, it felt as though the setting were somehow intimate, that the men above and the behemoth crew were the only ones present. The words translated in his ear. We have gathered to bring to the fold another culture, one full of differences and nuances, their own beliefs and goals. These unique attributes, when combined with ours, shall make the entirety of our alliance stronger. As we grow, so will our enemies shrink. We work toward the same goal— Suppression of war and expansion of exploration. There are other cultures, other galaxies to unite in commonality and peace. The future holds many discoveries, many mysteries we have yet to unravel. These journeys, yet unplanned or imagined, are far better when undertaken with friends. Together, with our combined strength, we shall make our collective alliance stable, wise, and ever vigilant. He shifted his words to English, looking directly at Gray. You represent the Earth, and your exploits are well known to us. We have read the reports and stand impressed. Through the years you have stood on your own against a tide of darkness with increasing help and cooperation from the Keelan people. Now, as you join us here as partners, your patience and perseverance have paid off. Thank you, sir, Gray replied, bowing his head briefly. We offer you a great responsibility, one we believe you are more than capable of shouldering. Each mission has shown we are making the right decision. The attendant suddenly advanced, holding out the baton. We extend this token as a representation of our will that we wish you to join us. 
that you take up the torch of our cause and make it your own, just as we do the same for you. Of these things and all we have to offer, do you, Captain Gray Atwell of the planet Earth, accept this responsibility on behalf of your species, military and political bodies? I accept, Gray intoned. He took the baton as it was offered. So by taking up the item, you too are now part of the Alliance. Welcome, new friends. May we have many years of peace, cooperation, and prosperity. The applauds were incredible, near deafening as thousands of people clapped their hands and shouted their excitement. Gray couldn't help but be moved, his heart rate picking up and his body trembling. The weight of so many people staring at them weighed on him, and he stood with his head high throughout the conclusion. The rest of the night would be considerably less intense, but that moment, he embraced the spectacle of it. Few people could claim to be part of history, to participate in something schools would teach for years to come. He was proud to consider what his contribution provided to his people, his friends, and culture. Redding shook his hand, then Clea as well. The council bowed as they departed. The ambassador ushered them through the door and back out into the chamber. The parade would begin any moment, and he had a perfect seat for him and Redding to enjoy it. A few hours of celebration felt right after such a solemn affair. And afterward, they could truly focus on ending the conflict plaguing all the universe and get back to the real purpose of space travel exploration, and peace. Chapter 5 The time spent on Alantha went by in a whirlwind for Gray. He witnessed the parade, then immediately was swept off to dinner and late-night conversation with the military council. He felt they hit it off well, and he enjoyed their company. It would make his conversation with them later much easier. Afterward, he took a tour with the ambassador, but assumed it would be the safe version, not like what Clea might offer. He didn't see her for the first two days. She went and stayed with her family before linking up with him the morning of the third day. Redding accompanied them, and she gave them the insider trip, showing them places off the beaten path. On the fourth day, Gray met with the head of the military, essentially Daniel Burke's equivalent. His name was Dane Gursa an older Keelan who still looked like he was in his forties. I hope I age even half as well. These guys must have an amazing diet. They sat in a cozy den off one of the spire's main passageways. So, Captain, Dane said, what is it you wish to discuss? We're interested in the salvage of a battle that took place some time ago, Gray explained. You fought against four enemy ships and destroyed them all, but unfortunately lost a couple of your own. Salvage, Dane's brows lifted. I'm not sure what you mean. If it was an older fight, what do you hope to find? It's a dangerous area. Gray offered him his data pad so Dane could see the location in question. We believe that anyone who has been through there might not have gotten what we're after. So my question still stands. We think there's information about the enemy. Something vital. It would be a shame if we left it behind. Dane handed back the pad and rubbed his chin. I do know the area. My son fought in that battle, on a ship that was not damaged. What do you need from us? Surely, if you were going to check it out, you must have realized we would not have stopped you. It's not that, Gray said. We're hoping to cooperate, to get a little help. I see. What sort? Gray hesitated a moment, thinking through what they really needed. He didn't want another captain there cutting into the operation. Maybe something small would work better. Enough to show they were working together but not enough to limit their ability to react to the situation as he saw fit. A tech crew would be nice, Gray said. We need some folks to supplement Suanthar on Tufal's knowledge of this technology so we can properly investigate what we discover. 
Dane nodded. I believe we can do that quite easily. He got out a computer pad of his own and tapped out a message. I'll have them report to the behemoth in the next two days. They'll bring a jump-capable shuttle. Just in case. They have to leave in a hurry? Gray asked. Dane shrugged. One never knows what one will find in forgotten sectors. It's best to be prepared. Is there anything else you wish to discuss? No, I think we're good, unless you'd like another round of cultural exchange. Dane smiled brightly and nodded. I would. I'll start, this time with breakfast rituals. Clea got the message from Gray, stating the Keelans committed to helping with the salvage operation. She was sitting with her parents in the house, having breakfast. Her mother took her hand gently and brought her back to reality. She hadn't even realized she'd been staring off into space. What is it? Clea smiled. Just thinking about my first combat mission. That was a bad one, her father said. You were in the hospital for a few days. Never wanted to talk about it. Do you want to now? Her mother looked worried. No, not really. I guess I just didn't realize how much it affected me. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Why? Her father asked. Any particular reason? I had a crazy dream, and when I woke up, I remembered a bunch of details. The psychologist told me that might happen, but after a few years, I figured he was wrong. They rarely are, her father squinted at her. So what are you going to do? I convinced Captain Atwell to take a trip out to the battle site, Clea said. We're going to see if there's anything to salvage of my old station. Her father nodded. What do you hope to find? A key to helping fight the enemy, Clea replied. A way to drive them back, maybe? I don't know. Something about my past, so I can put this behind me, maybe? But I don't think I'm that selfish. I genuinely believe I found something while we were on that mission, and I want to be sure I explore the option. Then you're being thorough, her mother said. And that's a good trait. I hope so, Clea sighed. I have to go back to the ship tomorrow morning. And you'll be off? Her father asked. Clea nodded. Then today we'll stay in and be together. Her mother squeezed her hand. Who knows the next time we'll see one another? Who indeed? Clea muttered. I like that plan, guys. Thank you. Any time, daughter. Her father patted her shoulder. Any time. Gray received access to a library with accounts of space battles conducted by the Keelans throughout the war. These were simulations a commander could watch from any angle and study the tactics to better understand the forces they were up against. Some of the losses were also recorded, pieced together through scans and collection of salvage. He watched a couple of these early in the morning while having breakfast. The ability to move the camera to any point and witness the fight from different perspectives appealed to his tactical mind. The Keelans, in particular, were cunning with their use of micro-jumps and focused firepower from multiple vessels. After going through several of the fights, he brought up the one that destroyed the ship Clea was on with the data they needed. The conflict was old, and the computer spent almost a minute updating the graphics to modern thresholds. When it fully loaded, he put in his earbud and hit play, watching from the perspective of the four Alliance battleships. It seems odd to be watching a fight when someone I knew was there. Incredible. The battle started out with the four enemy vessels jumping into the area at nearly 500,000 kilometers out. The eight Alliance ships separated, spacing themselves out distant enough that splash damage would not be a concern. Shields went up and they advanced, preparing for what appeared to be a toe-to-toe -to -toe struggle. The ship on the outermost starboard side suddenly performed a micro-jump and hit one of the enemies on the flank. They began to exchange fire while the rest of the Alliance ships focused all their attention on the outermost vessel on the opposite side. 
concentrated fire pounded the enemy's shields, but this was back when the Alliance was technically outmatched. An energy buildup launched a blast into one of the seven Alliance ships working together, punching right through its shields. Gray saw what they did. Right when the Keelans fired, the enemy hit them while their power dipped from weapon discharge. It caused hull damage and a follow-up shot finished them off. They worked down the shields and caused catastrophic damage to their enemy, destroying their engines first, then causing fractures all across the hull. They didn't have data to support it, but Gray figured he just witnessed the entire ship lose artificial atmosphere, possibly killing everyone on board. If they didn't matter whether they survived that initial damage or not. Moments later, the entire vessel exploded, leaving behind little more than debris. Fighters joined the fray, screaming about and engaging hostiles. Some got through and hit another of the Keelan vessels, causing shield damage enough for the larger of the enemy ships to fire a blast and knock out its defenses. Gray took a moment to observe that ship. He hadn't seen such a large one in their fights so far, and certainly not one that hung back. The Keelans managed to destroy another enemy with continuous pulse bursts over the upper part of the enemy hull. They performed flybys and micro-jumped to safety. Their fighters managed to finish one off, obliterating it with bombs before turning to the next. Sadly, those ships were taken out by enemy fighters. Their exchange of damages was brutal and constant. Each side vied for more catastrophic damage, and as another Keelan vessel exploded, Gray tensed up. They'd brought down two of the enemy ships, and a third was suffering under heavy damage. The tempered steel went up next, a shot tearing through its hull and splitting it down the center. Clea's vessel. Gray couldn't believe anyone survived the attack. While the ship itself was not obliterated, several holes appeared throughout the hull. The fact so many people got off the ship was a testament to their safety protocols and quick thinking. Some of it was luck, too, because if it had hit a different way, they'd all be gone. I wonder if Clea has watched this. The last five ships were able to dispatch the damaged enemy. They went for what they assumed was the bridge, according to the text at the bottom of the screen. Each vessel flanked and went to town, hitting it with everything they had. When it finally drifted off and exploded, the larger ship jumped out of the system and the Keelans started search and rescue operations, took another six hours to complete. Holy crap, those people required aid for an entire shift. Amazing. Gray understood why they might have lost the equipment then. By the time they finished their rescue operations, they received a signal of more enemies incoming. They jumped out to report in and lick their wounds. Another engagement in the area took place, but between the enemy and a different culture. He didn't know how it ended. Why was the enemy so interested in that space? He checked the area and discovered the sector happened to be adjacent to several others with settlements and resource-rich planets. Perhaps they were expanding for that reason, but every engagement left both sides off poorly. Eventually, they seemed to stop, but not before dozens of ships were destroyed in the area. It's the Bermuda Triangle of Space. Gray shut down the computer and went about his day, but he couldn't shake the fight out of his head. Eight against four, and they lost three vessels. He fought two enemy vessels with the aid of a ship that wasn't even fully operational and won, albeit not easily. Of course, the years apart in the conflict made a difference. Technology was a lot better already. Still, the first days of the war must have been terrifying. Such heavy losses couldn't have been easy to bear. I hope you found something out there, Clea. This has to stop. One way or another, it has to stop. Adam joined Group Commander Esteban Revente in the hangar as the Keelan shuttle came aboard. The two men watched as the shiny craft came to a rest in the middle of the deck, air bursting from the landing gear as it settled. Deck crew hurried over and locked it down, ensuring it would not move in the event of a gravity shift. Looks pretty, Adam said. The captain's message said it's jump capable. I didn't even know smaller ships could jump, Esteban said. Amazing, huh? I look forward to a tour of the thing. 
I'm sure they'll hook you up eventually. Adam checked his chronometer. I have to get to the bridge. The captain's landing in ten minutes and he wants us underway within the hour. You find someone who can maneuver around all that debris? I've narrowed it down to pointer or hail, Esteban said. Whichever of them wants to go. Maybe they should both do it, Adam pointed out. They'll need a co-pilot, someone good enough to take over if necessary. Esteban grinned. Trying to take my job, Commander? Adam chuckled. Not at all. I'll leave you to it then. He headed back to the bridge and took a seat. Ollie sat at his station, tapping away. Redding returned before Gray and she was already back on duty, working with Leonard to get them safe passage out of the system. When the captain boarded, they'd be off to their next mission. How are we doing, everyone? We're ready to depart, Redding said. Leonard has plotted a solid jump course. How close was it to your initial estimates? Adam asked. Leonard turned and smiled. I was off by less than 300 meters, a very reasonable margin and one which would have worked just fine. Congratulations and good job on the great math. Adam checked his computer for reports. All stations showed green. Time to get back to action, folks. I hope you're ready. Not much action to be found in salvage, Ollie said. When was the last time something went right? Redding countered. Ollie blushed. Good point, he paused. Captain Shuttle is landing now. Adam brought Gray up on his comm. You here, sir? I am, Adam. Get us moving. Hi, Captain. Adam turned to the others. Agatha, do we have clearance to depart? We do, sir. Our window of opportunity is now. Take us out, Redding. Yes, sir. Redding initiated the thrusters and they began to move, rumbling at first, then smoothing out. They pulled away from orbit and headed toward open space. We will be at the jump point in less than two hours. Sounds good. Adam turned to Ollie. You might want to hop down and familiarize yourself with the technicians who just came on board. I suspect you'll be working closely with them throughout this operation. I will, sir. Is Miss Antufa going to be there? Yes, she came aboard with the captain. Grab her on the way. You've got two hours to get ready for the op. I suggest anyone who has a part to play double-check that they're ready. If this place is as dangerous as the reports suggest, we're going to need to be on our toes the entire time. Despite the success of their last jump, Redding still didn't entirely trust their faster-than-light travel. It burned them too many times and would definitely have to earn back her faith. She didn't hesitate to initiate the process, but her stomach tightened up seconds before they made the trip. When they appeared without incident, not even a strange feeling, she sighed and refocused on her job. Two for two so far. They really did seem to fix it. Ollie put the sector up on the main screen, showing a massive field of rock and chunks of ship. There were far more than the two enemies and three Alliance vessels. This was a graveyard for starships of all sizes. More than a few battles took place there, and they didn't seem to go very well for most of the participants. Gray spoke up, directing his attention to Clea. I read the briefing that this place was dangerous, but what happened here? Why so many battles? Why so much debris? Long ago, a planet became unstable and essentially exploded, Clea explained. This made for excellent mining. Before the enemy attacked, many cultures, even within the Alliance, fought over the rights to claim the minerals. Pirates got involved back then as well. Then the enemy attacked, and since then, I'm not aware of any further conflict. Did the mining dry up? Redding asked. Not really. Those who risk coming out here don't fight amongst themselves. They only really have to worry about criminals, and if they see some coming, they can just flee. Of course, some fights like that would not be reported to Alliance Command, so maybe they blast away at each other all the time. I'm picking up a group of ships, Ollie said, not far off. They seem to be scouring the wreckage over there. He focused the screen on a section off to the left. Looks like five total. Redding leaned forward to look. Those aren't Alliance. They used to be, Clea said. Those, my friends, are pirates. 
Gray replied. Wonderful. Ollie, get us a good scan of those vessels. If we have to engage, I'd like to be prepared. Yes, sir. A readout of the largest one, essentially the size of a scout, appeared on the screen. Redding estimated it had a crew of 30 with room for maybe four fighters. It was armed with modern weapons, so not as helpless as the new culture they encountered. Still, they were so small any hit from the pulse cannons would likely eliminate them. The others were like large shuttles. Ollie posted on the screen that they probably attached themselves to the hull of the larger one when they weren't performing an operation. Redding waited for the order to approach, feeling particularly ready to throw down with these guys. The pirates at the mining facility left a bad taste in her mouth. I'm picking up a communication, Agatha announced. They've hailed us, asking for our immediate surrender. Redding's eyes widened and she turned to look back at Gray. He wore an equal look of surprise. They must not have very good scans. They did hit us with one, Ollie said. Maybe they only got a cursory look at what we've got going on. We should finish them off, Clea said. Take them down so we don't have to worry about them stinging us while we perform our search. I agree, Adam added. Hitting them hard and fast will get them out of the way before they can fly off and get lost in this mess. But we shouldn't risk fighters out in that. These guys look like they've been here a while. They might know the area better, and all the places to maneuver to avoid collisions. Agatha? Gray began. No reply. Redding, advance. Weapons hot. Let's get our shields up. Weapons fully charged and ready, Redding said. Maximum range in 20 seconds, optimal in one minute. Shields are online, Ollie said. Sound the alert, Gray added. Red lights went on behind Redding and she did her best to ignore them. The targeting computer assisted her with lining up decent shots, grabbing each of the vessels with a different turret. The scout might be able to survive a direct hit or two, but the others would go down almost instantly. Optimal range achieved, Redding announced. Permission to open fire? Granted, Gray said. Take them out. Redding pulled the trigger, letting the various turrets rip. The scout took a direct hit to the port side, near their engines and another barely ten meters up. One of the shuttles was gone in a globe of red fire while two more took direct hits and began to drift. A fourth managed to dodge the attack and attempted to fly into the wreckage. Redding redirected a turret and opened fire, scoring a hit to the engines. Another one exploded, pieces of the ship flying in all directions. The scout vessel returned fire, a continuous beam that struck the behemoth's shields for a good ten seconds. Ollie's hands moved so fast he distracted Redding for a moment, and she took a quick glance. He looked frantic, actually worried. Whatever they had might actually be far more dangerous than they anticipated. That thing just dropped our shields from 100% to 10%. In that section? Gray asked. No, sir. All our shields are at 10%. Impossible, Adam nearly shouted. How the hell? What kind of weapon is that? Analyzing it now. At least we know why they demanded our surrender, Gray said. Redding. Finish that ship off right now. Yes, sir. She directed all their weapons on the target, opening up with everything. It would require a recharge when they were done, but it didn't seem like keeping available weapons was as important as removing that threat. Every blast scored a direct hit, tearing through the scout's shields and wreaking havoc over its hull. A piece of debris collided with it as their weapons forced the thing off course, a crack appeared in the hull, and a moment later, the entire thing went up and burst. Once again, pieces were cast off to join the rest of the wreckage, another ship for this boneyard. I understand why they risk this place. It's a wealth of salvage. Captain, Agatha spoke up. The final shuttle is transmitting to us again. They wish to surrender, sir. They've cut all power to their weapons and are drifting. Ollie, scanning them now. Ollie tapped his console impatiently. There we go. It looks like they're telling the truth. They've turned their offensive systems off. They're not on standby. Okay. Tell them we need access to their computer systems immediately, and we'll bring them aboard. Ollie spent the next few minutes disabling their systems before they allowed them to land. Marines were dispatched to take the prisoners to the brig. This allowed them to refocus on the whole purpose of going there. 
They needed to find this ship that Clea served on, but after seeing the mess out there, Redding had no idea how they planned to do so. How are our shields now? Gray asked. Recharging, sir, Ollie replied. I'd love to get a look at that weapon. I don't think it's intact, though. You think? Redding muttered. Start the scans for the tempered steel, Gray said. Clea and the tech team will assist. Remember, we're in a hostile environment. That's bad enough without being shot at, so keep yourselves frosty and let's get out of here without injury or damage. Clea worked closely with Ollie, Paul, and the Keelan tech crew to start a sensor web looking for the old wreckage. They collected massive amounts of data, and each of them began processing it as quickly as possible. Over an hour later, they still hadn't found what they were looking for and only analyzed half of their information. They did, however, catalog a number of items worth investigating later. Much had been stripped, though, and Clea started worrying about what they'd find at the tempered steel. It may not be there at all, stripped of all but the frame itself. She tried to prepare herself for that eventuality, but couldn't quite shake the despair. Another half hour later, Paul shouted out to them. I found it! Ollie and Clea joined him while the others continued to work. There'd been enough false positives that not everyone got excited from a find. The three of them peered over the screen, and Clea really scrutinized his findings. The mass and density were correct, so it may at least have been one of the vessels they lost. If it's not the steel, it's going to be close to it. We haven't lost that many ships out here. The Hulk didn't radiate any power. It was certainly dead. That meant they could not remotely claim any data from whatever storage banks might be left. They'd have to physically visit the wreckage and take things the old-fashioned way. Luckily, the tech team brought cutting torches capable of removing bulkheads. I'll tell the captain, Clea said. Keep analyzing the data until we're ready to do something about this. Clea left, rushing to the elevator and hurrying along the hall to the bridge. She stormed in, causing Leonard to jump. Welcome back, Adam grumbled. You're excited? We found Alliance wreckage, Clea replied, breathing heavily from her run. There's no power out there, so we'll have to go there. The behemoth can't make that trip, Gray said. We'd probably make it even more hazardous, pushing all that debris around. Clea nodded. We'll bring the shuttle. It's got the shields for it and can maneuver the way the pirates did. You're going to need someone particularly good at flying, Adam said. One of the bomber pilots, maybe? Someone who can handle a bigger craft? Rudy, Gray said. He's got the chops for this. Have Ravente send him down. Clea stood at attention. Sir, I would like to accompany the team. Clea, that's probably not a good idea, Gray frowned. Let's talk in the ready room. The two of them disappeared into his office and closed the door. He turned to her and kept his voice low. Sometimes it's important for a superior officer to let their subordinates do their jobs. You can't hover over them all the time. I trust them all, of course, Clea said. But I want to see it with my own eyes, to be there again and, I don't know, put my memories to rest, I suppose? Besides, I know exactly where we have to look, and they'd flounder. You can't show them on a schematic? The ship's been cut in half and is possibly worse by now. I'm afraid there won't be a map for however many sections it's been broken into. I shouldn't permit this. I hope you will. Gray stepped away, peering at a monitor for several long moments. Clea worried he would come back with a negative but she didn't see the harm in her departure. She'd gone down to the research facility, after all. Why not a jaunt into space? Her zero-G qualification was still current. Okay, Clea, you can go. Clea closed her eyes in silent thanks. Providing you be careful, I can't afford to lose our liaison. You're lucky I'm not as conservative as the rest of my military council. I appreciate your confidence, sir. We'll return with what we're after or bad news. Either way, I believe this is something I need to do. For my sanity. I hope it helps. Be safe, Suanthar. I look forward to your report. Clea gave him a salute. Yes, sir. 
and departed the bridge. Rudy arrived at the flight deck and looked over the shuttle they expected him to fly. The tech crew who brought the thing were all certified pilots, but none of them actually had experience in the sort of environment they were about to fly through. Ravente told him to consider it a combat op, but that made him nervous. He never used Keelan technology. Their own bombers were human-designed, based on Alliance work. This thing? He hoped they kept it pretty straightforward or he'd be telling them he wasn't their guy. As he boarded the ship, he noted that the cargo area had been converted into a computer lab, but the walls represented every other military vehicle he'd ever been on. Spartan and Bear. At least these guys aren't all flash and pomp. Rudy climbed a ladder up to the next section, a living space with eight bunks recessed into the walls two by two. At the end, a hatch led to a mess area, then the bridge was another ten meters away. This isn't a shuttle, it's an RV for scientists. He figured they could carry enough supplies to survive for weeks, if not a full month in deep space. Not exactly luxury, but doable. Taking a look at the controls, he let out a sigh of relief. Flight controls looked a lot like his bomber with a throttler on the right and wheel in front. One of the techs joined him. Hello there. My name's Arak. Rudy, nice to meet you. Indeed, Arak smiled. Can I give you a brief tour of the pilot's station? Go for it, Rudy replied. The primer was more than sufficient to get him up to snuff, but he didn't quite feel comfortable flying a combat mission in it. Arak stated he'd be riding co-pilot to help with shield control and navigation, plus Rudy would have a good twenty minutes to get the feel of the ship before they arrived at the debris field. Plenty of time. I hope. Clea joined them, carrying a large case. There are more of these in the back, in the event that we have to leave the shuttle. What are they? Rudy asked. Environmental suits. I have a feeling we're going to have to physically check out the wreckage to find what we're after. Oh, Rudy nodded, suddenly grateful he'd be up in the front of the ship flying it. Good luck with that. I appreciate that, Wing Commander. Clea turned to Arak. Can we change in the mess area? There are a couple of rooms down there where you can have some privacy, Arak said. Go ahead. Thank you, Rudy. We leave in fifteen minutes. Let me just grab my things and I'll start our pre-flight check. Rudy stowed his gear behind the seat and ran through the various systems with Arak, ensuring they were ready to go. Everything checked out and he contacted the tower. They gave him immediate clearance and a few moments later, the hangar deck cleared. His communicator went off, a private message from Ravente. You sure you got this, Hale? Yes, sir. I just went over it with one of theirs. The ship's enough like ours to make it okay. Be very careful out there. I looked at the scans and you're flying into some of the worst environmental hazards I've ever seen. Sounds like a challenge. Just make sure you don't take unnecessary risks. Ravente out. Very inspirational. Thank you for that, Commander. Clea returned wearing all but the helmet of an environmental suit. It fit the body tightly with rigid plates in place to avoid damage. A wrist computer attached to her left arm and a small pack rested on her back. He'd seen one of the Keelan suits before and knew that they had a continuous oxygen generator that took up the bottom of the burden. Anything else in there must have been to enhance the computer. Okay, Mr. Hale, Clea said. I believe everyone's ready. You can take us out. Yes, ma'am. Rudy took a deep breath and engaged the engines. The ship rumbled as he turned it around slowly, bringing them out of the hangar into deep space. Here we go. Learn fast, Hale. You don't have time for mistakes. Chapter 6 Rudy took the ship through some paces as they departed the behemoth, getting a feel for how the thrusters moved them about. The inertial dampeners were incredible, reacting to the twitchiest motions he could manage. 
As they pulled a lazy circle, he felt confident he could get them where they needed to go. If you're ready, Clea said, I've put the information up on your screen. Just follow the marker and we'll be in the general vicinity. Yes, ma'am. Rudy narrowed his eyes and read the scanner. Revente wasn't kidding. The debris he saw made his stomach turn. This place is insane. I'm increasing power to the shields, Arak said. I don't think all the debris will be avoidable, just the biggest of them. Rudy nodded, concentrating for their entry into the field far too much to reply. He saw a massive bulkhead floating less than 200 meters off to the starboard. Directly ahead, small rocks, probably the size of his fist, were highlighted by the scanner. He slowed down and nudged them with the shields, entering the area at little more than a drift. Subtle flying, Arak said. I'm quite impressed. Thanks, Rudy muttered. I didn't know I had it in me. Mr. Hale is a bomber pilot, Clea explained, which means subtlety isn't usually part of his job. Ah, Arak nodded, turning back to his station. We've got a massive asteroid to port drifting toward us. Without compensation, it'll collide in less than a minute. Wow, this guy's pretty calm considering what that would mean. Rudy compensated by initiating the thrusters, pushing them starboard to avoid the thing. He turned and saw it, swallowing hard. The massive asteroid might have been half the size of the behemoth. It would have been like being on a raft and getting crushed by a humpback whale. I guess I'm glad he didn't start yelling. They've got some faith in me, I guess. Rudy climbed to avoid a particularly dense patch of technical debris, pieces of ship that he couldn't identify. They moved past it and even deeper into the field. He checked the scanner just to scare himself, to see how far they were away from the behemoth, and they'd already traveled over 10,000 kilometers. Twenty minutes had passed. That long? It felt like five. A near miss nearly shaved their underside, but he managed to twitch up, avoiding that asteroid but connecting with a few small rocks directly above them. The shields deflected them, but a rock warned they dropped to 40%. Rudy let them recharge before pressing on, trying to take more care with the scanners. I'm picking up a small vessel, a rock said, roughly equivalent to us moving in. On intercept? Rudy asked. Out here? The pirates fight in this sector all the time, Arak replied. I would not be surprised if they assume we're just some competition. Do we have any weapons? Rudy assumed they did, but the question made sense. Indeed. Pulse cannons and military-grade missiles. Rudy nodded. Great. Should we contact them first? Give them a chance to back off? Clea spoke up. There's a good chance they'll ignore us, but I agree. Out here in this mess, it would be best to avoid a fight. Rudy engaged the communicator and tried to hail the craft. Attention, incoming vessel. This is Commander Hale on an Alliance salvage run. Please fall back and disengage. We are not here for a fight. They're maintaining course, Arak said. Come on, guys. Do you really want to throw down out here? We're looking for one thing, and you can go back to whatever you're doing. Alliance ship, a man's voice crackled through the speakers. This is the dragon's tongue, and you're infringing on our territory. If you don't want to be obliterated, fall back now and get out of this sector. This is your one and only warning. Did you totally ignore what I just said? Rudy asked. We're alliance. That means military, and we're not infringing on anything. You can't claim this junkyard. Half the stuff out here belongs to us. Now, I'll totally let you continue your operations, but you have to let me finish mine. This is important. I guess we'll be salvaging you guys, too, then. The pirates cut the line. That happened, Rudy sighed. Okay. Familiarize me with the weapons, because we're going to be in it. 
Analysis of the enemy vessel indicates that they are not as well equipped as ours. Their shields are enhanced consumer grade, meaning a few well-placed blasts will take them down. Iraq brought something up on the scanner. Furthermore, they are not equipped with the continuous cannon that the other pirates were, so we should be safe from retaliation. Weapons? Rudy prompted. I've brought them online, Arak said. Your triggers are on the flight wheel. Targeting computer is also up and ready. Just avoid the largest debris in the conflict and we should come out okay. Rudy checked the scanner and saw their opponent was merely 200 kilometers away, but they approached behind a veil of tightly packed rockets. That's interesting. Let's try something. He pulled up, putting their target reticle directly in the center of the barrier blocking their target and opened fire with pulse cannons. The rocks were obliterated, opening a perfect view of the pirates as they barreled toward them. Their plan seemed to be get as close as possible and go above or below the barrier to get a sneak attack in. As they started to bank high for their shot, Rudy fired again, clipping the back of their ship. It spun to the right, then engaged engines and tried to put some distance between them. Rudy pursued, taking their six. He hadn't done any real dogfighting outside the simulator in a long time. His ships were designed for a totally different purpose, but he got back into quickly enough. Unleashing another blast, he barely missed. The pirates continued to fly erratically, and it became clear they knew the area well. Rudy smacked into some pretty sizable rocks, and a rock casually informed him what each blow did to the shields. The constant reminder of the descending percentages started to annoy him, but he was too focused to say anything. The pirates pulled around a particularly large piece of starship, what looked like the frame of an engine. As they did, Rudy slowed and prepared for them to pop out the other side. Instead, they sprouted from the top and spun, firing a full blast that directly hit the top of the Alliance ship. Damn it! Rudy pressed the throttle forward, gaining some momentum before initiating the thrusters and spinning around. Just as the pirates would have taken their six, he was flying backward and facing them. Firing missiles and cannons at the same time, the pirate couldn't pull up in time. Their front took the full brunt of the damage and micro-explosions dotted the hull of their craft. Rudy slowed them down again, just a few dozen kilometers ahead of running into another chunk of ship. The pirate exploded, leaving behind little more than dust and sparking metal. Phew, that was nuts. Excellent flying, Mr. Hale, Arak said. Our destination is approximately 20,000 kilometers back the way we came. I'll give you an indicator to follow. I'm glad he thought the flying was okay, but I expected a few more moments of elation that we made it before we got right back to business. I guess that's not how Keelan's roll. Rudy got them moving again this time even more cautious and aware of their surroundings. He reported back to the behemoth and let them know about the attack. Ravente advised caution. If I wasn't with the Keelans, I'd tell them off about that. Thanks for the news flash, group commander. I never would have thought of that on my own. As they approached their destination, he realized they'd been flying for well over 45 minutes. That was the longest three quarters of an hour of my life. Very good. Clea said. Arak, I'm taking two people with me over to the ship when we find it. Please use the scan data in lines 36 to 48 for signatures. Yes, ma'am. Arak did as instructed and put a marker on the screen. If the readings are correct, the tempered steel is right over there, less than a kilometer away. Take us over there, Rudy. Clea put on her helmet. You should be able to land on the surface. The drift, according to our readings, was not too bad. Now I'm landing on moving garbage? This is definitely my day to be tested. Rudy again moved them slowly toward their destination. Here, so close to the wreckage they were after, rocks continually bounced off their shields, bumped out of the way as they progressed. A ship with less protective capacity would be suicidal to try for any of the salvage in this place. When he saw the hulk of the tempered steel, his heart pounded hard in his chest. Seeing a capital ship dead in space filled him with awe and a sense of sadness. Many people died on that ship, 
their bodies likely still floating in the vacuum of space, mixed in amongst this debris surrounding them. He shook it off and approached, turning the ship to find a suitable point to set down. Reporting back to the behemoth, he let them know they'd found their target and were on a final approach for landing. Ravente acknowledged, but the tension in his voice said he was worried. Now I feel like I should be more concerned. Rudy matched the drift of the vessel and brought them down on what used to be the hull near the engineering section. It was the largest part of the ship still intact, and he hoped it was the one that Clea needed to perform her investigation. The other part was some 300 meters away, tethered to this part by a series of wires and a single metal panel that refused to break. Good luck, ma'am. I hope you find what you're looking for. Me too, Rudy, Clea replied. We'll be back as soon as we can. Clea and two of the technicians, a woman named Tria and a man, Dara, stood in the airlock just off the mess area. They each double-checked their environmental suits, ensuring none of them missed anything. Their computers stated everything was secure and sealed, but sensors could break, so visual inspection was necessary. As the doors opened, Clea fought back a sense of panic. She'd never done anything like this before. Her zero-G training was for disasters on ships, not trudging around on the outside of them. They'd get into the corridors soon enough, but before then, they had a 1,000-meter walk to the first access point, a shattered hole where the ship took a blow. I'll lead the way, Clea said over the comm, forcing herself to take the first step. An irrational fear of her magnetic boots failing made her nearly hyperventilate, but as soon as she felt them secure to the hull, she calmed down a little. Her companions seemed much more at ease, pacing out behind her without hesitation. The second part of traveling in open space came from the difficulty of fighting the magnetic boots. It was like walking in deep snow, and by the time they were halfway to the hull breach, Clea's legs ached. She risked a look down at her computer, and she looked back up. A rock sailed by at an alarming rate, nearly striking her in the head. Be careful, she said to the others. I don't know if you saw that, but if the debris is moving that fast, it could be very dangerous. Understood, Suanthar, Tria said. We're almost there. The majesty of open space had to be acknowledged. Looking out of the boneyard, Clea couldn't help but feel awe at the carnage she looked over. Years of conflict and history floated out there in what amounted to the middle of nowhere. Every broken-up shield held a story of some kind, along with lives lost or altered. They arrived at the breach and cast a light inside. The floor was intact, but they would need to use a bit of thrust from their oxygen pack to get down there. Once within proximity of the deck, their boots would do the rest, but jumping wouldn't do anything but make them float off. Clea double-checked her understanding of the controls before attempting it. The last thing I need is to throw myself into deep space because I had no idea what I was doing. I'll go first, ma'am, Tria said, stepping off the edge and engaging her thrust. Clea watched as the young woman descended, bending her knees as she connected with the deck and backing away easily. Dura went next, leaving Clea alone to contemplate the area. She glanced over her shoulder and gasped, just as a large rock connected with her shoulder. The force of it made her magnetic boots disengage and she floated, rotating so she was staring down at the deck below. Engage your thrusts? Tria's voice filled her ear. Do it now, ma'am. Clea nearly hit the wrong button, the one she would have needed had she jumped and not been shoved. As she tapped it, she began to sail toward her companions. The speed was alarming. She engaged the thrust to slow herself down, but it took both Tria and Dura catching her to prevent her from hitting the deck. You okay? Dura asked. Clea nodded. Yes, I'll probably have a bruise from that rock but I'll be fine. Thank you for the help. No problem, Tria gestured. The scan data we pulled suggests we need to go this way. Clea cast her light about the area and instantly felt a rush of nostalgia and sadness. Yes, you're right. It's that way. 
I walked this hallway a thousand times when it was part of a functioning starship. This is how I got to work every shift. Seeing it in such a state makes my heart hurt. She would loved her time on the tempered steel. Her commanding officer had been a fantastic teacher and mentor. Those around her did their jobs professionally and made each day a joy to work. They were all reassigned to different vessels after the incident, and she only spoke to a few of them ever again. Let's go. Clea swallowed hard and started along the deck, moving with a purpose. Her light illuminated the way, but in her mind's eye, it was brightly lit as the day she first boarded. This visit bolstered her memory, but she wasn't sure that was a good thing. As it filled in gaps she didn't even realize she had, it made her miss the ship all the more. I guess most people look back on fond memories with nostalgic regret. I just wish I would have had more time with them. They rounded a corner and paused. The wall to their left was missing, open to space like a window at a luxury hotel allowing a view of something exotic. Far off, they could just barely see the behemoth. We really came a long way. Considering how large the ship was, to see it so small gave Clea more respect for the speed of their ships and the overall vastness of space. We need to keep moving. They pressed on, coming to a door jammed shut. Tria stepped forward and pressed a rod roughly the size of a screwdriver at the center where they would open. She tapped something and it began to vibrate, wiggling its way between the doors. Once it was fully wedged into place, she pulled hard to the side and the doors slid open easily. Is that new? Clea asked. Yes, it pulses energy through the door if you can get it partially open. That simulates the same power which gets the mechanism moving. It's a search and rescue tool now. I'm sure they were using those when they were looking for survivors back at the research facility. I need to keep up with the advances in technology of my own people. Pressing through, they walked for another five minutes before arriving at Clea's work area, the tech lab. The door was gone, though not from the combat damage. Clea performed a scan and frowned. Someone cut this out. She exchanged a glance with Tria and Dura. Are you two seeing this? Dura confirmed. Yes, someone's been here already. They all stepped inside and further confirmed the bad news. The entire area had been attacked by scavengers, down to the seats being removed. Most of the computer panels had been taken as well, and even some sections of floor were missing. Damn it. Clea moved over to her station without much hope, but she had to know if her data was missing. Tools weren't necessary. As she drew closer, she could easily see through the wall where her storage devices would have been. Checking the rest of the stations proved out the same information. All of them were missing. This trip was for nothing. Clea slapped the wall in frustration and tapped her communicator back to Rudy. Bad news. Scavengers have already been here and taken everything. Oh, crap, Rudy sighed. Do you want me to inform the behemoth? I'll let them know now, but thank you. Clea changed the frequency and contacted the ship. Agatha responded and quickly transferred her over to Gray. Scavengers took everything. The storage devices are gone, sir. I'm... I'm sorry. For what? Gray asked. We had to check? Besides, I wouldn't despair just yet. We've got some people on board who might be able to shed some light on the situation. Head back to the ship as soon as you can, and maybe when you return, I'll have some better news to share. Gray, out. Come on, Clea said. It's time to go back. Major Harrington Bean was brought down to the brig for another interrogation, this time with pirates operating openly in the sector. These guys surrendered after their two companions were destroyed, but not all of them wanted to come peacefully. The Marines had to dislodge them from their vessel by venting gas into the ship, which gave them all a nice nap. The worst of the bunch remained in their cells, but the one who claimed to be an engineer was brought to interrogation. He seemed the most amiable to conversation, so they figured Harrington would be able to get something out of him. Apparently, 
The tech crew didn't find what they were looking for, so hope fell to the pirates to give them an idea of where it may have ended up. The idea made sense. How many places could pirates offload illegal merchandise? Few reputable vendors in the Alliance would risk the consequences. Those who didn't care about their reputation or operated well outside the law were also not likely to be listed in any business directory. All they had to do was find them. Harrington observed the man through the one-way glass for a moment, surprised to find he was human. Once the behemoth was on the verge of active service again, the Alliance had merchant vessels arriving to deliver goods. These ships took on industrious humans as crew members and passengers. They encountered some of them as pirates at the mining facility. I'm a little ashamed to know my people left the solar system to be crooks. The man had stringy brown hair that hung low over his forehead, obscuring blue eyes. He sported a thick beard and his clothes had seen better days. The black vest was frayed and his brown shirt had been patched in several locations. So these guys either don't spend their money on personal upkeep, or it's a hard life. Probably both. Harrington stepped into the room and closed the door, opting for a direct approach. My name's Harrington Bean, and I'll cut to the chase. You and I both know I'm in here for information. If you'd like to give it to me, this whole situation will go a lot easier for you. The pirate looked up at him, scowling. I already told people I was willing to cooperate. You took out our base ship. That was our meal ticket. Without them, we're back to square one. Then good, Harrington sat down. What's your name? Jesse Wilkins? Thanks, Jesse. So let's talk about how you make your money. Mostly we just salvage tech from the boneyard, Jesse said. We estimate there's enough here to keep people for another few years at least. Then there's the competition. We occasionally engage with them and take what they got. Not the most honorable of professions, but it gets us by. Off topic, but why did you attack the behemoth? Did you guys not know it was a warship? We knew, but our weapon, it should have torn through the shields quicker. We underestimated that part. Okay, then, Harrington shook his head. So back to how you make your money. What do you do with the salvage? I need to know every place you sell it to. Jesse looked uneasy, turning his head away. Harrington recognized the expression as one of regret. He didn't want to talk about this part and probably had good reason. His compatriots would not look kindly on the guy who snitched out their cash spots. However, this is what he'd promised, so he had to come clean eventually. I mean, I want to help. I do. But telling you that is what's going to keep you from life in prison, Harrington said. If you don't recall the regulations in this sector, the Alliance has stated any act of piracy is punishable by life in a maximum security work facility. Mining most of the time. You're looking at 12-hour days and some pretty miserable environments until you die. Jesse pursed his lips, getting anxious. It's just, I mean, at least I get to live in that scenario. You're wondering what happens if you tell me? Jesse nodded. I'll make sure your sentence is much shorter. A year or two at the most in a non-work-related environment. You can get some education, clean up your act, and come out with a clean slate. Providing you don't rush back to pirating, you can still make a life for yourself. Does that sound better than dying in prison? Yeah, Jesse sighed. But if I tell you, they'll find me later. I don't have any interest in shutting down operations, Harrington said. I'm only in this to find a piece of equipment. It's a wild goose chase, but one we're willing to pursue. You're not here to bust pirates? Harrington shook his head. No, we're here for information. This sector has all but been written off by the Alliance. They don't care about the tech you're taking, but if they knew what we did, they'd be out here enforcing the law a lot harder. Now give me the information I need. 
every broker who buys your merchandise. It used to move around, Jesse said, to different bases in different sectors, abandoned research facilities on asteroids, tough planets, moons, and even a few derelict capital ships. What do you mean by it? Harrington asked. Surely there's more than one. Jesse nodded. Yeah, but they're too far away. The one we frequented for the last few years is close by and always made it easy to offload goods from our trips into the boneyard. They're on a planet now, only a short jump away. They set down in an oasis in the middle of a desert so no one could just waltz in from the outside. Defenses? Oh, they've got some early warning systems. This big old thing isn't going to hop in unnoticed. Not close by, at least. And they don't let just anybody in, neither. Talk to me about how we're going to get in, then. We need to check the shops. The junk dealers. Only a pirate would get through, Jesse shrugged. How would you like to go home, then? Jesse scowled. What do you mean? I mean, if we need a pirate to get through the defenses and land, it sounds like you're the right guy for the job. Jesse sighed. This is risky. But not for someone who wants to get their life back. Jesse really contemplated the situation for a time and finally nodded. I need something if I do it. What's that? If I go to prison, I want a new identity and some money waiting when I get out so I'm screwed. Jesse looked into Harrington's eyes. I need to disappear if I do this, and you have to help me. We can do that. If you get us in there, then we'll hook you up with whatever you need to get straight. Do we have a deal? Jesse nodded. We do. He gave them the coordinates for the pirate base. That's the place we have to go. I can tell your navigator where this thing can hop into if it has to come along. Thank you, Harrington said, standing up. I'm going to have the guards take you to a room to get cleaned up and changed. We'll probably need your help soon, so get some rest. I have a feeling the next few days are going to be... challenging. Chapter 7 Gray, Adam, and Clea sat in the briefing room. Harrington presented the information from the pirate and let them know the deal he made. He was dismissed when he finished and Adam turned to the others, looking grave. Gray figured he knew what the commander was about to say, but he didn't interrupt. Clearly we can't keep this place a secret, Adam began. These pirates attacked us immediately, and had we not been an advanced warship, they would have taken us down. God knows how they treat crews, but I'm thinking it's not five-star. I agree, Clea said. But we have to be cautious with the information. If we tell the Alliance, they're going to want to come in immediately and roust the pirates. This base has eluded them for a long time. They're not about to let it get away again. Maybe we can give them the information and let them know about our operation, Gray said. Our primary focus is finding the data. How are we going to get in there? Impersonate the pirates, Clea said. Major Bean considered it, or he wouldn't have asked the prisoner to help. We have their vessel. We can just mimic it with the Alliance shuttle. It's far more advanced and will give us an advantage if we have to get out of there in a hurry. Also, it is not falling apart, so it'll be safer to fly. Gray grinned. Yes, I saw their craft, and it's not exactly in top condition. He turned to Adam. What do you think? Sounds dangerous, but doable, Adam replied. After all, we've seen how well Trojan horses worked in the past. Do you know what they barter with down there, Clea? Are you going to be able to buy back the storage device if, through some miracle, you find it? We've got the salvage on the pirate's vessel, Clea said. We'll load that into our cargo hold and provide some of the tech we brought back from our trip. It's inconsequential to us. But to junk dealers needing parts to repair ragtag ships, they'll be worth something. This plan's coming together, Gray hummed. Okay, but we have to do something to that shuttle. It couldn't scream Alliance more if we made it run a streamer. The insignias will be easy to remove, Clea added. We just have to tarnish the hull a bit, 
take some of the gleam off of her. I think our engineers will have a few ideas. I'll leave you in charge of prepping the shuttle. Adam and I will figure out how we're going to get there undetected. You'll want us as backup. As long as we're in the system, we can monitor communications through your ship, using it like a satellite. Correct? Clea nodded. Ali can set that up very easily and make it undetectable. Perfect. Sounds like we've all got a lot to do. Let's make it happen, folks. The engineering team went at the Alliance shuttle, tarnishing it up and giving it a lived-in feel. They didn't want to remove all signs of the military from it, giving the crew some credibility at having stolen such a prize. Their work took over ten hours, but when they finished, it looked more like the confiscated shuttle than the pristine modern ship hiding beneath the surface. Leonard received the coordinates and, with the help of an updated database from their visit to the Keelan world, was able to map out the solar system they intended to visit. Ollie helped him, showing him where long-range early warning systems would be located to help them plan their approach. In the end, they decided to jump in well outside the system, far enough away to avoid any possibility of detection. This meant the shuttle would not be accompanying them, but rather disembarking from the behemoth in the boneyard and heading in on their own. The ploy would help them sell their cover, and with the salvage from the confiscated ship, they had cargo to sell. Jesse worked closely with them on what would be expected. First, they had little protocol to worry about as pirates. No one really offered up respectful sir or ma'am, and crews tended to be on a first-name basis. Or last name, if the first was undesirable. He didn't get too in-depth about the actual place they were visiting, but let them know it can be pretty rough. What's that mean? Adam asked at the briefing table. I think our people need to know. Let's just say wearing weapons openly is a good idea. I've seen fights break out in the promenade plenty of times. I'm starting to formulate who should go, Adam said to Gray. At least two Marines. Jesse nodded. We do tend to keep a couple of hard types with us, ex-military and such. Good, Gray replied. Jesse will be going, of course. I'll guide them the best I can. Clea needs to go, Adam said. She's going to be able to identify the parts we need and should be able to test them on the spot. Yes, I know, Gray hummed. So two Marines, Clea, at least one pilot, Jesse, and I'm thinking an engineer. They might need someone to fix the thing. Then it'll have to be a Keelan, Adam replied. That Iraq character seems to know the physical part of their ship the best. I'd recommend him. Sounds good to me, Gray stood. Let's get Ravente to pick a pilot. Crews moved all the salvage over and packed it up. They also supplied the vessel, storing up just enough food to make it look like they'd been out in space for a while. Ravente insisted on sending two pilots, as a contingency against something unthinkable. His rationale came as, if you lose one of those people and need a quick getaway, you're going to be in trouble. Megan and Rudy were picked for the duty and arrived at the same time as Corporals Bobby Jenks and Dylan Walsh, the Marines. They were dressed in civilian clothes, wearing their sidearms. Do you think we need guns? Megan asked. Yes, Jenks replied and we brought enough for everyone in our duffels. You'll want yours at all times, according to the briefing. Megan wore dark jeans and a black sweater. As the Marine handed her the pistol and holster, she checked it over. Oh, lovely, she turned to Rudy. When's the last time you fired one of these? Shooting range with you, Rudy replied. It'll come back to you, Walsh said. When someone starts firing at us, I like that you assume it's a foregone conclusion, Rudy pointed out. First off, when they send us, it's because they figure someone's going to do some shooting. Jenks ticked off on his fingers. Second, we're rarely lucky enough to get in and out of a place without violence. And finally, we're going into a den of criminals. God only knows what we're about to encounter. Fair points, Megan muttered. Come on, Rudy. Familiarize me with these controls. It's more like what I fly than you do, but they made it nimble enough. Rudy and Megan disappeared into the ship, and a moment later, Gray and Clea arrived. 
She too was dressed down, wearing cargo pants, a black vest, and black sweater. Jenks and Walsh snapped to attention. At ease, Gray said. You two might want to stow some of the discipline until you get back. You don't want to make such a mistake on the surface. We won't, sir, Jenks replied. Do you know these guys? Gray asked Clea. Yes, sir. They were on the research facility mission with me. Clea offered them both a wave. It's good to see you both again. You too, Clea, Jenks said. Walsh gave him an odd look. What? I'm practicing being a pirate. Shouldn't you have said R or something then? Walsh asked. Okay, you two, Gray gestured for the ship. I believe you're heading out in ten, so you might want to stow your gear. Do you need a weapon, Miss Antufal? Walsh asked. No, I'm carrying. Clea patted a holster on her side. Thank you. The Marines boarded the vessel and Clea turned to Gray. This is it. You don't have to do this, Gray said. They are going to find anyone down there with storage devices and get them. Clea shrugged. I'm the only one who can find the exact thing we're looking for, if it's there. I have little hope at this point, but I'm glad we have the chance to check. Be safe. Gray checked his chronometer. We'll be out there if you need to signal us. Don't hesitate to call for help. We won't. Clea patted his shoulder. I hope I make a decent pirate. You're probably too clean, Gray backed away. Good luck. Thank you. She boarded the ship and Gray headed back to the hangar control tower to watch them launch. Megan requested clearance to depart and they hovered on the deck, turned, and departed. Gray worried about this particular mission. Sending people into a blatantly dangerous location didn't set well with him, especially since it wasn't even a combat zone. But they had preparations of their own to make and no time to waste. Gray headed back to the bridge to plot their own jump to be in a position where they could help their comrades should the need arise. He hoped Leonard figured out a good jump path to get them in undetected, or most of this would be for nothing. The last thing they needed to do was alert the pirates and spook them before their team located the data. If the criminals scattered to the wind, it would be months before they settled again. Any chance of finding that data would be lost. We'll avoid that. I'm sure Ollie and Leonard figured it out. Megan let Rudy take the lead while she continued to familiarize herself with the controls. Watching the scans, she gave him a countdown of how far out they should get from the behemoth before initiating the jump drive. Jesse provided the coordinates for where they should arrive, a brazen approach which suggested they belonged there. I've never initiated a jump myself, Rudy said. Arak, are you going to be able to help? It's very simple, Arak yelled from the back of the ship. Input the coordinates and hit the glowing amber button. We'll arrive in short order. Is a jump any less pleasant on a smaller ship? Megan asked. On the behemoth, it was hell the first time. Our technology, and from what I saw, yours now too, is much more sophisticated than the generation you're talking about. You'll barely notice the transition. I'll hold you to that, Jenks said, sitting on one of the bunks. Walsh sat across from him. Should we strap in? Jesse stood nearby, holding a bulkhead as he watched through the windows with the pilots. I never did, he muttered. Not to say you guys shouldn't, if you have to. I'm not doing something a pirate won't, Walsh replied. Guess we're all daring it then, huh? Jenks shook his head. I wish I wasn't competitive. Megan turned to Rudy. We're well out of range of the behemoth and the course is ready. On your mark, I'll initiate the jump sequence. Rudy nodded, leaned back in his seat, and took a deep breath. Go for it. Megan hit the button and the entire ship whined for half a second. Then they were floating in a new sector, far away from the salvage and the behemoth. Rudy engaged the engines and set their course for the nearby planet their destination. Someone hailed them immediately, a frantic broadcast. Jesse? Rudy asked. What do I tell them? Put them on speaker. 
Unidentified vessel, come in. This is landing control. Respond now or we will be forced to fire upon you. Come in. Ah, uh, hey there, Jesse said. This is the Fallen Star coming in for a selling supply. Over. The Fallen Star? The guy sounded shocked. We already have two of those here. We just claimed this ship and it sounded good, Jesse said. How about we go with Dark Star? Also have one already. Damn, um, Wicked Knight? That'll do. Landing control paused. What's the clearance code? Delta Charlie Tango 3, Jesse said. That's the one from last week. Come on, man, we've been out on salvage runs for a month. That's the code they gave me when we left. Are you really going to burn my ass over a code that only changed a few days ago? A pause, then... Fair point. Okay, you can land at Bay 8. Take a careful approach from the north. The winds are picking up this afternoon. Thank you, Control. Jesse shook his head. I'm turning this over to my pilot now for any required updates on the weather. They're a bristly bunch, Megan said. About as organized as a bunch of monkeys throwing a party, too, Jesse replied. We're good now. I'll get everyone ready for the landing. There's a few things those soldier boys need to know if they want to make it on the surface. After he left, Megan smirked. So what do you think? How's undercover work treating you? Ask me after we've landed at the pirate base and wandered around with a bunch of criminals for a while, Rudy replied. I hope this data's worth it. Hell, I hope we find it at all. This could end up being a very dangerous wild goose chase. Wow. Megan leaned forward to look out the window. The continent they were aiming toward appeared golden from the vast desert they were about to set down in. The rest looked green, possibly tropical. She ran a quick scan to get the surface conditions. Luckily, they'd missed the hottest part of the day by a couple hours. It would still be 36 centigrade. Lovely. We missed 47 by a couple hours. I'm glad we don't have to wander around in that. Still, it'll be a dry heat and dusty unless the oasis happens to be more humid than I'm guessing. Entering atmosphere, Rudy announced to the whole ship. It began to tremble, shaking as they descended toward the surface. Megan grabbed the co-pilot controls in an effort to help him maintain a reasonable descent. The wheel vibrated violently in her hands, a good indication of just how much resistance pushed back at them. Their nose began to glow as streams of air cooked around them. When they finally broke through, the wind pockets caught them and they compensated accordingly. I haven't flown into Atmo for a while. This should be fun. You okay over there? She asked Rudy. Yeah, but landing might be a challenge. I'm used to predictable artificial gravity and this seems, I don't know, a little heavier than we're used to. Megan checked the scan. Sure enough, this planet enjoyed a slightly higher gravitational force than Earth. Means we won't want to do much running around. You're right, but it's not much. Just don't compensate too much. I'm sure I'll be fine. Megan got on the comm to the rest of the ship. We're on our final descent, everyone. Please strap yourselves in and get ready for a landing. Shouldn't be long now. Temperature is hot as hell, gravity is heavier, and we're going into a den of criminals so probably not the vacation destination you were hoping for. The behemoth jumped in shortly after the shuttle, but they were quite a ways from the nearest early warning system. Even at full magnification, the pirate planet was barely more than a marble size. Gray watched the reports coming in, paying most attention to Ollie's concerning the shuttle. They picked it up and it plunged toward the planet right on schedule. Good luck, guys. Gray turned to Adam and showed him the information. The commander nodded and went back to his duties. They'd give the undercover crew five hours to accomplish their mission before informing the Alliance about the location of the base. After that, they'd have to get out of there before a battleship showed up to put these thieves down. Sir, Agatha turned in her seat to address him. I'm picking up a message leaving the ship from Tech Lab 7. Gray frowned trying to think of who might be down there. He looked at Adam, but the man shrugged. What's it say, Ensign? It's a warning, 
Agatha's eyes widened. Sir, someone is sending a message back to the Keelan homeworld giving the coordinates of the planet. What? Gray stood. Who? It... It appears to be one of the Keelans. Damn it. I'm not surprised, Adam said. They have people to answer to as well. We can't expect them to keep quiet about something their people have been looking for, especially since our reason for making them wait is all based on hope. We don't have actionable intel, sir. They're just taking advantage of a situation. Put me through to Alliance Command, Gray said. Hurry. Um, but we're far away. They figured it out, Gray interrupted. Ask them how if you have to. Agatha worked for a few moments, finally shaking her head. I don't know precisely how they did it, but you're patched in through some kind of faster-than-light anomaly? The delay is only a few seconds. That would have been nice of them to share, Adam muttered. Gray ignored him, directing his comments to the Keelans. This is Captain Atwell of the Behemoth. Please note that we are conducting an undercover operation in this sector and cannot risk our people. Hold off on an attack until we let you know when. Believe us, we do not want these pirates running free, but we have to get something from them first. Please respond. The delay made Gray want to pace, but he forced himself to stand still, finding some patience. When finally a voice piped through, he cursed under his breath. He anticipated the answer, but he didn't like it regardless. Behemoth, this is Alliance High Command. Please note, we will be preparing an offensive party which will take us approximately two hours. At that time, we will launch an all-out attack on the pirate base. Have your operatives finish their business inside of three hours to avoid becoming casualties of this conflict. Alliance Command, out. Well, that's that. Adam said. How are we going to tell them? Gray sat down, staring at the floor and thought. First off, cut those Keelans off from any external communications. No more chatting with anyone without permission. Second, Ollie, Agatha, any ideas of how we can get them a message without tipping our hand? The pirates have some fairly sophisticated scanners, Ollie said. Some of them are even military grade, likely salvaged from the boneyard. As long as they know how to use them, any transmission from off-world will be intercepted. Not entirely true, Agatha said. If we were to tap into their own systems, we could send the message through their communication net. To any logging programs, it would look like the comm was sent internally and not from an outside force. But how do you get the signal to them without it catching you? Ollie asked. The shuttle communicated with them on the way down, Agatha said. I've got the frequency logged. I can use that to cut through and send to them. How sure are you that you won't get caught? Gray asked. Eighty percent, sir? Let's hold off and give them the warning closer to the deadline, Gray said. That way, if the pirates see the message, it won't matter. They won't have time to figure out we're out here. Adam shook his head. This is a much tighter timeline now. I know but I don't think anyone thought this would be super easy. Now, it's just painfully hard. I'm sure they'll figure it out. The market down there can't be that big. Right? Chapter 8 Rudy set them down on Bay 8 as directed, but he figured they should have called it a landing pad at best. The strip of stone was barely big enough for their ship, and anyone performing maintenance might well end up standing in sand while working on the ship. Not the best conditions for starship repair. Leave the engine on low idle, Clea said, just in case we have to leave in a hurry. You anticipate much trouble? Rudy asked. In this environment, I would not be surprised if we encounter some. Clea turned to the Marines. You two are with us, but do keep a low profile. I'll do the talking with Jesse backing me up. Ma'am, Jenks said, stepping forward. He kept his voice low. Are you sure we should bring him with us? How can we trust him? He has quite the deal worked out with us, so I don't think he's going to risk losing it in a hopeful attempt to find a new place to work. Clea turned to Jesse. Are you? No way, Jesse shook his head. 
This life isn't really worth much. I'm happy to get out, seriously. Uh-huh. Walsh glared at him suspiciously. I don't really buy it, but okay. Anyway, Clea said. The four of us will go. The rest of you stay here and keep the ship prepped. Again, we'll probably want to get out in a hurry. We'll hold down the fort, Rudy said. Good luck, guys. I hope we won't need it, Jenks muttered, taking the lead. See you when we get back. Clea and Jesse led the way, stepping down the ramp in the back of the ship. A man met them at the end of the landing pad, dressed in greasy clothes which were covered in dust and sand. He smiled, revealing many missing teeth, and his breath was rank even from thirty feet away. You need a resupply? No, thank you, Clea said. We're here to trade, but we're fine on supplies. Maintenance? Refuel? Clea tried to walk by him, but he moved in front of her. She scowled. No, we're fine, thank you. Anything at all? Women? Slaves? Contraband alliance vids? Clea sighed. I'm about to lose my patience, sir, and when I do... She gestured to Jenks. He does something about it. Jenks stepped forward, adopting a menacing expression. The man audibly gulped and nodded. Understood, understood. But I like to offer right away. New blood might be a little desperate. I assure you we are not, Clea turned to Jesse. Shall we? Jesse stood grinning at the scene and forced his expression to turn placid. He nodded quickly. Absolutely. This way. The entire base was built around what amounted to a lake. Palm trees towered over the buildings, but had been cut back on the various landing pads surrounding the space. They stepped through a threshold which was little more than two metal planks held up by other heavier objects. This offered some distinction between the area people congregated in and the space where ships were tended. They passed by a number of storage containers of all sizes before seeing any people. A large crowd mingled about, and the scent of cooking food filled the air. Jesse took the lead, plunging into the crowd like a diver might the sea. Clea followed in the small gap he left behind with the others remaining close behind. Keep your hands on your goods, Jesse said over his shoulder. There are vultures in the food court. I'm sure, Clea muttered, placing a hand on her weapon to hold it in place. Her other objects were all well secured to her person and beneath her jacket. That might not matter to a particularly proficient thief, though, and paranoia began to tickle her neck. Just as she started to wonder whether she should start hugging herself to prevent losing something, they left the crowd and entered a clearing. Okay, shops are up ahead, Jesse said. The most legit ones, at least. There are a few less reputable ones, but they rarely have the kind of exchange to buy what you're after. Those storage units can go for a decent amount. What do people do with them? Walsh asked. Delete them? Yeah, clean them up and put them in their own ship, typically. Clea's heart throbbed in her chest. I hope they didn't do that with ours. Lord, the data they might have casually wasted. A fist fight broke out not twenty feet from them. Two men began brawling, both at least a foot taller than Clea. The first slammed the other in the face and picked up a food tray. He began beating his victim over the back with it. Walsh took a step forward, but Clea stopped him. The guy getting hit rallied and lunged forward, tackling his abuser to the ground. They rolled around, exchanging blows over and over again. Blood splattered the ground, and one of the two went limp. No one attempted to break it up, not even when the victor casually reached down and snapped his opponent's neck. Clea stiffened as she witnessed the murder. That's seriously. Walsh tensed beside her. It's not our fight, Clea warned. Am I correct, Jesse? Yeah, you don't want any. If you jump in now, then it'll look like some kind of event. Some other jerk will step up afterward, and it'll just keep going. Where's security? Jenks asked. Here? Ha! <laughs> you two are our security, and anyone who has any sense brought their own too. Jesse shook his head. You types, hilarious. Let's keep moving, before someone notices your wide eyes and shock. Clea hoped they might have two or three large junk dealers at the most. 
She felt her heart sink when they entered a massive bazaar with dozens of little shops lining the streets. Shouts called out wares and people desperately tried to attract customers, waving wares about like flags. How are we going to find what I'm looking for? Clea asked Jesse. This could take forever. There are only a few dealers who would take on what you're talking about, Jesse replied. I know which ones. Most of these types don't trade so much as sell. The guys I'm thinking of, they'll barter for goods. They've been doing this for a long time. They continued along, looking over what amounted to the largest collection of stolen items Clea had ever seen. Clothes, luxury items, trinkets, and more lined various stands, most of which were guarded by large men with guns. Clea wondered how often people tried to steal from these places, especially with personal security keeping a close watch. Jesse stopped in front of a stall, attracting the seller's attention. He came close and they spoke quietly for a moment. You sure? Jesse asked louder. I don't get that kind of techie stuff usually. It's too rare. Jesse nodded. Thanks. He gestured for them to move on. Their next stop involved a man literally screaming at them to grab their attention. Jesse held up his hands as he approached. Relax, we're coming. What can I sell you? The man must have stood no taller than five foot two, his bald head covered in sweat. He looked about frantically, as if a sail might be the only way he survived the next half hour. Circuit boards, relays, conduit cable, I've got it all, son. Just tell me what you need and I'll make it happen. We're looking for Alliance storage units, Jesse replied. Just took a ship and need a few repairs. The man's face dropped into such a state of depression Cleo wondered if he might commit suicide on the spot. He didn't look up for a time, finally letting out a massive sigh. It caused his jowls to tremble, and when he met Jesse's eyes, he shook his head. I'm afraid I don't have any of those. But there are other... That's all we need, bud. Jesse moved away. Good luck. Wait! The shrill cry made Clea look back at him. Please! I've got other things to sell! Jenks leaned close to Walsh, but Clea still overheard him say, Whack job alert. Seriously. Only one left, Clea thought. This does not bode well. Maybe there are other dealers Jesse doesn't know about. We'll have to scour these places if this doesn't work out. Their last planned stop took nearly 30 minutes to get to through all the crowds, when they arrived, they found a well-appointed building that might have been a cargo bay at one time. Inside, a man sat behind a counter tinkering with a communication device. Clea looked around for the security guard but didn't see one. A sign said, Crandy's Shop. The place seemed much better off than any of the other stalls. Equipment hung from racks, neat and shining as if it were brand new. Crates of circuits and other small parts occupied the floor here and there. He even seemed to sell weapons, Alliance military, which was probably the most illegal part of his operation. No wonder my people want to find this place so badly. What can I do for you? The man didn't look up from his tinkering. He just kept on working. You crandy? Jesse asked. I am. Nice to meet you, Jesse said. We're looking for storage units, Alliance make. Crandy shook his head. Sold out. Clea stepped forward. So you had some? Yeah, sure did. Some crazy bastard actually figured out how to dislodge them without a wipe. Nice work, and no idea how he did it, considering he had no idea how to actually read them. Crandy shrugged. Apparently he didn't care anyway. Just wanted some money so we could fuel up and get back out there. But you sold them, Clea said, to another spacer? Most spacers can't afford a storage unit, not from me. Crandy looked up, squinting. You don't seem like you need repairs. I'm looking for a specific set of them, Clea replied. This place looks very organized. You don't happen to keep records of your items, do you? If I did, it wouldn't matter to you. Crandy put his communicator down and rounded the corner. Who are you people? What do you really want? We need to find the storage devices you sold, Clea said. It's vitally important. 
Treasure, Jesse interrupted. Some alliance survey of a planet full of minerals just waiting for the taking. It's on their registry, but we happen to know they haven't tapped it out yet. We're going for the retirement score. Oh, you are, huh? You telling us you didn't look at the data? Jesse asked. No, I didn't bother. Some of that stuff gets a guy killed just for knowing it. Please, Clea implored. If you have information of where they might be, we need to know. What makes you think the owner hasn't already dug up the precious planet you're talking about? Jesse shook his head. We don't necessarily, but the Alliance lost the data before they could do anything about it, and frankly, there'll be enough to share. With me? Crandy smiled. Why not? Jesse asked. You paint an intriguing picture, but I think you're full of it. Even if you went out there and found this place, you ain't coming back to give it to me. Crandy shook his head. I see no incentive for this deal. Jenks stepped forward. How about we don't hurt you? Crandy tapped a button and the door slammed shut. Turrets popped down from the corners and aimed in their direction. You were saying... Just a hypothetical question. Jenks held his hands up and stepped back. Walsh whacked him on the arm. Anyway, Clea moved over to him. What will it take to convince you to help us, Crandy? We've got a ship full of scrap. You give us the information and it's yours. Everything we took in exchange for a lead on where to go next. How much do you have? Clea brought out her computer and showed him the sum. His eyes widened, but only for a moment. Still, he gave away a tell. He wanted what they had. That was a good sign. She could work with that. She hoped. I don't know. Crandy scratched his head. This sounds pretty dangerous for me. I mean, you guys are a pretty rough-looking crew, coming in and threatening a shopkeep like myself. If I send you out there and something happens, it might screw up business for me. And I'm doing fine without your scrap. An alarm went off overhead. What's that? Jenks asked. I stood down, man. It's not you, idiot. Crandy rushed around his counter and stared at a screen. Oh my god. It's Alliance. An Alliance battleship just hopped into the sector. Gray read the standard reports from the bridge of the behemoth, waiting as patiently as possible to get word from the folks on the planet. They were still well out of the range of the early warning technology and didn't intend to get involved unless they absolutely had to. He settled into a routine for over an hour before Ollie shouted, making him jump. Captain, we've got a problem. Jesus, Ollie, Redding grumbled. What's wrong with you? Two Alliance warships just jumped into the sector. They're launching fighters. What? Adam stood up and stared at the screen. Whoa, that's intense. I thought they gave us more time. They did, Gray scowled. I guess they're early. Agatha, get them on the line. On screen, sir. Akeelan appeared with blonde white hair and jade green eyes. She looked impassively at Gray, allowing him to make the greeting. This is Captain Atwell of the Behemoth, Gray said. We spoke to your command. What's the meaning of this? We were told we had more time before you arrived. I'm Captain Inwa of the White Light. Plans change, I'm afraid. We were bad already and did not want to allow these vermin to escape again. But we're looking for something vitally important down there, Gray replied. We needed more time. Anything you need will be confiscated and you can go through it yourselves if you'd like. However, we're going to take this planet today and hold it. I do expect you to help as members of the Alliance. Well, hold on a second. You might want to know about a special weapon they have. Gray scowled. They hit us with it and nearly took our shields out. That was one pirate. If they have more of those, you'll want to be cautious. Understood, Behemoth. Thank you for the warning. She cut the line, sir, Agatha announced. But their comm officer is setting up lines to our various departments to coordinate the attack. Gray sighed. Well, we don't have to be sneaky about informing our folks now. I'm sure they know already, Adam said. What do you think they're going to do? Hopefully stay alive, Gray said. Redding, micro-jump us into the action. Ollie, get the readings up from the time we were hit with that laser. 
I'd like a little warning this time before they unleash it. Let's engage these pirates and help our new allies. Wouldn't want to start off on the wrong foot. What are we going to do? Jesse turned to Clea. This is going to get bad. Fast. Jenks and Walsh took a position by the closed door, their weapons drawn. Clea turned to Crandy. I assume you have a contingency plan for this? Not really, Crandy grunted. But this situation, I'm kind of ruined. Are you jerks genuine about this planet? Jesse nodded. Of course we are, man. We want to retire. I can get us to the ships and show you the most likely place to find your device, but I have a price. Crandy scowled. You have to get me out of here and share the wealth. Really? Jesse rolled his eyes. You have no other way off this rock? We thought we were safe here. I can blow this place up to prevent real jail time, but I can't make a living on ashes. And that's assuming I don't get shot before capture. Crandy turned to Clea again. You seem like the one in charge, so get me out of here. I'll make it worth your while. Clea considered his request for only a moment before making her decision. They needed his knowledge. Okay, what do we do? Go out the back to avoid the real panic. It still won't be an easy path, but I can get us to the landing pads. I hope your ship's big enough for everyone. Crandy rushed over to a computer terminal and tapped away. He hit a button and a countdown started. A door in the back opened and he snatched a duffel bag. Okay, we've got 15 seconds to get out of here. What'll happen? Jenks asked as they hurried out the back. Did you blow it up? Kind of. It's locked down and I've got the code to open it back up, but if someone tampers, everything inside gets blown. Crandy shrugged. At least there'll be a chance they leave it alone and I can get my stuff back. Clea sighed. I have to report that as soon as possible. Just lead the way, she said aloud. Everyone keep your heads down. I don't want injuries. Outside, the sounds of panic were nearly deafening. People in the market were rioting. Guns went off and screams erupted here and there. Ships launched, ready to do battle with the invaders. Clea's comm went off and it was Rudy contacting her with an urgent request. She clicked it on as they moved. Clea here. Ma'am, the landing pads are going insane with the arrival of the Alliance, Rudy said. We're locking down the ship and kicking on the weapons just in case. Keep the ship safe, Clea said. We're making our way back, but it might take some time. Things are crazy out here. We'll keep in touch. Jenks and Walsh took point, their weapons raised. Clea drew her own, watching their back the best she could. They departed from the shop and headed toward the landing pads, but had to go around several of the shops, moving along the rear. Others came pouring out, running for their lives. Contact, Jenks shouted, aiming his weapon and firing. An armed man dropped to the ground, blood oozing from a wound on his head. He's got company. Walsh gestured for the others to take cover and fired, moving toward a building. Another person went down, their weapon thumping in the sand. Someone returned fire, bullets clanking against the walls of shops behind them. Clea crouched, peering around the corner at their opponents. It seemed a crew of six decided to engage them. What is the point of this? She asked Jesse. What are they doing? Trying to earn a little extra on their way off the planet, I guess, Jesse said. These kind of opportunistic bastards just love taking what doesn't belong to them, even if it means risking their own lives in the process. Jenks fired again, hitting one of the guys in the leg. Walsh finished him off and laid down some suppressive fire. Reloading. Jenks spoke calmly as he replaced his magazine. We have to move. Any other way to the landing pad? Walsh asked Crandy. Or do we have to finish these guys off? They're in our way, Crandy gestured. If we have to go around, we might as well surrender. It'll take an hour. Walsh and Jenks exchanged glances. They shrugged and returned their attention to the action. Their opponents, the three remaining, continued firing, using the automatic setting on their rifles to great effect. Jenks pushed away and went around the building toward the riot. 
Clea wanted to call out to him, but they seemed to have some kind of plan. Slow down, Walsh shouted out to their attackers. We're interested in talking. You're going down. The reply came out harsh, full of fury. Clea didn't blame them. Three of their friends were dead. Come on, don't you see what's going on? Walsh poked his gun around the corner and blind fired. We can't fight amongst ourselves right now. Just stick your head out so we can wrap this up. A gun fired several times, fast enough that Clea couldn't count. She peeked around the corner in time to see the three guys dancing as they were shot, falling to the ground in a heap. Jenks stepped out and waved at them to join him. Let's go. Clea stood, grabbed Crandy and forced him to run with her as they passed by the bodies and kept moving. Walsh and Jenks went to warm themselves, the latter pausing for a moment as he observed the bodies. They gathered up the guns and handed Clea a rifle. Walsh gave her a severe look. You might need this, ma'am. I hope not. Clea slung it over her shoulder. But good thinking. If we would have known it would be a brawl to get out of here, we would have grabbed some of that guy's guns. They reached a section where they either needed to plunge into the water or take a right and risk the crowds. Clea watched as people struck each other, grabbed things from stands and aimed weapons at aggressors. The man they encountered earlier who had been so twitchy lie on the ground, bloody and broken shot and beaten to death. Wow, this is insanity. How's the water? Jenks asked. Filled with some kind of horrifying fish, Crandy said. You don't want to go in there. Looks like we've got man-eating crap on either direction, Walsh replied. Looks like we're risking the people threat. They led the way, shoving people aside as they moved. A man attacked Jenks and was rewarded with a punch to the throat and a well-placed stomp to his ankle. Walsh ducked a wild swing and fired his weapon into the man's gut. As he fell back, another person shoved him away and jumped Clea. She took a blow to the face and stumbled backward but recovered quickly, blocking another attack. As the man brought his fist back, she lashed out with a palm strike to his nose, shattering the cartilage. He cried out, blood splattering over his lip as he stumbled away, collapsing to the ground. Before Clea moved off, she watched two people trample him and he went still. The riot only picked up as they drew closer to the landing pad. Rocks flew through the air, and they walked over more than a few people. Jenks and Walsh used their weapons conservatively, putting each round to good use. Eventually, the throng of the crowd became too thick to fight, and people just mashed together until they reached the various landing platforms. Ships had been taking off the whole time, and a battle raged above them, far into space. Clea reached up and tapped her calm, but when someone bumped her, she ended up really whacking her own head. It made her ear ring as the connection was established back to their ship. Rudy, how are things? She had to shout to be heard. We're almost there. We've kept them back with our weapons so far, ma'am, Rudy replied. There are people in the landing pad, though, so be advised. We're looking at ten people trying to take the ship. Thank you. Clea tapped Jenks. We've got ten people at the ship trying to take it. Won't be a problem, Jenks replied. When we get there, we'll deal with it. The crowds thinned somewhat, as many of them peeled off for the different vessels. Many might have actually belonged on them, but Clea doubted it. Chances were good they were off to pillage, using any desperate method to get the hell off that rock before the Alliance landed troops to capture them. Getting into space won't help most of them, Clea thought. They're going to encounter some pretty serious resistance. They moved off the promenade and approached the doorway leading to their ship. Jenks and Walsh unshouldered the rifles and checked them out. As they reloaded, they turned back to Clea. We're going to clear this place, but I'm going to have Rudy help us. How? Walsh grinned. Don't ask. Just stay back. Jenks got on the comm. Rudy, I need you to start shooting. Drive these pricks back toward us. He paused a moment and rolled his eyes. Of course I want you to hit them. Put them down if you can, man. This is serious. Clea swallowed hard. The thought of someone being hit by ship weaponry made her stomach turn. The damage caused by such a weapon would be catastrophic. Considering the possibility, there'd probably be nothing left. 
She watched, much as she didn't want to, out of both morbid curiosity and a desire to help if needed. The Marines prepared themselves, holding their weapons at the ready. Go! Walsh shouted. The weapons from their ship began firing. People screamed and returned fire, rushing back toward the exit. As they approached, Jenks stepped forward first, firing controlled bursts into the different men. Walsh followed suit, laying into the opposite side of the room. Clea held her own weapon up, staring down the sight just in case. Jesse and Crandy watched the back and suddenly started freaking out. Clea spun in time to see a couple men hurrying toward them, raising their weapons. She fired four times, two for each, and put them down before they got their own shots off. Her heart raced. She'd wondered if she'd ever be in another ground situation like the research facility again. Much as she'd done on that mission, she still didn't feel prepared for this one. Clear? Walsh's shout made her jump and she looked back. Bodies were piled near the walls and the Marines rushed in, double-checking to ensure they didn't have any more company. We're good. Get the ramp open so we can get the hell out of here, Rudy. The ramp dropped and Megan appeared, holding a rifle and aiming back toward the exit. Come on, she shouted. Let's go. Clea urged Crandy and Jesse to go ahead of her, and she hustled backward, watching out for any more enemies. And they came. Megan fired first. Contact. Jenks hurried over and fired as well into a crowd intent on rushing them. The combined fire of three rifles held their attackers at bay, but they shot back, bullets careening off the hull of the ship. Clea dropped low and hurried up the ramp and took cover, aiming her weapon just in case they were overrun. Walsh boarded next, followed by Jenks. As they climbed aboard, a bullet entered the vessel and slammed into the ceiling. Closing, Megan shouted, hitting a button. The ramp lifted as another spray of ordnance scattered across the hull. Rudy, launch, but don't go into orbit yet. Why not? Rudy shouted back. I have to check some damage to ensure we won't all be sucked out of a hole the size of my pinky. Clea turned and looked, fearing she'd see daylight streaming through. However, the bullet was stopped by a heavy beam going down the middle of the ship. They weren't in any danger. Thank goodness. The ship tilted, shook, then launched, departing the doomed pirate camp. Rudy kept them low, flying over the oasis and into the desert. Megan ran a diagnostic scan before a rock showed up to do the same. They concurred that there was no appreciable damage. They could break orbit. Clea set her weapon on one of the beds and sat down, trying to catch her breath. Walsh slapped Jenks on the shoulder. That's how you get it done. No doubt, Jenks said, taking a seat. I'm thirsty. Is anyone else thirsty? Who are you people, really? Crandy asked, sitting beside Clea. Those two don't act like any pirates I've ever seen. That was some coordinated military stuff. Tell me I'm wrong. They're ex-military. Clea didn't have it in her to put much conviction into the lie. Just like all of us. You left the military to seek fortune, huh? Clea shrugged. Considering the pay, wouldn't you? Crandy accepted it. At least he seemed to as he moved off. Clea didn't care. He'd helped them because he wanted in on the action. He lost everything in that attack. Now they needed to escape the Alliance vessels attacking the area and find what this guy had to show them. If they could get out of the system, they might just still locate the device but considering the fact they just tried twice with no luck, she was beginning to lose hope. Chapter 9 The behemoth jumped into the fray just as over a dozen large pirate ships flew out to meet them. They were the types of ships they met at the debris field, not huge, with probably crews of thirty or less, but Gray knew what they carried, and he instantly became wary of the battle about to take place. Launch all fighters, Gray ordered. I want to get on those things with as much pulse energy as we can muster. Yes, sir. Adam went about giving the order. The Keelans did the same, launching their own crafts to meet the incoming threat. Agatha turned. The Keelans are offering them a chance to surrender. Gray nodded. They won't take it, but that's civil of them. Redding, are we in firing range? Almost, sir. I'm targeting the closest vessel now for a full barrage. Excellent. 
Ollie, get our shields up and be ready to report when they start to use their special weapon. I want to be ready to move if we have to. Micro jump? Adam asked. Yes, that's my thought. Gray checked something on his data pad. Ollie, organize it with the engineering room. Looks like we get to test our equipment today in ways that I didn't entirely anticipate. Sounds good, sir. I hope it's up to it. This is going to be pretty nasty if it's not. Squadron leader Mick Torin took the lead for Panther Wing while Megan was away. His and three other fighter wings charged out of the ship, fully aware of the dangers they were facing. The enemy they traditionally fought had quite the firepower, but these pirates harbored a weapon all of them should be worried about. Ravente told them, Their beam weapon damaged the behemoth shields. Any longer of a sustained strike would have opened them up. We don't know if they can aim it at something as small as a fighter, but assume the worst and stay safe. Going into the battle with that warning made them all leery, but some of the younger pilots scoffed. We'll know if the pirates are targeting us and just evade. Go under them. Maybe we can identify the weapon and where it's located to get out of the way. Mick figured the gun was primarily designed for capital ships, and it was how they took down their larger prey. A dozen large ships and perhaps twenty shuttle-sized vessels charged out to meet them. Their job was to focus on the smaller ones, then harass the bigger while their base crafts took them down. Another five wings from the two Alliance ships met up with them and coordinated the assault. I wish we would have had these numbers the last time we fought the real enemy. He figured the battle couldn't last long with so much firepower. Why the pirates hadn't surrendered made no sense to him at all. They were clearly outmatched. The first of the ships they faced started taking shots at his wing, totally random blasts from an overcharged pulse cannon. Mick called for evasive, and they all dodged out of the way, taking their own pot shots in the process. When his weapons scored a direct hit and splashed off the shields, he realized why the pirates had so much confidence. They might not have the numbers, but their technology defied the state of their ships. In other words, those shields shouldn't have been able to stop a direct hit, but they did. Such modifications might have been performed on all of them, granting an advantage against superior military vessels. We're going to have to hit these guys with concentrated fire, Mick said. Pair up and do what you can. I'm thinking missiles will definitely be our friends. They spread out, going at different ships across the way. One of their opponents dashed toward them with a quick burst, then started firing like crazy. Mick saw Panther Six take a hit, but it wasn't fatal. His heart hammered for a moment as he asked for a status. Shields held, sir. I'm okay. Let's watch that stuff. This is the kind of random we don't normally contend with. Mick and his wingman, Flight Lieutenant Shelley Brown, performed a series of hard maneuvers, quick turns and climbs to come around behind their target. As they did, they both opened up, firing missiles and pulse blasts at the same time. Mick's cockpit instantly warmed until he began to sweat, and he pulled up when they pulled within 30 kilometers of their target. The missiles scored direct hits, the computer showing that their shields dropped down to 30%. Their pulse blasts knocked them down even further. Get that guy, he's almost there. The pirate spun around and tried to flee toward the planet, and as he did, two Alliance ships closed behind and hit him hard from the top. Mick caught a glance of the ship being torn in half before exploding. Their allies moved off to another battle and Mick regrouped with Panther for another fight. The capital ship's up to something, Panther 7 shouted. Look! One of the larger pirate vessels approached the behemoth and deliberately turned their nose to her. What the hell are they up to? He didn't have time to wonder for long. A blast skimmed his nose and he dove, redirecting so he and his wing could take on another of the smaller pirates. Mick's computer went crazy, warning about some kind of debris. Avoid that, he shouted, pulling up, but he saw one of the Alliance vessels pull right through it. Whatever they dropped clung to the hull, going right through the shields. A moment later they exploded, taking the fighter with them. Wow, mines? Really? These guys are fighting dirty, everyone. Stay on your toes. The entire wing converged on that pirate, letting him have it in a concentrated fire. He still managed to get a couple shots off before being taken down, clipping Shelley's side. She lost control for a moment, spinning away before slowing and returning to formation. 
Damage report? Mick asked. Minimal. All systems are still green. Let's keep it up. These guys have managed to hit two of us and destroy an Alliance fighter. They're doing better than the enemy does sometimes. I can't even believe it. But even as the thought entered his head, he realized he shouldn't underestimate them. Many of the pirates likely came from the ranks of the military and probably knew the tactics they faced. It was like fighting colleagues in one sense. Each of them had to have come from a friendly culture. Mick took a blind shot to the engine. His power fluctuated twice before remaining steady. He checked his damage and saw that something got knocked loose in his generator. Someone would have to manually fix it on the hangar deck. And if I jostle too much, I may lose power entirely. First off, I'm okay for the moment, but that hit damaged my power relay. It could come totally loose and I'll be useless. Second, who hit me? I want to return the favor before I have to go back to the behemoth. We're on him, sir. Shelley and the others dove, screaming toward the enemy at full speed. More blasts flew past them as they each unleashed a missile, six projectiles hurtling down the pirate. As they connected, Mick checked his scan to see the shields were eliminated and massive hull breaches spread throughout the ship. A couple pulse blasts from one of his wing knocked them out completely. Other dogfights went on all around them, ships diving and veering to avoid destruction. One of the capital ships fired its beam weapon at the Alliance vessel, chewing at its shields like an entire colony of termites. A human ship, he thought maybe from Tiger Wing, went down, and a couple more Alliance fighters were destroyed as well. The pirates gave far better than Mick would have anticipated. His power pulsed again and he determined to make his way back to the behemoth. I'll be useless to you guys if I don't get this fixed. Hopefully they can plug it in and get me back out here in a flash. I'll cover you, Shelley said. The rest of you form up and concentrate on the next vessel. We'll be right back. Mick pushed it, heading for the behemoth as fast as he could manage. The enemy vessel that faced them began to fire their beam weapon. He winced. Then his stomach dropped when the behemoth micro jumped away. Oh, crap. Where'd they go? It took his scanners a moment to see he had another 5,000 kilometers to go. Better adjust course. I hope they're ready to take us on. Pretty bold move. Good job, guys. I only wish I'd been on board before you did it. Ollie tapped his screen. The fighters are doing okay, but those pirates are pretty dangerous. The tactics are... nothing short of dirty. I figured as much, Gray said. Leonard, do you have a course for a micro jump? Yes, sir. It's plotted and laid in. We just have to initiate it. Perfect. One of the larger ships turned to face them, giving them their nose. Adam spoke up, addressing Redding. Give that bastard everything you've got. Yes, sir. Redding fired, letting all the cannons hit the pirate at once. Their shields were decimated, but it didn't quite destroy them. We're on recharge. Ten seconds. How are the Alliance ships doing? Gray asked. Are they still with us? Yes, sir, Ollie replied. They've taken down one of the larger enemy. It seems the pirate tried to ram them. Adam shook his head. What's the deal with ramming? That shouldn't even be a tactic. Effective if you have a death wish, Gray muttered. Redding, fire. She let loose another torrent just as the enemy fired their beam weapon. Direct hit to us, Ollie shouted. Shield's already at 60%. Jump, Gray ordered. Now. Redding hit the button and the ship winked out. Ollie hoped to God the engineers truly fixed the jump module the way they said. As they reappeared without incident or negative sensation, he decided they needed a fruit basket. Or at least a drink. I'm totally buying them a drink. We've repositioned, Redding reported. She sounded shaken, though. Clearly, she expected worse from the jump. Redirecting our fire to eliminate our target. As they fired again, the enemy vessel cracked and listed before turning into an orange ball. One more down. Ollie checked the scanner. There were nine more large vessels combat ready. He analyzed each and found that they were in various stages of damage. Apparently, they were taking quite the beating as well. Agatha spoke up. Sir, Panther 2 has contacted hangar control for permission to land for hot maintenance. He's asking we don't micro-jump for the next few minutes. Tell him not to worry, we've got other problems, Gray said. Agatha, can you reach Clea's party? 
Attempting to now, sir. Do you think they're okay? Adam asked. I guess it depends on what the conditions are like down there, Gray said. It could be pretty bad. If it's completely lawless, then no one's trying to maintain order while the military attacks their base. Get us into position for another strike on one of those ships, Redding. I want this wrapped up. Miss on two fall? Rudy called from the cockpit. Can you come here, please? Clea hurried over to him and leaned close. What is it? I'm getting a message from the behemoth on a coded channel. We've got the coordinates from that crandy guy and are ready to jump. What do you want to do? Clea took a headset and put it on, sitting in the passenger seat behind Megan. Patch me through to Gray, please. Gray's voice crackled in her ear. What's going on? Did you make it? We're safe, Clea said. But we're pursuing this further. A junk dealer knew who might have bought the data storage devices, and we're going to get them. Wait, you're jumping out? Gray hummed. I don't think that's a good idea, Clea. Come back to the ship and we'll go together. If we do that, we risk losing the cooperation of our passenger. You took the junk dealer with you? Gray sighed. Clea, this isn't part of the plan. You don't know what you could be jumping into. We're sending you the coordinates so you can meet us there, Clea replied. We'll scope it out and see what's going on. Buy you some time to arrive. If it's nothing, then we can just board the behemoth and go home. But if it's something, be careful, Clea. With everyone on board, be careful. Of course, sir. Clea out. She put the headset away. Let's get far enough away to jump out of here without attracting attention. Plenty of people who evacuated are doing the same thing, Megan said. Clea looked out the window and witnessed several ships jumping out all around them. That's what the fight is out there. A chance for all these folks to get away. We got to nestle ourselves amongst those who needed to flee. Fantastic news for us, I suppose. Though I'm guessing the guys who wanted to take the ship would have used it to fight. The pirates had a strange loyalty if they were willing to risk their lives to let their dealers and services escape. She wondered how many of them would try to flee the Alliance once the majority of the planet escaped. How many would get away? Considering the firepower being brought against them, she doubted much. Even with their dirty tactics, they weren't a match for three capital ships and all the fighters they had at their disposal. Hey, Megan spoke quietly. Panther wings out there somewhere. I just saw a ping from Mick. He took some damage. I'm sure he's okay, Rudy replied. Clea heard the tension in his voice. She knew he'd lost a man in their last mission and was still trying to cope with it. He's a tough guy. I know, Megan said. I wish I was out there with them. This is important, Clea replied. She put her hand on the pilot's shoulder. Believe me, if this works out, we're going to change things for the better. Not just an engagement either, but the whole war. You'll see. I hope so, Megan said. I'd hate for us to be fighting pirates for nothing. Any unnecessary combat is regrettable, Clea said. Don't worry, I'll explain more when we get there. If we're ready for the jump, let's get strapped in to make it happen. Thank you both for your help. Let's see this through now. Gray rubbed his eyes after the conversation with Clea. This has gotten out of hand. They shouldn't be on a wild goose chase throughout the sector. He hadn't anticipated this investigation taking an onion turn. Layers annoyed him. He figured they would either find the device or nothing on the pirate world, not another location. And what happens if she finds another trail to follow? The obsession with this data became clear to him, though Keelans handled such things differently than humans. The signs were far less overt. She needed to follow this to the end, but it might not entirely be the best thing for the military or the people with her. We've taken another one down, Redding's voice interrupted Gray's thinking and he looked up. They were about to fire that weapon of theirs again. Gray nodded. How many are left, Ollie? Seven, Ollie hummed. Sir, I think they're preparing to retreat, Adam sighed. They bought the time they needed. Agatha, let the Keelan ships know. Gray rubbed his chin. I have a bad feeling we're going to be on cleanup here. Was that Clea on your personal comm? Adam asked. Gray nodded. I'm guessing her message wasn't something you wanted to hear. 
Not particularly. Gray looked at his personal message queue. A set of coordinates sat at the top. He sent them over to the navigation console. Leonard, I sent you something I need researched. Get all the information you can on the sector. Quietly. I don't want our friends to find out about that, too. Yes, sir. Leonard looked back at him. I'll compile a report as soon as possible. Thank you. Gray turned to Adam. Let's help our allies wrap this up. I'm afraid they didn't do a very good job of keeping this place locked down. I'm not entirely surprised. The pirates were fighting dirty and they didn't have any regard for their own lives. We've seen what a lack of self-preservation does in a battle. Two ships escaped, Ollie said. Three others have been destroyed and two have been disabled. The Keelans are moving in for a capture. The smaller vessels have also been wrangled up. Looks like this fight's over. Keelan troop carriers are descending to the planet. Whoever they find down there is going to be frantic, Gray said, and probably not very cooperative. Let's offer up some support for that. Agatha, ask if they'd like any of our Marines to accompany them to the surface. We need to expedite the situation as quickly as possible so we can get back to our business. Before it's too late, Gray thought. I hope our people are ready for whatever they're about to encounter. Mick landed and didn't even make a motion to get out of his fighter. Three people rushed forward, ran the fastest diagnostic he'd ever seen, and opened the maintenance panel. His computer showed their progress, and when they reattached the cable, all lights turned green. One of the techs moved over to see him through the cockpit, offering a thumbs up as he spoke. You're good to go. Shields are nominal and all systems are up. Good luck. The techs hustled away and Mick launched again plunging back into space and toward his wing. He sent a ping to let them know he was back in the fight and gunned it, full throttle back into the action. As he flew closer, he saw one of the larger ships trying to gain a firing solution on Panther 4. Shelly. Mick set the targeting computer to task, but couldn't wait for it to get a lock. He manually aimed, firing his pulse cannons. A near miss, but it caused the enemy to pull to the side, buying Shelly a little space. Glad to see you, Mick. Thanks for the assist. No problem, Mick replied. This might help a little more. He fired his missiles the moment he got tone. Two of them dropped from his craft and raced forward, chasing his target. The pirate pulled away, disengaging from Shelley, but it didn't help. The missiles continued to pursue him, striking the engines dead center. The shields flared then. The craft began to flip far too fast. Mick imagined the inertial dampeners couldn't keep up with such a maneuver, and as the ship just kept on going, he figured the people inside must be dead. They didn't even try to recover, but their shields began to recharge even as they drifted off, away from the battle. Form up on me, Mick ordered. Let's see who's left. All wings, Ravente's voice filled the channel. We are receiving surrender notifications from various pirates in the area. Stand down and hold your distance. I do not put a trick past these people and I won't risk any pilots on deceit. Let the capital ships take care of this part and good work. Wow, Shelley said. You flew all the way back out here and still managed to take one out before the fight ended. Lucky, I guess, Mick grumbled. I'm surprised. These guys seemed ready to fight to the death. What happened? Looks like a bunch of ships escaped from the surface, Kelly, Panther 8, replied. I've got a feed from the behemoth. A ton of vessels fled the sector during the engagement. They're sending marines down to see who's left. There you go, Mick shook his head. They'd been distracted. His estimation of the pirates changed dramatically. If they were capable of sacrificing themselves for others, maybe they weren't the mercenary scum he'd thought them to be. He figured they were the everyman-for-themselves type, but the valor displayed said otherwise. Some of them even surrendered. Incredible. We are on security detail, Mick said. Let's keep our formation tight and wait for orders, folks. I guess this fight's all over. Chapter 10 Clea strapped herself in, anticipating their jump. Megan clicked her tongue. Keelan Capital Ships sent out a message warning all ships to remain in the sector. Apparently they're locking everyone down and no one's to leave. Imagine that. 
Authorities wanting to arrest criminals. What a galaxy we live in. Hush, Rudy muttered. I'm about to do the scariest thing I've ever done. Admit you can't fly? Megan asked. You're incredibly funny. Definitely worthy of taking stage. Clea recognized the banter as a defensive mechanism. They were afraid of jumping in a small craft. She'd done it before, so the prospect didn't bother her nearly as much. But listening to the tension in their voices, it gave her pause to think about it. Maybe she shouldn't have been as comfortable. Then again, the technology was tried and true. She had no reason to worry. Here we go. Rudy hit the button and the ship vibrated. A moment later, they were in another place, far from the pirate planet. Whoa, that was, that was... Really smooth, Megan said. Easy, even. Incredible. I wonder if they could install one on the bombers. Rudy shook his head. Talk about a tactical advantage. Full stop, Clea ordered. She took her safety belts off. I want to talk to our passenger before we go any further. We have no idea what we're about to walk into. Moving back to the cargo area, she found Crandy admiring the scrap they had aboard. You guys weren't kidding. You've got quite the haul. Yes, it's a lot. Clea folded her arms over her chest. Tell me where we've gone. Who are we meeting? He's a collector, Crandy said. A crazy old bastard from the early days of the war. He used to work for the government designing weapons. At some point, he got tired of it and just left. He's been buying up tech from battles all over the galaxy since then. If your storage device is still intact and not wiped, he's got it. Clea nodded. His name? Durant Vipurin. Clea instantly knew the man. He was a legend in the scientific and technology community. His designs helped bolster their shield technology, enhanced their weapons, and provided better protection for ground troops. Small arms and scanning devices also benefited from his genius. She thought he'd passed away several years ago. When he disappeared, most thought he just wanted to retire but there was always a cloud around his departure. No one could find any information on it, and Durant stopped publishing articles or theories. He'd effectively disappeared. So he went off to conduct his own research. Interesting. But why? What would have led him to leave us in the middle of the war? Clea turned to her data pad and brought up the man's public record. Her eyes widened when she saw how old he should be. Seventy-three. He'd seen a lot of conflict, four decades of fighting, and more importantly, he knew what it was like before the enemy declared war on them. That made quite the difference. No wonder he wanted to get away from it all. Have you ever seen this man? Clea asked Crandy. Yes, a couple of times. Fancy bastards stuck out on our little retreats, but he always brought plenty for all. The beam weapon the pirates use? He made that. Well, that's a treasonous act. Really, Durant? Why arm criminals with something so potent? That's reckless to say the least. I see. Clea shook her head. Then we need to be cautious going toward his home. I have a feeling it will be well defended. That's a guarantee, Crandy said. Well, at least I'd think so. Clea returned to the cockpit, passing by Jesse on her way. He was complaining to the Marines about how dangerous the situation was and how he shouldn't have come. Jenks told him to shut up before she got out of earshot. The man was right. Their trip went from mildly dangerous to extremely. I need to perform some scans. Clea sat at one of the terminals behind them and began working on the computer. This should only take a moment to find the system we want. Then I need to hail the person living there to ensure we're not destroyed the moment we hit atmosphere. I'd like to avoid that, Rudy said. Just, you know, if we're voting. Clea smirked. I'll let you know when this becomes a democracy, Mr. Hale. She went about checking the solar system, running their long-range scanners for any habitable space bodies. There were six planets orbiting a relatively old star. Of them, one was capable of easily supporting life without alteration, and another might have been viable with proper terraforming. 
Various moons might hold bases which could easily sustain life, but the expense of doing so should have been beyond a single person. Clea wasn't sure of the resources Durant might command, though, so she needed to find any technology in the area and map it out. From there, she figured she'd pinpoint a primary location where inhabitants might dwell. The first thing that popped up made her groan. A satellite on the edge of the sector, just on the border before departing. It had scanned them, and she didn't know until she took an energy reading from it. Okay, Durant knows we're out here. Now where is he? She started a long-term scan and got on the ship-wide comm. Crandy, please report to the bridge. Crandy arrived a moment later, leaning in to look at her. What? How did you know this man was out here? He's had things delivered to him before, Crandy replied. Guy's bringing him some of the bigger stuff he bought. Always been that way. And it didn't seem to matter to you that there's an early warning system in place? Crandy shrugged. I thought we were coming to talk. Clea sighed and hit the comm channel, opening it wide. Mr. Vipurin, this is Clea on Twofall. We're not here in a hostile capacity. We just need to talk. Please respond. They were met with silence. Clea glared at Crandy and tried again. We may have information that you want concerning the enemy, and, quite honestly, I think you might have something we need as well. Please respond. This time, the speakers crackled as if someone did acknowledge their message, but no reply came. Clea considered what exactly she might say to pique the man's curiosity. What did he need or want that might bring him to the line? Honestly, she'd been bluffing with most anything she had to offer, unless he hadn't seen the data on the drive they were after. Maybe that'll be the ticket. Sir, we're looking for something of great value on a storage drive you may have procured, Clea tried. If you'll simply let us talk, I'm certain we can work something out. Please, we're rather desperate. This time, a response came immediately. I've been listening to you, Miss Antufal. I knew your father. Clea's heart hammered in her chest. If you've turned to piracy, he won't exactly be proud. I assure you there's a reason for everything, Clea replied. Can you please direct us where to land? I would like to speak to you in person. Just know that if you're here for nefarious reasons, I have defenses that will liquefy you. I don't tolerate hostility. And we're not bringing any, I assure you. Clea clenched her fist. Please, you have to trust us. A long pause made Clea worry he'd cut the line. She was about to speak up when something in the back of her mind told her to remain patient. Let the man think it through. He's become a reclusive hermit, so he's not exactly used to guests who are there to talk. Selling things is a far cry from visiting. While she waited, she brought up Durant's file and looked over his accolades again. He'd won every science award the Keelan people had to offer. Prior to the war, he'd been responsible for making space travel safer through environmental shield improvements, and he also enhanced the artificial gravity, making it more pleasant to live in. When the war started, he shifted his focus to arms, a point which must have bothered him considering his previous work. Putting his genius to destruction went against some of the awards he won. The things which showed his dedication to peaceful expansion. Due to patriotic zeal, no one called him out for the shift in direction. Not in the beginning. Clea found an article about a protest group in the last years of his government work who called him a hypocrite. Some grew so tired of the fighting and losing family members that all the patriotism in the universe couldn't assuage their frustration. They lashed out at anyone they perceived as having to do with prolonging the conflict. Some even went so far as to say Durant was war profiteering. He never addressed any of these allegations. He just left and Clea couldn't necessarily blame him. He'd given his entire life to the Keelan people, devoted it to improvements and defense, only to eventually be lumped into the problem. Why stay? All right, Miss Antufal, I've decided to trust you. Remember my warning. I'm sending you the coordinates to where you can land. 
The line went dead just after a series of numbers appeared on her console. Clea sent them to the pilot station. Please make course for that location, she said. We just got clearance to land. Do we want to? Megan asked. It sounded like you really had to work to get that permission. This is our destination, Miss Pointer, Clea replied. We need to see where this path ends. I hope it's not on another planet, Rudy said, because I'm not sure our mission parameters are going to extend beyond this visit. I agree, Clea nodded. I'll be in the back briefing the others. She left the bridge and found Jesse, Arak, the Marines, and Crandy all gathered in the mess area. The table and chairs were secured to the deck, and they were sitting around, sipping from cups. She paused at the door before launching into where they were about to land and how she expected everyone to remain on their absolute best behavior. This guy's a bit of a nutter, Crandy said. So don't push him. He's old, eccentric, and has lived alone for a very long time. A good warning, Clea agreed. We don't know how much he's changed since his work with us so many years ago. I'm quite certain whatever he's been able to build out here all alone will be spectacular. I'll be playing to his ego somewhat, giving him the credit he probably feels he deserves. We need that storage device or at least what's on it. I'll do the majority of the talking. Suits me, Jenks said. I've never been good at chatting it up with scientists. You're terrible at talking to anyone, Walsh replied. What makes scientists special? They're techier than everyone else. I can't really follow. I know how to use my data pad, but other than that, I'm not a deep dive kind of guy. Not on machinery, at least. I beg to differ, Walsh muttered. What's that mean? Arak asked. You don't want to know, Clea interrupted. Anyway, we'll be landing shortly, so prepare yourselves. I'm fairly certain this is going to be an educational experience. Hoffner's people were busy processing prisoners the behemoth took on board. Some of them weren't as ready to give up as the captains who commanded the ships, and fights broke out immediately. At one point, they had to seal an entire ship and gas it to knock out the inhabitants, then carry them out while wearing environmental suits. Another set of pirates pretended to go easily, and as they were being marched to the brig, they attacked the marines, trying to confiscate their weapons. Hoffner's men proved to be more than a match for them, and they beat them down, killing one. As they got them to the cells, the captain of the pirates confessed that they were planning to commandeer the behemoth. Once their brig was full, they sent the rest on a shuttle to their allies. It took nearly two hours to get everything worked out. Then there was the surface mission. When they landed, the soldiers were met with a bunch of stranded, rioting pirates or their support staff, all desperate to leave the planet at any cost. A few major firefights broke out with two marines getting injured and over a dozen dead or wounded on the pirate side of things. Once they realized the Keelans and humans were there to arrest them, they gave up peacefully and allowed themselves to be transported back to the various ships for processing. The Keelans confiscated nearly three tons of total contraband cargo. Much of it had been stolen, though some was legitimately salvaged. Unfortunately, no one had one or the other, so the combination of goods put these people in dire straits. According to Alliance law, being caught as they were, most looked at years of prison time. They found a large cargo container registered to a man named Crandy. When the Keelans tried to open it, the inside exploded destroying everything inside and killing one of the men who picked the lock. All the evidence inside was incinerated, leaving nothing behind. They made a note to keep an eye out for him, especially since he was the only one who sabotaged his own stock. He must be on one of the ships by now, Hoffner thought. I'm sure they'll figure it out. He spoke with Marshall and discovered the captain was desperate to get moving, to follow their undercover crew to another sector. Word from the bridge was the marines should be ready to move if necessary. The captain had a hunch about what they'd find and wanted everyone on their toes. Hoffner briefed his folks, putting them on alert. They still had some time before they'd be able to jump out of the system. The Keelans wanted to make sure everyone was accounted for and the work they were there to perform was completed properly. 
Had they not shown up early, the behemoth might have gotten their data and been able to go home. Nice of them to screw us over. Hoffner couldn't help but be a little bitter. Their next adventure put his guys directly in danger, and that didn't set well with him. Especially when the threat was completely unknown. I guess we'll see how bad it is soon enough. He went back to helping coordinate prisoners and gathering IDs. Security people would be busy through the jump and beyond. None of them would have time to worry about where they were going, and in a way, that suited Hoffner. His folks didn't need time to think when they were on the verge of a potential fight. Megan took control from Rudy so he could take a moment to stretch. She approached the second planet, the one closest to Earth's atmosphere, according to Clea. It looked a lot like home, but the continents were all wrong. The cloud coverage reminded her of the first time she went into space on her own. She looked back over her shoulder and gasped at the majesty. Even all these years later, she still felt a sense of awe when approaching a world. So much went on down there, and to see it all at once gave her quite the thrill. It was such a privilege to gain perspective on how small a big world really was. Though there may not be a lot of civilization where they were going, life had to be flourishing there for it to be so blue and green. Rudy returned before they broke atmosphere and took his seat, yawning. I think I need a couple days of sleep to recover after this. Probably, Megan said. You've always been lazy. Nice. Rudy shook his head. He got on the comm. Um, Control, this is... He muted the line and turned to Megan. What did that maniac call the ship? Wicked Knight. Thanks, he unmuted. This is the Wicked Knight requesting clearance to land. Yes, yes, an irritable voice replied. Just land already. You have the coordinates. You don't need to keep asking for it like an errant child desperate for a sweet. The line went dead and Rudy smirked. He's salty. Yeah, not entirely social, huh? Megan maintained control of the ship as they broke atmosphere and began their descent. She had gotten the hang of the craft throughout the last hour as they approached, and bringing it down felt fairly natural, despite most of her time being spent behind the controls of a fighter. As they broke the cloud coverage, they found themselves flying over a vast forest that stretched on as far as the eye could see. Megan's eyes widened as she considered the implications of what she saw. This place was a wealth of resources, totally untouched by any culture. It seemed impossible. You thinking? Rudy nodded. I am. This is pristine. I can't believe it. I wonder how he's kept it safe? Megan checked her scanner. There's plenty of water and life down there, too. Mammals and fish, at least. And minerals. Wow, I'm picking up a lot of heavy metals, too. The types we use for building ships. Incredible. Maybe that's why he set up shop here, to use the resources for his own work. One guy couldn't mine all that, Megan said. It's impossible. He'd never get enough and process it to make any difference. I wouldn't put it past him, Rudy replied. Look over there. He directed her attention to a brilliant silver spire that stretched up a good six stories, a complex, easily large enough for a small factory, spread out near a rocky outcropping with a waterfall to the left and the forest encroaching on the borders in front of it. Megan saw the landing pad and redirected for it, but she couldn't help but stare at the construction. This place is amazing. How did he get it here? Prefab housing, maybe? Rudy replied. It has to be. I wonder how long he's lived here. And added on to this place. Must have been years. This place is practically a small town. Hell, it's bigger than where Mick grew up, I can assure you of that. There must be more people here, then. It can't just be him. Maybe he brought his family? I don't know. I guess we can ask Miss Antufal. He doesn't have family, Clea said, startling Megan. At least as far as the public knows. He was solely devoted to his work. You have a light footstep. Megan muttered. But take a look at this place. Do you really think he lives here all alone? It's very possible. Sometimes genius flourishes best away from all distractions. Rudy got on the comm. 
Hang tight, we're landing now. The ship turned, and as it did, Megan noted a man standing near the doors of the structure. The landing pad was attached to the main area through a bridge easily large enough for a couple of cargo containers to travel side by side. As they set down, the engines whined while setting to idle. Megan performed a systems check and filed a positive report. She nodded to Rudy, who turned to Clea. We're good to go, Miss Antufal. Ship secure. Thank you. Clea turned away. I think at least one of us should stay with the ship, but if one of you is particularly curious, please feel free to come with. You want to go? Rudy offered. I'm not curious. Yeah, I think I will. Megan took off her safety harness and followed Clea out. Don't get bored without us. Clea entered the mess area and Megan followed. We're here. I'll remind you again, let me do the talking. Once we establish the possibility of Durant having our storage device, I'll negotiate him letting us have it. The rest of you are just there to observe. Do you have any questions before we leave? Are we going armed? Jenks asked. Sidearms only, please. You sure? Walsh lifted his brows. It didn't work out for us so well last time, and now we've got some better hardware. Durant should be the only person here. Even if he's not, these won't be pirates, so we shouldn't experience any sort of... rioting. Let's go. I think he's waiting for us. Clea steadied herself as they dropped the ramp and headed out into the cool air. The scent of pine tickled her nose, something she didn't expect. She hadn't experienced those types of trees except on Earth. To find them out here and in such a large number seemed strange. She turned and started down the lane, leading to the massive complex. The distance was only a few hundred meters, but it looked much farther. The sound of the waterfall cascading nearby and the wind blowing through the trees felt soothing, and she understood why Durant might have taken up there. He definitely found a tranquil place to do whatever task he put himself to. Sunlight beamed down, filtered through sparse clouds. It made the area bright as it glistened off the shiny metal walls of the structure and the light gray of the paved walkway. Despite the light, the ambient temperature sat around 65 degrees. Clea wondered what season the region might be in. Without blossoming plants or more deciduous trees, it was hard to tell without a scan. The others followed close behind with the Marines taking up the rear. Crandy, Jesse, Arak, and Megan were enthralled enough to be admiring the scenery like true tourists. Clea kept her focus on the man waiting for them. He dressed in a long gray coat with matching pants and a black shirt. His hair was jet black with streaks of white on the sides. He wore a beard, also flecked with gray, and he stood motionless as they approached. Clea's eyes flicked to the side and noted turrets over the nearby doorway. A green light indicated they were active. Durant, Vi Purin, Clea called as they drew close enough to be heard. Thank you for seeing us. I appreciate it more than you know. You'll have to convince me this wasn't a mistake to let you come here, Durant replied. What do you want? And however did you become, well, this? I can explain everything, Clea said. But our primary need is a storage device you may have procured. Some pirate group or scavengers stripped a storage device from the tempered steel. The ship was destroyed in a battle with an enemy you possibly know better than any other civilian alive. Ah, Durant shook his head. And who told you I might have it? Clea gestured to Crandy, who stepped forward looking sheepish. Uh, hi, sir, Crandy waved. Sorry I told them about you, but I didn't have a lot of choice. The Alliance showed up and destroyed our base. They were taking prisoners. I had to get out of there, and this was the price. You're a fool, Crandy, Durant replied. These people aren't pirates. Crandy scowled. What does that mean? They're clearly military, Durant gestured to Clea. And I know her parents. She'd never turn criminal. 
Is this true? Crandy turned to Clea. Are you... Are you Alliance? Yes, Clea said. But we'll honor our bargain with you. You're not going to prison. But there's no planet of wealth, then. Crandy clenched his fists. I'm ruined. Just imagine where you'd be if we hadn't taken you, Jenks said. And where would you be without me? Crandy shouted. Certainly not standing here, you insignificant military lapdog. Settle down, Jesse said. This is a chance to start over for both of us. Don't throw it away. You shut up, Crandy pointed at the pirate. You brought them to me in the first place. This is your fault. Durand held up his hands. That's enough. Crandy, if these people genuinely have good cause to be here, I'll reward you myself. But they'd better have a good story. We do, Clea assured him. Then come with me. Durant turned back toward the complex. Let's get indoors where we can speak with some decorum. Gray anxiously checked the reports, waiting for an opportunity to bow out of the operation and get moving. He wanted to chase after Clea as soon as possible, to give them the backup they might sorely need. Unfortunately, the semantics of collecting so many prisoners and all that evidence simply took time. Ollie worked past his shift in order to help locate every scrap of information on the surface of the planet. He uncovered three hidden caches of contraband, directing the Alliance forces so they could confiscate them. He even managed to download the schematics for the weapon the pirates used against them. Hopefully we can build a defense against those. Maybe it would work on the enemy. Lots of possibilities there. Ollie yawned and stretched, pausing in his motion. Gray looked at him, recognizing the hesitation to move. The man saw something, and that meant they should all brace themselves for some bad news. Captain, some ship just jumped out of here? One we didn't detect until a moment ago. What do you mean? How'd we miss it? I'm checking the data, Ollie frowned. Sir, I think they were using something to deflect sensor probes. They must not be able to do it right before to jump. The energy buildup may contradict the other tech. I'm totally guessing here, but in any event, they literally appeared for a moment, then jumped out of the system. Leonard, can you calculate a course? Um. Leonard took a moment, also having worked past the end of his shift. He paused. They jumped out within five meters of where Miss Antufal's ship departed? We don't have a signature for them, so I can't track where they went. You think they're chasing Clea? Adam asked. Gray shrugged. It would be just our luck. Fortunately, we've been out here for hours, so our team has a major head start. I hope they're ready to defend themselves if necessary. I'm sure they are. Megan and Rudy are good combat pilots. Gray nodded. Still, we need to get moving as quickly as possible. Agatha, contact the Alliance command ship. Tell them we're on a schedule and we need to get moving. Redding, begin the countdown for the jump. I want us at those coordinates in the next 20 minutes. Let's get our people back. Chapter 11 The wonders in Durant's workshop shocked Clea. They wondered how he might have built such a place all alone, but he wasn't entirely. Robots with fully articulated joints and movement for work occupied his factory. They brought his visions to life on an assembly line, crafting the communication tower and living quarters, as well as all the labs for further research. Some of them were designed for mining, delving deep into the earth all around the area. The trees came as saplings a short time ago, but through chemical assistance and terraforming, Durant got them to grow into a vast forest. It provided a natural deterrent for the heavy winds during the winter months and an endless supply of wood for the foundry. The minerals they pulled and used were of the highest quality, many of which were used in Alliance space vessels. He experimented on weapons and quality of life devices to take away the needs of everyday labor. Artificial intelligence drove the machines all night long while he rested, and in the morning, he checked the logs to correct any errors. Over the years, he perfected the systems, creating a working rhythm that allowed him to conduct his research 
and apply it practically. He showed them some of the weapons labs as they walked, rooms full of guns, enough for an army. Many of them required no ordnance and fired beams from packs which recharged within seconds. They were good for a thousand shots, but he was aiming for more. When asked why he would put so much thought into the weapons when he left because of the war, he had a simple enough answer. My critics wanted to blame the war on me, Durant explained. They protested my involvement and were of the impression that if I stopped designing weapons, the fighting would simply stop. That naivety wore on me. Most of them were young and didn't remember my work prior to the conflict. If they had, they'd know my focus had always been on saving lives, not taking them. I needed a place to work in peace. I want to stop the war, Clea, but I couldn't do so with protesters hounding me every step of the way. So I bide my time. However, I'm not ready to share this with the Alliance just yet. There's still too much to do. I don't understand the enemy yet. That's why I study every battle. I've made breakthroughs, but not solved the problem. Have you studied the battle I'm here about? Clea asked. I have so many black boxes and storage devices, I've barely scratched the surface, Durant said. Grandy might have told you I haven't bought anything in months. My computers are processing it all. Some of the best technology ever built, and even they cannot scour the data fast enough to go through it all quickly. In short, I doubt I've seen what you're looking for yet, but if I have, it didn't contain the epiphany you're hoping for. I suppose we'll see, Clea sighed. They reached the primary complex, Durant's living space. The foyer was well-appointed and comfortable, with plush furniture and a massive fireplace filled with blazing flames. Clea admired the rustic decor, offsetting the hyper-technology all around them. It felt homey, despite the foundry not even 300 meters away. Soundproofing took away all the noise of labor, leaving this place tranquil. Durant led them through the room and down a hallway to a computer lab. Data banks lined the walls, and a single terminal with twelve screens occupied the center opposite the door. He moved over and sat down, entering a thirty-digit password. The screens came to life, displaying information on an OS Clea had never seen before. He does everything. No wonder everyone spoke so highly of him. His knowledge is impressive, to say the least. These storage devices you see around the room are my sorters. They're linked up to a warehouse on the other side of this wall, holding literally countless banks of information. It took three months to index my initial findings, and it's an ongoing, continual process. After nearly a year, just about everything is searchable, but as far as finding specific bits, that will take a lot more time. Maybe we won't need it, Clea said. Can you relate anything you've learned about the enemy so far? Do you understand how they operate? I know what their ships are made of, how they power them, and the structural integrity of their shields, Durant explained. I wrote a paper on their tactics, both before I left and after. The latter piece will be something you can leave with. Even if I'm not ready, it'll help your commanders fight the battle. Crandy groaned. I can't believe you guys are military. Just stop, Jenks grunted. Be happy you're alive. Anyway, Durant continued, tell me what you're after and we can try to find it. We're looking for a battle involving a ship called the Tempered Steel. You might have the storage device I used to keep my data. Durant turned to her, raising a brow. And what exactly do you believe you're going to find? I served on the ship on my first tour as a tech officer, Clea said. We got into a battle, eight of us against four of them. We lost three ships, as did they. I was injured when we took a direct hit and had to evacuate. Frankly, I lost my memory of the entire event until a few days ago when I had a dream. A dream? Durant shook his head. A dream brought you all this way? In a manner of speaking, yes. My psychologist warned me my memories may never return, or if they did, it could be through a dream or some other trauma. Fortunately for me, it didn't involve anything uncomfortable. 
Anyway, during the mission, I found something during the attack. A signal, and I believe it may help us. If that's true, I'll certainly devote some cycles to studying the recuperative power of sleep. Durant began typing, watching one of the screens. This may take a moment, so you'll forgive me if... An alarm went off overhead, causing Crandy and Jesse to jump. Um, what is that? Jenks asked. Durant tapped something on his console. One of the terminals depicted a shot of space, a satellite image showing a large ship approaching orbit. We have uninvited guests. Who are they? Megan leaned in. That's not the enemy. No, Durant said. They're mercenaries, I believe. Someone who followed you here, perhaps? How? Clea asked. We jumped. How would they have sophisticated enough equipment to plot our jump course? Durant shook his head. Silly girl. Pirates have all sorts of black market software. It's not hard to snatch the coordinates from a computer just before the jump. It's how they catch merchants who think they can escape. A smaller vessel detached from the larger. That's a troop transport, Walsh pointed out. Don't you have defenses? Durant nodded. Some of the best, but I'm afraid they're not working. I'm actually very impressed. These scum managed to disable the orbital turrets in record time. Their tech officer is amazing. Perhaps I was wrong. They may not be mercenaries. Let's see, there's a symbol on the side of that ship. A couple of circles intersecting. I've never seen it before, have you? Crandy's shoulders slumped. I have. They call themselves Orion's Light. Those zealot bastards visited our bases before, demanding weapons and improvements at half the cost they're worth. Sometimes even bigger discounts. I've seen them simply take things from vendors. Who are they? Jenks asked. What's their deal? They're some kind of psychotic order, Crandy replied. A bunch of crazies that are against everyone. Probably taking a page from the enemy you guys are so keen to fight, to be honest. They don't believe in the Alliance or any other culture. Their sole purpose is to eventually run the galaxy as a religious state. And yet they consort with pirates, Megan said. Seems hypocritical. They're also about getting the job done through any means necessary. Crandy replied. I've run into them too, Jesse said. They're real scum, and they'll kill anyone, women, children, whatever they have to do to get their point across. How have you alliance types never heard of them? Crandy glared at Clea. I mean, your intel must be terrible. There are far too many fringe groups for us to track them all, Clea replied. They can crop up any time and anywhere as long as someone has the resources to fund them. And clearly, they've managed to procure some better-than-average tech people if they got past Durant's defenses. Anyway, why are they here? Walsh asked. Wait, don't bother. They want the gear. Yes, it would be quite the boon to their cause, Durant said. Clea, the system is quite simple to search. I'll leave you here to find the data you're after. What are you going to do? Clea asked. Help your friends defend this place. Durant turned to the others. I hope you're interested in making this happen. Arak nodded. We can do whatever is necessary. Let us break into the weapons stores, and we'll set up the defenses. Very good. You might want to radio back to your ship. Whoever you left behind is probably going to contact you at any moment. Let's hope we can manage their numbers. This fight is likely to be quite bloody. Jenks leaned close to Walsh as they followed Durant. I recognize that symbol they showed us. Walsh whispered back, from where? Think back to the fight with those jerks who burst out on us as we left Crandy's shop. They had patches on their sleeves. Your attention to detail is pretty sick, because I didn't have a chance to admire their clothes while they shot at us. When I took their stuff, I noticed each of them wore one. They etched it on their guns, too. Jenks scowled. I'll show you when we get back to the ship. 
I don't think that was random, and they weren't after us. They wanted Crandy. Because he had all those guns in the shop. Maybe, Jenks agreed. Or maybe they knew about this place. Same destination as us? Different reason? Seems plausible, but what timing? Walsh shook his head. Why didn't you tell Miss Antufal? I run things by you first, in case I'm crazy. Your mental state's a given, but we'll have to brief her soon. Could be important. Walsh scratched his head. I wonder. Crandy did say he'd seen those type of guys take stuff before. I wonder why he didn't say anything when they attacked us. Probably because, like you, he didn't notice the patches. Walsh nodded. Good point. Anyway, we should focus on not getting dead. I prefer to make it back from this mission alive, if it's all the same to you. Wouldn't have it any other way, Jenks grinned. Besides, that's what we do, man. We've got this. I love your confidence, Walsh muttered. Move out. Rudy met the others near one of the large storehouses located by where they landed. Some of Durant's robots, absolute tech wonders, carried equipment out and stacked it nearby. Jenks and Walsh went about familiarizing themselves with the different weapons. Iraq stood beside Durant, speaking with him quietly while Jesse and Crandy stayed out of the way. What's going on? Rudy asked. What are we doing? Someone seems to have followed us, Megan replied. I'm scanning their vessel now. Shouldn't we get up there and take it out then? Rudy gestured to their ship. Our weapons are pretty nasty. Not a good plan, Durant interrupted. In fact, I'm going to place a shield on your vessel so it doesn't take damage. But if they were able to take down my defenses, then your craft won't be any match for their cannons. No, we'll make our stand on the ground. Can you arm the robots? Arak asked. Kind of. Some of them will be outfitted with their own turrets, but we'll be controlling them. However, I have a fear about it. My guess is that they found a way to do a precise EMP attack. That's how they knocked out the weapons above us. If that's the case, and they have something equally capable for ground engagements, they'll be able to take out the robots and we won't be able to adjust. Can't EMP this, Jenks said, holding up a large rifle. I'm digging the idea that this thing doesn't need to be reloaded. Durant nodded. Yes, I suspect we should be listening to you two on where to set up. The fact is, we don't want them shooting at the storehouse with all the armaments, Walsh said. How do your shields work? I've got plenty of them, but they'll last roughly five minutes each and can take quite a bit of kinetic punishment before failing. However, they are also subject to the concern about EMP. No problem, Jenks said. These metal containers over here are full of resources, wood and metal. Let's get them moved out here and use them as cover. I'll get out there and throw some mines down. You don't think they're going to be so brazen as to land directly in the complex, do you? Walsh sighed. They don't have much reason not to. I'll give them one, Durant replied, turning to his data pad. He hit a button and a section of the ceiling opened, revealing a massive cannon. He tapped at it a few times. There. This is going to make their entry less than pleasant. The gun began firing, massive red blasts which vanished into the sky. Rudy wondered if they might be capable of causing damage to the ship in orbit. They had such defenses on Earth now, and they were incredibly powerful. He couldn't imagine a troop transport being capable of taking that kind of shot without going down. Durant watched his scanner intently, and Rudy held his breath waiting for the man's report. Meanwhile, the robots helped build some cover and Jenks hurried out into the field beyond the foundation of the complex and planted the mines. Walsh armed Crandy and Jesse, giving them positions further down the line. Megan took a rifle and found a doorway near the makeshift cover. Rudy grabbed a gun and one of the larger shield generators. He hurried back to the ship and placed it underneath, engaging a delayed timer. It would turn on in 30 seconds and encompass the entire ship. The projector threw the beans around the vessel in a great dome, touching the ground. It should be safe, at least for the time being. 
That's our way home, so I hope it stays that way. When he got back, Durant smiled. My attack's working. They are no longer on a direct course for my home. Where are they going to land? Walsh shouted. About a thousand meters that way, Durant pointed. In the forest, they'll have to trudge through the trees to get here. Any natural predators to worry about? Megan called. Not that will deter them, Durant replied. They may be tired, but that's all. However many men they bring, and I'll know the moment they open their ship, is how many we'll have to deal with. Jenks came back, hurrying over to them. I planted a bunch of mines and threw in some other nasty surprises. There are rocks on top of them. Should act as a decent amount of shrapnel if they trigger any. Some are on remote detonators, so we can let them rip from a data pad back here. Good idea, Walsh said. Jenks and I'll do the heavy lifting out here. You guys stick to the doorways and move about to different windows for better shots. Watch your line of fire and avoid this area. That's where we're going to cover. We'll need some grenades. Jenks offered him a satchel. There you go. Robots moved in front of them, each loaded up with a turret on its shoulders. They crouched down, their waists able to rotate, allowing a decent field of fire. Other turrets were set up along the edge of the landing, each one controlled by Durant's computer. He moved back into the warehouse and closed the door. Okay, the old dude's safe. Jenks turned to Rudy. You should work with Miss Pointer, he gestured to Megan. Stay in that building over there. You'll have the best vantage to shoot guys coming from our flank to the east. On it. Rudy hurried over to the other pilot and entered the room. She had opened the window and poised her rifle on the edge, peering out into the forest. They haven't landed yet, but are you ready for this? Not my personal choice for fighting, Megan said. But at least I remember how to aim. I really would rather be in the ship. Me too. Do you believe them about the weapons these guys have? Megan shrugged. It's not worth taking the chance. This Durant guy has some pretty incredible technology and our visitors blew right through his outer defenses. I'm thinking it's better to err on the side of caution this time. Rudy nodded. He agreed, but it didn't set well with him. The idea that they were about to be involved in a ground conflict turned his stomach. He'd been in plenty of scrapes, most of them with the behemoth, but this one was way outside his comfort zone. He hadn't fired a hand weapon at a person in a long time. So long he couldn't remember. This is going to work out. We're on course for a simple engagement. The people we have with us are good, and that tech is going to provide us quite the advantage. Durant's a genius. We're going to be okay. Crandy's voice crackled over their comms. This is insane. You guys realize that, right? If there are dozens of them, we're going to be screwed. How can there be dozens? Jesse's voice answered. Because that's how they operate? I've seen it. They have far more people than brains. A bunch of brainwashed idiots with nothing to lose. That's what we're facing. Relax, Jenks said. Just means they won't have any self-preservation when we start shooting. Makes them a lot easier to kill. Says the Marine, who's probably killed more people than I've met. Crandy grumbled. Be quiet, Walsh's voice came up next. They're about to land. They saw the ship off in the distance, nearly a mile away. It came in fast, avoiding more shots from the cannon, which stopped firing when they plunged into the trees. A moment passed before Durant spoke up into the microphone, his tone grave as he reported his findings. Rudy once again held his breath. I'm afraid they've brought 36 people in there, Durant announced. Prepare yourselves. At a normal rate of speed, they should arrive in less than 15 minutes. Here we go. Rudy tried not to think about the enemy's numbers. He focused on the weapon in his hands, on what his task was, and staying alive. In the next 30 minutes, he and his friends might well be dead. Or worse. The only thing they could do now was hope and fight with everything they had. Worst mission ever. Chapter 12 The behemoth made their jump, finally, leaving the system and following Clea's coordinates. 
As soon as they arrived, Gray was on his feet, standing beside Ollie. The younger man performed a system scan while Leonard mapped the solar system for them. On a screen to the left, they saw the star and the different planets orbiting it. Contact, Ollie said. Large capital ship orbiting the second planet. Gray frowned. What's the origin? Um, Ollie performed a database search. Unknown, but they do have a symbol. He put it on the screen, two circles intersecting. There you go. Any ideas? Gray turned to Adam, who shrugged. I've never seen it. Hail them, Gray said. Let's see if they want to talk. And what's on that planet? Ollie paused. Our people must be down there. I have their shuttle on scans. Get them on the line, too. No response from the unknown vessel, Agatha said. I've got Clea on channel seven. Gray went to his station and brought Clea up on his speaker. Report, what's going on down there? Sir, we may have found the data, Clea answered. I'm glad to hear from you. We're about to be attacked by a group of zealots calling themselves Orion's Light. They followed us here from the pirate planet, intent on taking, well, whatever they want. I see. They don't seem to be firing. They landed a force on the planet to take the facility intact. Clea paused. I'm searching for the data while the others prepare to defend the location. We've got turrets and decent hand ordnance, but numbers are lacking. We're looking at over 30 combatants. We'll get you some help, Clea. Stand by. Gray turned to Adam. Work with Marshall and Ravente to get some people down there ASAP. Agatha, give them one more try on Hale. Tell them if they do not back off, we will open fire. Agatha relayed the message and Adam went about his task. Gray turned to Redding and gestured. Get us in range for an attack. I want to be ready to hit them the moment we have to. Ollie, can you tell us how they're armed? Like the pirates, Ollie sighed. Potentially worse. Their shields are on par with our own. They can take some hits and they might be able to dish out some serious damage. Plus their hull? It's made of something particularly powerful. I think it's designed for ramming. Again with the ramming? Gray clenched his fist. Okay, work with Redding to plot the best places to hit them. I want maximum damage potential when this goes hot. Sound the alert through the ship and get all pilots on ready. Those people down there don't have a lot of time, and if we don't get them some reinforcements, they're going to have a real bad day. Ravente gave the briefing in person. A rarity, as most of the time they received their mission parameters while in the cockpits of their fighters waiting to launch. Mick carried his helmet under his arm, standing amidst his fellows on the hangar deck. Each of them exchanged glances, unsure about the change in protocol. As the group commander took his place in front of them, he addressed them quickly. Team, we're sending you out in support of efforts against a different kind of enemy, not the one who invaded Earth or the new culture we encountered. These people are zealots, a fringe group bent on toppling governments, I'm bringing you together this way to express the gravity of the situation. While this ship may not seem all that imposing, they have weapons we're not entirely familiar with yet. We already know they have the same beam cannon the pirates used to take the behemoth shields down quickly. What other tricks they're hiding up their sleeves, we don't know. Use extreme caution as you fly today. You're not up there for attack, but rather support. If they throw something at the behemoth you can shoot down, do it. If they have fighters, you'll engage, but until you're directed, do not assault the vessel directly. Wait for the shields to go down and the command. Bombers' squadrons are to steer clear of the behemoth and wait for orders. Do you have any questions? One of the pilots raised his hand. Sir, do we have any idea of what the enemy defenses are like? They have shields on par with our own, Ravente said. Their hulls are also well armored, and the bow is shaped for ramming. Next question. Do we have clearance for targets of opportunity? Negative. Wait for orders or call in what you see. I'll make the decision on the fly. Why not try the bombs right away? We don't want to waste ordnance, Ravente replied. Throwing those away would be pointless if the shields just stopped them. No one else spoke up and Ravente nodded. Get to your ships and good luck. Mick led his people to their fighters and boarded his own. They were the first with clearance and launched right away. As they left the ship, they pulled far enough away to avoid any secondary explosions from splash weapons. Directing themselves to face the enemy, he took in the threat. 
They looked like most capital ships, long with weapon ports and a section near the middle for the bridge section. He noted they still hadn't broken orbit, still hadn't acknowledged the threat the behemoth posed. Engagement might change their attitude. Something about their disregard annoyed Mick. I hope you guys don't have anything to back up this arrogance. Ravente pinged them all, his voice filling their helmets. The hull's opening, he said. Looks like there are fighters after all. Wow, for a fringe group, these guys are well-funded. Hosting fighters isn't cheap. Mick checked his scanner and counted 20 total flying to meet them. The behemoth crew still outnumbered them, but perhaps that didn't matter. The Orion's light only needed to hold them off long enough to get what they wanted from the planet, then they could flee. They must have believed whatever they'd find on the surface could be worth losing some of their own. As they clear their vessel, you're clear to engage, Ravente called out. Keep it tight and remember, we don't know what they've got. Your shields might not help. Keep it cautious. Like hell. Mick radioed to his own wing. You heard him. Well, let's pair up and tear them down. Watch how they approach. It may tell a lot about them. They separated out into groups of three. Six pulled off from the hole, heading toward the behemoth. Mick scowled and called it in. One of their wing broke off to face those stragglers as the rest of them continued their approach on the mainstay of the enemy fighters. Distance closed rapidly, numbers plunging on the scanner. The enemy opened fire, purple blasts tearing past Mick's ship. He veered to the left, his wingmen following closely. He jammed the throttle forward, initiated the top thrusters, and plunged forward, redirecting to gain a firing solution. The enemy was fast, but he just managed a good couple shots at the one lagging behind. A series of pulse blasts caught the tail, igniting the engine. The ship began to spin, just as an explosion popped the fuselage. It went up in an instant, annihilating the cockpit before the pilot could pull the ejection handle. His two companions turned, engaging with Mick and Shelley. Hitting his thrusters, Mick tried to pull away, but it became apparent his pursuers matched him in speed. Shelley directed him to pull up, to draw them away. He yanked on the stick, his thrusters pulling his nose up. One of the two fighters climbed after him. The other tried to stay on Shelley. Mick saw his scanner out of the corner of his eye. Shelley hit the reverse thrusters and dropped behind her attacker. Blasts made Mick wince as she took out her target. The one behind him fired, nearly tagging him if not for a quick evasion. He dodged with a jolted thrust, pushing him down just enough to avoid destruction. Disengaging his engine's safety link, he initiated the left thrusters, spinning his vessel while still maintaining his momentum. Depressing the trigger, he fired in his opponent's path, scoring a direct hit to the side. Shields flared, but the ship reacted, a knee-jerk reaction pulling him away from his pursuit. Mick re-engaged the safety on his engines and struggled against the inertia, even as the dampeners whined while compensating. He turned to his scanner, noting he was clear. Shelley closed in, reforming on him while he tried to get a visual of the target. Explosions around him caused a major distraction, other fights broken out all across the sector. He noted at least three of their own had been taken out even as they were maintaining a solid upper hand. I've got him, Shelley called out. Trying for our six again. Break left and let's put him in a crossfire, Mick said. Go. They burst away from one another, firing hard in a semicircle. The enemy came between them and realized his mistake too late. He tried to plunge out of the way, but Mick and Shelley fired at the same time, lighting him up from two directions. An orange ball erupted, then went out, leaving nothing behind of the ship. Great work. Mick turned to get back into the fight, leading the way toward the others. Looks like we've got some mop-up still. Let's do this. Right behind you, Shelley paused. Behemoth's about to engage. We need to steer clear of that nonsense. Panther wing, regroup. Form up on us for another push. The other ships closed in, and he quietly thanked heaven they were all still with him. He didn't want to lose a pilot his first time out as commander, and certainly didn't want to explain to Megan what happened. As they plunged toward the remaining enemy, the scanner said only a half dozen remained. Mick watched as one of Tiger Wing tore through one of the enemies, 
very nearly colliding with the debris. He winced as the ship barely pulled up in time, shields flaring as it contacted the jagged edges of metal. Another ship jet across his path and Mick had to pull up to avoid them. More pulse blasts erupted around him. The dogfight turned totally chaotic. He let the targeting computer decide who to shoot at, pulling the trigger when he got tone. A hit, but not fatal. The enemy drifted away but did not eject. Another of his comrades finished him off. Only three opponents remained, but instead of falling back or surrendering, they headed straight for the behemoth, pushing to full throttle. What are they doing? Someone's voice crackled in Mick's ear. They're going straight for it? Shelley sounded shocked. Why? What do they hope to accomplish? Sensors read an overload in their reactors, Mick said. They're turning themselves into bombs. Get after them and finish them off before they get there. Every fighter started in on pursuit, pushing to full throttle. A few random shots nearly hit, but the enemy was moving too fast. They had only a few more chances before the ship's turned missiles reached their target. Mick didn't know what kind of damage they'd cause, but he didn't have any intention of finding out. Ravente, you've got a problem we're trying to solve, Mick called out. Three fighters incoming hot, they're suiciding. Roger that, Ravente replied. Take them down, but we'll get the defenses ready for it. I hope that's true, Mick thought. We've tried this tactic before to great effect. Redding moved them into position and finally the enemy broke orbit, directing themselves into the behemoth's path. A blue field erupted around them, indicating their opponent had raised shields. Ollie called it out, letting them all know a real fight was about to begin. The fighters had already engaged. The Orion's light ship made up their mind. No communication, just a straight fight. They didn't even know what they were up against and still planned to throw down. The notion made Renning shake her head. Why not at least try to talk? Why not see what someone had to say? Buy some time for their attack crews on the planet? But no, they went straight to escalate. Scans are in, Ollie said. They've got pulse cannons equivalent of our own and... Yes, those beam weapons we encountered with the pirates. Weapons? Adam asked. Do you mean they have more than one? Yes, sir, they're sporting two. Ollie shook his head. Nasty combo, Gray hummed. Do you have a range on them? According to our last encounter, they needed to be at close range, Ollie said. If we remain at at least 20,000 kilometers distant, they'll be forced to only use their pulse weapons. But I have some bad news. Can't wait, Redding muttered. Their engines are powerful. I'd say they've sacrificed a lot of luxury for extra generators and power. They're smaller than us, but they've got equal defenses, slightly superior firepower, and more maneuverability. And if they're truly zealots, Gray said, then there's a good chance they lack much in the way of self-preservation. Did you get us any good targeting? Ollie shrugged. I mean, the whole ship's made up of energy relays and weapons. I can't find any particular weaknesses. We're going to have to beat them down, sir. You heard him, Redding. When they get in range, light them up. They're hailing us, sir, Agatha said. They've demanded our immediate surrender. Redding turned a wide-eyed expression to Gray. They're serious, aren't they? I'll let you give our answer, Redding. Gray leaned back in his seat. Fire at will. Yes, sir. Redding turned to her station, marking a series of proposed targets. Ollie guessed on them, but they were better than nothing. One aimed for the bridge, another what he believed to be a weapon relay, and another the presumed life support system. Wow, you're pretty vicious, Oliver. Let's hope this works. The computer lit up, lights blinking to indicate they were within range. Redding fired, launching the cannons in stages. As she counted them off, the second barrage following the first at a good ten seconds. The third, ten seconds after that. This allowed her to have a downtime of only fifteen seconds for the recharge before she could shoot again. All the work the engineers did back on Earth provided the extra power to make this possible, to enhance the weapons and optimize the energy output. The first of the blasts connected with the enemy, splashing on their shields. 
She reversed their thrusts as the second pulse beams struck home. Direct hits. Ali spoke calmly, but Redding heard the tension in his voice. Shields holding. I'm reading 80%. Not bad, Gray said. Keep our distance, Redding. The enemy returned fire, shots slamming into the behemoth, causing the mildest of trembles. We're holding. 95%. Enemy is gaining. Leonard cleared his throat. Captain, I've laid in a course for a micro-jump. According to Lieutenant Darnell's calculations, their special weapon has a 45-degree angle arc, so if we end up behind them, they'll have to turn to get a shot off. Understood, Gray said. When they're within range, perform the jump and lay into them. Maybe direct shots to the thrusters won't be as protected. The ship shook again, this time more violently. Another set of hits, Ollie said. Shields are down to 80%, recharging fast. Redding fired again, but held back the second and third barrages. The enemy was closing fast, at nearly full thrust. She watched the sensors closely, waiting for the last moment to engage the jump. Those special weapons are powering up, Ollie said. They'll have a firing solution in less than five seconds. Jump, Gray said, now. Redding slapped the button, gripping the edge of her console. The ship trembled, shimmered, and a moment later the view screen changed, depicting the enemy's rear. Try that, you bastards. She fired, this time every cannon at the same time directly into the enemy engines. Enemy shields down to 40%, Ollie shouted. They're attempting to turn. Divert power to recharge, Gray said. Get us some energy before they can take their shot. Working on it, sir. Redding worked the controls, contacting engineering for the auxiliary power they needed. As the meter began to rise, she kicked the thrusters on to pull back again, this time toward the planet. They needed 20 seconds for another firing solution, but their enemy was fast and they were already showing their side to them. The jump module was also on cooldown. Another minute for another such trick. Redding willed the weapons to come back online and then her primary cannons lit up green. She fired, a full blast with tremendous results. Shields flickered and a micro-explosion on the exterior of the enemy indicated an actual hit. Damage, Ollie shouted. Minor, but we got through. Their shields are at 30% ship-wide, but... Wait. What is it? Gray asked. What's wrong? Shields are recharging at an insane rate. They're up to 50, 60. I don't know what's happening. Fire again, Gray ordered. Do it now. Redding let loose another two volleys, collecting again with the now mostly recharged shields. Nothing got through, but they did see the shields flare up, much like they might when they're being overloaded. If we can keep that up, we might tear them down, Gray said. Do they have a solution? Almost. Full thrust, Adam said. Get us back from them. We're at full thrust, Redding replied. We're moving as fast as we can without taking away from the weapon recharge. They're about to fire, Ollie shouted. Gray spoke over the ship-wide intercom. Brace for impact, I repeat, brace for impact. Cannons on the front of the enemy brightened as red glows filled the barrels. They saw them turn, aiming directly for the behemoth. Ollie's hands moved frantically, and Redding prepared for evasive. She checked the cooldown on the jump module, but it had another full thirty seconds. Time moves too slowly and too fast in combat. This is probably going to hurt. The enemy fired and the shields began flaring. Ollie started calling out the damage and the countdown began on how long they could fire, whether the behemoth would get out of the beam's path or their shields dropped completely, exposing them to a pulse blast attack. Redding entered the cannons into the targeting computer, prepared to let loose their own fury in retaliation. Opening fire! Redding shouted out, pulling the trigger. As their attack shot forth from their cannons, she held her breath in anticipation of what she hoped might at least slow down the enemy assault. This moment may well determine the course of the rest of the battle. She took a brief moment to pray, then watched the censors intently. Enemy contact! Durant's voice burst into Jenks's ear. One click out, they're on censors, moving fast. They'll be at your first mines in less than twenty seconds. Get ready, Jenks ordered, turning to Walsh. 
Hold fire on the turrets for my mark. I'll detonate the mines just as they pass. Sounds good. His partner stood beside him, holding two grenades. They were ready to arm, prepped to throw when the enemy drew close enough for them. Several tense minutes passed between when the Orion's Light soldiers landed and when they finally drew close enough to engage. Adrenaline took over as the action was about to begin. Jenks laid out mines a good twenty feet apart out in the woods, spreading them so when they detonated, they'd cause the most amount of collateral damage. Considering who made them, he wouldn't be surprised if they took down some trees with the force of the blast. A little extra chaos would help the cause for sure. Durant counted down in his ear from five. The soldiers moved far more cautiously than they anticipated, tactically rather than rushing in. Where'd these guys train? They can't be ex-military, can they? Maybe their command structure is. Regardless, they certainly seem to know what they're doing. Getting past that cannon should have been impossible. Two, Durant said. One, they have passed the mines. Jenks hit the detonator, causing a series of massive explosions just beyond the trees. Men screamed, and a tree did indeed go down. Walsh followed up, hurling his grenades out as far as he could. The two Marines aimed their rifles over their cover, waiting to see if any of the soldiers made it out. You got five of them, Durant said. They must have caught wind of the trap moments before it went off to spread out so quickly. Great. They've got a sixth sense. Understood, Jenks grumbled. The news disappointed him. He'd hoped to get a much larger contingent of them. As the grenades went off, he heard indistinct shouts, syllables without meaning. He glanced at Walsh, who shrugged. What the hell are they saying? Is that another language? Battle language, Jesse said. I've heard people talk about it before, but never heard anyone actually use it. That must be what you're hearing. Wow, these freaks developed their own language on top of it all? Fantastic. Contact, Walsh spoke softly. Jenks felt the tension in the rest of the team as they let it sink in what they just heard. Two to our left flank. Jenks scanned the area and paused, nodding once. He saw the men emerging, keeping their center of gravity low. They led with their weapons, pressed against their shoulders while staring down the sights. He shifted his own aim, marking them both. Hold your fire, everyone. The explosions put them on edge, but we need them to get closer if we hope to seal this deal. I've got some, Rudy said. Um, contact right? Three incoming near the landing pad. We're on those, Megan said. They seem to be checking out the ship. Hold. Jenks again kept his voice calm and low. He had some faith in Rudy and Megan because he knew they were trained. The other three, Iraq, Jesse, and Crandy, on the other hand, might as well have been total civilians in his eyes. Durant, do you have the targets? Only dead ahead, Durant replied. Six dead ahead of our defenses. Let me know when they're open and we'll let go. Jenks took a deep breath, perhaps the last one he would be afforded for some time. He scowled at the men who continued to inch their way closer, wary of an ambush but forced to make progress. They didn't have the ability to take this place slowly. Not with the behemoth topside causing their ride trouble. I have a shot, Durant said. All units, Jenks shouted, hoping to startle their opponents. Open fire! They didn't have time to try out the weapons Durant provided, and Jenks didn't know exactly what to expect. It annoyed him going into battle without at least peeling off a few rounds, but he had to trust the guy and hope they worked as well as he said. When he depressed the trigger, the gun exhibited so little recoil, he wondered if he left a safety on. Bright flashes erupted from the barrel and his first three rounds clipped a tree, chewing bark off as easily as a chainsaw might. The next burst caught one of his targets full in the chest tossing him back on the ground with a smoldering hole where his heart used to be. The dead soldier's partner tried to dive for cover, but Jenks caught him in the leg just above the knee. The man got to cover, but left his shin and foot behind. Holy crap, this gun is insane. Jenks grabbed a grenade, cooked it for three seconds, and threw it where the man tried to hide. Even with such a grievous injury, he represented a clear threat. 
Two arms and consciousness could still take some shots at them. The man cried out, this time not using their special language. The word help halfway left his mouth before the grenade silenced him. Seven down so far. Only twenty-nine to go. This is going to take a while. The turrets went off, barking as they chewed through any natural cover out there, ripping people to shreds. Jenks aimed but did not fire, letting the defenses do their work. The victims were torn in half, ripped up by the high-caliber rounds. Durant had the robots move, spreading out to flank anyone out there. Grenade! Walsh shouted, ducking behind the cover. Jenks joined him, but instead of an explosion, they heard a loud crack, like someone struck wood with metal. Targeted EMP, Durant said. The robots are down. That was fast. Mr. Vipurin, a rock's voice came over the comm. I have an idea for an EMP shield which could prevent such an attack in the future. It would need to be at the core level as my technology is already covered for such an attack. Not the time for a debate. Jenks popped back up and started firing, catching a man in the head. We got ours on the right, Rudy shouted. But more are incoming. They're using the ship's shield for cover. Just keep up the pressure. Jenks said between shots. They can take cover all they want. They just waste their time, not ours. Walsh threw another pair of grenades, then followed up with a few well-timed bursts. Jenks knew who was shooting by the length of their shots. When he heard more than five rounds go off at once, it had to be Jesse or Crandy. The pilots had better sense. He and Walsh never went above three. When the enemy finally returned fire, they had to drop down to cover. A concentrated current of suppressive shots made them keep their heads down. If they keep this up, they'll definitely overrun us. Jenks checked his own scanner and saw the men were definitely advancing. They need to find a way to stop them quick. Durant, you got any other tricks up your sleeve? And those of you behind cover at the doors, I need you to reposition and start clipping these guys. I'm about to unleash another bout of turrets. These won't be as easy to take out for them. Certainly not with their EMP. Don't wait on our account, Walsh shouted. Get them going now. Turrets fired up, making a loud whine as they drove the attackers back into their cover once again. Walsh peeked out the side and took some shots, calling out hits. Looks like we got another four or five of them, Crandy cried out. I'm hit, I'm hit. I've got him, Jesse said. Oh my God, this is bad. Do what you can, Jenks replied. We can't break off for him now. Stabilize and hope we get out of this in one piece to save him. I have bad news, Durant said. We've got another troop transport bearing the sign of Orion's light. Reinforcements, Walsh sighed. Christ, I can't believe they thought they needed them. We should be flattered. Jenks said. Concentrate your fire and we'll get out of this, everyone. Keep them back. Even as he gave the speech, he didn't entirely believe it. The thought they could stand against a second wave of these guys sounded ludicrous. He prepared himself for the last fight he may ever be in and continued firing. Chapter 13 Shields are at 30%. Ollie shouted. Sparks burst from panels overhead, but none of them had time to take note. They're still going strong. Gray gritted his teeth, thinking through the next few moments. The attack might well take out their defenses, leaving them open to catastrophic damage. But in mere seconds, their own attack would impact the enemy weapons, possibly give them a reprieve. If so, they needed to take advantage of the fact and make it count. Time to jump module recharge? On hold, Ollie said. Weapons took priority and our shields tapped the generators. Take that off hold, Gray ordered. We need to hop if we're going to survive this. I have bad news, Adam said. Reventage just said the last three enemy fighters overloaded their reactors and charged us. His people are in pursuit now. Can we target them? Possibly, but they're moving pretty fast. It's likely the pilots already killed themselves. They're pushing so many G-forces. Adam shook his head. 
They're on autopilot. Gray tilted his head. Ollie, are they locked onto us? Yes, sir. I've picked up the signal. Ollie paused. Solid hit from our attack. The weapon stopped. Shields holding at 15% and recharging. Jump module will be back in 10 seconds. Gray nodded. Redding, get us moving. Close on the enemy. Redding engaged the thrusters. You want to get closer to them, sir? Yeah, as if we're going to give them a broadside. This sounds risky, Adam said. I think I know what you're planning. A micro jump might save our lives, if it comes up in time. Gray turned to Ollie. How long before those ships hit us? Twenty seconds? Talk about cutting it close, Leonard muttered. Course, sir? Put us 300,000 kilometers out away from the planet, Gray said. Make it fast. Have Ravente's people back off. Leonard's hands rushed over the panel. Course laid in and ready, sir. Initiate on my mark. Pilots have fallen back, Captain, Adam said. They're moving to a safe range. Ollie spoke up. Enemy is firing again, this time pulse cannons. Their other weapon must be on cooldown, sir. Direct hit. The ship shook violently, and something else sparked behind them. More overloaded circuits. That took us down to 5% shields. Ollie pounded his terminal. I'm trying to recharge faster, but we can't at the expense of the jump module. What are their shields at? Adam asked. 60%. Ollie sighed. How are they doing that? How can they get them recharged so quickly? We'll find out from the salvage. Gray turned to Redding. Get ready. Gray watched the countdown on the screen. Fire our weapons just before we jump. It'll give them something else to think about for a moment. Sir, they're attempting to move off, Leonard called out. Fire and jump. Redding slapped the trigger, then hit the jump module. The ship shimmered, rattled, and the screen changed, depicting a distant shot of the enemy. Three explosions racked the side, brightening space until Gray had to look away for a moment. Get us back in there, Gray ordered. Open fire as soon as we're in range. Enemy shields are totally down, Ollie said. They're on auxiliary power, it looks like. Wow, those reactors really went up. Agatha, give them a chance to surrender. Gray turned in his seat. Hurry. You are ordered to surrender now and prepare to be boarded, Agatha said. Power down your weapons and heave to. Repeat, you are ordered to surrender. Ah! She cried out just as the enemy vessel exploded on their screen, turning into a molten ball, then winking out of existence. What the hell just happened? Adam asked. Ollie? Sir, they seem to have initiated a self-destruct sequence. Ollie read several things on his screen and nodded. Yes, that was all them. The damage was bad, but recoverable. Just before the explosion, I read that their weapons were offline and unavailable. I guess they didn't want to give up, Adam said. Zealots, right? Gray nodded. Search and rescue teams out in five. Let's see if any of them are left. Get our troop transports down to the surface to support our folks. Get Clea on the line again and bring our pilots back in. Time to mop this operation up and call it a day. Clea worked as fast as she could, trying desperately to ignore the gunfire barking outside. She turned down the conversation on her teammates as they fought off the invaders. Their chatter distracted her from looking through the countless archives Durant compiled. As she tapped away, she began to worry she wouldn't find what she was after. Clea, this is Agatha on the behemoth. Can you read me? I do, Clea said. But I'm a little busy right now. What's going on? We finished off the enemy ship and are sending down reinforcements to help you out. What's the situation? Grave. They sent reinforcements as well. Can you hold? They are so far, Clea replied. I'm searching for the data now. The door burst open behind her and she threw herself out of her chair just as a shot hit the wall opposite the monitors. She drew her sidearm and shoved away with her feet, aiming in the direction of the attack. Two men entered slowly, one going right and the other left. She fired, connecting with a man's knee, then shot twice more into his head. The other fired wildly but missed, his shots going high and wide. She crawled toward the door for a better angle and leaned up to take a shot. Clean miss near his back, and he fired at the table she hid behind. Dropping to her back, 
Bullets riddled the surface where she'd been moments before. Rolling to her left, she aimed while lying on her back and shot again. The man screamed and rushed the door. She fired after him but missed. He seemed to be nursing his arm as he ran, but she couldn't be sure. Clea climbed to her feet and sealed the room, locking it down before checking the man she'd shot before. He was truly dead, so she hurried back to the terminal and continued her search, trying to calm down. Her hands trembled as she typed. Are you okay? Agatha's voice reminded her she'd been in a conversation a moment before. What happened? I was just attacked, Clea replied, but I'm okay. How long before reinforcements arrive? They're already en route and will land on your position. Have them coordinate with Jenks, Clea said. That might not be the best plan. For whatever reason, we didn't use our ship in the fight, so I think they're concerned about something. Roger, over and out. Clea took a deep breath and continued working. She hoped the behemoth soldiers got there in time. So much was riding on the success of this mission, even if the data wasn't present. Durant's research alone would set them years ahead in the arms race. But if she found it, then they might be able to wrap the whole thing up. If only it will be so easy. Come on, computer. Move, move. Jenks fired again and tapped Walsh. We have to get back. Fall back to Megan and Rudy. That's going to be crazy, you know that, right? The enemy had begun laying down suppressive fire again, a wide spread of action all across the area. Bullets riddled their makeshift cover, but so far, they hadn't employed any explosives. I wonder why. Jenks didn't want to look the gift horse in the mouth, but considering the situation, it seemed suspicious. They would be overrun if they didn't get to new cover, but that meant risking being shot. His calm barked in his ear. This is Captain Hoffner. I understand you guys need some help? Jenks felt his heart hammer in his chest. Thank God. Glad to hear your voice, sir. We've got two transport shuttles with 50 men converging on your location. What's your status? Defenses are holding, but not for long, Walsh replied. We need to fall back to better cover. Enemy is about to overrun our position. Why didn't you use your ship for cover? The enemy has some kind of directed EMP weapon, Jenks replied. Could be possible to take a ship out of the air. Understood. Can we set down near your position safely? I'll give you coordinates, Jenks said. But we really need some help getting out of our current situation if you can risk it. We're on it. Stay alive, guys. Jenks looked around and gestured to the door behind them. It's only 50 meters away. Might as well be a mile, Walsh said. They'll snag us, even with cover. They're definitely going to get us here, and they aren't proving to be the best of shots. A bullet nearly caught his foot, and he pulled himself more fully behind the cover. Another scream echoed off behind their line. This time, Jesse. I've been hit. He recovered himself quickly enough, not sounding as if he'd been butchered the way Crandy carried on. Leg, I'll live. We've got a big problem, Rudy shouted. Grenade? There they are, Jenks cursed. They saved them for the buildings. Get it out of there. He heard an explosion off to his left and prayed the pilots got it out of there. Report. We're okay. Megan replied, though a fit of coughing cut off a report. Can't see a damn thing, but we're okay. For now, Rudy cried out. They're charging. Shit. Jenks turned and fired at the men he could see some 70 meters off. It caused them to divert their rush and run for the side of the building. He took two of them down before the other four made it to safety. A bullet grazed his arm and he winced, spinning to return fire. We cannot stay out here. A ship flew by overhead and another opened up with a strafing run. More cries of agony filled the air and the strange battle language continued barking back and forth. Jenks and Walsh ran for it, each dashing at a full sprint. The door loomed ahead, growing larger with every step. When he cleared it, Jenks couldn't believe his luck. He swore they'd be gunned down in the effort. Even more gunfire erupted outside, this time from the familiar rifles of their own men. Jenks glanced outside to help and saw as more than a dozen of their own took cover and laid down their own suppressive fire. The ship above flew by again, but someone took a shot at it from a shoulder-mounted weapon, a blue blast flying directly for it. 
The pilot managed to evade the attack and disappeared behind Durant's home. That was an EMP blast, Durant pointed out. If it would have hit them, we get it. Jenks aimed and fired at the guy who tried to take down the ship. He connected with his shoulder and a second burst perforated his head. The man collapsed, and as one of his friends tried to grab the weapon, Walsh blew him away. Do you have another count on these guys? There are ten left, Durant said. My turrets are overheating. Iraq shouted for help, but the cry was silenced a moment later. Jenks turned in time to see the man collapse to the ground, a wound in his head bleeding profusely. Damn it. He called out for a sound off. Megan replied, I'm okay, Rudy's down, shot to the shoulder. Durant confirmed he was still okay. Neither Crandy nor Jesse replied. Wow, this is getting worse than I thought. Jenks' arm hurt from where he'd been grazed. The wound stung and it ran up into his forearm, but he did his best to ignore it. They were on the verge of driving these pricks back. All he had to do was hold out for a few more moments and they'd win. The miracle of their reinforcements arriving saved the day, but they survived, and that was no small feat. More of the behemoth's marines came from around the corner, charging into battle and firing into the ranks of the final men. Some of them tried to flee back toward their ship, but they were pursued, cut down before they could even get back to the undamaged tree line. Jenks and Walsh joined the assault, helping to finish off the remnants. Is that all of them? Jenks shouted. Did we get them? No, Durant said. There's still one left. What? Jenks looked around. Where? Oh no, Durant sighed. He's made his way over to where Clea's performing her searches. We have to get over there. Now. Jenks slapped Walsh's arm and gestured. Move out. Now. Clea heard someone pound on the door. Three hits high, then three low. Her eyes flew over the screen. The back of her mind, praying Durant built the room to withstand a beating. Text made her gasp. A single line. Logs from the tempered steel. Zanthari on to fall. I found it. I found it. Her excitement was short-lived. An explosion shook the room and tossed her to the floor. Smoke filled the area and her ears rang from the suddenness of it. Someone entered, but she couldn't move. Couldn't make her legs respond or her muscles clench. She struggled, desperate to recover any faculty, any chance to defend herself. Her vision cleared and she saw her pistol some five feet away. Rolling on her stomach, she managed to crawl, reaching for the weapon. A blow to her side knocked the wind out of her, making her slide into the wall under the desk. She didn't have time to nurse the injury and instead pressed away, climbing to her feet unsteadily. Another attack came, this one a punch toward her face. She faded backward, narrowly avoiding the blow. In desperation, she retaliated, throwing a feeble kick. It kept her opponent back and she pressed backward, stumbling away from the assault. A weapon cocked and she dove to the ground just as the person fired, destroying a computer console behind her. Adrenaline cleared her head and granted her some strength. She crawled, scampering toward her gun. The enemy walked casually, rounding the table to get a clear shot at her. She rolled toward the console she'd been working at, once again taking herself out of the line of fire, but away from her weapon. Turning, Clea decided on another tactic. Moving toward the soldier, she climbed to her feet in a crouch and crept closer. When she saw him, he was about to turn on her. She dashed forward, grabbing his arm with the pistol and aiming it toward the ground. He peeled off several shots as she struggled to disarm him. He punched her in the face, but it wasn't enough to dislodge her. Clea smelled blood, wondered if it might be her own, then saw the man's wound, the shot to the shoulder she'd scored before he scampered out. Jamming her thumb into the injury, he screamed in agony and tried to throw her off. She clung tightly to him, grinding into the hole with all her might. A knee to her stomach made her lose some of the fight in her and he shoved her away so she collapsed on the floor. He struggled to raise his weapon, trying to point it in her direction, but the offended arm would not respond. As he switched hands, Clea rushed for her gun, diving for it just as his went off. 
Hot fire burned her leg as she rolled in place and unloaded her magazine. The man fired once more, a shot tapping the ground by her head even as he began to dance backwards from her attack. When he hit the ground, he heaved a gurgling sigh and went still. Quite dead. Clea didn't move for several moments, savoring the fact that she'd somehow survived unscathed. When she finally tried to stand, she realized he'd got her in the thigh just above the knee. The pain made her vision go dim and her stomach turn, but she fought through it, crawling back to the terminal. Blinking the blur from her eyes, she read the words on the screen, noting that she'd found her scan data, what they'd come all that way for. It was there, waiting to be downloaded and disseminated, but just then, she couldn't make any of it out. Pain overwhelmed her and she collapsed to the floor, focusing on breathing. Someone else came in the room shouting her name. She recognized them as Jenks and Walsh. I'm here, she whispered, lifting her hand. It wasn't just the gunshot, but the punch to the face, the adrenaline, the kick to her side. Everything caught up to her, and she didn't have it in her to move anymore. They came close and checked on her, applying pressure to the wound. You're going to be okay, Jenks said. Just relax, we've got you. Thanks, Clea muttered. That was pretty crazy. You sure know how to pick a mission, Walsh said. We won, by the way. Never had any doubt? Clea smiled. Well, just for a second. Be quiet. Talking's a bad idea right now. Jenks turned to Walsh. Get one of the medics in here. We have to get her somewhere more comfortable. Maybe even back to the ship. Thank God this mess is over with. But holy crap, what a rush. Is everyone else okay? Clea asked. Anyone else get hurt? Walsh cleared his throat. Crandy's in critical condition. Jesse, well, he died. Bled out, it looks like. Iraq also took one to the head and Rudy's shoulders pretty bad. I took a graze and you have the leg injury. All in all, considering the odds, we probably made out better than we deserved. Though not as we hoped. Clea sighed. Poor Jesse. He just wanted to leave that life behind. And I suppose he has. But Arak, a solid engineer, he'll be missed. I'll have to deliver the letter to his family personally. That's not going to be an easy task. Be sure to let the ship know I found what we're after. This was not for nothing. I found it. Now I just hope it pays off. Heavens, please let it pay off. Epilogue Gray left Adam in charge of the ship and went down to the planet personally with another contingency of Marines. Not a single enemy remained alive down there. None of them surrendered, and the injured ones killed themselves before they could be captured. They did manage to isolate their shuttles and confiscate their weapons, though, allowing them to do some research on this new threat. They landed in the clearing where the majority of the ground battle took place. He disembarked and made his way for the platform meeting Hoffner beside a makeshift barricade. They took a tour of the battle, briefing Gray on what happened and how the men held out. Afterward, they met Durant, who was guiding robots to help clean up the mess. I hope you'll be coming back to the fight, Gray said to the scientist. The Alliance could definitely use everything you've got. If your people hadn't been here, I'd be dead now, Durant said. They didn't hesitate to stay and protect my home. I believe I have enough of everything to help the war effort, and with what Clea discovered, I'm sure we may well end this conflict soon. You have my commitment, Captain, and the use of my facilities. Please contact the Alliance and have them send people as soon as possible. You know what Clea found? Gray asked. Durant nodded. Her dream turned out to be extraordinary. Who knows how long it would have been before I got to that particular record and discovered the hidden gem. A random storage drive from a forgotten battle didn't seem like a treasure, but it sure has proven to be one. 
I'll let her explain how. Where is she? Gray looked around. This way. Durant led the way, taking them through the foyer into a bedroom. Clea sat up on the bed, her wounded leg bandaged. She worked on a data pad, reading intently without even taking note of three people entering the room. Um, Clea, your captain is here to see you. Clea looked up and her expression melted from serious to relieved. Gray, I'm so glad to see you. You too. Looks like you've had a bit of excitement. Gray approached the bed. How are you feeling? Oh, I'll be fine. The injury isn't so bad, the medic said, but it'll take a while to heal. Clea tapped the side of her pad. I found it, Gray. I found it. Please explain why it's so exciting, Gray replied. What drove us through three systems to find? When the attack began all those years ago, I happened to be scanning the largest ship for weaknesses, a chance to get through the shields or disable systems, anything a hack might have been for. Just before we were hit and destroyed, I uncovered something far more beneficial. As you know, the enemy ignores our hails and has not communicated with us since discovery. Right? Gray nodded. Well, one of the reasons is their communications operate on a totally different technology than ours, much like that other species we discovered. Their codes are totally foreign to us. Or so we thought. I uncovered their trick. The largest ship was broadcasting and decoding at the same time. I happened upon it and recorded it. So you can talk to the enemy now? And better. Not only can we force communications and adapt our systems to tap into them, but they sent an FTL message back home. Gray frowned. Are you suggesting you know? Clea nodded. Their home world. The information was lost a long time ago. Some even said a saboteur made it happen, but regardless, we haven't had coordinates for their point of origin since first contact. Now, we do. We'll have to verify the data, Gray said. But otherwise, fantastic work. I'm sorry I doubted you. I'm sorry I gave you cause to. Clea smiled. At least it proved to be more than a random obsession. Or if it was, it paid off. Either way, discovering Durant and gaining this information will definitely make the trip worth it. The Alliance is going to benefit in a major way, and when we verify these coordinates, we can take the fight to them. Soon, Gray said. For now, we need to keep this place safe until reinforcements arrive. These weapons can't fall into the wrong hands, and now that we have them, I'm loath to leave them unguarded. Besides, you could probably use the rest planetside. Seems pretty nice out there in Durant's terraformed nature. Clea peered out the window. He definitely did a good job. Reminds me of the mountain you took me to on Earth. Good memory. Even on the verge of war, with the threat of violence, we managed to find a moment of peace. Gray leaned against the wall, peering outside. Maybe when this is all over, we'll find it again, only more permanently. There's always another challenge, Clea said. Even in times without violence, we'll create obstacles to test ourselves and push our cultures to progress. I just hope they involve exploration rather than pulse cannons. I'll second that, Clea. Gray took a deep breath and let his shoulders relax. Wholeheartedly. Artifact. Prologue. We on Sortrex loved working in the fields. He and the others watched the sunrise every morning from the best vantage their little colony offered. The golden-purple rays tickled the horizon, then cast yellow-orange rays down on the land, coating the green fields in a luxurious glow. The farmers began to consider the sun's rise a blessing and gave the moment due reverence. Dremere's hope flourished due to the hard-working citizens and abundance of natural resources. Native wildlife didn't cause any problems, and they were able to carve out not only a decent life, but a lucrative one. 
trade with other colonies around the planet, and even beyond the solar system, gave them enough money to contend on the galactic trading ring. And Rian's favorite part of that was he could still live a simple life, far from the rigors and toils of Keelan society. After his mandatory government service, he felt more than ready to depart the fast-paced lifestyle of his people and live somewhere calmer. Dremere's hope was still a young colony, and as a result, it hadn't become too high-tech. Once it did, he knew it would follow in the footsteps of other places throughout Alliance space. Cities would eventually come along, and with them, off-worlders would seek residence. Businesses would come, and even his days of farming would end. It might not happen within his lifetime, but he studied such progress in school. Every colony aspired to be great. Rian also found many people of his mindset constantly moved. The nomadic lifestyle didn't appeal to him. He wanted a home, a place he could eventually raise a family. Space travel to the next rigorous unknown terrain did not appeal to him. No, he'd retire when the big companies took over rather than try to find another berth. They began to toil, preparing the plot for the next crop they planned. Weon attended school for agriculture, and though he stood side by side with men and women who didn't truly know their work, he planned it all. His schedule allowed one field to lay fallow while another be used. His education made this place work, and he shared his ideas and suggestions with the other colonies around the planet. By mid-morning, his muscles just started complaining about the rigorous activity. Their break was coming soon, but until then... They had too much to do to slow down. His mind wandered back to working in the capital, and he compared it to his current activity. Always moving forward, always doing something. The difference there involved being in the city. He recognized colony living still required a lot of activity, but the big difference came down to the rewards of a simple schedule. He worked the fields for the first part of his day, then spent a few hours in his office going over the crop schedule and ensuring they had all the supplies they needed to be effective farmers. When he worked in the military, he had 15 different meetings a day, plus a full-time job to do. It was untenable and made his hair go gray on the sides. Not a day went by that he enjoyed his work in the capital, and he still had nightmares from time to time about some of the worst days. Someone began shouting from some distance off. Weon ignored it at first, but when the screams drew closer and more insistent, he finally looked up. No one cried out like that on the farm unless someone was dreadfully hurt, and injury was a distinct possibility. Weon handed his rake off to one of the others and met the young man at the edge of the field. Drea Orn Evra was no more than sixteen, his mother acted as administrator for the whole colony. She descended from Dremir, who founded the place. Drea bent at the waist, unable to speak through his panting. When he finally could communicate, he gestured wildly backward. Taran's Peak was attacked! Weon's blood ran cold. Attacked? By what? What are you talking about? Pirates or raiders, something. They came down from the sky and assaulted the colony. We received a distress call which went out to the Alliance. Mother told me to gather everyone and get to the shelters because they are likely headed this way. Everyone? Weon shouted. Let's go. We need to get to the shelters immediately. Questions came his way, most of them asking why and what was happening. He informed them as they hustled back to the colony proper. We should arm ourselves someone said. If they come here, we're going to want to shoot back. Good idea, Weon replied. I'm sure they've opened the armory. We'll go there first, then get to the shelters. Maybe we'll be lucky. They heard the turbines of a starship far off in the distance. The sound filled Weon with adrenaline, and he knew from experience on the capital they had less than ten minutes before the attackers arrived. Hurry! He broke into a sprint, his tired muscles forgotten. Security, the four of them that were there, issued handguns and rifles before pointing them in the direction of the shelter. Each man and woman made their way there and held up, aiming weapons at the door. Weon shook. He'd never been in combat before, 
and the thought of firing a gun at another person terrified him. Even during basic training, he'd been terrible with conflict. His instructors accepted his request to be in administration because they believed he would have died in combat. Now I get to find out if that's true. Why would they come here? The engines approached and they heard something land outside, not even 300 yards away. Men's voices filled the air, speaking a strange language Weon never heard before. They heard a scream, one of their own, and Weon cursed loudly. Who did we leave behind? Did we not perform a roll call? Before anyone could answer, they heard a gun go off and someone cry out. Three more shots silenced them all as they held their breath, shocked to have witnessed, even through a wall, the end of a life. What monsters had come to their doorstep? What fiends wanted to bring death to their little colony? Weon knew in his heart they were about to find out. He pulled out his personal computer and set it to record, hiding it in the back of the room. There, half buried under debris from when they dug the place out, he hoped it might capture something if they all perished at the hands of these scum. He hoped otherwise, but realism weighed heavy on his shoulders. The next twenty minutes would determine, one way or another. Pulse blasts annihilated the communications array, turning it into a smoldering ruin after a single pass. Soldiers spilled out of the shuttle, moving swiftly door to door, looking for the colonists in the place called Dremere's Hope. They didn't find them immediately, but took over the command center, a place attached to the now ruined tower, which could have sent messages to the buoys orbiting the planet. From there, these wretches might have even warned the Alliance, but Krelon Arvax ensured the orbital rays had been taken offline. He understood the protocols of these people, knew their weaknesses as well as their strengths. The colonies they tried to protect held no chance against his well-trained, fanatical force. Farmers and engineers could not put up a meaningful fight. He disembarked the ship last, surveying the small town center as his men looted technology and searched for the inhabitants. No ships had taken off, so Creelon knew they were there somewhere. He just needed to find them. One of them would have information he needed, and they'd talk regardless of what it took. Creelon wore his black hair long and tied back in a ponytail. Jade green eyes carried steel in them, an uncompromising glint refusing any mercy or kindness. He remained lean from hard work and a restricted diet. Every man serving him knew he could take them in one-on-one -on -one combat, and he reminded them from time to time with duels and practice. He wore a black uniform with red piping. Black pants matched the top, tucked into tall boots. A pistol rode low on his right leg and a knife rested at the small of his back. Those under his command carried rifles and other technology, but he only needed the two small weapons in the event of close quarters fighting. Bombs started to go off as the homes were leveled. Such tactics would terrify the hiding cowards further making them pliable when they were finally located. Creelon turned his gaze toward the fields where they grew their food, wondering if they might have tried to make it on foot, to escape into the wilds between colonies. One of his fighters flew by overhead, sending information back to his wrist-mounted computer with an update to their search progress. No civilians were found moving about above ground. They were all in the colony somewhere, keeping a low profile. Perhaps they even set a trap. Creelon issued an order for his people to be cautious. I doubt these peasants have such foresight in them, but if they do, I won't let my people die to some ridiculous booby trap. Three gunshots went off, and Creelon moved toward the direction. A bleeding corpse sat in the dirt, face down. One of his men stood over him, checking to ensure the colonist was dead. Creelon sighed. Sometimes my men are more loyal than competent. The unarmed fool on the ground did not need to be killed. Not yet. Why is this man dead? Creelon asked. My lord, the man he knew as Relas spoke up. He was running. I took a shot at him and got lucky. 
Creelon's brows lifted. I see. Then you fired twice more. He moved? You realize we're here to question people, yes? How do you consider yourself lucky when you removed one of our only leads as to the whereabouts of these colonists? Um. Rilas stood at attention, his expression twisting in worry. I meant to say, my shot went high and hit him in the spine. He died instantly. A better report. Creelon shook his head, crouching beside the body. He checked the man over, rifling his pockets, but found nothing. Keep searching and try not to shoot more unarmed people until we've talked to them. Yes, my lord. The zeal in which his people served him worked out quite well, but occasionally they allowed their passion to get the better of them. He had been working on discipline, getting them into line, but for the time being, some still acted out of emotion. Eventually it would stop. They went through much to become better soldiers. Creelon turned again to the fields and looked out over the horizon. Years ago, before he started his army, he grew up in such a place. His family owned property much like what he stood upon. As a child, he remembered running through tall grass, the warmth of sun on his face. He gave it all up for a life in space, one of duty. And he continued to express his duty as a military man, a representative of a new order come to cleanse the universe in all its decadence and violent glory. Eventually, all would be subjugated into following orders and living in peace, but until then, they would wallow in the filth of their false doctrines, ridiculous religions, and pathetic militaries. And when I control our old enemy, my time will come. My lord, another soldier, this time Pliaris, shouted, We've found the colonists. They've taken refuge in some type of shelter. Very well. Creelon followed him to a large door set against a rock wall burrowing directly into the ground. His men surrounded the area, their weapons aimed at the portal waiting for others. He approached, standing to the side to address those within. Citizens of Dramir's Hope, my name is Creelon Arvax of the Orion's Light. We have much to discuss. You murdered our man, a muffled woman's voice shouted from the other side. It grated on Creelon's nerves. Outspoken females needed to be silenced, and if the director of this place happened to be of the weaker gender, he would ensure she understood what that meant. The door is locked and we are well armed. If you attempt to enter, we will kill you. I see, Creelon replied. Who am I addressing? Alavia Orn Evra, director of this settlement. Alavia. Let me tell you how this is going to play out. My men are going to plant explosives on this door. We will then park our shuttle directly outside and detonate it. All those within who aren't killed by the blast will then be annihilated by pulse blasts from our ship. You can fire all you like, but your weapons won't be enough to penetrate our shields. Is this the blaze of glory you wish to die in, or would you rather speak with us as civilized people might? How do I know you won't kill us the moment we surrender? You don't, Creelon said. But I think I've made it clear what happens if you resist. Take a chance, or ensure your end. Those are your choices. You have ten seconds to decide, starting now. He nodded to one of his men who began to install the explosives they promised. The sounds of the magnetics tapping the door would jar the spirits of those within. The people started to speak loudly as panic gripped the colonists. The director would surrender at any moment. Before even seven seconds passed, she shouted out for them to stop. We give up. We are dropping our weapons and will relinquish ourselves to your custody, but you must not hurt anyone. As I'm sure you're aware, prisoners have rights. I'm aware, Creelon replied. But I don't trust you. Open the door only partially and begin putting your weapons out. We will then scan the room, and if anyone in there is armed, everyone dies. Do you understand? We do. 
then proceed. The door opened and guns were tossed out. Most of them were ancient, antiques. Krelon's men collected them, putting each well away from the colonists. When they stopped coming out, one of his men performed a scan and nodded. They're clean. They then opened the door the rest of the way and brought the colonists out with their hands raised above their heads. Krelon stepped in after they all left and looked around. The shelter was little more than a storage chamber emptied out. They couldn't have weathered much in there. No food, no water, and only the weapons they brought to defend themselves. This was a place for the truly desperate. He shook his head and returned to look over his prisoners. Men, women, and children were lined up, each bound at the wrists by his men. He looked them over, scanning each face. None of them met his eyes but for a defiant teenager, a young man no more than nineteen at the oldest. Conscript him. He's got some spirit. What? An older woman spoke up. No, he's my son. Please don't take him. What army are you with? What is this? You can't just kidnap a man. Someone slapped her hard enough to knock her on the ground. Her son charged over to her side, dropping beside her, calling out to see if she was all right. Krelon gave him a count of three and looked at one of his soldiers. I believe I gave an order. Did I not? Two people grabbed the boy and dragged him over to the shuttle, roughing him up as they went. Take any other young man as well. None of them will know anything anyway. The colonists began to get vocal at that point, shouting at them. Krelon waited until the youngsters were safely aboard before he drew his pistol. The sight of the weapon silenced the others and he paced up and down their rank. I appreciate you deciding to still your tongues. I'd like to address you all now. I'm looking for something and I want your help to find it. We don't know anything, a woman cried. Why are you doing this? You don't even know what I'm asking, Creelon sneered. You will speak when addressed, otherwise remain silent. I will execute the next person who speaks out of turn. Now, I need a map, and it is on this planet. It leads to a monastery far from here with an artifact I need to take custody of. Who here is the custodian of this star chart? No one replied. Creelon figured they might not, but someone on this rock would. He cocked his weapon to emphasize how serious he was. Where is Director Orn Evra? The older woman stepped forward. I am. Creelon scowled at her, another proud woman flouting her power over men. He took aim and fired, catching her in the temple. Blood sprayed out the side of her head as her body collapsed to the ground dead. The others screamed and had to be contained by his soldiers. He turned to the others and cleared his throat. Do I have your attention? Someone knows where my map is and I will kill each and every one of you until I'm convinced that person is dead or they have spoken. Choose now. Sir. A man stepped forward. These people are simple farmhands. They're colonists. They don't know anything about star charts. Each of them was specially trained to do a job to make this planet habitable. They aren't here hiding anything, I assure you. What's your name? Creelon asked. And how do you know? My name is Weon Sotrex. I served in the Alliance military for my mandatory period before coming here. I'm an agricultural specialist, but worked in naval admin. Believe me, I know these people are unaware of what you're after. I promise. You offer a compelling story, Weon. Creelon considered the man for a time, really scrutinizing him. You intrigue me. Do you believe telling me this will spare the people here? Of course. There's no reason to hurt them now. Weon seemed as if the answer were obvious. Creelon smirked. Naval admin. Creelon rubbed his chin with his free hand. Do you remember the penalty for harming civilians? I do. 
Weon replied. Dishonorable discharge, life in prison or possible execution depending on what the soldier did. Very good. Krilon nodded. Take this man to the ship with the others. I'd like to speak with him some more. Sir, he's too old for the conscript program. Did I say you were conscripting him? Krilon glared at his subordinate. And did I invite a conversation? No, sir, right away. Weon struggled at first. Wait, where are you taking me? Be grateful, Krilon said. I just saved your life. Saved my... Wait, no! Krilon nodded to his men and they opened fire on the crowd, mowing down the women, children, and remaining men. Weon continued to scream even as they dragged him aboard the vessel. The soldiers finished off the wounded and went back to their tasks of looting the colony, taking anything technological. Krilon gazed over the carnage and gave the order to ensure no building was left standing. He then boarded the shuttle and took the co-pilot's seat. They'd move on to the next colony now and the next. Someone on that rock would be able to answer his question, and if not, then he'd find another way to locate the object. Orion's light would light the way for a better tomorrow, even if Krelon had to kill 10,000 civilians to get there. Chapter 1 Commander Adam Everly went over the after-action reports from their most recent mission. As the Earthship Behemoth made its way back to the Alliance capital, he wanted to ensure he had a proper report prepared for the captain, who would then have to speak to the military council. Not all of the information would be complimentary. The Behemoth's presence in a seemingly out-of-the-way sector uncovered a pirate operation the Alliance had been tracking for quite a while. Keelan forces, loyal more to their own military structure than the human commanders on board the ship, informed their superiors of the location. This nearly cost the mission, as the pirates were stirred up like hornets fleeing a burning hive. If they would have given the behemoth the time they asked for, a full-scale battle wouldn't have been necessary, not to mention hours wasted ensuring they caught every vessel trying to leave the sector. Adam considered it all to be quite the start for their first foray as a joint force with the aliens, and not really in a good way. He compiled a list of the refugees they took on and the technology recovered from the surface with the Keelans. Compiling it into a higher-level view, he sent it off to Captain Gray Atwell and turned his attentions to daily operations. The ship survived a major conflict with a group of terrorists known as Orion's Light. They only required minimal repairs, but the enemy weapon proved quite dangerous. A beam weapon which annihilated shields and could easily cut through a hull, this, to Adam, constituted a more immediate threat than the enemy they were working so hard to track down and face. Clea on Tufal, their liaison with the Keelan people, essentially discovered what they might need to take the fight to their enemy's doorstep, but Adam knew the military. They wouldn't launch an immediate attack, but rather gather data and intel. Before any ship was committed to a conflict, a full battle plan would be created with every leader having their chance to put in some feedback. Many soldiers would want the glory of ending the age-long war, and as a result, a lot of egos would be in one room. It might constitute another front, they'd be so intense. Regardless, Adam felt thankful he didn't have to attend one of those high-level meetings. He knew the behemoth would end up in that fight, taking it to the enemy as he always wanted, but this would be different. Their success or failure would determine the fate of the free galaxy. Earth and all the other Alliance capitals would survive or die, depending on how the fight went. Clea gave them this chance through her lucky memory, essentially a dream of a forgotten moment in a battle that almost took her life. The data she'd collected before her vessel went down held more than some flight patterns and coded communications— Strictly by chance, she found the nearly gibberish communication between their capital ship and their home world, essentially uncovering a way to talk to them and where they lived. The path to gather this data took them to a remote planet where Durant Vipurin lived, an engineer of some renown and a brilliant craftsman. He turned over everything he built to the Alliance and granted them access to his automated foundry, a situation which allowed robots to essentially churn out weapons at an alarming rate. 
This boon helped shove the Alliance forward in their war effort and brought Durant back into the fight. He accompanied the behemoth back to the capital and had already offered up several design ideas to optimize operations aboard the ship. Adam read through some of his recommendations and had to admit, the man knew his stuff. Taking down the pirates, locating Durant and the information, and uncovering the weapons foundry made certain their hunch mission would be lauded as highly successful. Adam was happy for Clea, because had that turned out to be a bust, High Command likely would have given them grief over hopping all over the place. After all, they had plenty of other operations to conduct. This whim may have cost them, if not for all they found. The overhead comm speakers chimed, and Ensign Agatha White's voice spoke softly a moment later. Please note, we will be jumping back into Keelan space in the next ten minutes. Secure what you're doing and ensure you are strapped in. We will send another reminder at the five-minute mark. Adam donned his jacket and prepared to head for the bridge. His shift began in a half hour, so he figured he may as well show up early. He preferred to be out of his office or room when they performed jumps, mostly because he didn't want to associate the discomfort with one of his leisure spaces. He stepped into the hallway and made his way to the elevator, having to wait for a good two minutes before it arrived. People must have been rushing about, preparing for their departure from the system. Alliance ships outside surrounded Durant's planet and ensured that it was secure. They stationed a massive military force on the ground and ensured all orbital defenses were ready for any attacks. Durant also installed distant early warning signs. On the edge of the system, probes sent back images of any ship jumping into the sector to prepare defenses if necessary. The Alliance would make use of those, tying the feeds directly into the ships surrounding the system. Technicians and colonists were expected to arrive to occupy the place, turning it into a technological center. The hermit days of Durant were certainly behind him. Adam heard the next message about their jump from Agatha as he rode the elevator up. Just before they left, the ship would inform their tech officer if anyone was stuck in a lift and give them a chance to get off. They hadn't experienced it before. Most people didn't want to risk riding out a jump on one of those, even if it had stopped. Faster than light travel proved to be better after they altered and optimized the jump drive, but the first few were rocky. And when someone sabotaged it, they all nearly died. Adam might never forget the physical punishment he experienced after that, and considering where they ended up, None of them had a chance to recover before being thrown into action. The elevator opened and he stepped down the short hallway to the bridge. Quiet talking filled the room along with computer beeps and indicators. Captain Atwell read through reports on his computer. Clea stood beside Lieutenant Oliver Darnell, pointing at the screen. Lieutenant Commander Stephanie Redding occupied the pilot's seat beside Ensign Leonard Marcus, the navigator. Ensign White took the communications station behind the captain. How's it going? Adam asked as he took his seat. We good? Gray nodded. Everything's green. Durant took a look at the engineering section and seemed shocked we were using out-of-date scan tech down there. He's got a whole upgrade plan mapped out for when we get back to the capital. How long will those take? He claims he can have people fix everything up inside a couple days at the most. Gray shrugged. Maybe less if he's given the proper resources. Engineers love to change things, right? I hope command gives us the time. How necessary do his suggestions sound? The scans would allow us to speed up jump times, ensure we catch any glitches long before they're about to happen, and monitor every system in real time. Gray finally looked up from his computer. I found out we've got a short two-second delay on our current setup. Ollie didn't even realize it. How'd we miss that? I'm pretty sure people were under the impression two seconds was more than sufficient. Gray shook his head. According to Durant, that's nonsense. But I'll tell you this, I'd be surprised if any of the Alliance ships in the fleet have better right now. He's working up a proposal for every ship to get a retrofit on that design. I'm nervous about the idea that jump technology is so twitchy we have to worry about a two-second delay while monitoring it. Adam grinned. But then again, I guess it's fitting, considering we're dealing with technology that shouldn't be possible. 
Risk and reward. Gray turned to Ollie. Are we clear for launch, Ollie? Yes, sir, Ollie replied. Elevators cleared, all sections report green. Clea returned to her seat and strapped in. You heard him, Redding, Gray said. Initiate the jump. The ship seemed to warble around them, space outside blurred, and a moment later, they were elsewhere. Their first jump left them all feeling strange, giving them a sense of weightlessness. Some crew members reported hallucinations for the few moments it took to complete the maneuver. After upgrades and cleanup, they practically felt nothing. It simply happened, and they were at their destination. Adam checked, and in this case, they were on the outskirts of the Keelan home system with a six-hour flight time to make dock. He turned to Gray. Either we're getting better at those, or our technology is simply improving. Both, I think. Gray unstrapped himself and stood. All right, everyone, let's get moving. Keep on comms and ensure we stay out of everyone's way. We've got a lot to do when we get there. Commander Everly will brief you on your duties while I'm reporting into high command. Clea, if you could come with me, I'd like a word in my office. Adam, you have the bridge. Thank you, sir. Adam nodded and quickly took in the current duty roster and read through the major projects happening during his shift. He skimmed for any blockages and requests for help, and when he didn't find any, he turned his attention to their course. Ensign Marcus had proved to be a solid choice, and his numbers looked solid. Looks like all I need to do is be available for a while. Could be worse. This might be the only downtime I get on this bridge. I guess I'll catch up on some work then. Gray gestured for Clea to have a seat and offered her a cup of tea. They each indulged a sip before he considered the topic he'd brought her in to discuss. Durant might well make a huge difference for the Alliance, but how long would he stay? Did he intend to see the war through, or would he become quickly disillusioned by military protocol? How do you feel? I'm fine, Clea replied. The doctor cleared me for active duty, after all. Good. I didn't call you in here for that. I'm curious about Durant. What do you think of his... dedication? After he saw the data I found, he seemed fully committed to helping, Clea said. He's been trying to find a way to end the war for some time now. I think we've given him the chance to do so. Providing high command proves they're also interested in finishing this, he'll do whatever it takes to support us. He's already offered a lot of good suggestions for the behemoth. I can't wait to see what else he's got in mind. Exactly. His discoveries and technical genius have pushed us forward many times in the past. This situation, finding him working on weapons, only contributes further to our cause. Believe me, if anyone can help us gain an edge with technology, it's Durant. We just left him on his own without guidance for several years. You can't buy the type of inspiration he found. Good. I received a message as soon as we made it into the system. One of Earth's representatives has arrived and is taking their place on the Council. Apparently we've got a message waiting for them, and the Council in general has an urgent problem they're hoping we can help with. No rest, huh? I wonder what it could be. We're on the verge of finishing the war. What could they possibly want us to do but stand down and wait for analysis of our data? Gray shrugged. Must be something big. Perhaps more pirates? Clea frowned. After taking them out on that planet, I can't imagine there are more out there waiting to cause trouble. Not so quickly, at least. No, it must be something else. I'm thinking unrest. Perhaps a rebellion. Though no one's done so for many years, I'd be surprised by that, too. I'm glad to hear it. The last mission I want to undertake is quelling a civilian uprising. No one comes away clean from those. Can we reach out to them now? Perhaps they'll brief us while we're underway. Gray shook his head. Afraid not. They made it clear they would only discuss it in person. They're not entirely sure of the security of our communications. Tech officers are working on changing all the codes and clearing the channels. That's why I thought pirates at first. They might have some good hackers. If they're worried about our comms, then I'd guess military problems. Perhaps even a defector. Clea's eyes narrowed. They might have our protocols memorized and be able to direct a particularly gifted tech to uncover any attempts to cover them up. Again, we haven't had such a thing in a while. 
This intrigues me, but I have to admit, I'm worried. Unknowns are good for putting one on edge. Anyway, we'll be there in just under six hours and we can talk to the folks then. You and Durant will come with. Yes, sir. You know, Gray cleared his throat. We've been so busy I didn't have the opportunity to thank you for everything. You did great on that last mission, even as you rushed into some of the most dangerous situations we've experienced. Great work. Seriously. Thank you, Captain. Clea nodded her head. I appreciate it, but honestly, the whole thing could be considered selfish. After all, I felt tortured by not knowing. Finding that data meant a lot to me. I'm free of it now, and know what happened all those years ago. I'm not crazy, and knowing that means a great deal. I imagine. I'm glad your previous experience paid off. Gray stood. I think I'm going to catch a little downtime before we arrive. I recommend the same. People may have a lot of questions for you when we get there, especially as they try to understand our data. Indeed. Fortunately, we didn't transmit it if our comms are compromised. Durant insisted on keeping it on his external drive, too, so at least we're safe from any prying eyes. Good thinking on his part. Do you think he'll be able to help the techs secure our channels? Clea shrugged. I honestly don't know all the things Durant can do. There seems to be no limit to his talents, at least in the technology field. However, he's primarily focused on getting our ships ready for fighting. I doubt he'll want the distraction at this point. He's been reading our schematics of modern hull design, and I know he was scoffing at some of our decisions. Ah, the criticisms of geniuses, huh? They really do like to give their successors a hard time, especially if they don't perform up to the standards they set. Gray opened the door. Let's meet up a half hour before we make orbit. We can go over our reports, then head down together. Sounds good, sir. I'll talk to you later. Clea paused. Thank you for trusting me. On our last mission, I know how it all sounded, and you still gave me the benefit of the doubt. I won't forget it. You've been invaluable to this ship and crew, Gray replied. Part of my job as a leader is to trust the people under my command. If they come to me with as much conviction as you did... I'd have been a fool to ignore it. Get some rest. We'll talk again later. They parted ways and Gray returned to his quarters, flopping on the bed. He risked a great deal when he brought Clea's request to the Earth Council, but it paid off in the end. He believed in her, but doubt nibbled his mind when they started. When they spoke to High Command, they'd likely say the same. Pragmatists always found the negative side of a situation, even when the results were overwhelmingly positive. It was how a man could win a battle and still receive a reprimand. In this case, Clea had an advantage, though. The data she uncovered may end a conflict that went on for longer than Gray could even imagine. That had to count for something, and Gray planned to ensure it did. Gray, Clea, and Durant met with the Council, discussing the latest mission from a high-level view. There were several questions involving the pirate base, mostly to understand the operation and how the untimely involvement of the Keelan military caused them some trouble. Gray expressed his opinion that it would be wise to coach some trust into the various captains rather than have them second-guessing fellow commanders. His criticism was met with surprisingly positive responses, even from the military high command. When they finished... They directed Gray and Clea to speak with the War Council while Durant stayed behind for further discussion. Back in the hallway, Gray waited for them to be out of earshot before he spoke. That went better than I anticipated? They know when to listen to a good commander, Clea replied. I've heard far worse come from captains during after-action reports. Wow, I can't imagine. Don't try. Some of them are embarrassing, Clea grinned. Anyway, the War Council is on level seven. Let's get going. They took an elevator down and found their way to a massive room guarded by over a dozen soldiers. After their credentials were cleared, they were allowed entrance and stepped in to see holographic displays of star maps and systems from all over the galaxy. Men and women moved about, pulling data from computers and organizing action plans. An older man Gray hadn't met yet approached. 
Captain Atwell, I presume? Indeed. Gray shook his head. Pleased to meet you, um... Arthur Day Valence Toxpre, at your service. Gray knew Atha Day basically meant admiral to the Keelans. They didn't have many higher ranks than that, so this man likely oversaw most of the military operations, or at least had his hand in many of them. As a result, his most likely peer in the Earth military structure may have been someone on the Chief of Military Operations staff. Thank you for coming. We understand you've got some kind of urgent request? Gray said. Oh, do you know my liaison officer, Clea Antufal? Yes, we've met. Valence shook Clea's hand. It's been a long time, Suantar. It has. Clea turned to Gray. Our families have been close for many years. Perfect, Gray nodded. Okay, so what's going on? We have studied your briefing, Valence replied. The people you fought out at Durant's planet are a group called Orion's Light. We thought they might simply be some fringe group unworthy of concern, but they've managed to elevate themselves on the severity list. They're attacking colonies now, conscripting people and murdering civilians. Few have escaped so far. Gray frowned. That's awful. How many ships could they possibly have? How organized are they? Or, I suppose I should just ask, what do we know about them? Not as much as we'd like, but we are aware they command a fleet rivaling some of our smaller, better established allies. Their structure seems to follow a modified form of our own according to the witnesses we've got. They have no mercy and adhere to a doctrine of religious zeal. Honestly, your assessment from the pirate you captured has given us most of our data. Gray winced. I hope he can help more. He was hurt pretty bad during the assault with those guys. We brought back as much of their technology as we could— their weapons mostly, but they seem to have been stolen. And they blew up their ships. Yes, they're quite insane. Valence shook his head. And it gets worse. We believe they may have hit a planet we recently colonized. It's several parsecs away, but they've lost all communication with them. They missed three check-ins. All the settlements, I mean. You believe Orion's Light attacked them? Clea frowned. To what end? I'm sure I don't have to say anything could have happened to those settlements. You're quite right. But if they did, then they're on some kind of rampage. It will be the sixth planet they've assaulted in less than a month. They move swiftly and kill any survivors. I'm sure we can look into it, Gray replied. But I'd have to speak to my government first. Your representative has given us leave to task you with this. Valence tapped his tablet. I've sent you the orders from your people. Gray checked, running them through the security analyzer. Once it came back as authentic, he nodded. Good enough for me. When do we start? As soon as you offload your passengers, technology, and are resupplied. No more than 24 hours. We need to move quickly to avoid another attack. Valence stepped closer, lowering his voice. These attacks combined with the enemy are putting many people on edge. Some are on the verge of panic and we must avoid that at any cost. Of course, Gray turned to Clea. We'll get underway as soon as possible. Sir, Clea said, I need to deliver a letter to the family of someone who was killed in action during our operation. May I have your leave to do so? I'll take the responsibility, Clea. Valence smiled sadly. They'll consider it quite the honor if I make the delivery in person. Thank you, sir. I'm sure they will. Valence looked between them both. I'm providing you with all the intel we've got so far. It'll be mailed to you shortly. Please disseminate it to your crew and specialists, then report back anything you find. Thank you, Captain Atwell. We appreciate your service. The two men saluted one another in the earthway before Clea and Gray stepped out of the room. Orion's light, Gray hummed. I'm surprised we're faced with some fringe group of anarchists. How can they possibly be organized enough to cause these problems? Never underestimate small forces, Clea replied. I believe you taught me that when we were discussing some of the guerrilla tactics of forces on Earth. True, Gray shook his head. And these folks must be just like them. We'll have to discover why they're attacking our people before we can really do anything to stop them. This may prove more challenging than a frontal assault. 
Investigations and mysteries usually are. Kriya's calm started blaring and she checked. Odd. Durant wishes to see us. He's with the Earth representative. He states that it's important and that we should get over there right away. Well, by all means, let's not keep Durant waiting. Gray chuckled. He's pretty feisty, huh? Yes, it is his reputation. Clea scowled. I can't imagine what he might want with us, especially when we're on the verge of getting out of here. Let's try to ensure he speaks quickly, because if we get caught up in some lecture of his, then we'll be here all night. I, for now, need time to study our intel. You probably have good cause to worry. Gray patted her shoulder as they walked. The poor bastard spent all that time alone in the wilderness with only robots for company. I wouldn't be surprised if he wanted to talk all day long. He could do that when he was amongst others every day, Clea pointed out. Imagine how much it may have been compounded. Not filling me with hope, Clea. Gray boarded the elevator. Let's see what the genius wants. Chapter 2 Clea primarily knew Durant by reputation only, just as every other Keelan with an interest in technology might. He brought about a number of key innovations their people enjoyed, both for luxury and the military. When he left, the vast majority of average people had no idea, but tech journals wrote extensively about the loss. While they prepared to head back to the capital, Clea had an opportunity to speak with him privately. They talked while she recovered and the others secured the planet while waiting for reinforcements. She found him as brilliant as reputed, but still a person. The legend built up about him didn't match the Keelan with emotions and frustrations who spoke freely with his guest. Durant fell easily into the role of teacher, but also knew when to back off. He proved to be quite impressed with her discovery of the enemy's codes and home planet location, enough so that he took an active interest in her career. They spoke extensively about her family and goals, education and aspirations, he felt the liaison position was wasted on her, which was one of the few points they disagreed on. When they finally went back to the behemoth, she had recovered enough to return to duty, and Durant went about observing the ship, making his recommendations while assisting with minor tweaks to optimize systems. She looked forward to talking with him again, but it looked as if it might not be possible. As soon as they returned home, they'd be off in a lab someplace, providing upgrades to weapon systems. The summons to talk with him and the Earth representative seemed odd, unless he had some new technology he wanted them to test. This made sense to her, and she could understand why they'd all have to meet, considering what sort of permission they would need to modify the behemoth in any dramatic manner. Clea led Gray to the conference room, where they were supposed to meet, and upon entering, Durant and an older human male stood, greeting them with smiles. The Earth representative stepped forward and offered his hand to Gray. Captain Atwell, I'm so glad to meet you. My name is Riley Porter. Good to meet you, Gray replied. This is Sue Anthar Clea Antufal. She's our liaison with the Keelans. A pleasure, really. Riley shook her hand as well. I believe you both know Durant Vipurin? Yes, yes, we all know each other, Durant interrupted. We have much to discuss, and I believe these two have little time before departure. Let's talk quickly, shall we? I'm curious what this is about, Gray said. Besides meeting you, I'd anticipated a trip back to Earth, to be honest. We have a lot to tell home. I've sent the report, Riley replied. I also spoke with our leaders and convinced them to assign you to this new mission. As you may or may not know, the Earth now has ample protection. Keelan war vessels are erecting orbital defense stations in several locations, not to mention two more of our own ships are on the verge of completion. Durant stepped in. My advances in automation and fabrication have also provided your people with a swifter path toward the construction of vessels. I estimate that when we get these in place, you will have your own fleet in full production in less than a month. As resources pour in, you should have enough ships to protect your system and participate in the galactic theater. But for now, Gray asked, we're supposed to be the shield of our solar system? We've taken care of that, Riley said. Three Keelan ships are there now. The behemoth's sister ship is done, and they're igniting the core this week. 
They've been training the crew for some time, and a few of your seasoned officers will train the trainers. Smaller ships are also underway, scouts and the like carrying more firepower than any of our others in the past. We're well defended now, Captain Atwell, but this threat we're facing needs to be addressed. You guys know that they were pretty devastating to our shields, Gray said. They almost prevailed in a head-to-head -head fight. Durant nodded. That's why I've convinced the Council to let me come with you. Clea lifted her brows and looked at Gray. She spoke first. I'm surprised they're letting you. Is that wise? You need someone who can adjust the shield matrix to match those weapons. I know how they built them, and I'm certain I can provide us an edge against them. Durant shrugged. This means I need to come with you and provide that support in person. I believe I'm the most qualified for the job anyway. My technical expertise is not surpassed by anyone. How did you get them to let you go? Gray asked. I can't let that point go. They didn't have a choice. I gave them all my schematics and directed them to find a particular group of scientists to start studying them. When we get back, I'll help. But I need some field time if I'm to be truly effective. They understand my wishes, but they weren't happy, as you can guess. I'm sure, Gray smirked. Okay, so you're going to come with us to take down the Orion's Light, or at least figure out what they're up to and stop them. That's how I interpret the orders. He turned to Riley. Am I right? Riley nodded. You are indeed. This is a benefit to all our people and our new alliance as well. One day, we'd like to colonize planets outside our solar system, and we don't need thugs killing our people in the process. This is important, Captain, and I will be honest, I pushed hard for us to be the ones to take care of it. More favors? Exactly, Riley said. The more we've done for them, the better position we have for asking for things. Your ship is proving to be most effective, and the more we can leverage you, the more we can ask for. They already owe us in a major way for what we've done. Imagine what this will do for us. When are we going to take the fight to the enemy? Clea asked. After the data we recovered, I thought more people would be talking about that. Ah, Durant cleared his throat. We are still working on a strategy for how to verify the data and not get caught. We need to be cautious. Intelligence is light in that sector you uncovered. Read as non-existent. When we gather what we need, make no mistake that we'll be bringing the fight to their doorstep en masse. But for now, we have immediate threats to deal with. Clea nodded her head. Of course. Thank you. I guess you should find your way aboard the behemoth, Gray said. We'll get you clearance, which I assume Riley's taken care of. I have, Riley smiled. Everything's ready to go. You just have to ensure you're resupplied and have whatever Durant needs to do his job properly. I've made a list and it's all being loaded up in a supply shuttle now, Durant said. I'll head there to oversee their progress. Then I'll meet you on the ship in, say, six hours? Sounds good to us. Gray turned to Clea. We have a little time if you want to get something to eat. We'll head back up after lunch. Certainly. Clea turned to the others. It was nice to meet you, Mr. Porter. Talk to you later, Durant. You as well, Clea. Have a pleasant afternoon. Back on the elevator, they found themselves alone. Clea stared hard at the door, feeling thoughtful. Gray touched her shoulder startling her from her reverie. She looked up at him without speaking, waiting to see what he wanted. After a moment of observation, he finally cleared his throat. Something's wrong. No, I'm just thinking about this mission. The Orion's light people didn't even hesitate to kill themselves. That's a kind of zeal I find abhorrent. It's so wasteful. We know about that kind of fighting, Gray sighed. I'm curious what drives them to it. That'll be part of this mission, discovering their motivation. I have a feeling we're stepping into something pretty big here, something no one is anticipating. I hope Durant's up to the task of helping us too, because those weapons are scary. Clea nodded. Countering them would be a trick. Especially when they didn't have prototypes even to work with. If Durant could replicate them in theory, then they might be able to adjust their defenses. 
She began to work through how when the elevator opened and they headed down to the cafeteria. There, she began playing out equations in her head, but Gray finally interrupted her with a nudge. Whatever you're thinking about can wait. We'll be busy enough soon. You don't have to lose yourself in work while we're having a moment off. I'm sorry. Their weapons are just... vexing. And the fact that they have them at all irritates me. How did they build them? Or where did they steal them from? We're not going to be able to investigate that part. We're stuck researching their motivations and how scary they are. Who they're killing and why. The technology aspect is secondary, to say the least. True, Gray said. But the real goal is to stop them. We don't need a third front. These guys have to be put out of action so we can focus on the real fight. And it's coming soon. I know you're chomping at the bit to verify your findings, but don't be too hasty on that. We'll get there soon enough, believe me. There are plenty of others who feel as you do. This war has gone on too long for your people. If Orion's Light truly has a fleet of ships, what good do you think we're going to do against them? I guess it depends on if they all travel together and we can escape easily enough. They got their food and took a table. I'm anticipating more ground action than space, though, and we do have one advantage. A sad one. What's that? You heard the briefing. These zealots are conscripting people. Pressed soldiers are never as good as volunteers. Professional military men and women trump their determination and skill every time. But as you said, these people are fanatics. What are they doing to the men and women they force into service? Brainwashing, perhaps? Maybe, but how thorough can it be? Clea frowned. You'd be surprised. Gray shook his head. The way you said that is chilling. Technology does not extend to weapons alone, and the types of torture a person can be put through may be put through. Clea let the sentence die. I'm quite certain most of these people would rather die. If Orion's Light doesn't use fear of death, then what do they have left? Spiritual beliefs, maybe? Clea suggested. Or fear of permanent maiming? Of course. Gray turned to his lunch. Thank you for giving me a little more reason to stop these guys. I'll be sure to impart this type of rhetoric to the section heads when we do our ship briefing before leaving the system. Good. I think they need to know the score, and more importantly, they need to understand what happens if anyone is captured by them. What a fate that would be. And a tragedy for all of us, to be sure. Clea leaned forward. If one of us gives them some clue about our advantages, about Durant, we may find ourselves at the wrong end of this engagement, and I'm fairly certain the last thing any of us wants is for them to anticipate our tactics. We'll ensure that doesn't happen. At all costs. Weon woke with a start, praying he broke free from the nightmare his life became. The same cell walls greeted him. His stomach snarled from hunger and his mouth felt papery from thirst. No one had been by to speak to him or provide nourishment for days, perhaps longer. He lost track of time in the darkness which never relented. At least I'm able to sleep. That's at least a blissful escape from this horror. The murders he witnessed shook him to the core. At first he believed he'd been conscripted as well, but when they arrived on a capital ship, he was separated from the other settlers. Guards deposited him in the cell and left him there. Perhaps they were waiting for him to die, but it didn't make sense. They clearly didn't mind shooting people. Why make him suffer? They want me for something. That bastard who picked me out of the crowd. He saved my life, but for what? And why? This makes no sense. Several hours after being left, he shouted for a guard, demanded to be granted the rights of a prisoner and told where he was. Later, he demanded food and water, but after being ignored, weakness overwhelmed him. There were no amenities in the room. No comforts, just metal floors and walls. He picked a corner to relieve himself in and slept on the opposite side of the ten by ten chamber. I can't believe they're so... barbaric. Weon thought hard about the star chart the bastard wanted, but he couldn't think of anything on the planet which might have served such a purpose. 
certainly not at Dramir's hope. They provided much of the food to the other settlements in the area, but that was the extent of their efforts. Perhaps one of the more technological buildings held on to such relics. But why would they? The planet had only recently been discovered and the people hadn't been there but for a year. Who would hide anything amongst a place so newly populated? Even as he considered the question, the idea began to make sense. Who would know to look in such a place? The doors opened and two men stormed in, grabbing him by the arms. He tried to protest, even resist, but weakness claimed his limbs and he couldn't even stand. They dragged him out, his feet sliding on the metal plates, taking him to an elevator. There they went up, holding him aloft. Where are you taking me? How long have I been down there? You animals haven't given me any food or water. This is a war crime. Neither of the men responded. They simply stared straight ahead. What's wrong with you? Are you mute? How can you treat a person this way? It's incredible. I demand to speak to your leader. Now. Where do you think we're taking you, idiot? The man on his right muttered. Now be silent. I refuse to be silent. This treatment is horrifying. You'll all be brought up on charges. I demand my government be informed of my imprisonment so they can begin negotiating my release. Sounds like a topic to discuss with our leader. Now the man on the left spoke up. If you talk again, I'm going to hit you. I doubt you can really tolerate much pain right now, so I suggest you hold your tongue. I'm sure you'll have plenty of time to chat it up with the High Lord. High Lord? You call him? The blow came fast, slamming him in the gut and instantly silencing him. Pain raced through his body, gripping his limbs and making him all the weaker. He wheezed, but otherwise could not make any sound. The elevator doors opened and they dragged him out, bringing him to a larger space with furniture and, more importantly, a table full of food. The scent of meat made Weon dizzy, but his desire to be fed overwhelmed any illness he felt and the thought of putting something in his body. They deposited him on a chair and took two steps back, slapping their legs as they snapped to attention. A moment passed before Creelon entered from the back, sitting across from Weon. I thought I might indulge a decent meal, Creelon launched in without preamble. Maybe you're hungry. Please, join me. Weon looked over the spread, his eyes widening. Meat, starches, vegetables, it looked like a holiday meal. They didn't struggle for food at the settlement, but they did carefully ration so as to never experience a shortage. A massive glass of water sat nearby, and he started with that, taking it with trembling hands and downing half of it in a single go. You might want to take it slow, Creelon said. If you consume any of this too quickly, you'll be quite sick. And if I'm not mistaken, your accommodations don't include waste facilities. Throwing up might be, well, difficult to sleep with. Why would you force me to sleep in filth? Weon asked. You are all conducting grievous crimes by treating a prisoner in such a way. And conscripting people, this is simply not done. A new way is coming. Creelon said, cutting into his meat. He took a bite before continuing. One far more efficient. Better. I intend to fix all the wrongs our culture has perpetrated throughout the galaxy. Under my leadership, I will bring peace to us all and guide our citizens through righteousness and spiritual purity. You're a zealot. Weon's eyes went wide. You truly believe you can tell people what to do? To run our lives? What gives you the right? Might, Creelon replied. As has been proven through the generations, true power lies in one's ability to exercise violence and enforce one's will. I have proven my strength time and again and will continue to do so until all forms of resistance fall. When I've conquered the known cultures of the Alliance, I'll move on to those we have yet to encounter. Adding their forces to our own will be so powerful, no one will ever threaten us again. Insanity. I'd recommend you eat before insulting me more, 
Creelon said. Or else you may regret missing this opportunity. Weon complied, trying to eat slow, but his body's needs nearly pushed him to excess. The meal tasted better than any he'd ever had, and he dished himself seconds before the end. As his headache began to subside, he took a deep breath and sat back. Strength returned to him, albeit slowly, and he felt less shaky. There, now that you'll be thinking clearly, Krilan leaned forward. I'd like to talk about the star chart. You stopped my interrogation with those people. I went on to raise the rest of the settlements and didn't discover what I wanted. It seemed a likely location for the Alliance to hide something, but apparently I was wrong. So what do you want from me? I don't know anything about a star chart. Perhaps not, but you can help me find it. Krilon's eyes narrowed. Think hard before you answer my next questions. I know that the Alliance has taken to hiding such things in newly discovered worlds, places where no one would think to look. The one you came from was the seventh on my list. I no longer know of any others. Tell me where to go. Straight to the underworld, Weon shouted. Are you jesting? Do you honestly believe I'd help you find another group of people to murder? I only want the star chart. Then why kill those settlers? Weon shook his head. Forgive me for not believing you, but this seems ridiculous. I would rather die than help you hurt others. What is this star chart to you anyway? A small thing. A path to a particular world I cannot find through any traditional means. And what's there? Creelon clenched his fist. None of your concern. Listen, I can have you tortured. For days. I can put you back in that room with the lights on for the next week. I can do a wide variety of horrors, but to be honest, I don't have time. So what my men will do to you next is begin cutting you. We'll start with tendons and work our way to something even more permanent. Death will not come to you for a long time, so you might want to cooperate. Weon trembled. The thought made him sick to his stomach. Surely they wouldn't. But why not? They were animals. Monsters. They proved it already and now were more than happy to push it to the next level. Perhaps they would treat him like a side of meat and brutalize him, but much as it terrified him, he could not lead them to others to hurt. I won't help you. Not as much conviction in your voice this time. Creelon nodded. I see. Look at it this way. If you don't help me, I'll find them another way. If it's more difficult, I'll be far more brutal. Regardless of what happens, even if I find them without you, I'll still have my men keep you alive. They need the practice. You understand? Torture's an art form, and our medical teams are incredible. You won't die, so at least you have that to look forward to. Does this terror work on others? Yes. And it's working on you, too. Creelon stood and circled the table, putting his hands on Weon's shoulders. Just think of it. Mutilation, permanent damage, parts removed and haphazardly restored. When you're released back to your people, you'll temporarily be on community assistance. The only thing you'll have to look forward to is when I take over. Why? Why is that? Because I won't suffer invalids to live. Finally, when I ascend to command the Alliance, you'll have your death. A peaceful execution, but not before that day. And it may take a while. Just as your punishment is about to. Creelon patted him on the bicep. I'll tell you what. You get settled downstairs in the chair. I'll send some men around and let them have an hour with you. After that, if you still don't want to talk, we'll escalate. What do you say? A tear drifted down Weon's cheek. His heart hammered in his chest. 
The threat of what Creelon suggested gnawed at his mind. The unimaginable cruelty of these people made him tremble uncontrollably. The injustice of it all made him nauseous, but he could not break. Not if he wanted to protect others. Please, Weon muttered. Don't do this. You know I cannot help you. Would you talk in my place? Yes, Creelon replied. I'm afraid I'm far more pragmatic than most, though. I recognize a situation where I cannot win, and I look for another way to claim victory. Telling me what I want to know will save you, Weon. But since you've wasted my time, only full cooperation will prevent you from getting a taste of our accommodations. I can not. Creelon stepped away. Very well. He turned to the soldiers. Take him to interrogation. No questions, no discussion, no description. You will conduct the torture in total silence. Clinically hurt him. He hesitated. And bring one of the new conscripts in. The useless one I heard about earlier. Brutalize him in front of our friend. Perhaps a little psychological trauma will nudge his stubbornness. The thought of another suffering in front of him made Weon even more frantic. He tried to stand, but the men grabbed him. Wait, you can't harm another. I thought I was to be the one. You would torture me. Don't worry. They've got plenty for you, Creelon said. But I find that horrible situations are much easier to take with another person. There's a saying passed on by our Earth friends, something I learned just before I left the military. I started studying their culture, you see. Misery loves company. And, Weon, you're about to have an affair with a young man accompanying you. Take him away. They dragged Weon for the door, and he screamed back at Creelon, demanding him to halt the order, begging him. As the elevator closed, his voice echoed off the metal. He implored with the guards, but they maintained placid expressions, not even looking at him. The future seemed inevitable, but he could not resign himself to the fact. He trembled, waiting for the pain to come, and the horror he'd be forced to witness. Chapter 3 Lieutenant Colonel Marshal Dupont read through the briefing again, preparing a truncated version for his men. Orion's light proved to be real pieces of work when they faced them on Durant's planet. Now that they were going after them directly, he knew they'd be up against heavier odds. Still, he had faith in the training of the Marines aboard for any real engagement. Captain Atwell brought them all together to discuss their latest mission. Durant came aboard, and with him, they acquired over 100 of his rifles he'd built back on his home world. The Marines were given leave to take them down to the shooting range on board and become familiar with them. He assigned shifts to try the weapons and allowed them to get some serious trigger time before needing them in a fight. Other technology came with the weapons. Defensive shields, which might turn a direct hit, better cameras attached to drones, and even portable gun emplacements, which could be used for a serious scrape. They were better armed than ever before and prepared to take on a nasty enemy, one that Marshall wanted to take down more than even the bastards who attacked Earth. At least those pieces of filth took the fight to them head on. These Orion's light jerks hurt civilians and ran away. Durant immediately made himself at home in the engineering section, working with Clea and Ollie to update key systems. They did this before departure, running tests and making sure they didn't cause any serious damage. Marshall became involved only to provide security clearance, otherwise he knew he wouldn't have even known about it. The technical crews went crazy when they found out about Durant joining them, and they all wanted a shot at chatting him up. Apparently, they all read about the guy around the time the Keelans shared historical data. His papers taught them a lot, and they came away far better at their jobs having studied his schematics and breakthroughs. To have him in the flesh might have been the single best thing to happen to any of them in the last four years. 
providing he had time to run a few workshops or whatever they wanted. Marshall felt thankful all he had to do was keep people safe. Technology advances didn't impact his teams all that much, and they rarely completely changed the job. He barely finished writing up his briefing for his senior staff when the announcement came that they were leaving the system. They'd fly two hours out, then jump to their first destination, the latest colony to potentially have been hit by Orion's light. Marshall's men would go down in several shuttles, investigating each settlement. They hoped not only to find evidence of the attackers, but survivors as well. Once they cleared the locations, medical relief would arrive to assist. Marshall couldn't quite drum up optimism they would find anyone alive, but he kept it to himself. If these animals had killed colonists elsewhere, they wouldn't suddenly develop a conscience. The behemoth crew needed body bags, not medics. Marshall left his office to give his senior officers their briefing. They'd be ready to go as soon as the ship arrived in the sector, having fired off plenty of rounds to be ready to use the weapons. He wished they had longer, even a few weeks, but their timelines seemed to always be short. It made for a stressful work environment, but at least no one had a chance to get bored. Or complain, for that matter. Lieutenant Oliver Darnell brought up scans the moment they jumped into the system where the colony had gone silent. He pinged the area, searching for any ships or even technology remaining nearby. Debris, with consistent make of the colony's satellites, orbited the planet. Communications arrays and defenses were devastated, all on a decaying orbit. He estimated the largest pieces would make landfall within ten hours. Ollie was about to report in on this discovery when his scans indicated technology in motion through artificial thrust. He zoomed in, eyes widening at the discovery. Drones, maybe fifteen of them, orbited the planet, and as they approached, they began scanning the behemoth. After a moment, they began an intercept course. Captain, we've got a number of drones incoming. Ollie frowned. ETA, less than five minutes. Hostile? Gray asked. Ollie performed another scan and nodded. Yes, sir. They're coming in weapons hot, but all indications show they shouldn't be able to penetrate our shields. We're not taking any chances, Gray said. Redding, target those things and take them out. Keep your eyes open for any other little traps they might have left. Redding tapped at her controls, and the smaller turrets opened fire. The drones got off a few pot shots, but were taken out quickly. Ollie continued his scans. Clea spoke up. If a civilian ship would have come here to provide aid, they would have been taken out by those. I imagine, Gray sighed. So whoever hit this place left behind a care package. Seems pretty ruthless. Consistent with the Orion's light. Clea replied. Bring us closer, Redding, Captain Atwell said. Let's remain on alert status. Adam, inform Marshall they'll be operational inside 30 minutes. Ollie used the time it took to close on the planet to conduct surface scans. He found a lot of destruction. Buildings devastated, whole settlements razed to the ground. They'd need to be a lot closer to detect life signs, but he didn't feel much optimism. After such a horrifying attack, who could possibly have survived? We're within shuttle range, Redding announced. We can make orbit in 15 minutes. Hold position, Captain Atwell said. Launch the shuttles. Commander Everly gave the order and Ollie put each of the ten ships on one of his screens to monitor their progress. Agatha patched comms through to the various stations so anyone there could listen in if they needed to. When they broke atmosphere, Ollie would be able to relay their sensors to his station and do a more thorough scan of the planet. Maybe then they'd find some people. Captain Hoffner led a group to what was called Dramir's Hope, a settlement dedicated to agriculture. His briefing showed there should be 38 people working there, mostly farmers with a few technicians and administrators. Security seemed to be handled militia-style, with everyone pitching in when necessary. Two full-time officials had the ability to make arrests. I guess with such a small crew, they don't have the time or gumption to cause trouble. Must be a Keelan thing, 
Humans would probably need a drunk tank at the very least. They set down on the outskirts of town, nearly half a mile away. Ten men disembarked the shuttle, each fully armed and ready for a fight. Hoffner assigned a man to point and spread them out in the event of an area attack. Half the team went at the buildings from the east, while the rest approached west. They'd meet in the middle. I'm not ruling out the possibility of a trap. Someone might have wanted a group to investigate this place. Just because Ollie couldn't find technology doesn't mean someone isn't clever enough to hide it from scans. Hell, I wouldn't put it past that kid to be capable of it himself. Best to be cautious. The first building they approached seemed to be a storage facility. The walls crumbled inward, crushing the food stores, which were blackened from a fire. He figured they could easily fit fifty men inside when it was whole, and now it was little more than a burned-out wreck. His scanner didn't show any organic, sentient material inside. At least no one got crushed in this mess. Keep it cautious, people, Hoffner ordered. If anyone's going to cause trouble, I'm betting we'll find them closer to the middle, somewhere harder to escape from. Bravo team is entering the village. The voice in his ear came from the squad leader to the east. We're seeing a lot of damage here, gunfire and explosives mostly. Roger, Hoffner replied. Same drill as these guys. Keep it slow and watch your angles. They proceeded, following a trail of additional destruction. Not a single building remained standing each one little more than a pile of stones. Blast points made it clear they used some kind of high-yield explosive, but scans showed no remnants to provide an idea of what kind. Why be so cautious? What did it matter if someone knew how they blew up the buildings? These people are either insanely paranoid or just that good. Maybe if we knew where they got their explosives, we could find out where their base was. Some clues, however oblique, can lead to results, I suppose. But the fact we can't tell what it is has to be a clue unto itself. How many volatile substances could they have used to defy a scanner? I'll ask Ollie to look into it. Contact right? One of his men shouted and all of them spread out, aiming in the same direction. Hoffner moved to cover as a bout of gunfire laced the ground where they were standing a few moments before. Permission to return fire? Hold? Hoffner shouted, tapping the side of his helmet so his voice could be heard by those off their comms. This is Captain William Hoffner of the Starship Behemoth. We're here on a relief mission. Hold your fire. Die, you alliance dogs. The shout prefaced another bunch of gunfire, this time from three different weapons. We'll never surrender. Hoffner hit his helmet and brought him back to comms only. Bravo team, we're under fire. Need you to flank the enemy position while we keep them here. Alpha, keep your heads down, but give the others time to get in position. Let's take these guys down. Some of his men fired back, shots keeping the enemy busy. Hoffner watched the heads-up display in his helmet, waiting impatiently for Bravo. They moved swiftly, then suddenly stopped. Reporting in, they were ready and opening fire. Gunfire burst over the area, and screams erupted on the hill. Alpha, shift position to get a firing angle on any stragglers or someone trying to escape. Take prisoners, if possible. Hoffner joined his men, leading with his weapon. One of the enemy popped up to take a shot, and he pulled the trigger, striking the man dead center in the face. The blast from the advanced weapon Durant provided nearly took the guy's head clean off, and the recoil was non-existent. These are something else. Another man tried to crawl away, firing behind him. Marines took cover, shouting for him to surrender. Hoffner calmed them with a quick word and tapped his helmet to allow external communication. Come on, you're outnumbered and you don't have anywhere to go. You've seen what our weapons can do. Surrender and you'll be well treated. Go to hell, heathens. The man turned his gun on himself, discharging a round into his chin. The blast went out the top of his head, finishing him off. Clear, one of the Marines said. No more life signs. What a waste. 
Hoffner stepped closer, gazing at the heap of bodies wearing Orion's light uniforms. As he examined them, he came to realize many of them were already injured by some kind of blast. Their clothes were blackened and one was missing half his leg. As the limb was nowhere to be found, he figured his men didn't do it. Giant Control, this is Alpha Team at Sector 17, Hoffner radioed back to the ship. We have met with minor resistance at the settlement Dramir's Hope. Unfortunately, no prisoners, but they are definitely Orion's Light. We have confirmed they attacked the colony. Roger that, Alpha. Marshall's voice crackled in his ear. Conduct a sweep for any remaining technology. We need to know what they were after there. What made them attack that site? We're on it. Hoffner turned to the others. Get your scans going. Look for anything that might be transmitting, anything that requires power. I don't care how small the reading is. You report to me immediately. Understood? Yes, sir. The shout resounded over the area and his people hurried off to conduct their assignment. Hoffner checked over the bodies. They lacked all but the most rudimentary supplies and their weapons. Someone erected a lean-to nearby, but that was their only shelter. He found a pile of old paper beneath a coat and some rations they hadn't gotten to yet. Maybe you jackasses shouldn't have blown up all the buildings. You might have had a place to sleep. He picked up the pages and flipped through them. There were five in total, and the man had used coal to write a message. Hoffner had to use his translator to decipher the words, each written in some Keelan dialect. He leaned against the rocks as he browsed through the microjournal of the men they'd just killed. We were left behind, our whole fire team abandoned, as we should have been for our failure to comply with regulations. The explosives were not measured carefully enough, and as a result, we will die in this settlement. This fate came from our direct superior, who elected to leave us our weapons and just enough food to survive a month. The others believe we will be rescued if we last so long. They don't realize the Alliance will be here soon, and when they arrive, we will have to die fighting. None of us is in any condition for a prolonged engagement. Anpi lost his leg from the mistake, and Valk has four broken ribs. We're done. I was cast out through association. If only I'd been more observant, I might have stopped my comrades from dooming us all. Unfortunately, we do not deserve redemption, and here I must stay until the day we perish. None of us can survive in the wilderness. We are not hunters or farmers. Soldiers for the cause, one and all, and the cause has left us behind. Without purpose, we should do the honorable and kill ourselves. If it comes down to hunger or a bullet, I will choose the quick end. Perhaps I might even shoot my companions before the time comes. I know they lack the courage to do so on their own. If only they understood the honor we have known serving the Lord, then perhaps they would commit the ultimate sacrifice in their final moments. My faith will never falter. Hoffner shook his head. Giant Control, this is Alpha Leader. I found some documents from one of the combatants, and these guys are serious nutters, sir. I mean, they're way out there. The briefing suggested true zealots. Marshall replied, I'm not surprised you found proof. I never had any doubt. Understood. We're continuing our search now. Other teams are reporting their settlements are wrecked with no surviving technology. I'm guessing you'll find the same, but we might get lucky. They didn't have leftover enemies, though. Let's police those bodies and bring them back. Yes, sir. One of the soldiers called his name. I have to go. We might have found something. Hoffner rushed over to the others and stopped short his shoulders slumping. A massive pile of bodies, presumably the settlers, were heaped up in a massive pile. They'd been gunned down near a caved-in building, down to the women and children. Whoever did it made sure they were dead, too. Each one took a bullet to the head along with a group in the bodies. Count them up, Hoffner said. We'll try to reconcile them with the census for this place. A sergeant drew their attention to the bombed-out building. I'm picking up a technology reading from in there. It's faint, but definitely a power signature. Maybe a personal comm unit? Someone could be alive in there, another soldier shouted. 
We have to dislodge these rocks. Hoffner nodded. Let's get in there, gentlemen. Bravo, create a perimeter and stand by a security. Alpha, let's start digging. He set his weapon aside and prepared to join them, helping move massive cement boulders that took two and three men to shove aside. It looked like they'd be at it for a while, but they couldn't risk firing or using explosives. Not if someone might have survived. The lack of life readings didn't tell them anything. Interference might block their scans. Considering they didn't have anyone else to talk to, a live colonist would be a perfect find. They couldn't have eliminated everyone on the planet. It seemed impossible. But then again, these guys might have been thorough. They could have flown around for a couple days ensuring they eliminated all threats if they wanted to. We didn't arrive quickly. Hoffner delivered three reports back to the behemoth concerning their progress working at the debris before they finally uncovered the shelter. The place proved to be void of anyone, living or dead, but the tech reading grew in strength. Their tech officer, Corporal Eddings, walked inside, waving his scanner about the room. Other reports came in from the teams all around the planet. Hoffner frowned at their message, mostly indicating how they'd found bodies and burnt-out homes. Pretty much the same they found at Dramir's Hope. Relief crews didn't appear to be necessary. There was no one to receive the aid. If the Alliance wanted the planet back, they'd have to send a host of new settlers. A few months of work might get the place back up and running, as it had before. While the behemoth might not be able to help any living people, they could at least police the bodies and return them to the Keelans for proper burial. The bastards who killed them didn't even offer the dignity of a proper grave. Hoffner knew such things were likely beyond a group capable of gunning down children. Generally, people only cared about what happened to a body in death when they showed concern for how a person lived. The cold murder they witnessed gave them a good idea of what they were facing and how they'd have to deal with them. Considering their abandoned men still fought to the end, we have a real group of crazies. Who would continue to show loyalty for a group that didn't even have the decency to bring them back to their ship? Over a mistake? Especially one which harmed them? They must have learned their lesson. Leaving them. That was just unnecessary. Captain Hoffner, Eddings called out. I found a personal communication device. Power's running low, but it was set to record. We've got some video footage of the settlers. How'd Orion's light miss it? Hoffner asked. They took all the rest of the technology. This is a low-profile device, Eddings explained. In other words, when it was fully powered, it emitted practically no signature at all. Only when the energy began to run out did it start sending a signal to suggest it needed a recharge. That's what we picked up when we performed our scan. While these jerks were here, they wouldn't have seen it. I see. Hoffner took the device from him. Can we play it back? Yes, for now. It's probably got another eight hours of life left on its current power settings. Hoffner hit the play button and the feed began from the start. Settlers gathered in the small room, armed and aiming at the door. He was watching their backs, but even without expressions, he felt the tension in the room, the anxiety over the situation. He knew what was going on. They were waiting for the Orion's light people to find them, and when they did, they'd have to fight. I hope they gunned down some of those bastards. He fast-forwarded for several minutes and started it up again when people started to move around. Voices shouted from outside, telling the colonists to surrender. The description of what they planned to do, to bring the force of their shuttle against them, made Hoffner glare. They put their guns through the door and left the area. Damn it. We're not going to get anything from this. Then a man stepped inside and looked around. Hoffner paused the feed. The uniform looked like the other Orion's light people, but flashier. He must have been a commanding officer, a lieutenant or captain, maybe. They might be able to get something from the database about him, a match on who he was. This could help. Hoffner continued to play the video, and a few moments later, they heard the screams of women, something about conscription, then gunfire. Dear God, they... A massive explosion brought down the entrance to the shelter, covering it in debris. 
The video went dark and Hoffner hit stop. He handed it back to Eddings. Seems we found what we were after. Two pieces of evidence that the Orion's Light attacked this settlement. Should be enough to continue the investigation. We'll finish our sweep of the area, sir. Eddings hurried off and Hoffner connected with the behemoth. Giant Control, this is Alpha Leader. We have finished our search and have evidence showing who did this. It's an atrocity, to be honest. Relief crews will be needed to police a lot of bodies for proper burial. But no one survived this attack. I'll leave security crews just in case to defend anyone you send. Let's make this happen. Roger that, Alpha Leader, Marshall's voice replied. Please return with the evidence ASAP. We'll go over what you found while we clean up the mess down there. Alliance reinforcements are on the way to secure the area and start the reclamation process. Good work. Hoffner glanced at the bodies piled up nearby and let out a sigh. I don't feel like we did any good work here today. Too bad these people didn't have proper security. But then they probably didn't feel like they needed it. And even if they had, chances are good they might have been killed too. Whoever attacked this place did it on force. Can't wait to get a stab at them. He and Eddings boarded the shuttle while the others maintained a perimeter. They'd return to the ship and deliver their findings while the relief crews did their work. With any luck, they'd have some ideas of where they were heading before too long. As long as it involved a brawl with the Orion's Light, Hoffner was all in. Clea received the initial findings from the Marines who went to the planet's surface. Medical crews took images of the dead on the planet and sent them back to her small team so they could check the database to identify each victim. She made a list to send to the Alliance so their respective families could be informed. The whole exercise made her sick to her stomach. Senseless murder went against everything the Keelan people believed, and she knew the majority of Orion's light had to be from her species. They'd gone far afield of their beliefs to have such disregard for life, especially considering the horrifying nature of the violence. Clea noted there were several people missing from the identifying records. Hoffner's report included a message about people being conscripted, another notion which felt like a punch to the gut. Those who were not to be found ranged between 17 and 22 years old, all men. Every woman and child was accounted for. Wait, what's this? An anomaly? We on Sortrex worked at Tremere's Hope and set his age down as 47. He too was listed as missing. Clea checked the recording device which was found there and discovered it belonged to him. He risked a lot to set that up. Maybe they can't find him because his body took too much damage to be recognizable. But that didn't seem right. She brought him his record and noted his time in the military as an administrator, mostly dealing with travel for high-ranking officers. He retired just around the time she got her second assignment, so it was no surprise she'd never heard of him before. Why had he moved to an out-of-the-way settlement to take up farming? Then she saw his agricultural background. Aha, that makes more sense. But could he have been working with the Orion's Light? I can't rule it out. He may be a traitor. She made some notes for the report and moved on to the video recording. Watching it disturbed her far more than she anticipated, but when the Orion's light man entered the shelter, she switched off her concern for the dead and focused on his face. If he happened to be listed in the database, she'd find him quickly enough. Copying the face image to another program, recognition started scanning millions of pictures. The entire process took less than five minutes before it came back with a hit. Her heart raced in her chest as she tapped the link and brought up the record. A military file for someone discharged quite some time ago. Name? Krelon Arvax. Rank? Anthar. Former. Current status? Fugitive from justice. Sentence? Life in prison. The document went on to explain Krelon's crimes. Krelon Arvax was responsible for a number of atrocities while putting down a rebellion in one of the outer systems. 
On his orders, Keelan soldiers murdered the families of the highest-ranking members of the uprising. They displayed their bodies over a broadcast and continued to execute people until the rebellion surrendered. When those who started the uprising were captured, he slaughtered them all and left a military force behind to contain the remaining population. Upon his return to high command, he was immediately arrested, but maintained that he did what was necessary for the mission. Council determined he would be discharged of command and put in prison for life. One week into his incarceration, a prison riot broke out and 30 people escaped. Creelon disappeared and was not seen again. Many believed he went into hiding with a group of sympathizers far out in uncharted space. Sightings have been unsubstantiated, though he does remain in the top ten most wanted criminals hiding from Keelan justice. Clea turned to his academic record and felt her shoulders slump. Creelon operated at the top of his class, one of the finest students most of his teachers ever taught. He maintained a solid record through the ranks until he became an Anthar. Once in a position of authority, he proved to be a harsh disciplinarian, and his men lodged many complaints. Those who served him loyally seemed to do well, but those who could not handle his method of command sought transfers, even if the move impacted their careers. Clea suddenly felt lucky she never served under him. He sounded like a real piece of work. High Command wrote glowing reviews until the uprising. Why did you decide to come out as a psycho on that particular mission? Clea shook her head. Such a move seemed strange, almost as if he genuinely lost his mind. Sure, he was harsh before, but murder? Executions? Atrocities like displaying the families of his enemies for them to see? None of that made sense. If he's the commander of Orion's Light, we have a serious problem. Is he in charge or just one of the officers? Something told Clea he wouldn't suffer another command structure where he wasn't on top. He probably had enough of taking orders for a lifetime. Whatever plans he harbored couldn't be good for anyone outside his organization. Clea hit the comm and connected with Gray. Captain, I have a briefing and some news but I'm not sure anyone's going to like what I found. Not really a shock, Gray replied. Let me guess, we know more about the Orion's Light? Possibly their leader, but if I'm right, we've got a real adversary on our hands. This guy's good, even if he's gone crazy, which I'm sure he has. Fantastic. Insane and in charge. Horrible combination. Let's get together for a briefing. Maybe we can puzzle some things together and get on the right path. I'm starting to get the sense that we don't have much time to figure this out before something big happens. Since we're in a reactive state, let's see what we can do about catching up. Chapter 4 Suanthar Hal Rin Tevis gazed at the view screen aboard the Wild Dream. His destroyer had been tasked with protecting an out-of-the-way colony, one which hadn't seen any action since before the settlers arrived. The briefing stated a mercenary group called Orion's Light might attack the planet, and so vessels were sent to deter any aggression. This is a total milk run. No one's coming out this far to cause trouble. Hal barely believed the briefings in regards to how dangerous this fringe group was supposed to be. Where would they supply? How would they manage it? What government supported them? Without these things, an army would be useless. A functional force required backup from a stable, civil body. Sir, long-range sensors are picking up a jump signature, Tech Officer Pruitt Vormolen said. On screen. Hal squinted at the viewer, unable to believe his eyes. Had the Orion's Light truly decided to attack them after all? Why would they? What could possibly be on the planet's surface to warrant such an event? He couldn't wrap his mind around it, even as the ship appeared and began a rapid advance. Raise shields, Hal shouted. Hail that ship immediately and warn it off. They've already hailed us, Tivin, his comm officer, cried out. He put it on the speaker. 
Hello there. This is the Carrion Drop, and we demand your immediate surrender. Please don't make us annihilate your vessel and kill everyone on board. It would be unfortunate and probably unnecessary. After all, we're going to take what we want regardless of how hard you fight against it. Those bastards. Hal slammed his fist into the arm of his chair. Reply to them back and ask if they are part of Orion's light. Tivin complied, and the response was a chuckle. No, we have no ties to those maniacs. We're just pirates. Sorry to disappoint. Is that why you're out here, trying to fend them off? If so, you should be lucky we came along. Those guys are not at all reasonable. For example, they wouldn't have given you this lovely opportunity to give up. Open fire, Hal shouted. Give them a dose of our turrets and let's see if they're so haughty. The ship hummed as weapons lit up, blasting away and turning the area around the wild dream bright blue for a brief moment. The pirate proved quite maneuverable and evaded the first attack. They leveled off and fired their own volley, a staggering number of turrets hammering against the destroyer's shields. Defenses down to 40%. Pruitt sounded on the verge of losing his mind. They're on recharge. Return fire, fire at will. Hit them with everything we've got. Hal's heart raced in his chest, and he felt like he might be sick. This pirate vessel proved far more dangerous and crafty than he anticipated. The destroyer opened fire again, this time holding nothing back. Missiles departed the vessel and more beam weapons laced the dark sky. A couple smacked into the side of the pirate, causing their shields to flare. Pruitt performed a quick tally and shook his head. Clean misses with the missiles, but two turrets score direct hits. Their shields appear to be at 70%. Communications, reach out to Alliance High Command, Hal shouted, unable to contain his excitement. Tell them what's going on. Get some reinforcements out here. They're jamming us, sir. I can't connect to the relays. Damn, Hal stood up. Keep firing. Upload all log files to a comm pod. Delay its signal for five hours and eject it. They'll destroy it if the thing starts right away. The pirate moved in for the kill. Hal knew what was about to happen. As another wave of destruction hammered against them, their comm pod was thrown from the vessel. His bridge crew looked at him, desperate for an answer or command that would save them. He didn't have any tricks, no tactics to fight such a superior fighting vessel. Another volley of death rained down upon the wild dream, ripping through the shields and cutting the hull as if it were wheat beneath the scythe. Damage reports came in and Hal sat in his chair as the reactor went critical. He didn't even have time to shout for an evacuation before his ship went up in a massive orange ball, leaving the colony undefended. Creelon leaned forward, sitting on the bridge as he gazed at the view screen. His ship arrived at the next colony only to find a pirate vessel struggling to take down the planetary defenses. Apparently the criminals believed an incoming ship would be easier prey than the planet, so they turned on them instead, sending a message demanding they surrender. This may work to my advantage. Creelon sat back, smirking. Raise our shields. Target their enemies, but hold fire for my mark. His people went about their tasks and the ship briefly hummed from the sudden power output. Creelon wondered if he should communicate with the raiders, but elected instead to simply engage them. No words he might offer would be as impactful as a full-powered relay cannon. He just wanted to buy a little more time to ensure they had range. My lord, Machin, his pilot, spoke up. The pirates are moving into an attack position. They are flying straight for us. Good. Creelon shook his head. Scans? What sort of weapons do they have? Conventional beam weapons? Brillin replied. The tech officer had been with Creelon since his military days and always proven to be one of the best at his job. They have damage potential from the sheer number of hard points littered throughout their ship. I'd say a full blast might take our shields to 60%, but they're on the old system, which means recharge. Are they in range of our relay cannon? Brillin hesitated to reply, watching a scanner. He finally nodded. Yes, sir. They are now at maximum range. Machin, give them a count of three, then open fire. 
Tear through the shields with the relay, then open up with our other turrets. I want their engines down in the first pass, if at all possible. Very possible, Brillen said. They favor weapons over defenses. Initiate my commands. Mockin tapped at his terminal, then tapped something a little more aggressively. A green energy beam burst from below the ship, striking the pirate on the side. Enemy shields flared, then burst in a bright light as the relay cannon began tearing into their hull. Sparks popped into space, and an orange globe indicated a fire. The pirate fired back, then tried to pull away. Energy beams splashed against Creelon's ship, but Brillen shook his head. No appreciable damage to the shields. In trying to flee, the criminals made their engines even easier targets. Mockin let the rest of their turrets fly, and the pirate ship exploded a moment later, casting debris off in every direction. Creelon shook his head. Simple enough. Target all communications arrays surrounding the planet, but don't fire yet. I'd like to hail the colony and have a quick chat. Jam the sector from outgoing transmissions. Make it seem like the pirate's destruction is causing it. Hmm. I'm surprised we didn't find an Alliance security force here defending the planet after our recent activities. I'm reading debris from another ship, Brillen said. Maybe they were here and lost to the pirates. Very possible. Interesting. My, these colonists are having a terrible day. Creelon stood up. Get them on the line right away. A face appeared a moment later, another woman with a worried expression. She visibly trembled as she came on. Creelon admired her light-colored hair and jade eyes. While his beliefs didn't afford women a place in the military or in any sort of command structure, he did find them attractive enough, and this one caught his eye. Unidentified starship? She began. My name is Director Silar Infa. Please state the nature of your arrival. We just eliminated the pirates attacking your planet, Creelon replied, and it seems none too soon as they took out your defenses. I hope we can work together on something of vital importance. Who do you represent? I don't believe it matters. However, what does is a star chart I'm looking for a relic your people may possess. Do you know what I'm talking about, and if so, can you tell me who has it? We'd be happy to simply make a copy. No, I'm afraid I don't know, but we have over 300 people in the various settlements. We can put out the call if you'd like. Thank you, Silar. That would be very generous. I'd like to send an all-clear to the Alliance. Sila replied. However, it seems our communications are being jammed. Do you know what's going on? My tech officer tells me that the destruction of the pirate ship has caused a low-level disturbance to your long-range communication array. We're working to clear it up. However, there's a lot of debris up here. You might require some actual repairs. We're not qualified to conduct them... However, when we're done here, we'll be happy to send whatever message you'd like. Thank you very much, Silar paused. I didn't catch your name. I'm Creelon, and this is my ship, the Final Star. Creelon offered a smile. Which settlement are you in? We'll come down to meet face to face so we can conduct an investigation for the star chart. I'm in the primary site called Stonewater. There's a large cliff nearby with a waterfall feeding the river system. I look forward to speaking with you. The line went dead, and Creelon stared at the empty screen. As do I. He shook it off and turned to Brillen. Get them to bring Weon to the shuttle, but gag him. He may be useful when we get down there. May I have a word in private, my lord? Brillin was one of the only men on board who spoke to him like the old days, but he had the sense to do so when they were alone. 
Krelaw nodded, taking him into his office. They closed the door before his younger officer spoke up. This is against our standard procedures. I thought we'd just come here and destroy them as we had the others. That tactic has proven ineffective, Krelon replied. I thought I'd try something different. They may not have it, but if they do, I might be able to get it with this director's help. Are you sure that's why we're doing this? I saw the way you looked at her. Krelon chuckled. You really do take liberties, don't you? You told me to, Brillen replied. If you recall, you asked that I keep you honest even with yourself? Yes, true. Krelon patted his shoulder. Don't worry. Weon's going to be there to witness the slaughter if these people defy us. And if they don't, we'll get what we want. Destroy the calm arrays and leave them to rot. Shouldn't we leave no witnesses? The men will be shaken if we do. Krelon sighed, nodding. You're right, but three hundred will take a lot of time, and I'm not sure we have it anymore. You saw. The Alliance was here defending this world, and when a military ship doesn't check in... I remember. They send reinforcements fast. Exactly. But we'll play it out as it must be. Get back in there and assemble the men in the hangar. We've got a lot to do and little time to do it in. I'll be sure to keep us safe. Yes, sir. Brillin snapped to his old salute and left the room. Krelon couldn't do this without him. He needed some tie to the past. This was the best one he could manage. The young man had been a staunch supporter no matter the task. He stood by Krelon even during the uprising when he purged all those civilians. No one understood the necessity of that act, and no one ever will. High Command didn't even look at the evidence he presented before sentencing him. They accepted the situation at face value and condemned him swiftly. The hypocrisy infuriated him. Those miserable elitists sent him to deal with the problem. One of them even used the term, put this uprising down, through any means necessary. Turned out they had a limit on the term, any means. Down in the hangar, he met with Weon, who was led in with his hands bound behind his back. He looked exhausted, having been through quite the torture sessions. He met Krelon's eyes, but there was no defiance there, just resignation. He'd come to terms with his predicament and seemed ready to perish if necessary. Hello, Krelon said. I trust you're tired of being hurt. I never asked for it to begin with. We rarely do. Are you taking me down to watch you murder more civilians? If required, yes. Krelon shrugged. I'm trying diplomacy this time, but believe me, I won't be able to leave these people alive. The rest of the fleet will arrive shortly to take on the conscripts. We're still in need of more soldiers. We'll take on as many young men as we can, and hopefully, with any luck, we'll have the star chart. So you believe me that I don't know anything about it now? Krelon shrugged. Yes and no. I believe you could have looked into this for us if you truly wanted to. With your former position, you might have gotten into the Alliance database or called in a favor to help us find what we're after. How do you even know this thing exists? Why would we hide it in some defenseless colony? While I was in prison, I learned a great deal. Krelon gestured and the guards led Weon onto the shuttle. He followed and continued. We were in the midst of the war with those bastards from beyond our known regions long before I fell from grace. Do you know why we're at war with them? Weon shook his head. I do not. Rumor suggests the conflict began when we happened upon their region of space and met with them. Their ways so directly contrasted with our own that negotiations immediately broke down. It's believed we took something from them, an item of great importance to their race, something of religious significance. So they came after us over a relic? 
Not entirely, Krelon replied. They may not even know we have it because their attacks have not suggested any sort of searching. No, their assault means to obliterate our culture and put their own in its place. Have you never noticed the zeal of their attacks? The methodical manner in which they bring their might to bear against planets? Only through study, we answered. I've never been in a battle before. Then you'll need to take my word for it. In any event, this item has been hidden away, stuck in some archive. But the location was intentionally obscured. What's it do? If the rumors are correct, I will be able to use it to control our enemies. To make them fight for my cause, instead of their misguided crusade against what our people would call decency. You're insane, Weon shook his head. You can't for a moment believe that you can manipulate those monsters into working for you. And to what end? So you can install your own ideals upon our people? The galaxy, Creelon corrected. My ambitions far exceed merely our culture. You're sick. Weon looked sad as he spoke. You really don't understand anything about us as people, or what our military has fought and died for. We do not deserve what you're describing, Krelon. Our culture's just fine without a radical shift. I know we sent you to prison, but we don't deserve to be punished for your indiscretion. I thought you might be won over, Krelon scowled. But I see I was wrong. At least for now. Gag him and put him near the front of the shuttle. Give him a monitor so he can witness our exchanges out there. Perhaps a little more torment will nudge him toward helping us before the end. For now, let's get out of here. I have a people to deceive. Adam read over the information about Creelon one more time and turned to Gray. They met in the briefing room with Marshall and Clea. The painted picture made him sick to his stomach. A soldier gone beyond rogue. The man needed psychiatric help and possibly a lot of drugs to keep him calm. This is all fascinating, Adam said. But how does it help us figure out where he's going next? Clea stepped over to the screen and tapped her tablet, bringing up a star chart. I've calculated several possibilities, each ranked by range, and tried to correlate them to the first six places we've seen assaulted. Ali did some work trying to determine their jump vector, but that didn't pan out. Let me show you the options. How many are there? Gray asked. And how new is this region of space to the Keelan people? We began colonizing these solar systems in the six years, Clea said. We have fifteen colonies in this area, all young. Six have been hit so far. Creelon has been systematic about it, going in a perceived line. This was the first one they destroyed. She circled a star on the map. Then he moved on to the next adjacent one and formed this line. A line appeared between the first six locations. What's next on the list, then? Adam asked. There are multiple options, I'm afraid. Clea gestured. He might go here or here. She drew two short lines, one up and one to the side. They're roughly equidistant. However, I'm guessing he's heading to the top there. Why? Gray asked. So far, the indication is he's looking for something, and he seems to believe it is with the smaller colonies. This is why he's not hitting our older, more established planets. The top one is the newest and therefore has the fewest people. Whatever he thinks he'll find, he believes it's being hidden in an unlikely location. Interesting, Adam hummed. What's the other colony like? One year older, Clea replied, and twice as populated. Hitting them may actually be difficult as well. They have a real security force at this point, mostly due to the fact they had to deal with some dangerous wildlife. As a result, they have a ground force. However, I should also mention that the Alliance sent ships to defend both places, destroyers while they tried to drum up some capital ships. Gray gave her a grim look. What are the chances they can survive a fight with his weapons? Based on what we know, 
I'd have to ask Durant to be sure, but I don't believe they'd stand much of a chance. As I thought, Gray sighed. Okay, Adam, what's your opinion? Head to the smaller colony, Adam said. I trust Clea's reasons. Gray nodded. If the relays here were online, we could communicate with both places. Find out which one's answering. Once we arrive at one, if it hasn't been attacked, we can reach out to the other. Clea stared at the chart for a moment before continuing. If neither's been attacked, though, we'll be back to square one. It might mean he found what he was after on this colony. Let's set a course for the smaller one and get over there as soon as possible. Maybe we'll get lucky and catch this guy with his pants down. Gray stood and headed for the door. I won't jump in less than twenty minutes. Weon felt resignation as the shuttle left the final star and plunged toward the colony. He paid vague attention as they deployed several large metal balls on their way down, roughly 5,000 meter intervals. One of the men joked about laying down a surprise. Must be mines, he thought. These people care for nothing. The ship landed just outside the colony, and Creelon patted him on the shoulder, directing his attention to the monitor. Enjoy the show, my friend. I'm sure you'll have many opinions you'd like to share when I return. Do keep them in mind so you don't forget. I can't wait for more sanctimonious nonsense. At first, Weon desperately wanted to avoid watching, but he couldn't bring himself to look away. He trembled in his seat as Creelon and his men disembarked to meet the colonists, and the screen flickered to life, showing a view from one of the men's perspectives. It played out like some kind of nightmare, the deliberate stroll toward the innocents, criminals descending on prey. Weon watched the scene unfold in horror, a flashback to Dramir's hope, but with far more deception. Creelon treated the director with utmost courtesy, going so far as to bow when he drew near. The entire exchange was broadcast to him through a live communicator, feeding him the information. Thank you for agreeing to help us, Silar, Creelon said. I can come clean about who we are now. I'm just grateful you're not with that Orion's Light group, Silar replied. Our defender who lost to the pirates was here to fight them off. Creelon smiled. Understood. We are with Alliance Special Forces, working to end the fighting with the real enemy out there. This star chart I'm looking for leads to something important, something we can use to stop the war. It's vital we discover it. Do you know of anyone here who might have ties to the Alliance military? Someone we might ask about it? Silar's face contorted as she thought, bowing her head. Weon wanted to shout at her, to warn her about the man she was dealing with. He struggled to free himself, but the metal bonds would not give. He couldn't move, but only watched as she tried to inadvertently commit treason by helping this scum. Perhaps old Varlin? Silar finally said. He operates a weather station in the mountain to the south. Kind of a hermit? and he let me know he'd stay that way. I guess he saw a lot of action in the war. A perfect candidate, Creelon smiled. Can you tell me specifically where to go? We'll fly out there right away. Yes, I'll give you the coordinates. Weon screamed into his gag, frustration tearing at him as he witnessed her sell out the poor veteran. There you are. Thank you. Creelon touched her face, tracing a line with the backs of his fingers. He brushed her hair back from her ear and smiled. In another time, I would have courted you. Considering what's coming, I wish I could now. You're stunning. Oh, Silar blushed. Thank, thank you, but I don't know what you mean. What's coming? Something I doubt you'll forgive me for. Creelon nodded to one of his men who began chatting on his radio. 
I'm afraid I was not entirely honest with you. Silar's brow raised. I don't know what you mean. I'm the commander of Orion's Light, Krelon said, and I'm here for that star chart. I'm here to replace the Alliance government, all governments, actually. One day soon, I'll finish the war, then take my rightful place in charge of everything you and I know. No, Silar took a step back, but I trusted you. And if I believed I could trust you, I'd spare you what's about to happen. Krelon turned away. I sincerely believe I could have found a place with you. What are you going to do? Krelon hesitated to speak, but when he did, he glanced over his shoulder. They didn't tell you why they were defending this place against us. Silar shook her head emphatically. No. They just said you were dangerous. Now you'll find out why. Krelon turned to the others. Get the shuttles down here and start the process. I'm going to depart to meet with this Varlin person. Spare the woman until the end. I'd like to speak to her one last time. The end? Silar moved forward and grabbed his arm. The end of what? What are you talking about? Soldiers dragged her back and Krelon brushed at where she'd touched him. You'll see soon enough. Shuttles descended upon the settlement, landing in various places. They began rounding up the people. Weon felt like he was witnessing his own nightmares come true again. Krelon boarded and sat across from him, remaining silent as he watched the violence unfold. He realized he was watching from the perspective of one of the soldiers who had carefully allowed him to see the entire scene. The first casualty made Weon want to throw up. A middle-aged woman shot in the head. From there it got worse. People tried to fight back and were gunned down. Silar was held back, forced to watch it all. As tears flowed down Weon's cheeks, Krelon leaned forward and shut off the video feed. I hope you realize I'm determined enough to get my way, no matter what. Weon glared at him, hatred brewing in his heart. I believe you begin to understand the sort of passion that drives me on. Krelon took the gag off. The rage you feel came to me every time I had to fight those bastards and see what they did to our people. So you found it so reprehensible, you do it yourself? Weon spat on the floor. You're no better than they are, murdering our own people. Who will be left to rule, Krilan? Why do you have to slaughter innocents in your quest to save the galaxy? Right now, witnesses are a detriment. You know our government. They'll investigate this to the very end, and if they find out who I am too soon, or catch our trail... It will only be a matter of time before we're discovered. I'm not ready to fight them all yet. I need the conflict to happen on my terms. But when it does, it will be glorious. Even if you take over and rule our people, you're just a murderous coward, a fiend. You know nothing of sacrifice. But much of crime. You've taught me. Krelon sighed. Those people are a means to an end. And if this Varlin character knows nothing, what then? There's another colony nearby, Krelon replied, and every one of them makes us stronger. We take more resources, more people, and build our army ever stronger. You must realize these are the two things a functioning armed force needs to continue and survive. Even an administrator had to receive some training. What if you do not find this star chart? It may not even exist. You did learn about it in prison, and if I'm not mistaken, convicts aren't the most honest types to extract data from. You're not entirely wrong about that. True. Krelon smiled. 
I found a reference to it in the database of this ship when we took it. Unfortunately, it did not have its location because they were still moving it around. At the time, when I was establishing the Orion's Light, I knew they needed time to settle their little secret. But they've had plenty now, and it can't constantly move. I'm only surprised they didn't ever trust their own database with the information. I mean, who would have thought the Alliance would be so crafty as to hide something like this and not maintain a copy back at Central HQ? Or to tell High Command about it, for that matter? Weon squinted. How do you know they didn't? Because their troop movements aren't suggesting any special protection anywhere, and I know those fools. If they realized what they had, they'd have it locked away where no one would ever get it. So you believe one person is involved? That they made the decision to keep it hidden? Krilon nodded. Someone who didn't trust anyone with the data. Maybe even a thief. He got on his data pad and tapped away. Let's look into this Varlin person, shall we? Perhaps his old records will indicate whether or not he can help us, or if this is simply another dead end. Everywhere you go ends with someone dying. Krilon smirked. Very poetic, Weon. Perhaps I should have you chronicle my journey. I don't think you'd like the end, Weon said but I believe the galaxy might. On that final note, we both agree. Chapter 5 Clea held her breath as they jumped into the sector she'd suggested. This time, she didn't wait for Ollie to perform his scans and check from her station. The first sign of debris gave her both a sense of relief and urgency. On the positive side, she'd picked right but unfortunately, that meant Creelon may have already killed the settlers. Reading debris, Ollie said. Too much for satellites. Sir, I think there was a battle here. Explain, Gray said. I've got some metal consistent with Alliance craft. Ollie shook his head. And something else. Clea joined him. He's right. There seems to be a second ship, but it's not Alliance. The scorching on the pieces of Alliance ship... I don't know what kind of weapons did that. Something nasty. Maybe that beam we saw before? Or something even worse. Either way, they were taken down pretty fast. Did the Orion's Light do this? Gray tapped his calm. Engineering, this is the captain. Is Durant down there? I am, Durant's voice replied. What can I do for you? We'd like you to come up to the bridge to check out some scans. Seems there was a fight you might be able to shed some light on. I'm on my way. Ollie sighed. All satellites are down. Relays, defenses, torn up like the last place. Every piece of floating technology has been eliminated, which limits our scan abilities from up here. We'll be relying solely on our own long-range capabilities. Thorough, Adam said. As if he has a standard operating procedure. He did serve in the military. Gray replied. Technically, he still does. Just his own. Let's start scanning the surface. Redding moved them in closer. She leaned forward to look at the view screen. Whoever got in a scrape wasn't taking any prisoners. Maybe they wanted them, Clea said. The Alliance ship's reactor is simply gone, which means it went critical. Ollie whistled. Ouch. Disabling shot gone wrong? Clea nodded. Very possible. They began to scan the planet's surface just as Durant arrived. He joined them at the tech station and looked over the data, frowning. Clea gave him some space, turning to look over Leonard's shoulder in navigation. If this place did not have what Creelon wanted, would he go after the next colony on the way? Plot a jump, Clea said, just to be ready in the event we need to get there quickly. Leonard nodded. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Durant spoke up. I'm seeing regular weapons for the most part. The Alliance ship likely relied on the same thing they've been using for the last several years. Markings on the other vessel. I think they were pirates. 
They favored weapons over all else, and just overwhelmed with sheer firepower, but the marks on what's left on their hull don't look like they took a single unshielded hit from our guy. Creelon, Gray offered. Orion's Light does have access to some advanced tech. They may have used their relay cannon. Durant had talked briefly about the weapon after their last engagement. It's why he set about updating the behemoth's shields and offering the same tech to the rest of the Alliance. Those things tore through shields and did considerable damage to the hull, but it wouldn't matter when defenses dropped. Any conventional weapon could finish off a ship at that point. Gray stood. So a pirate attacked this colony and took out a defending ship. Then Creelon shows up and blows away the pirate. He rubbed his chin. Then he goes about his SOP? I don't think so. What do you mean? Adam asked. What's your thought? Our guy seems a little craftier than to follow a rote pattern. If an opportunity presents itself, Gray shrugged. In other words, he just happened to hop in and save this colony. They might have even cooperated with him. I'm reading life signs, Ollie said. Some people did survive this attack. Maybe a lot of people. Which can mean many things, Gray replied. Get Marshall on the line and send the Marines down. But I'm a little nervous this time, so launch a wing of fighters to patrol the area. I want this area secured and held down. I can prepare a new relay to get back to high command, Durant said. Shouldn't take me more than two hours. Do it. Someone needs to get out here to defend these people while they rebuild the orbital weapons. Gray returned to his seat. I think everyone's got an action item. Let's get to work. Clea worked closely with Agatha as they attempted to establish communications with the surface. The Marines prepared for departure and Durant worked on a temporary relay to call in support. Unlike the last colony, this one still had people alive. It made the need to talk to them all the more important. I've got a signal, Agatha said, gesturing to one of her screens. See? But it's terribly weak. I'm thinking personal comm unit? Something designed only for surface communication? It would need a satellite up here to relay our way. Otherwise, they must have towers set up on the surface to carry transmissions. And those might be down too, Clea added. She closed her eyes for a moment, working through the problem. They could easily boost their own signal enough to get a message to the person they were reading below, but they wouldn't be able to hear any reply. Somehow they needed to come up with something simple, since they couldn't transmit voice data. I have an idea, Agatha said. We can send anything we want, and they'll receive it. If they get above any ground interference, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to receive messages in plain text. The size is tiny, and though it might get garbled, they can at least tell us what state they're in. Clea nodded. Good idea, Ensign. Go ahead. Agatha tapped in a message, then read it out loud, giving the surface instructions on how to communicate with them. When Durant finished his relay, it might allow the people to talk to an orbiting ship, but hopefully by then, the behemoth would have the chance to install a proper communications system. Clea turned back to Gray and let him know their progress. He continued working with Adam and Marshall on how the Marines would approach the situation on the surface. They were planning on bringing a relief crew with them, a third shuttle with medics and artisans capable of getting the people back up and running quickly. Creelon was not on the planet anymore, nor in system, which was worrisome. If he got what he wanted, the behemoth was running behind. If he didn't, then another colony was in jeopardy. But they couldn't leave the people defenseless. Any criminal could come along and cause some serious trouble and slavers would be worse. Though this one planet may be a small loss when compared to what Creelon's up to, I hate to be cynical or cold about it. Ma'am, Agatha drew Clea's attention back to her. I've received a text message. I'm cleaning it up, but basically it states that they were attacked and they need aid. The director of the colony's hurt pretty bad and needs medical attention. She has information for us. 
Clea relayed this information to the captain, which upped the priority of their deployment. She turned to Agatha. Let them know we have people on the way to help. They should be there soon. Gray joined them. The Marines are launching now with medical personnel and a couple of fighters just in case we need some air support. We'll have this place locked down in no time. Recently promoted, Sergeant Bobby Jenks and Sergeant Dylan Walsh led two squads of Marines to the surface of the planet. Hoffner planned to coordinate from the relief shuttle, so they'd report into him. But their task was to clear the settlement, lock it down, and ensure everyone remained safe throughout the mission. Jenks looked forward to it. They both received their promotion after the last craziness with the Orion's light, and neither of them could believe it. They'd seen the slow progress of others in the ranks, but this worked out well. Unfortunately, it required a good six-hour video training course, but it was a small price to pay for a higher salary and more responsibility. Still seems weird, having guys call me Sarge. Their shuttle bounced around after breaking atmosphere. Turbulence knocked them around enough to turn some of the younger Marines into whiners. They started razzing each other a few minutes into the drop, enough so that Walsh settled them down with a grunt. Getting too riled up during a relief mission never ended well. Jenks had been involved with plenty in the past, and whenever Marines got colorful before interacting with civilians, there were incidents. He'd never forget when one of the other privates knocked down an administrator because the guy wouldn't leave his house. That came with some demerits, and the civvy wanted to press charges. Luckily, Hoffner, then a lieutenant, talked the guy down. I'm just glad I wasn't the dude who threw the punch. Some lessons are better to learn by watching than doing. Jenks turned to look out the window, frowning at the smoke rising from the settlement they were descending toward. He nudged Walsh and gestured. Great. These pricks messed them up, too. Looks awful, Jenks muttered. Why go in and waste settlers? Is it really about no witnesses? Or are we seeing something else? Psychosis and no witnesses, Walsh replied. Guaranteed. They've got an agenda and don't want to share it with anyone who might be pursuing them. But they screwed up this time, which is probably worrying Captain Hoffner. Oh, dude, he gets worried during inspection, Jenks shook his head. This change-up will mess with him, but I think it's pretty obvious. They must have found what they were after. Or something happened to facilitate a quick departure. An attack? Some other force? I guess we'll find out. The settlement itself was little more than ten buildings, but they were clustered together to form three square blocks of a regular city. Most of them were only one story tall, but a couple pressed three, probably storage units. Homes might have been away from the main area, possibly out near the fields or wherever the people were working. The shuttle came in for a landing, and moments before, he turned to both squads. When we depart the craft, Alpha Squad will come with me to the east. Bravo sticks with Sergeant Walsh on the west side. We'll flank the place cover the perimeter, then set up overwatch. From there, the rest of us will clear the buildings and ensure we've got a secure location. Get me? The men all shouted affirmative. Don't forget, Walsh said, the last planet our buddies met resistance from some jackasses who got left behind. If that happens here, you have to check your fire. There are still non-coms on the planet and no one wants to blow one of them away. Stay frosty but thoughtful. We've got this, guys. Let's be professionals. The shuttle landed and the men departed with Walsh and Jenks shouting after them. Teams separated and started off for their flanking positions, and they surrounded the settlement quickly. Once they were in position, Jenks checked his computer and coordinated with Walsh. They would start sweeping in any moment. I'm reading weapons, Walsh spoke through the general comm. Quite a few. I don't think there are only non-coms there. Ambush, Jenks said. Guys, be ready. This will be ugly if it is. Stick to cover, watch your fire, and keep your corners in check. Go. Jenks led the way, sticking close to one of the buildings and hurrying along toward the center of town. 
The others gave him some space and followed, ensuring they weren't close enough together to make for an easy target. As they pressed on, Jenks kept his head on a swivel, watching all around for action. It came swiftly, gunfire tapping the wall just in front of them. Contact left! Someone yelled and they moved for cover while returning fire. A series of blasts from the behemoth marines nearly took half the roof off where the attack came from and Jenks' guys moved around the building they were beside to temporary safety. I think I was hit, Private Trilling said. Might not have penetrated my armor, though. Man up, then, one of the others said. We don't have time to fix you if it did go through. Jenks spoke to Walsh. We've got contact. You okay? They hit us, too. Walsh replied, at least five on top of a building. We're returning fire. Maybe they'll surrender with a little display of force. Jenks turned to his men. Lay down some suppressive fire. He contacted their air support. Eagle One, this is Blade Two. We need a flyby of the settlement, something low and loud. Do you copy? Copy that, Blade Two. You got problems down there? Nothing too terrible, but hopefully with a little danger close, they might settle down. The Marines opened fire on the building, laying into it. A couple went around the other side of the building and offered a different angle. No one returned fire on them, but Jenks had a feeling they were either hiding up there or trying to find a way down on the other side. The fighters would definitely give them something to think about. He heard the engines roaring overhead long before they arrived. When they flew over, they rattled the building and made the very ground shake with their passing. All violence stopped for a moment, but as soon as the ships were gone, the bad guys opened up again. God damn it, they're determined to play with us. Give those idiots some grenades. Two men got in position, cooked their grenades, and hurled them from opposite sides of the building. They sailed through the air, landing with an audible plink, even over the gunfire. A man shouted from the roof in alarm. Two explosions brought about a series of screams. Jenks glanced just in time to see the meaty remains of one of their attackers hit the ground. A quick scan indicated of the six people they had been fighting, only two survived, and of those, one somehow remained uninjured. Jenks decided to try a little diplomacy now that they were in a position of strength. He shouted, We know there's only one of you combat effective left. Give it up, man. You'll die if not. You know nothing of death, the man yelled back. Jenks watched his scan as a gunshot went off. The injured man's life signs went dead. Are you kidding me? He's... He can't be. Don't do it. Come on, this doesn't have to end this way. You'll never defeat us, scum! Another gunshot sounded the end of the man's life. His suicide shocked Jenks, but he snapped out of it quickly, turning to the others. We have to move. Let's support Walsh. You two. He grabbed some men. Get on top of the building to the flank of their attackers as quickly and quietly as possible. Get ready to tear them up. We'll provide some suppressive fire from another angle. Should keep them busy long enough for you to get a good shot. Shoot to kill? One asked. Jenks sighed. I would love one alive, but I don't think they're interested in obliging. Let's worry about being safe before grabbing live intel. They hustled in the direction of the sounds of violence, a firefight that went louder than their own. Jenks checked his scanner as they moved and felt a wave of relief hit him as he noted none of the behemoth crew were down. He heard Walsh over the calm, remaining calm as he gave orders. They were planning their own means of ending the fight. Walsh, we're closing in on your position. I've got two men taking one of the adjacent buildings to lay down some fire. I think we've got this. Walsh replied. Keep your guys back. We're going to try to take some of these yahoos alive. How? Stay back and provide overwatch in case there are more, Walsh said. Just be sure we don't get flanked. Jenks gave the order, redirecting his troops to security positions. He advanced closer to see what his partner had in mind. Leaning around a corner, he caught a glimpse of the building the enemy fought from. Once again on the roof. Two Marines fled the scene just as the rest of their unit opened fire. The suppression kept the enemy's head down. Fire in the hole! Walsh shouted, and the rest of the Marines took cover. A couple massive explosions brought the whole building down. 
People screamed over the sound of crumbling mortar, and the second the rocks settled, the Marines darted out, plunging into the dust to collect whoever survived the blast. Jenks shook his head. The idea worked, but he never would have considered it, just for the fact he wanted to preserve the infrastructure of the place. Then again, the settlers did lie, so losing a building shouldn't be such a big deal. He hoped they didn't have a choice, but either way, he figured they'd lodge a complaint about the destruction. A couple gunshots sounded and Jenks' heart hammered in his chest. Report in, he spoke into the comm. Walsh, was that our guys firing? He knew it wasn't. The new rifles had a distinct sound to them, not at all like a discharging bullet. Despite the disorientation of falling through a damn building, one of them must have found the strength to take a shot. Another gun went off, this time on the behemoth side. Jenks cursed and moved in, holding his weapon at the ready. As he approached, he saw one of their men down and a couple marines standing over a dead terrorist. The other criminals had been secured, each locked up with cuffs. Their medic knelt by the man on the ground, but he shook his head. Clean hit, point blank to the face mask. He's gone. Walsh cursed, but kept his cool. Jenks had a harder time. He felt a compelling urge to finish off the rest of them, but fought it back. Considering what they were dealing with and what they needed, the survivors would be able to answer a lot of questions. But the fact they managed to take one of them down, sit heavy with Jenks. Let's police up his body, Walsh said. Get it ready for transport, and move these assholes into the shuttle. Ensure they're secure and provide any medical aid to ensure they don't die on departure. The last thing we need is for Gregson's death to be in vain. Jenks let them carry on while grabbing his own unit, moving them through the settlement to clear the rest of the place. He found the settlers in a building, unharmed with their own injured to take care of. A sense of frustration hit him. These pricks didn't even warn them. They must have thought the enemy had the upper hand. He didn't even want to speak with them and instead left two men to stand guard and stepped down, tapping into Hoffner's calm. Sir, I've got the settlers, but we had some action down here. We lost Gregson. Damn it, Hoffner sighed. We're incoming. Is the area secure? Yes, sir. We've locked it down and are in security positions around the perimeter. We managed to take some prisoners, too. Well done. See you soon, Sergeant. Jenks killed the calm and walked off his irritation. At least there was some success to show for the loss of their man. But why did these animals keep leaving people behind? Or had they? Were these criminals still in system somewhere? He felt compelled to warn someone. He sent the message to Hoffner, this time as a text. He'd let him decide who to tell. Thinking too much beyond securing the settlement went above his pay grade. Hoffner sat in the shuttle as it raced for the settlement where Jenks and Walsh met resistance. He reached out to Marshall and gave him a report, letting him know what happened between his men and the Orion's light guys. The loss of their man came first, then he went into his opinion about the situation. The settlers are still alive, he said, and there was a large number of men set in ambush for us. This leads me to believe we're not alone in this system. I think the Orion's light is still here somewhere and their ship must be up there too. Explain. They haven't left any survivors yet, Hoffner said. Why start now? And the last fight we had with them on the other planet involved some guys who were stuck there. They didn't set up to fight us. They just happened to have their camp in a good position to deal with intruders. The conflict down here was calculated and planned. Fair point. Find out what's going on then and I'll report to the captain. You're going to have to make this fast, Hoffner. If what you say is true, then we've got a chance to stop them right here. Yes, sir, I'm on it. Hoffner heard the comm line drop and he returned his attention to the task at hand. He didn't particularly care for interrogation and preferred to leave it to the professionals, but in a pinch, he could manage. The tough part came from the fact that he had to deal with people who just killed one of his men. The challenge came from not getting hostile and staying professional. Despite years of moving up the ranks, that was one part of his job he never got entirely good at but he'd never hurt someone in his charge, never lost control. It just caused some internal conflict, 
arguments with himself as emotion battled reason. They'd better have some valuable intel. I'm not in the mood for wasting time at this point. Gray pulled Adam into his small office just off the bridge when Marshall reached out to them. They listened to the briefing, acknowledging the ground force's concerns. If they were right, the Orion's light ship harbored technology hiding them from long-range scans, and Ollie was damn good at his job. They'd have to try something else. Thank you, Marshal, Gray said. Keep us informed of what Hoffner finds out during his interrogation. Gray, out. He turned to Adam. Do you have an ETA on Durant's makeshift communications satellite? No, but the guy's a frickin' genius, and he's got some of our best helping him. It won't take long. Gray nodded. I'd love to have him to help Ollie locate the vessel. I think Clea could be pulled, Adam said. After all, she found that information about the enemy back in the day. She's probably the right person to take a look at this, too. Okay, let's get her on it. I don't want to let this ship slip away. But if they're lingering, it must mean they've got some valuable intel to collect still. You don't think their commander's still down there, do you? Adam shrugged. If I was him, I wouldn't risk it. He clearly knew someone would come after him, though, or he wouldn't have bothered delaying us at the settlement with an ambush. Arrogance is a hard vice to shake, Gray sighed. I want Ollie and Clea to expand their search. Let's see if we can find anything on the planet's surface that doesn't belong. A shuttle can't be that easy to hide. The reactor, even contained, should give off something unusual. Focus on that and turn something up. Adam nodded. We're on it, sir. I'll monitor our Marines with Marshall if you take the scans. We might want to let Durant know the ship could still be in system, Adam said. In case we have to fight, he'll want in on helping with power regulation. He already boosted the shields, but said something about manual control for any big attacks. At least until his automation is fully implemented. Okay. Drop that message to him when you reach out to Clea. Also, find out how long we've got on that comm device. We need those reinforcements out here soon, in case we have to take off in a hurry. Think that's a possibility? Gray nodded. I'm sure of it. If these Orion's light guys run, we have to follow and quick. I don't want them to slip away without us right on their tail. We need to be all over this. We've already got them causing plenty of havoc for innocent civilians. This is a big risk, and whatever they're after, let's just say we need to find it before they do. Chapter 6 Weon felt his stomach crawl as the shuttle climbed up toward the mountain where Varlin's weather station was located. He felt ill that the director of the colony had inadvertently doomed the man, the hermit who lived up there. His only hope was that the man wouldn't be there, perhaps off gathering food or something, and see their arrival. Of course, he might see them and hurry back. Not many people could possibly visit the station. Weon figured supply deliveries were the only thing to count on up there. If he thought this was one of those, he'd definitely be there to greet them. Regardless, the poor hermit was in for a terrible surprise. I need to find a way to help him. Weon struggled against his bonds and fought at his gag. Creelon sat across from him and turned away from the window, smiling at the activity. I see you're not comfortable in your bonds. Perhaps if you'd help me instead of hinder, I wouldn't have to resort to such things. Weon glared at him, eyes narrow. Oh, don't bother giving me a sour look. I'm not impressed. What we're doing will go down in history as the right thing. You'll see soon enough. Right now, you should just be happy you're still alive. I could have left you to rot with the rest of your pathetic colony, but instead you get to be here, witnessing a galaxy-altering event. I'd love to see you hanged for your crimes. That would be quite the event, you bastard. I can't remove your gag. We're almost there. But if you'd like to watch again, Garant will have his scanner on for you to watch through your screen. I want to hear your thoughts when I get back. Perhaps you can offer some pointers on diplomacy. I tend to lead with a gun, 
but maybe there's a better way. I doubt it, but I'm open to discovery. Your sick humor doesn't do anything to disguise how horrible of a creature you are, Krelon. When you are captured, you will not last long in the Alliance courts. For all the lives you took, you'll be executed. I guarantee it. Weon wished he could voice his opinions, but all he could do was stare at the man. He wanted to memorize his tormentor's face. He never wanted to forget what true evil looked like. This creature, this horrible thing, killed those he had lived with for the better part of two years, and he'd likely do it again on this planet. And I can't do anything to stop it. Sir? A voice crackled through the overhead speakers. We're reading a massive warship approaching orbit. They've deployed shuttles to the settlement. Creelon smirked. I see. Not at all surprising. It took the Alliance long enough to figure out the pattern. At least I was right about when they would step in. Our men must have sent them the message, so they'll go to the correct settlement for the ambush. By the time they clean that mess up, we'll be long gone. Hope filled Weon's heart, despite Creelon's assessment of the situation. If someone truly came to the planet to stop the Orion's light, then there was a chance this all might end here. I need to find a way out of this mess to help. I have to delay Creelon. Somehow I must. He struggled, making quite the ruckus. What is wrong with you? Creelon removed the gag. What is it? Weon coughed several times, then glared at Creelon. You must stop this, Creelon. You must... At some point, you were a Keelan citizen, and you valued our ways enough to put your life on the line to protect them. Can't you find some piece of that man to embrace? Remember the point in time when you swore an oath? An oath I took seriously until they threw me in prison. Creelon shook his head and handed the gag to one of his men. Put that back in. This one doesn't have anything of interest to say. Weon struggled, shouting out before they could silence him. You can't murder this man we're going to see. He's done nothing wrong. The gag back in place. He grunted several times, but gave up quickly. Creelon scowled out the window. That's better. Weon, embrace the future with me. When you see what it is, and how I can fix all the woes of this galaxy, you'll be glad to have sat beside me. You're one of the few people alive who can say they've seen us work firsthand. A rare privilege. Nothing about spending time with you people is a privilege. Weon's brain screamed. I've never killed someone. I never wanted to, nor thought myself capable. Staring at this monster, I know for a fact I wouldn't hesitate given the opportunity. For the sake of the galaxy and the safety of my race, I'd be forced to. The shuttle landed, and Creelon sent his men out to find Varlin. They watched on the security camera as four of the eight men they brought crept up on the weather station with their guns out. Each man covered a different angle, keeping an eye out for trouble. Weon despaired at the fact they'd take this man, a veteran, no less. Surely they'll have some empathy for a man who served like them? A gunshot startled Weon, and his eyes widened as one of the men on the screen dropped to the ground. A mist of blood danced in the air from where his head had been a moment before. The other three dashed for cover, leaning against the weather station. They frantically checked their scanners, desperate for any clue as to where the attack came from. Creelon frowned and performed his own scans. He hummed. I'm not picking anything up. Perhaps it's an automated defense. He adjusted the computer and scanned again. No, I'm not picking anything like that up either. This maniac must have something to mask himself and whatever he's got out there. Good. I hope this man kills you all. Another shot rang out, and a second man dropped, this one from a blow to the stomach. The projectile went straight through his armor and sprayed blood all over the wall he was using for cover. One of his companions dropped down to check him and was rewarded with a headshot from their adversary, straight through the side with a clean exit. Three down, 
Go, Varlin, go. He's quite the shot, Creelon said. He picked up a microphone and tapped some buttons. As he spoke, his voice echoed through speakers located outside the ship. Varlin, this is Creelon Arvax. You might be able to take out the men I brought with me, but I'll promise you this. If the last man out there dies, I'll launch this shuttle and obliterate the weather station. He paused a moment, but no one replied. When he continued, he closed his eyes for a moment, clearly fighting back some rage. You know that if I start firing weapons into this mountain, I'll get you eventually, regardless of what type of tools you have to hide your presence. We merely want to speak. Speakers within the shuttle crackled, and a gruff voice came through a moment later. That's why your boys tried to infiltrate my station with guns, because they just wanted to talk. Creelon killed the external speakers and tapped into the comm link. Impressive. What did you do in the military, Varlin? Communications? I was a janitor, Varlin snarked. You want to talk, let's talk. Chats don't have to be in person. They're more personal. And deadly. Talk now or I'll just walk. Blow up the weather station. Start shooting the mountain. I'll be long gone. Creelon clenched his fists. Very well. Do you care about the settlers? They did sell you out, I suppose, but not intentionally. Get to the point, Arvax, and I know who you are. You don't remember me, but I was on one of your ships. Ground troop taken to an assignment. You gave us a ride. I didn't bother to memorize the names of every passenger, but I'm glad you're already aware of me. It'll save time. You must know that if I don't get what I want, I'll kill everyone on this planet. So talk to me about the star chart. Varlin didn't answer right away. You're here for that, huh? Creelon's eyes lit up, but he took a deep breath to remain steady. I am. So your people entrusted it to you, eh? I'm not in this remote hellhole because of its holiday possibilities. Varlin sighed. You must know I've been ordered to protect it, Arvax. I'm not simply going to give it to you. The director of the settlement dies first, Creelon spoke quickly. I'll have her skinned alive, the other settlers too each one strung up so their fleshless bodies can be seen from miles around. With good enough telescopes, you'll be able to watch them be consumed by scavengers if you're so inclined. Would you give up your charge because of a threat like that? Varlin asked. Do you remember what discipline is? Better question. If one of your men did what you're asking me to do, what consequences would they face? Creelon muted the line and slapped the side of the seat hard. Weon grinned at the man's frustration. As he listened to the two speak, he had to admit he liked Varlin's attitude. He could push Creelon's buttons, and while that might be dangerous, the former Anthar deserved all the abuse he could get. However this played out, Weon wondered if he might be able to escape into the mountain. If he did... He'd have to find Varlin and pray someone on the surface could remove his bonds. Plus, the force that had been ambushed might be looking for them. Saviors were on the planet. He just had to get to them. The chances of it seemed slim, though. He needed to get past four guys and Creelon, and the bonds were attached to the seat. He began to work at them, testing to see if he might slip them over the back or somehow wriggle free from the ship itself. If he was successful, then he might finally evade further madness. Your point is well taken, Creelon said. Standing in the face of seeing people tortured to death is quite different than merely following orders. You may well be able to do it, but when I start in on them and broadcast their screams up here, you'll get the chance to decide just how much those orders and your precious discipline soothes you at night. I know that you might think you can be hard, but considering you're still taking orders from those high-command fools, I'm going to gamble on the fact you've adopted their moral compunctions. 
They believe in helping individuals over the whole, and if you do too, then you're not going to preserve a star chart over lives. I don't know what this chart's for, Varlin said, but if you want it, then I can't let you have it. Very well, Creelon practically growled. We'll start with the station and move on to your friends. He sat up suddenly, muted the line, and turned to his men. Get out there. Have Saren run from his position and draw the man's fire. I'll have a wide-beam scanner out to catch the muzzle flash, or even the most temporary of heat signature. That's where you direct your fire. The men immediately filed off the ship and the door closed behind them. Weon turned to the screen, still broadcasting from one of the dead men. He saw the final soldier, Saren, dash from his position, and a gunshot rang out, blasting him directly in the back of the head. Creelon tapped something on his computer and the four men opened fire. Clever, Varlin spoke through the speaker again. I'm out of here, Arvax. Good luck finding me. Creelon smiled as he directed the shuttle to launch. He zeroed in on something, working on the computer quickly while watching the results. He muttered, with the microphone muted. Aha, a modified Stiltec cloak. No wonder you were so hard to locate. But I've worked with those before, Varlin, and they're not as infallible as you seem to think. Get to these coordinates. Creelon drew his own gun and moved to one of the side doors and opened it up. Freezing wind whistled through the craft, and Weon immediately began to shiver. He couldn't believe Creelon could stand there so steadily as the wind came howling through. The man was tough beyond measure, not like any normal bully. They circled around and Creelon aimed his weapon. He fired once, then gestured for the ship to descend. Weon leaned to look shocked to see a splatter of blood in a bank of snow. How did he do that? The ship landed and Creelon paced off not even ten feet away. He kicked something, a large gun, then nudged the man over onto his back. Nice to meet you in person, Varlin, Creelon said, aiming his weapon at the man's face. I believe you have something that belongs to me. Won't. Ever. Give it. Varlin struggled to move. The blast took his shoulder, but it looked ghastly, even from Weon's position. As he tried to sit up, Creelon kicked him back down. My charge is over. Creelon knelt and took the man's computer from his left wrist and looked it over. Hmm. Let's just see if it's on here, shall we? He performed a scan, and he leaned his head back. Thank the fates. You carried it with you, eh? I suppose that makes sense. If it would have been in the station, anyone could have stolen it. You can't. Whatever you're doing, just don't. I believe your time's at an end, Varlin. Creelon looked around. I should leave you to die up here. I'm pretty sure without communications and bleeding like that, you won't last long. Seems fitting to let you perish amongst the cold of this place. Forgive me. Varlin slumped, his body going still. Creelon turned back to the body. Hmm. Seems you died quicker than I thought. Or at least you're well on the way. Enjoy your final resting place, scum. I'm sure the mountain will provide a decent burial. He boarded the shuttle. Get us back to the final star. Sir, what about the men at the station? I'll address them. Creelon got on the comm. Listen, there will be people coming for this station soon. Delay them as long as you can. We need time to get back to the ship and depart. Fight to the last breath. If our goals are to be achieved, I need those Alliance bastards to remain distracted while we jump out of here. Do you understand? Weon's heart sank when he heard their passionate affirmation. The brainwashed masses working for Creelon worried him, and now they had the information they needed. The situation felt hopeless. 
Whatever destination lay before them, it could not possibly be good. Not for the Alliance, the Galaxy, or Weon himself. Clea sat beside Ollie with her tablet, reading through countless lines of code. He did the same as they tried to come up with the best way to find the enemy vessel, hidden by some technology neither of them ever heard of. As she considered the problem, she battled some serious frustration. Their other enemy didn't bother to hide, so such efforts were unnecessary. No, they liked to barrel in without regard for their safety. Every planetary satellite had been taken out, which made the task of searching the system all the more painful. Without those signal boosters, they had to rely on whatever power they could manage on their own. This meant launching probes, and they had enough of them, but she wanted to ensure they were looking for the right information. They must be hiding their vessel by operating at a low power level. What would be the minimum output required for a capital ship to function? If the crew wore environmental suits, they could practically shut everything off. They wouldn't even need heat, per se. But if that was the case, then the people on board would be the thing to search for. Not a reactor. What about a life scan? Clea asked. Ships the size we're looking for generally put off too much interference to get any accurate life readings, but if they shut everything off... Ollie nodded. I've got some good code from the hospital for those type of scans. They were primarily used in low-tech areas of planets, searching for people who were lost. We can make a few adjustments for Keelan physiology and send out the probes. How long? A couple minutes. The parameters are easy to set. Ollie went about the work and Clea prepared the probes. They'd launch several, each in a different direction, and have them relay back to the behemoth anything they found. This would also allow them to search without moving the ship. No one would know they were on to them until it was too late. Clea sent a quick report to Adam and Gray, letting them know where they were at. Adam gave them approval to launch when ready, and they prioritized the launch. Several fighters provided screen for the behemoth while they were operating in the system, so they had to send out a mass message, letting the pilots know to stay clear of the probes. Adam joined them. Do you think this is going to work? Clea nodded. I do. She glanced at her tablet. Durant has sent me a message. The shields are ready for a fight, and his relay satellite will be able to launch in five minutes. Great. Adam turned to Agatha. Prepare a message to Alliance High Command. Tell them we're going to need backup out here ASAP and give them the bad news about the destroyer. Yes, sir. Agatha leaned over her console and began recording her message. Ollie's hand poised over a section of his terminal. I'm launching the probes now. He tapped several times, then turned to the primary view screen. A tactical map of the area appeared, showing the course of the various probes. Each of them sent out a pulse to capture data, rapidly returning it to the behemoth. Nothing in Sector 5, Ollie muttered. Whoa, um, Probe 7 just hit an asteroid. It's, um... Kind of broken. Clea shook her head. No need to be tentative about that. It happens. Sorry. Ollie cleared his throat. Oh, look at this. Clea leaned over him and frowned at the readings. Probe 3, flying near the natural satellite of the planet, picked something up, but it was only a brief ping. They brought up the data and scrubbed it, trying to see what it might have found. A partial life form detection, though only at an organic level as in whatever it found might have been dead. Let's focus on that sector. Turn our own scans on it, full power. Clea looked back at her tablet and began tapping away. Yes, really narrow our search to that area. The satellite is lifeless with no atmosphere whatsoever. Something's over there for sure. Adam cleared his throat. Do you think you found their ship? Either that, Clea replied. Or another discovery no one ever imagined possible, a life form that can survive in deep space. Either way, we're investigating and should have results momentarily. Good, Adam said. Keep me informed. They watched their screen fill with more data, a much larger centralized mass of life. As they sorted it and scrubbed the data, it became apparent that they found a mass of people. The ship was hiding behind the moon. 
The ship itself emitted no power at all. They'd shut the reactor off. I can't imagine how uncomfortable that thing is right now. Found it, Clea said, hiding just on the other side of the natural satellite. They've got their power off. That should be an advantage, Adam replied, turning to his seat. They'll have to crank it back on to fight properly with us. Maybe this is our opportunity to take it out. Any idea how long it will take for them to be combat effective? Clea sighed and shook her head. I'm afraid not. I can speak to how long an Alliance ship or this one might take, but they clearly have wildly different technology. I'd be speculating without a good scan of their reactor, while it's at 100%. And considering it's off right now, I can't even determine if they use the same pulse reactors we do. Understood. Adam tapped the comm and reached out to Gray. Captain, we found the enemy vessel. They've got no power and are trying to hide near this planet's moon. I'd like permission to engage immediately. So someone's still down on the surface, Gray replied. Prepare battle stations. I'll be right up and we'll take them out. Have all pilots get into position for an attack run. I want to hit them with everything we've got. Hoffner found the Orion's light troops beyond uncooperative. No amount of coercing or threatening could get them to talk. He began to consider some extreme ideas when Jenks hurried over to him, offering a quick salute. The interruption was both annoying and welcome. He wasn't getting anywhere with the prisoners anyway. What is it, Sergeant? We've just spoken with the director of the colony, Jenks replied. She said that the commander of the Orion's Light basically trapped them all in the building where we found them and was heading up to a nearby weather station to talk to a vet. Some guy named Varlin? Why? He's looking for something? Some star chart? Jenks shrugged. Beyond that, they don't know where it leads or anything. They lied their way down here, saying they were special forces and on some secret mission. Apparently it was the Orion's Light that took out the pirates. They saved the colony only to come down here and cause havoc. Christ, prepare shuttle. We have to get out there. Hoffner turned to another soldier. Get these scum into a holding cell. Two of you stay to provide guard duty. If they try to escape, kill them. We don't have time for more challenges. I'm going to report into the behemoth before we go. Let's move, people. Jenks rushed off and Hoffner radioed back to Marshall to give him the news. He went through everything and told them the next step. Then he got the news about the discovery of the enemy vessel. A potential fight was about to break out up there, and if it did, they might finish everything right there. We have to get to this Varlin character then right away and help him. If we can stop him from being assaulted, interrogated, and killed, we might also be able to capture their commander. Hoffner paused. Or better yet... Put his crazy ass down. Do what you have to do, Marshall replied. Just ensure that we stop them from getting off the planet with the star chart. By any means necessary. Hoffner's brows raised. Sir, you mean rules of engagement don't apply? Whatever this guy is up to, we have to stop him. So yes, the rules of engagement don't apply. Literally, do anything you have to. I want him stopped, Hoffner. Before he leaves the surface of the planet, if you can. If not, then get any intel you can on what he's doing. This star chart business I'll relate to the captain. Thank you. Hoffner jogged to the shuttle. The engines were already fired up and it was ready to go. Jenks met him as they moved up the ramp. Prisoners are secure, Jenks said, and we're ready to fly. Hoffner told him what Marshall said, and even the gruff sergeant looked uneasy with the order. They never operated without limits, so their target must have been a real ass. Of course, considering how his people acted, it didn't surprise Hoffner at all. They were zealots, total lunatics, and the fact they killed innocents and themselves painted their leader in a sinister light. As the ship took off, they left the door open. Everyone strapped in and prepared for a hot drop. They'd swoop in, depart the ship, and throw themselves into a fight if necessary. If the ambushes were any sort of indication, they were in for another brawl. Orion's light crew seemed intent on throwing their lives away for whatever their cause was. Hoffner only wished they'd published it somewhere.
it would be good to know what kind of crazies they were dealing with. Considering the situation, it felt like they were some kind of religious order, another extremist group. Earth dealt with plenty of that before taking to the stars. They still had a few of them operating here and there, but nothing like these guys. Not anymore, at least. As the mountain came into view, he checked his rifle and took a steadying breath. Hoffner marched into countless battles in his lifetime, but he never became jaded to them. While he outwardly remained calm and cool, inwardly he recognized the distinct possibility of never coming back. Some of his peers purged such thoughts entirely as if they didn't care. Life can be snuffed out at any time, anywhere. Combat just ups the odds. Marshall told him that once, and he took it to heart. He hadn't been a lieutenant then, cocky and sure he could take on any task and walk away unscathed. They lost four Marines on an op, and it hit him hard. His commanding officer did his best to bring the gravity of the situation to bear, and it worked. Hoffner respected the danger much more, even if he couldn't do anything about mitigating it. Roland, the pilot, broke through his thoughts. We'll be at the LZ in less than three minutes. Their suits protected them from the cold, but the HUD of Hoffner's helmet indicated how chilly it had become. The mountain air matched what one might expect on Earth, with the ambient temperature rapidly approaching zero. Visibility also took a hit as misty snow flurried all about them. Life scans are positive near the weather station, Roland spoke up again. I'm reading warmer temperatures near the structure itself. That's where the people are I'm picking up. How many? Three? Fortified, I'm sure, Jenks said. We know there should only be one person out here. Three's better than ten, Hoffner replied. Unfortunately, we don't know if one of those that we're about to encounter is Varlin. I've got another life sign. Faint, though, Roland hummed. Nearly two hundred yards from the station on a hill. Wait, I'm reading. There's a ship about to break atmosphere, sir. Not one of ours. It's really hauling ass. Send word to the behemoth. We're focusing on the ground mission. Take us down near the faint life sign and we'll go from there. Hoffner turned to Jenks. When we disembark, set up a perimeter. Walsh, you go deal with those jackasses at the weather station. If my guess is right, we're about to try to save Varlin's life and take back his home. The shuttle landed in the snow roughly fifty yards from their objective. Hoffner brought the scan up on his computer while Jenks did his job, spreading his men out. Walsh and his crew headed toward the weather station. The body in the snow was covered in blood. It could be seen even from the shuttle at such a distance. Crimson against white made a vibrant landmark. Hoffner approached as one of the medics began applying pressure to a wound. The man's eyes fluttered open and he swallowed hard. He took the chart. What is it? Hoffner knelt beside him. What did he take? Star. Chart. Two. Varlin grunted, eyes closing tightly. His whole body stiffened just before the medic gave him an injection, something for the pain, apparently. As he relaxed, the medic continued his work, frantically looking him over. An old monastery. The lost ones home. The lost ones? Who are they? Hoffner looked at the medic, who shook his head. I'm sorry, sir, he's delirious from blood loss. If he wouldn't have been wearing this suit, he'd be dead from hypothermia. I need to get him back to the behemoth for surgery, and we might be able to save his life. Hoffner nodded. Let's prep him to move and get this place squared away. I'm pretty sure we won't be staying in the system long with this news. In the distance, he heard gunfire and turned to Jenks. Give Walsh some backup. Not that I think he needs it, but better to be safe than sorry. As the other Marines rushed off, Hoffner helped the medic get Varlin into the shuttle and settled. They'd be gone soon, and with any luck, it wouldn't matter that Orion's light got hold of their objective. Providing the behemoth blew them out of the sky in this system, they could leisurely check out what they were after on their own time. Just gotta save this guy first. One step at a time, Hoffner. Walsh and his men approached the weather station at a brisk but cautious pace. Their scanners indicated their targets had taken refuge inside the weather station, a five-story tower with a massive antenna at the top. The power seemed to be off as they drew closer. 
All the windows were dark, and a nearby generator remained silent. Let's spread out, Walsh spoke into their private comm. Take it from both sides and keep your eyes up. They might be trying to take the higher ground. There are only three of them? Felix, one of the newer privates, said. Why don't we just blast this place with the shuttle and get out of here? Might as well preserve the infrastructure, Johnson spoke up, a corporal. As you said, there's only three, so why bother to blow up a building for them? Cut the chatter, Walsh added. Just get into position and let's take them down. A spray of gunfire littered the snow near them. Coming from up high, the men rushed the building, pressing against it and moving around toward the entrance. The clean miss gave away far more than the enemy wanted. Walsh was certain. Now they knew where they were and that they were twitchy to boot. If they'd have waited another few moments, they would have easily gotten a decent shot on one of us. A little more aim, too. Dumbasses. No more shots were fired as they got into position near the doors, which were wide open. Why didn't they shut these up? Walsh ran a quick scan and frowned. Unstable substances framed the door. They booby-trapped it. Everyone move back around the building. We have to spring this, Walsh gestured. They've given themselves a little insurance in case someone just charged in. Bombs, Felix said. Looks like it's unstable enough for a grenade to crack. Toss one in and everyone get to cover. Watch the windows in case they come for another shot. Felix tossed the grenade and the Marines rushed out of the way, hurrying toward the rocks for cover. Gunshots caught the ground behind them and one of the men cried out in pain. Johnson shouted, Contact! Third story! They returned fire, blasting away at the windows just as the grenade went off. It triggered the booby trap as expected, and their helmets quelled the noise to avoid interfering with their hearing. But the resounding explosion shook the ground and caused the entire building to tremble. Christ, did they nearly take the whole place down? Walsh looked around for their down man, but they were all with him. Who's hurt? Got shot in the leg, Tellus said. I'm good. You sure? Just want to put them down. Walsh caught movement on the second floor and took quick aim before firing. He saw a man's face for a split second before blood obscured it. Scratch one for sure. More shots rang out, and they had to move when the shots got too close, rushing toward different cover for a better angle. We've got to get in there and finish this. I'm on it, Johnson said, darting forward. Wait, Walsh sighed. Give him cover. Light those windows up. They littered the building with enough ordnance to make Walsh think they probably should have just blown it up with the shuttle. Someone took several shots at Johnson but missed him, allowing him to enter the building. Walsh ducked and switched his HUD to see his man's perspective, ordering two more soldiers to get to the door and provide support. Johnson rushed up the stairs, drawing his sidearm and letting his rifle hang at his side. Someone started shouting as the Marine opened fire with his pistol. Three shots caught the target in the stomach and chest, with the last one catching him in the neck. As the man dropped to the ground, his companion came to the stairs and fired. Johnson fell against the wall as the blow popped his shoulder, but he managed to lift his weapon and fire at the same time as his opponent. The bullet ripped through the man's face just as he squeezed the trigger. A full burst tore at Johnson's chest, tossing him backwards out the window. What the hell? Walsh shouted, gesturing for his men to rush forward. Johnson landed in the snow and didn't move. Medic, get on him now. Tell us and Felix clear the building. I think they're all gone, but be sure. Form a perimeter and secure this area. Jenks and his team showed up as they were checking over their fallen man. They went about ensuring no more enemies were around before Jenks joined him. Will he be okay? I can't say, Walsh said. His life signs are weak, but not gone. We've got to get him aboard the ship. Crazy bastard ran in there by himself. Sounds like us when we were him. Jenks radioed to the shuttle and requested an immediate evac. Walsh remained beside Johnson while they waited, silently praying his guy would make it. He doesn't deserve to die here like this. Come on, man. You can make it.
Chapter 7 Gray leaned forward, watching the viewscreen intently as they moved in to attack the enemy vessel. He hoped he might glean some insight by staring at the image, something about the Orion's light he could use in the fight to come. No part of him believed they would simply swoop in and destroy the ship. The commander was far too clever to leave his ship completely undefended. They were unpredictable and beyond committed. They hadn't faced anyone yet who seemed quite so formidable. Even the enemy had a defined and simple purpose, to eliminate their opponents. Whatever this guy had in mind seemed far more sinister. He left some people alive, kidnapped others, and now played a game with his ship hiding near a moon. Even the pirates had a pattern. This guy just threw his off. Message from Captain Hoffner, Agatha said. He's contacted me directly to let us know a shuttle is on its way up. Definitely Orion's light. Fleeing the scene? Adam asked. I wonder who's on that ship. Think we might be lucky enough to have the commander out there? I hope so. Gray nodded to him. Get Ravente to send the fighters in to harass it, but tell them to be careful. I don't trust this guy, and there might be something more going on that we're not aware of. I don't want to lose anyone to a cheap trick. I feel like a soldier about to enter a minefield. Let's make sure we don't trigger anything. Wing Commander Megan Pointer's unit flew security for the behemoth during the operation. Tiger Wing escorted ships to the surface, then maintained air superiority, just in case the enemy decided to bring their own ships to take out the ground forces. Ground Commander Esteban Ravente contacted all ships to let them know the enemy had been found. They redirected for an attack. A new message reached her as they moved into position. Panther 1, this is Giant Control. There's an enemy shuttle leaving the surface that may have a high-value target on board. Problem is, it might also be a trap. I want you to cautiously take it out. Megan's brows lifted. Cautiously? Any suggestions on how that works, sir? Be wary of the surroundings. Have half your wing hang back as backup in the event that it has escorts. Nail it, though, Pointer. This might save us a lot of grief. We're on it. Megan switched over to communicate with the rest of her ships. Got us a new mission, everyone? We're going after an HVT leaving the planet's surface. I want five through eight to provide security as I take two through four in on an attack run. If they have escorts, deal with them. Any questions? If it's just a shuttle, why the caution? Squadron leader Mick Torrin, Panther 2, asked. Would we read any escorts? They might have something else up their sleeve, Megan replied. Command feels like these guys are pretty nasty customers, so let's give them some respect and make sure we do all this right. You all ready? The different ships sounded an affirmative. All right, follow my lead and we'll get this done. Megan accelerated to full throttle, adjusting course to meet the coordinates set by giant control. Turning to her scanner, she scowled at the single blip showing up ahead of her. Something felt off about the situation, but she couldn't put her finger on what. What else could be out there that they should worry about? She upped the sensitivity of the computer, pressing it to find even smaller items than ships. It would take longer to receive the results, but they had several minutes before they'd engage the enemy. Three minutes of constant flight later, the results came back. There was some kind of debris between them and their quarry, but not natural, like space dust or rocks. Megan sent the information back to the behemoth, requesting an immediate analysis, but she already didn't want to fly through whatever it was. They didn't look like mines, but the technology they were faced with differed dramatically from what they built on Earth. It may not even be from an Alliance foundry. A few moments passed, and she started to get nervous. Should I have us fall back until we get confirmation? The enemy shuttle had to have them on scans already. They weren't exactly being subtle, but any delay might give their target a chance to get some defenses going. If they didn't already. An urgent message came to her from the behemoth and she engaged the comm. This is Tech Officer Percy Dahl. I've received your request and you should avoid what you've seen at all costs. It's some kind of magnetic dust. When it makes contact with your shields, it should ignore them, hitting the hull of your vessel. The offset of heat will allow it to chew through and expose key systems, effectively destroying your ship. 
Christ. Megan sent a quick message to Pantherwing to fall back, and she climbed, redirecting her course back the way they came. Is there any way to counter the stuff? What about long term? No one's going to want to encounter it out here. Readings indicate that it's got a shelf life. The moment it entered the vacuum, it began to deteriorate and should be completely gone in the next half hour. I'd guess it lasts roughly three hours based on the rate of decay. Percy paused. Yes, my math plays out. It looks like there's a lane of the stuff leading from the moon toward the surface of the planet. They must have let it out while they flew by, but how would they deploy it without risking their own ship? Academic now. Can you get me a map around it? Working on it, ma'am? Megan cursed and cut in giant control. Sir, we've got a problem. She sent the data over. We're looking for a safe way around this mess, but keep the behemoth out of it, too. Might not be as catastrophic, but it could still cause some serious damage. Roger that, Panther One. Looks like you might have some other problems to deal with anyway. Megan glanced at her scanner and cursed again. A group of fighters showed up, rounding the moon to avoid their own booby trap. She pulled up a quick schematic, noting they looked an awful lot like the sleek design used by the Alliance ships. They'd lost their silvery exterior in favor of a dark blue that made them harder to see. Eight ships closed on an intercept course. Even numbers. For a change, Megan thought. I don't remember the last time we weren't outnumbered in a fight. I wonder if this is an indication of how good they are, or do they simply have limited resources? Panther Wing, we have incoming fighters closing on our starboard. Break formation, stick with your wingman and engage. Repeat, engage, but stay away from the trap. I'm marking it on your sensors now, so give it a wide berth at all costs. The enemy ships came into visual range and broke, mirroring Panther Wing's tactic of smaller groups of two. Megan and Mick pulled up, altering course to meet their targets. She increased power to her forward shields, anticipating an attack, and she wasn't disappointed. As soon as the enemy leveled out and faced them, they opened fire. Break down and I'll go left, Megan said. We'll see if we can't get around to their six. Mick fired a couple shots before complying, and the fact the enemy didn't even twitch made Megan's stomach sink. They don't give a crap about being hit. She banked hard to the left and hit the afterburner. Either their shields are incredible, or they have nerves of steel. Possibly both. The enemy dove, spinning as they moved to make for harder targets. Mick got around behind one of them and started firing, but the enemy pilot moved so erratically he didn't score a single hit. My computer can't even target that, he shouted. How can their dampeners handle all that maneuvering? No idea. Megan struggled to even get her target in front of her. As they performed an aerial dance, she knew something had to change up. Panther couldn't match this type of flying, so they had to come up with something else. A series of energy blasts flew past her cockpit, and she engaged the forward thrusters, slowing down. The enemy very nearly clipped her as he raced by, and she tried taking a few shots. Unfortunately, he twisted away, avoiding her attack. She launched a missile and let that chase him around for a moment, buying herself a little time to breathe. These guys are intense, Mick. We need some options. Thoughts? I'm a little busy for thinking. She glanced at her sensors, and even in the cold screen, she could see the drama of that battle. The two vessels looped around one another, nearly colliding in their efforts to get a viable firing solution. It looked like two birds at play more than combat, and the flying was pure ballet. The strain in Mick's voice proved he couldn't keep it up forever, though. Their inertial dampeners weren't designed for so many breakneck maneuvers. Megan's ship whined as she performed a particularly wild left and right motion to shake her pursuer and get away from him. The pressure working at her body reminded her of her training days. Giant Control, this is Panther One. We're faced with heavy opposition from fighters with more maneuverability, Megan called out. We're looking for options, but these guys are able to pull off some serious moves. I'm seeing it, Giant Control replied. Your guy was able to shoot down his own missile by spinning in place. I was a little too busy to notice how badass he was, Megan said. Suggestions? We're getting closer and can give you a hand momentarily. 
They won't be able to handle our turrets. Giant Control paused. ETA, three minutes. Christ, Ravente, you know better than that. We won't last another minute and a half at this rate. Roger that, Megan grunted, spinning once again to avoid another shot. She checked her distance to Mick and altered course, closing in on him and his enemy. Setting shields to double rear, she made a breakneck run for her wingman. Screw this, Mick. When I give you the command, hit your afterburners and take a straight line. Um, what? Just trust me, okay? This is like people who have to fall in those therapy sessions and trust some dudes behind them to ensure they don't hit the floor, right? Mick hesitated, groaning from another heavy maneuver. Don't let me hit the ground, Pointer. This might be our only chance with these guys. Megan flew as erratically as she could manage, but allowed her opponent to take the enviable position of being behind her. His firing solution would come up soon, so she didn't have a lot of time to try her plan. As she closed on Mick and his fighter, she called out, Go, now, full speed up. Mick complied, cursing under his breath as he did it. As predicted, his enemy started flying after him. Megan let the computer help with the leading, and she depressed the trigger. A volley of shots caught the enemy full on the port side. The first two shots made the shields flare, but the next three caught actual metal. He spun away, readings indicating he'd lost engine power and would be drifting shortly. Still, he took quite a beating. I'm shocked he survived that at all. Good job, Mick shouted. Two shots connected with a rear, but shields held. They dropped to 40%. Shit, Mick, get this guy off me. She banked left and climbed at the same time, then pressed the stick forward to avoid another blast. Her opponent kept on her, firing again. This time, he scored a solid hit to the top of her ship, knocking her down to environmental shields. Mick? I'm on it. He fired several times, driving the enemy away from Megan long enough for her to level out and disengage. Mick continued to harass the guy, buying her a moment to perform some emergency recharge and repairs. The shields came back up a moment later, but the percentages climbed slowly back toward 50. Need some help here, Megan? I'm on it. An explosion off to their starboard made them both check sensors. An enemy went down, but so did one of theirs. Through collision, it seemed. Damn it. Really? These guys are ramming people now? Be careful. Ours might get just as desperate. Megan closed in, taking the guy's rear even as he continued to fly on mix. Her computer started acquiring the target, but she had to take some shots just to distract him, to buy Mick time to maneuver. Her first three blasts missed, but it had the desired effect of making her opponent twitch. Oh, now you care about being hit, huh? The enemy hit their afterburners then. Their engines went dark. Megan frowned as she saw the thrusters on the side of the ship engage. Holy shit. She slammed the landing thrusters just as he spun in place, taking a shot at her the same way the other guy took out her missile. The shots went under her. So close, she swore she could feel the vibration of energy through her feet. The computer got a lock and she held the trigger down, letting out a full stream of constant firepower directly into the top of his vessel. The shields were chewed away, and this one exploded in a great purple bubble. Scratch two. Megan turned to her scanner and noted they were down two ships and the enemy had lost four. Good odds from a military perspective, considering they're enhanced vessels, but God, I hope our people ejected. Mick, let's get in there and engage. I'm on it. Mick formed up with her and they plunged into the fight, six against four. The odds worked in their favor, but their opponents were still going to be a total pain to target or take down. Another Panther ship took catastrophic damage, but was able to limp away from the fight with the help of some backup. That took them down from six to four, even odds again. Get them back to the ship, Megan called. We'll distract them. The fight continued, ships getting way too close for Megan's comfort. The Orion's light guys seemed perfectly willing to play chicken, and they never flinched from it, even when the behemoth ships started shooting at them. The total disregard for their lives made them like fighting especially intelligent drones. 
A flashback to their first brawl near Earth came to mind, but Megan shook it off, getting her head back in the fight. She watched as Panther 7 took a blast to their starboard and were knocked off course. A second ship riddled it with blaster fire, and she watched the escape pod blast out seconds before the pulse drive went up. Dear God, these guys are amazing. Megan noted they were now down to three versus four. Panther 1, 2, and 5 remained. The behemoth was less than a minute away, but even 60 seconds would be too long to survive against their enemies, especially now that the odds had shifted. They needed to either break and run for the behemoth and hope the turrets did their work, or finish the fight for good or ill. Lieutenant Leslie Eddings, Panther 5, spoke up. Panther 1, I've got an idea. Break back toward the behemoth. I'll draw the enemies away. That's not a plan, Panther 5, Megan said, narrowly avoiding a collision. Fall back with us and let the behemoth take these guys. They're just going to harass the behemoth, ma'am, I guarantee it. I worked with the fire crews aboard the ship and even with the AI. They're going to have a hard time catching these guys. They may be gnats, but I think they're going to have their hands full with the capital ship at this rate. Please, I've got this. I'd love to know what you're planning on doing. Using their tactics against them. Leslie sounded like she was grinning. Trust me, I've got this one. You won't make it a thousand meters before they tear you up, Mick called. Ah, come on, Leslie replied. Have a little faith, sir. Trust me. Do it. Megan cursed herself for authorizing whatever crazy plan Leslie came up with. Just make it back. I'm on it. Leslie spun in place, firing several times at the enemy before darting off, heading straight for the moon where their vessel was. Megan read on her scanners that the Panther V reactor began to superheat, essentially building up toward a self-destruct. She's turning herself into a bomb. Yes, that probably will get their attention. If she could possibly get close enough to the enemy capital ship, that would do some decent damage to it. Plus, they have no idea if we're willing to throw our lives away for a cause or not. And sure enough, the enemies broke from Panthers 1 and 2 and rushed off after her, pushing to full speed. Leslie turned out to be far more wily than Megan anticipated, juking away from the attacks and keeping just ahead of them. She would have been a difficult target for anyone to hit, and she seemed to learn a few things from her opponents, taking a page from their book as she pushed her dampeners to the absolute limit. Megan checked Leslie's course and frowned. Wait. She's not heading for the capital ship. Dear God, she's going for the weird trap. Um, Leslie, what are you doing? Faith, ma'am. Leslie's voice sounded strained and she pushed a little harder. A few blasts caught her in the rear, but her shields held. This is crazy, Mick shouted. You shouldn't have authorized that. Megan wanted to agree, but the ruse pulled the enemies away from them and off toward their capital ship. It gave them a chance to get back to the behemoth and they'd be able to save the others with search and rescue unhindered by fighter attacks. But Mick was probably right. Whatever Leslie had in mind seemed pretty crazy. And here's where faith plays a part, Leslie said, kicking in the afterburners even as the reactor continued to superheat. She ejected, launching far off into space while her fighter continued forward like a missile, plunging directly into the field of magnetic dust they'd scanned earlier. The first two enemy fighters went right after her, plunging through the stuff instantly. The next couple tried to pull up, but they were too close. The stuff seemed to reach out for them, clinging to their hulls and chewing right through the shields. A few moments passed where Megan figured their tech officer overestimated the damage the substance might do, but then it began to happen. Her scanners showed their hulls began to disintegrate, large chunks disappearing in an instant. Leslie's fighter exploded, taking one of the partially dissolved crafts with her. The others had their engines falter and die. They drifted, their internal systems corroding into dust until even the cockpits were impacted and the pilots within were subjected to the vacuum of space. Life signs extinguished a moment later and the ships dropped off her sensors. That's one way to do it, Megan muttered. Lord Leslie. You'd better be okay. I want to beat your ass for that stunt. 
Kind of cool, Mick said. But insane. Search and rescue, this is Panther One. Megan radioed to the behemoth. We're going to need some crews out here to pick up some downed pilots. I have a feeling we're going to want to get out of here in a hurry, so you'd better launch on the double. I don't want to lose anyone today if we can help it. Gray watched as the moon drew closer. They would have visual on the enemy ship in less than five minutes. Weapons were armed. They were ready to throw down, and he fully intended to unleash everything they had on these guys. Whatever happened in the next ten minutes would determine if they succeeded at their mission or have to continue the chase. A message appeared on his computer screen from Durant. Communication satellite is ready to deploy. I'll coordinate with the comms officer to get a message out to Alliance Command immediately. I'm also at the shield station now and ready to manipulate the power. I should be able to keep us going regardless of what weapons they toss at us. Adam cursed beside him, catching Gray's attention. Our pilots encountered pretty heavy resistance. They didn't get the shuttle and it's been allowed to dock on the capital ship. Gray frowned but nodded. Unfortunately, but not surprising. Their commander's good, Adam. It would have been nice to get whoever that was before they got there, but he didn't get this far by making stupid mistakes. He turned to Agatha. After you send the message to the Alliance, hail these people and let's see if they want to talk this time. ETA to visible target, Redding said. Two minutes. The whole situation might be resolved in less than five, Gray said. Did our pilots all get back safely? Search and rescue had to be deployed. We lost five fighters for sure out there, and I don't know how many pilots yet. The enemy had some kind of trap set up to prevent us from charging the shuttle. They created a lane of some kind of magnetic substance capable of eating through a hull. Still, they had to fly pretty strictly to avoid it themselves. That's the kind of thing that keeps them alive, Gray said, especially without a government entity to support them. Durant's deploying the satellite. We'll get some reinforcements here, but they won't be in time. The best we can hope for is their defense of the colony after we leave. Adam nodded and turned back to his station, monitoring the other actions going on aboard the ship. Agatha relayed a message to the Alliance a moment later, just as they were rounding the moon. When she finished, she indicated a positive send and began hailing the enemy, reaching out to them in a stern but calm voice. She's good at keeping her cool, even when we're about to go into battle. Great job. I'm reading an increase in power on the enemy ship, Ollie said. They've... Wow, they basically kick-started the reactor. What's that mean? Redding asked. Are you saying they didn't give themselves ample time to restore energy to the ship? Ollie nodded. Essentially, they risk a meltdown by fast-tracking it to full power, he shrugged. Maybe their gear is designed to take that kind of abuse? It's more than possible. Still, it seems pretty unsafe. Regardless, they now have shields and are moving to intercept. If they weren't able to receive our message before, they sure can now. I'm receiving a message from the enemy vessel, Agatha announced. They are requesting visual communication. Go ahead, Gray said, standing up. Let's see who we're dealing with. A face appeared on their screen, one that did not look monstrous as Gray hoped, but rather like any other Keelan. Black hair hung to his shoulders and jade-green eyes peered out from a severe brow. But other than a stiff expression, he was just a man, albeit one capable of incredible cruelty. His lips curved into a subtle smirk. So, a human commander. He said, I had wondered who managed to catch up to us. I expected one of my own people, but then maybe they knew who they were dealing with. Maybe, Gray said. I'm Captain Gray Atwell of the Behemoth. What's your name? Lord Creelon Arvax of the Final Star. Formerly an Anthar for the Alliance, though I'm sure you're already looking that up. Gave yourself a promotion, I guess, Gray said. As I'm sure you're aware, I can't allow your unprovoked attacks of these colonies to go on. 
You wouldn't want to surrender by any chance? Creelon shook his head. Doesn't really work for me. No. I'm afraid we have places to be, Captain. I'm sure you understand. Also, mission parameters do not extend to brawling with a massive Earth warship. You could always let me go and provide relief efforts for those people I've harmed. We're on that already, Gray said. We don't have to do this. Whatever you're after, it's not worth all the lives you've taken. How do you know that without understanding my goal? Creelon shrugged. You can't, and I'm sure there are some things out there that you'd kill to get. Lives mean less than you'd think when you compare them to the course of history itself. We are out here trying to change the entire galaxy for the better. Yes, a few people will be harmed in our wake. Justifying murder doesn't make it less horrific. Please, we don't want to do this. Then don't. I'm not planning on stopping, so if we're going to fight, you can feel free to start something. I'm afraid you're outmatched, though. This ship has tricks you've never even imagined. Ah, your first mistake. Arrogantly tell me about your advantages. Maybe so, Gray nodded. But we have to try. Just as you did when you were fighting for the Alliance all those years ago. How can you turn your back on the people you swore to protect? They threw me in prison, Captain. Our arrangement was voided when they decided to cast me aside. Creelon stiffened. This conversation is over. You don't have long to put me down. I suggest you get to it. The line went dead and Gray turned to Redding. Do we have a firing solution? Yes, sir, all batteries are ready and Durant's given us an advantage when it comes to recharging. I'm ready to go on your mark. Gray glanced at Adam, who nodded once. Okay, then. Let's make this count. Redding, you may fire at will. Chapter 8 Creelon killed the connection and stormed to his chair, sitting down heavily. The human captain grated on him, speaking as if he knew what it was like to be cast out by one's own government. Smug wretch didn't understand true ambition, or what one must sacrifice to change the galaxy. If he did, he'd stand down and save himself. Now we have to destroy those fools. We're plotting the course now, Brillin said. But sir... Not now, Creelon cut him off. I don't want to hear any excuses or complaints. How long before we can jump? The star chart's a bit complicated, Brillin said. We're going to have to deal with these humans for at least five minutes if you insist on jumping straight to the site. We don't have time for a delay in some other sector, and they might be able to trace us depending on the skill of their tech officer. Creelon rubbed his eyes. I can hold them off. Give me a full readout of their ship. I need weaknesses, capabilities, anything you can give me. On your terminal already, Brillin said. Creelon looked it over, frowning at the data. The ship was massive, easily larger than any of the Alliance capital ships. He thought at first they might have bloated the thing, but upon inspection, they seemed rather formidable. They carried an impressive amount of firepower, and their defenses might be able to fend off their most powerful weapons, at least for a while. They already saw their fighters were outclassed, but their soldiers were willing to throw themselves away for an objective. Even after nearly being destroyed, one of them sacrificed their vessel to take out the remaining Orion's light fighters, and with their own defense matrix to boot. The humans proved far more crafty than he would have given them credit for. I guess they deserved to be saved after all, Creelon sighed, rubbing his eyes. What exactly am I going to do against this thing? If I had the rest of our fleet here, that would be one thing, but just the final star, powerful as we are, this might not go well for us. Sir, a message came through his speaker. We've brought one of the human escape pods aboard. What would you like us to do with the prisoner? Creelon smiled and stood. The fight was about to change. Bring them to the bridge immediately. 
They're firing, Brillen shouted, with everything they've got. Brace for impact, Creelon said, and return fire. Buy us some time before we can have a little chat. Gray squinted at the screen as the first volley of their turret batteries splashed against the enemy shields. Their first fight with the Orion's light ship when they encountered Durant gave him pause for this fight. But when Creelon mentioned brawling with a massive Earth ship, Gray sensed some worry in the man's tone. Clearly he understood the behemoth could be a threat to him, one substantial enough to want to break away from the fight. Creelon couldn't just take off and jump away. Their reactor may have been fast started, but charging a jump drive took time. Even so, the fact their defenses held so stalwartly against their initial assault surprised him. Considering the circumstances, Gray swore they'd have a quick advantage, one that should have chewed through their enemy quickly. He glanced at Ollie, who shook his head. Their shields are tough, sir. It's going to take a while to batter them down. Keep up the pressure, Redding, Gray paged Durant. Their defenses are a lot better than we imagined. What have you got? I'll modulate the weapons so they have a better chance to punch through, Durant said. Sometimes, if we randomize the frequencies, we can dramatically reduce the effectiveness of an energy field. As I look at these readings, it's clear they rely heavily on protection. But I'm picking up some more of those relay cannons, too. This won't be easy, but we've got it. I like your optimism, Gray replied. Go ahead. We're going to continue firing. Hey, can anyone here stop them from jumping? Clea spoke up. Such technology exists, but it's costly. Huge. And I'm afraid we're not carrying it. You find it on high-end space stations most of the time. We might be able to jam up their navigation computers, making it much harder to get out of here in a hurry. If it works, it would buy us some time. But that's about it. Do what you can. Gray turned to Leonard. Can you track them if they get away? Leonard hummed. Sort of. We can rule out where they didn't go easier than know precisely where they went. The satellite Durant just dropped and our software upgrade will definitely help. Using those arrays, we can find out if they get scanned when they show up at whatever system, providing it's fairly close. Get ready for it just in case. Gray sat back down. Everyone's got a task. Get to it. Clea crouched beside Ollie with her tablet on her knees. Trying to get into the final star's computer system required they break through tremendous interference, then pierce the enemy security protocols. The chances were slim, but the tech officers didn't have anything else to do at that moment. What surprised her most was the fact the enemy hadn't fired yet. What are they waiting for? Maybe they wanted to conserve power and direct it all to the recharge of their jump drive. It made sense, and it didn't. Taking everything offline was a pretty dramatic risk, especially when they didn't know who might show up to stop them. They knew someone would, or they wouldn't have set up their lane of magnetic corrosives. Clea's eyes narrowed. I'm asking the wrong questions. Where does this star chart thereafter lead? When and if we get through to their computers, I'll grab everything they've got stored on them. Maybe we can see where they've been and where they hide out. Could they have a base of operations? Creelon struck her as the kind of man who would have some kind of facility hidden in a cubby in the vast galaxy. Maybe an asteroid or a decommissioned space station. Something where they might repair damage, count their spoils, or even develop their weapons. That information would go a long way toward dismantling the Orion's light for good. The ship shook from an impact, and Clea looked at the screen sharply. Ah, they've decided to shoot back. Ollie, how are their shields doing? Durant's plan is kind of working, Ollie replied. The modulation has knocked them down to 70% shields, but they've just hit us with one of those relay cannons. Did our update help? Clea asked. Yes, actually, instead of chewing through us, Ollie shook his head. Wow, the shields are actually drawing power from the relay. It's causing impact damage, but then our shields repair themselves just as quickly as they're damaged. Way to go, Durant. He certainly is a genius, Clea muttered, shaking her head. I have to admit I'm shocked it worked. Me too, Gray added, but thankful at the same time. 
We need to take this to the next level. How will bombs do against those shields? Ollie shrugged. I can't say. They're different than the other ships we faced. They might work. I mean, they'll probably overload them. I'd hope. Seriously, they put so much into those things, I don't know how they'll react. They might shrug them off. You guys almost into their computer yet? Adam asked. Clea sighed. I'm afraid the interference of our shields, the relay cannon, and their defenses is making it nearly impossible. We can't slip through all that and extract any usable data, or implant any for that matter. Each of us is working on it from a different angle, but I wouldn't count on this keeping them here. Understood, Gray said. Redding, get closer. Apply some serious pressure. Turn to port, then launch our bombers away from them. As those ships deploy, they can use our larger signature to avoid detection, then slip in and deploy their payloads. I'm on it. Redding increased acceleration. Adam turned to the comm and relayed the orders to Ravente to get the bombers out there. The group commander immediately brought them up on a three-way comm line. Gentlemen, Ravente started. I just wanted to point out that bombers require escorts, and if you didn't notice, our pilots just got their asses kicked. Search and rescue still hasn't recovered all the escape pods yet. They'll be right on top of us, Gray said. We'll defend them with the turrets. With all due respect, sir, I'm not sure that's a good idea either. I've checked the readings, and hitting those shields with the bombs has a couple of possibilities. The worst of the scenarios involves those things going off and causing us damage instead. The last thing you guys want is to be hammered with a full deployment of ordnance. Their defenses are too strong to get through with our current weapons, Gray said. We're making a dent, but we need to escalate. They're on the verge of jumping out of here. What do you propose, Ravente? We're in the business of taking risks, and right now, this conversation is causing the risk to build up. Yes, sir, Ravente replied. Deployment on your mark? Thank you. Gray killed the connection and turned to Ollie. How are we doing? Do you have any reading on their jump capabilities? I'm detecting a power buildup, but I'm not sure, Ollie sighed. All their readings seem to be obfuscated, made to look like other events. This one could just as easily be them firing up another relay cannon. Captain, Agatha called out over the rumble of combat. The enemy is hailing us. They say we'll want to talk. You think they're surrendering? Adam asked. Gray scowled. I doubt it. Their behavior on the planet suggests they'd rather die. They've stopped firing, Redding replied. Maybe when we advanced, we intimidated them. Cease fire, Gray said. Let's hear what they have to say. Put them on screen, Agatha. Creelon appeared again from the waist up, head bowed slightly so he could easily glare at them. Their bridge flashed red from some kind of alert. Clea hoped that it was because of some catastrophic damage they experienced and this conversation was meant to end the hostilities. As the man spoke, she realized they weren't done yet. Thank you for speaking with me, Captain. I thought you might want to have a brief talk before continuing these... Creelon smirked. Senseless exchanges of violence. What do you want? Gray demanded. You have a few seconds to speak up. If you're hoping to surrender, I'm happy to listen to terms. Creelon shook his head. Not quite what I had in mind. He snapped his fingers and a soldier dragged someone in front of the camera. One of their pilots. Clea recognized her from her files. Lieutenant Leslie Eddings. She was part of Panther Wing. Her face was bruised, but otherwise she seemed no worse the wear for what she'd gone through. We found this drifting near the moon after she valiantly led some of my men to their deaths. Clea looked back at Gray and saw him stiffen. Prisoners? Gray shook his head. Are you planning on trying to leverage her for your freedom? The thought crossed my mind, Creelon replied. Do you think it'll work? Leslie struggled, lifting her head to the camera. Send these bastards to hell, sir. Take them out. Don't worry about me. Creelon struck her hard on the side of the head, silencing her. She's got quite the mouth. Annoying how women never seem to know when to shut up. Clea felt the rage build in the room. Every human there wanted a piece of Creelon in that moment. She understood. Seeing one of their own in the hands of that scum was hard. 
What could they do, though? As Leslie said, they should be firing. Saving one life for all those who Creelon might take out. Her sacrifice would save countless lives. Are we good? Creelon asked someone off camera, and he smiled. Captain, I appreciate your time and the fact you listened to me. I'm afraid we'll be on our way now. Clea, Gray grunted. Stop them. We can't, sir. Clea frantically typed at her terminal, trying a last-ditch effort. The interference is still too strong. Listen, we'll probably meet again, Creelon said. But I'd like to leave you something memorable. So witness this. He drew a blade from one of his soldiers' belts, grabbed Leslie by the hair, and nonchalantly dragged it across her throat. She didn't even have a moment to struggle before the edge bit deep. The pilot's eyes widened, and she struggled against her captors as the blood flowed freely. Her motions lessened, her body went slack, and they let her fall to the floor. Clea felt the heat go up in the room as the people around her fell silent. Each one stared at the screen with the most amount of hatred she'd ever felt in their presence. There you are. Creelon dropped the blade. Good day. The final star performed a jump and left the system. The screen went dark, then showed empty space. Gray sat down in the chair and clenched his fists. No one spoke. Shock washed over them all, and even as the horror they witnessed processed, words simply seemed inappropriate. But they didn't have time to wallow. Leonard broke the silence, clearing his throat to lead the way. He turned in his seat, clearly struggling to maintain a placid professional expression. Captain, I've got the scanners trying to find their destination now, but it'll be tricky. We may have another lead. Adam added. He also clenched his fist so tightly his arm shook. The man they stole the star chart from is still alive in our medical bay, though he may not be for long. He might have some idea of where they were going, some concept of what they want. Whatever drove them, well, I'd like to know what the lieutenant died for. Agreed. Gray stood up and drew a deep breath. Let's cover all our bases. I'll head down and speak to the patient. You all keep doing what you can to locate where they went. When we've got what we need, we'll track this son of a bitch down and take care of him. No one takes a break until we've got him. Sir, Adam drew closer, lowering his voice. Some of these folks have been on for over a shift and a half so far. Leslie deserves our attention on this matter until it's totally resolved, Gray replied. I'm pretty sure no one here has it in them to leave while her murderer's at large. Put your best foot forward today, ladies and gentlemen. We're upping our game. Dr. Laura Brand took in a variety of casualties from the colony, those too hurt to be cared for by triage and couldn't wait for the relief of Alliance military. They filled up the sick bay along with some of their own. A couple pilots who were hurt during ejection a man with a nasty electrical burn across his back from a shorted-out panel in engineering, and the Marines who were shot on the surface fighting with the Orion's light thugs. She went through the roster of injuries, coordinating the medical staff to ensure everyone received treatment in the order of criticality. Checking the computer, she started a plan for her own rounds to check the work of her subordinates. There were some nasty ones, but perhaps none as bad as the Keelan named Varlin Kilot. Marine guards brought him in and they waited outside. Laura asked them if the man was dangerous, but all they'd give her was that they wanted to know when he woke up. Also, some of their own were there, so she knew a bunch of their men would be filling the halls shortly. They didn't require her to restrain him, so she assumed he'd be okay. When she got over to his table, she knew it was lucky he was alive at all. The blow to his shoulder looked ghastly, even after being all cleaned up. The exit wound was large enough to put her fist in. Her scans showed he lost a great deal of blood, enough that they were giving him a transfusion in an attempt to save his life. His breathing remained steady, though, so the doctor who worked on him did an excellent job of stabilizing him. Thank God for a small favor. I'm impressed. 
Dr. Stavers deserves a commendation for this. His experience with Keelan physiology is more impressive than I would have guessed. Captain Atwell entered the room and hurried directly over to her. Is this Varlin? Hello, Captain, Laura said, but she could tell he wasn't in the mood for pleasantries. Yes, this is him. He's lucky to be alive, if you're curious. I'm glad to hear it. We need to talk to him pretty much immediately. As you can see, he's not feeling particularly chatty. Laura scowled at the look he gave her, an expectant expression that suggested he didn't care. Are you serious right now? Do you want to see his wound beneath that bandage? Would that give you some idea of what this man's been through? He has information we need to finish this mission. And you're saying your mission is more important than his life? A couple quick questions won't be enough to risk him dying, Gray protested. Now you're a medical professional? Doctor, I don't have time to argue. We're wasting precious moments and we haven't been able to figure out where the enemy has gone. If we don't catch up to them, if we don't have a plan to get there before they do or at least meet them there, then whatever scheme they're engaged in will come true. Believe me, you haven't seen what this guy's capable of. Laura heard about the pilot the enemy executed, and she thanked God she didn't see it. The thought of what the monster did, it boiled her blood, but not so much that she immediately jumped to the conclusion of risking a patient. Still, Gray wasn't wrong. If they were careful, they could likely revive Varlin and give him a couple moments of awareness before he fell back into a delirious state. If I do this, you better keep it simple and to the point, Laura spoke sternly. I'm not joking. I won't lose a patient over this. I only need to know two things, Gray said where the star chart leads, and what the coordinates are. Laura sighed. Give me a moment, then. She grabbed a hypo and loaded it up with a stimulant. She needed to measure properly to avoid further injury and consulted the computer with his vitals and chart on record. Using his weight and the severity of the wound, it recommended a fairly heavy dosage. Lord, I think I'll drop that down a bit. I'd rather he be groggy than suddenly agitated. A decent sedative would counteract the effects, and she'd give it to him as soon as Gray finished talking to him. She prepared that as well, holding the man's safety net. As she pressed the stimulant against his neck, Laura bit her lip and turned to the screen displaying his vitals. If they went too crazy, she'd give him the shot. Gray would have to understand. Varlin began to stir almost instantly, but Laura put her hand on his good shoulder. Please don't move, sir. You're very hurt. I... where... am I? Aboard an Alliance ship, Gray said. Recently joined. We found you out in the snow and brought you here for medical treatment. Creelon, Varlin's eyes went wide. He took my computer, Gray nodded. He wanted something you were protecting. Can you tell us what that was? I, he held his breath, expression turning suspicious. Prove to me your alliance. First off, I'm a human, Gray replied. You're aboard the Behemoth, an Earth vessel. We're trying to stop Creelon. Second, look around. Several of your fellow colonists are here being treated. Director Sealar is right over there. She can vouch for us. Director, Varlin called out. He was getting weak again. Director Silar, are you okay? What is this place? Laura shook her head. We don't have time for this. He needs to tell Gray what he wants so he can rest. Varlin, Silar replied loudly. Oh, thank goodness you're all right. It looked bad. We're among friends. They saved us. All of us. That's good enough for me. Varlin said. Captain, I was protecting a star chart which led to a planet once sacred to an ally species. Unfortunately, a virus wiped them out completely, and their home became quarantined. Some time ago, a medical ship went back to check on whether or not the place was safe again. They discovered the virus had burned itself out. With no appropriate hosts, it followed those it killed and died off. High Command elected to not remove the quarantine status, but instead allowed a small group of Keelans to build a monastery there, a place they could study from, but also hide our people's secrets. To what end? Gray asked. And why did you have the star chart? There are three copies, Varlin replied. 
One was given to me when I elected to move to the colony. The next was stored on a secret server in our capital, accessible only by the military council. And the third is held by an admiral who is constantly in motion with his fleet. Depending on need, the right people could come and claim it from me. What sort of need? What's hidden there? Varlin winced. I'm not sure of that part, I'm afraid. They let me guard the secret, but didn't tell me what it was. You understand, surely, that occasionally we're given great responsibility in the military without all the facts. Gray nodded. I do. Varlin seemed to be slipping. Laura prepped the sedative, but Gray waved her off. Leaning close, he lowered his voice. Do you remember the coordinates, Varlin? We need to get after this guy right now. He jumped out of system and is on his way there right now. If we don't stop him, he'll get whatever he's after. Varlin gritted his teeth, tensing up. The pain started to get to him. Captain, we need to end this conversation, Laura said. He's clearly hurting. No, Varlin muttered. No, I can do this. Please, just... The coordinates? He gestured for Gray to draw closer and whispered something in his ear. Laura's curiosity was tempered by her desire to get the man some help. After he finished speaking, he slumped back and the captain nodded to her. She delivered the shot and Varlin settled down. Eyes closed and body relaxed once again. He... He should be fine. Laura checked his vitals. I don't think we pushed him too far. Good. Gray turned away. He's a brave man. He doesn't deserve to have died at the hands of that maniac. I trust whatever we're after is worth all this? Laura asked. We may be stopping a bout of chaos that could sweep the entire galaxy, Gray said. You be the judge. Laura frowned. I didn't mean to be snippy. I'm sorry. Gray touched her shoulder. I'm still pretty angry about what our opponent did. I don't mean to take it out on you. Thanks for your help, Doctor. We're going to be jumping out soon, so these patients will be in our care a little longer than we anticipated. That's fine. Some of them can't be moved anyway. Laura followed him to the door. Do you think there's going to be a fight? Or will you be able to talk him down? Gray paused, staring off into the distance. He drew a deep breath, seeming to contemplate her question for some time. When he finally turned to her, the look in his eyes made her gasp. He scowled and shook his head. Oh, I won't be talking to this guy, doctor. The time for diplomacy? The chance for him to surrender? Passed. Good luck with your patience. She watched him leave, a tremble touching her spine. What's up? Brian, her assistant, asked. You look pale. I've never seen the captain quite so upset. Laura shook off the moment and turned to him. It doesn't matter. Let's get back to work. We've got these folks as our guests for a while longer, so we should make sure they're comfortable. Inform the other doctors. I think the next twelve hours might be far more interesting than any of us would like. Chapter 9 When Megan and Mick landed, they both hurried over to Hangar Control to get involved with search and rescue. They coordinated with computer scans so the pods could be easily found and brought back for medical aid. Each person was found alive and well, except for Leslie, the bravest of them who pretty much risked her life to ensure they survived the encounter. A general message went out to the ship, Ensign Agatha White's voice letting everyone know they'd be jumping out of system shortly. Megan turned to Mick, who shrugged. She called out to anyone who might be listening. What's she talking about? We still have a pilot out there. Can someone let the bridge know? Search and rescue, please return to hangar immediately for departure. The deck sergeant made the call, and it pushed Megan's button. She advanced to him and patted his shoulder roughly. Hey, didn't you just hear me? We've got a pilot still out there. We can't just leave. Take it up with command, ma'am. He replied without looking back. I just work here. Mick tapped her arm, looking grave. He drew her out of the room to a private area of the catwalk overlooking the hangar bay. Leaning close, he kept his voice low, but she could tell something huge was wrong. He never acted so sheepish or felt quite so angry in her presence before. 
I just spoke to Ravente, Mick said. He told me what happened to Leslie. Megan's heart raised. Did her pod? It didn't touch that stuff, did it? Where is she? The enemy. Mick swallowed hard. They brought her pod aboard and then... On the camera for the bridge to see... What? Megan grabbed his arm. What did they do? She's dead. They... They killed her. Megan leaned back against the wall, feeling as if all the air had been kicked out of her lungs. She pressed the palm of her hand to her forehead and tried to work through the news, embracing what he said. Leslie murdered. After what she just went through and how she saved them, only to be executed? Those goddamn monsters. And that's why we're jumping out, Mick nodded. To go after them. We need to see Durant, Megan said. Tell him what we saw with those fighters. If we're going to face them again, we're going to need some advantage, something to put us on an even footing. They were way too maneuverable for us. I don't want that to happen again. I don't... God, poor Leslie. I'll tell the others. Get them together, Megan replied. I'll give them the news. It's my job. But I hope like hell we've got a serious response for this, for everything these Orion's light scumbags have done. I'd love to deliver whatever message we come up with in person. You and me both, ma'am. Mick let out a sigh and moved away. See you in ten. Agatha turned in her seat, still shaken by what they'd seen. She directed her attention at the captain, unable to look at the screen for fear of what she might see. Witnessing the pilot's death might have been the most traumatic thing she'd ever seen. Despite that, she managed to keep doing her job, but she realized most of her defenses were in place due to shock. Sir, all ships report in. They're aboard and we're ready to depart. Gray nodded. Good. Leonard, I believe you have the coordinates from Varlin? Yes, sir. Course is plotted and ready to execute. Turning over to pilot. Redding cleared her throat. I'm ready, sir. I can initiate the jump sequence on your mark. Gun crews are at the ready, Adam said. Pilots as well, though, based on the last report, we might want to hold them in reserve. Understood, Gray replied. Ali, I want you to be ready to scan the second we arrive. Don't mess around. Whatever you see, report it immediately. I want shields up after we jump in and be ready for a fight. They might jump us right away. We should have the element of surprise, Clea said. After all, they thought they killed Varlin. They couldn't possibly know he provided us information that would get us where we're going. Let's hope for that, but prepare for otherwise. Gray turned to Redding. Go ahead and initiate the jump sequence, Lieutenant Commander. I'd like to catch up to our opponents, if you don't mind. Agatha locked down communications and sent out the message that they'd be leaving the system in less than 20 seconds. Departments sent their ready check, green across the board, and as they did, she made logs for her report. The idea of something as mundane as a documentation ledger felt strange. The regular tasks seemed all the more absurd after seeing someone die. I hope we make this right. If we can. Creelon's ship emerged from jump near a small moon, and he directed the pilot to use the natural satellite to mask their presence while they performed a sensor sweep of the system. The Alliance may have placed some kind of defenses to prevent anyone from hopping in and stealing their prize. There may even be additional secrets in that place, and only total fools would leave it unguarded. To his surprise, they didn't detect any other ships in the area, and only two orbital defense satellites. Perhaps they were convinced no one could even find the place, let alone attack it. And if they did, who would know what to take? Pirates would only look for obvious valuables, and this place didn't seem to have any. Not for an industrious spacer, at least. He contemplated the screen, gazing at the only habitable world in the system. A guard brought Weon onto the bridge, the man walking mostly of his own accord. Their prisoner gave up any pretense he might escape, so he simply went along with the situation, following along when told and forced to. Creelon spared him a glance. What do you think? Creelon asked. This is what your government was hiding. 
That small world down there with hardly any defenses and a pathetic monastery. Seems strange, don't you think? Such a prize as we're after, sitting down there, unguarded. I very much doubt it lacks protection, Weon replied. How big of fools do you think we are? Answer carefully, Krilon. You used to be one of us. Krilon's temper flared, but he mastered it quickly. And I woke up. Much as you have the opportunity to now, direct your gaze to the floor near you. Weon complied and gasped. What? What is that? The last worthless meat who defied us. Creelon stood. I'll send a scouting party to check things out. Then we'll head down together to see what they have in store for us. I don't want to go. Weon spoke quickly. Haven't you done enough to me? So far, I've found you amusing, Weon. Your reactions to what you perceive as horrors have been educational. I plan on keeping you around to see my coronation as ruler of the galaxy. And just because you've been through so much, I'll ensure you live out the rest of your life in luxury. After all, you'll have witnessed history firsthand. That's special, don't you think? What will you search for next? The secret to immortality? Krilon smirked. You really do have quite a mouth. You've made me change my mind. He turned to one of the guards. Assemble a scouting party and bring we on with you. Let him be of some use down there in our first contact with the world below. Captain, Brillen spoke up. I'm picking up a Keelon broadcast message. This planet is under quarantine. They're talking about some kind of virus which may have wiped out the population of this place. I'm scanning for it now. Yes, do ensure we won't be contracting some horrifying disease, Creelon said. Or if we need hazard suits before going. In fact, he chuckled, issue the suits to the men, but not we on. Let him be your early warning sign that something's wrong. Weon shook his head. You're a real monster, Krilon. A sick bastard. Krilon balled his fist, but refrained from hitting him. Practicality and monstrous behavior tend to go hand in hand, I suppose. You have your orders, men. Go. He returned to his seat and peered out at the planet again. Eyes narrowed as he wondered at what the message meant. Surely they didn't hide it in a diseased hellhole, or they'd never be able to get their items back. No, this felt like a ruse, another defense mechanism to keep criminals away. And it may have worked most of the time. The average pirate didn't have sophisticated enough scanners to detect the subtleties of an airborne disease. They'd know soon enough, even if their sensors didn't pick it up. Weon would catch it. The man probably needed to die despite Creelon's growing interest in him. They'd likely have to kill him before they proceeded much further. He'd defy them at every turn, but then perhaps that's what Creelon liked about him so much. No matter how helpless he remained, he held up his integrity and duty. Though Weon only worked as an admin, contrary to his belief, he would have made an excellent soldier. At least in the loyalty department. My lord. Brillen spoke again. I'm reading an energy buildup. A jump? Someone's coming. What? Creelon stood suddenly cursing. It can't be. The Earth ship? But how? How would they have followed us? It's impossible to have tracked us here, isn't it? From all the technology I know, yes. Brillen replied. But sure enough, they will be here in five seconds. Battle stations! Krilon cried out. Launch our fighters and get those defenses taken out. Our shuttle needs a direct path to get to the surface. This needs to happen much quicker now, and we're going to do whatever it takes to claim our prize. Double the number of men we're sending down. Hurry! There's no time for stalling. The behemoth appeared in the system, raising their shields immediately. Gray recognized that not too long ago, they wouldn't have been capable of becoming combat effective so quickly after a jump. 
The way it impacted their systems, both electrical and biological, meant they needed a moment to recover from long distances. A few upgrades went a long way. We've got them, Ollie shouted. On scans, just over 300,000 kilometers away. They're approaching that planet there. He brought it up on the view screen, a blue world with white clouds surrounding it. They've got fighters launched and... Sir, they're attacking the satellite defenses. Redding, accelerate to full speed, Gray said. Are all weapons online? Yes, sir, we're ready to fire, Redding replied. The ship rumbled as the engines roared to life. The door behind them opened and someone joined them on the bridge. Gray glanced back to see Durant gazing at the screen. What can we do for you? Gray asked. Shouldn't you be in engineering? Durant shook his head. No, I believe I can be of more use up here with the tech officer performing scans. He moved over to one of the computer terminals near the pilot's seat. He began tapping away. While you attack, I can modulate defenses and weapons. This should ensure we have more time to react to whatever we discover. I have a question, Adam said. What about our fighters? I read the report and they were outmatched in that fight. The enemy could take much heavier maneuvers than they could, surviving forces that would have killed our people. They're not drones, either. How do they dampen the inertia so well? More efficient magnets, Durant said. That's the only thing I can think of without one to study. We might be able to compensate for it to give ourselves a boost, but it will require a retrofit of the current ships in our hangar. I'd say they should stay out of this fight to avoid being shot down. Those dogfights will be quite one-sided, at least in space. The pilots won't be happy, Adam muttered. They're going to one in. Tell Ravente to have them stand down, Gray said. We've got this fight. Durant, our guns, we're having a hard time targeting those fighters. What can you do for that? Hold on, Durant frowned. The aiming protocols are out of date. Oh, wait. It's the most recent software you have. I can update these. You'll have a much easier time with the fighters in a few moments. Is now a good time to do an upgrade? Redding asked. We're about four minutes from a fight. This is going to take less than a minute, Durant said. And besides, I wrote the original protocols. They're ready for the improvement, believe me. Go ahead, Gray said, though he had a feeling his permission was a little late. The scientist took more liberties than the captain would like but the behemoth could use the help. The Orion's light may not have a government behind them, but their technology and ruthlessness gave them some small advantages. Gray turned to his computer and noted they were nearly within firing range. Target their engines, he said. The thrusters specifically. No, Durant turned quickly. Sir, they will have the most protection at those points. What? Gray scowled. How? They can't emit as strong a field around the thrusters. They use the thrust to enhance the field, Durant explained, as in the heat being cast off by the thrusters are being absorbed by the shields and making them tougher there. I figured it out in the last battle when I did a scan. That would have been good information for a report, Adam said. Sooner than now, I mean? I'm sorry, we've been rather busy. Durant shrugged. The good news is the targeting software is now upgraded and ready for use. Thank God for small favors, Redding muttered. Permission to fire when in range? Granted, Gray said. Let's just test the waters first, since the thrusters are off limits. Maybe we'll get lucky. The defense satellites exploded in orange bubbles, winking out into the darkness. Gray winced. That's not a good sign. They've got a clear shot to the surface. He checked, and sure enough, a shuttle was on its way down. Damn it. This is going to be really close. We have to stop them. One way or another. Tell Marshall we need Marines on that planet, Gray said. If the enemy's risking a trip down during a battle, then whatever they want, they can't have. Yes, sir. But if those fighters turn to the shuttle... I know. We'll escort our people and hope Durant's upgrade makes short work of those bastards. Gray nodded. Send out the call. We have to have those guys up in less than three minutes if we hope to catch up to our enemies. I won't let you down over here, Durant said. When we start shooting, 
I'm ready to make the most of it. Makes me feel better, Gray sighed. Prepare for some precision flying, Redding. Looks like we're going to be multitasking on this one. Hoffner strapped in as the shuttle lifted off. The briefing didn't go very well. Marshall didn't want him to go, stating it was too dangerous to risk a captain when the chances of getting to the surface were so low. It wasn't that the lieutenant colonel didn't care about the men or feel they were expendable, but he sometimes erred on the side of command practical, which ended with an argument between subordinate and commander. I've been leading them into shitstorms for too long to simply tell them through inaction that I think they're going to die, Hoffner told him. I'm sure you remember what it was like when you were in my position. Imagine morale if I told them they were on their own. They'd likely understand, Marshall replied. They've worked with you a long time, and they understand command structure. And the reason they'd understand is because they know I would never make such a suggestion without it being beyond necessary. Like we were about to lead another attack somewhere. But this is the time, right here and now, where I need to be available to those men and show them that we have total faith in this mission. But we don't, Marshall sighed. I doubt I can talk you out of this. What if I gave you an order? Then I guess you'd be filing my court-martial papers because I'm going down to that planet with those men. You're a stubborn bastard, William. Sorry, sir, Marshall shrugged. I'm sure you recall our conversation when you were recruiting me for this post? Yes, yes. You were all about the men then, too. It's important to me. Those guys, they're shit on by the Navy most of the time. When we go out on assignment, we're the unsung heroes. Pilots get the glory, the guys on the bridge take the credit for successful missions, and the only time we're noticed is when we screw up. Luckily, Captain Atwell is a lot more fair than all that, but regardless, I'm the one they trust. I'm going. Just... I know you'll be fine when you get to the surface. It's whether those ships take you out before you get there. I'll put my faith in the behemoth's guns, Hoffner said, just like the other men going with me. Godspeed, Hoffner. Don't get killed out there. Hoffner gave his men a different briefing, one that was straightforward and to the point. He let them know that there was a chance they might not make it to the surface of the planet. They all wore environmental suits just in case they survived the initial blasts that might get through to them. Regardless, none of them even flinched when he gave them the warning. Everyone mounted up, strapped in, and prepared themselves for the fight to come. Some of the pilots wanted to fly escort, but they were denied the privilege. Apparently, there was an unfair advantage the enemy had, one that made them more than a match for the behemoth ships. They explained it had something to do with maneuverability, which would do the trick. Now the Marines had to risk an encounter with them. Good times. Hoffner took a deep breath and mentally prepared for the flight. They left the hangar and stayed close to the behemoth as it charged toward the planet. The massive ship planned on screening them the whole way, using turrets to fend off the enemy pilots. He held on to his rifle as the ship began to pick up speed. Here we go. Shuttle is away, Clea said. They're accelerating to full speed. Guns ready, Gray asked. They certainly are, Durant replied. We'll tear into those devils, I promise you. They're not going to cause any real trouble for our marines. When they get too close, these targeting protocols will easily anticipate, lead, and destroy them. I'm focusing on the capital ship now. Clea looked at her scanner and noted that the Orion's light ship had turned to engage them. Any moment, they'd unleash their relay cannon and try to tear through their shields. Their own main cannons could retaliate, but the smaller guns were reserved for fending off the enemy pilots. They'd been supercharged since Durant arrived, so they would have been good to focus on the bigger vessel. Captain, Agatha called out. The enemy ship is hailing us? Ignore it, Gray said. Open fire when they're in range, Redding. I'm turning guns over to Leonard, Redding said. I'll be a little busy keeping the ship close to the shuttle to be shooting too. I'm on it. Leonard leaned over his console and tapped the controls. Bringing targeting online? And we'll be in optimal range inside of 30 seconds. Clea focused on her scanner, looking for the enemy pilots. They had to be coming soon, and when they did, she wanted to monitor their gun batteries. 
She couldn't quite share Durant's confidence, not until she saw them in action. That was the difference between living with theory crafting and reality. When one faced the latter, the former lost some of its credibility. The Academy taught her to trust her math and instincts, but she'd seen both fail too many times to not believe in random elements screwing everything up. These pilots not only had superior technology, they were good at their jobs. That combination made it harder for her to simply believe an AI upgrade that took less than a minute would do much against them. I hope I'm just being cynical. The blips appeared on her screen, and she sat up straight. The enemy pilots are incoming, she said. They're advancing on our shuttle. Durant, Gray said. I hope you're ready for them. This is not the time for mistakes. Clea put their shuttle on her screen, watching as the fighters closed in on it. The automated turrets spun in place and began firing. At the same time, the shuttle deployed countermeasures, devices coded to be ignored by friendly scans but played havoc with targeting, like portable jammers. The enemy pilots began flying about like angry bees, swarming to keep away from the turrets. Clea held her breath, hoping, as Gray did, that Durant's upgrade worked. She felt skeptical until one of the small ships burst into a massive orange bubble. The leading worked. I guess I shouldn't have doubted him. That's one, Durant called out. Seems that we have eight more to go, though. Shuttle will breach atmosphere in less than five minutes, Clea added. Durant, Gray said. We have to have those fighters handled before then. I'm doing what I can. Durant devoted his attention to his computer. Opening fire! Leonard nearly shouted, finally showing how new he was to working on the bridge. Rarely did anyone raise their voice, and usually it was only Ollie. This might not have warranted a shout, but as the floor rumbled and every gun they had fired, Clea wondered if Durant's improvements would come into effect. She opened a second screen on her tablet, one to scan the enemy ship's defenses. The first volley struck them dead on, just as they returned fire, their relay cannon lancing out. It hit them on the port side, away from the shuttle, but this time it only did minimal damage. The cycling shields did the trick, at least for now. Another fighter went up. The shuttle began firing its own weapons, trying to fend off the aggressors. They couldn't score a target lock on them, but they fired blindly anyway, nearly taking them out several times. Clea turned to the orders issued to the weapon crews. Adam had them swap out the warheads from their standard missiles with the payloads from the bomber's ordnance. That should make quite the impression, Clea hummed. I wonder when they intend to throw those at the enemy. Gray moved over to Leonard's station and leaned over him. Target here, here, and here. Earlier scans showed the first one might be their life support, and providing they keep engineering by those thrusters, we could take that out too. And the last one, sir? Leonard asked. What I hope is the bridge, Gray replied. Carry on. Clea returned her attention to the fight outside, where the shuttle weaved about in a mad dash attempt to make it to the planet's surface. She could only imagine how wild the ride must be for the passengers, each one strapped in and unable to do anything but hope they made it to their area of operation. Jenks made over a hundred combat drops. The first ten made his stomach flip, but eventually he eased into them until they represented nothing more than a mild discomfort. Most of them were performed without having to worry about being blown out of the sky. They tended to be deployed while pilots fought each other. This drop was completely different. Their pilot, a crazy bastard who clearly felt no pain when it came to pushing his inertial dampeners, veered about to avoid the attackers trying to take them down. They weren't the only threat, either. The behemoth's turrets were blasting away, sending out enough ordnance to crowd the space around them. Definitely enough to make anyone feel a hint of anxiety. And we haven't even broken the atmosphere yet. If the enemy ships could follow them, they'd be in trouble. When the shuttle's turret began firing, he knew they were either getting desperate or somehow hopeful they might get lucky. Windows around them continually lit up, near misses from the enemy their friends, or their own weapons. Jenks couldn't tell. Atmosphere in less than a minute. The pilot sounded bored. He's cold as ice. Jenks loosened his grip on the harness of his seat. 
His knuckles began to ache. Tapping the side of his helmet, he brought up a tactical screen of the fight going on outside and immediately regretted it. There were still six fighters trying to take them down, each one being chased about by energy blasts from the behemoth. Their own turret, controlled by the co-pilot, caught one on the side, knocking its shields out just as the behemoth blew it away. Five to go, Jenks thought. The good news was their maneuverability would be for shit when they got into the air-filled environment of the planet. Such maneuvers might work with zero gravity, but air would tear those things up. Maybe we should hurry and take them on down there. They still held a major advantage against the lumbering shuttle. Their ordnance alone made them a major threat. Breaking atmosphere now. Another one of the fighters exploded, caught by the turrets. Four's better than five, I guess. The shuttle began bucking as air pockets buffeted the hull. Some of the younger marines really started to bellyache about it. Jenks knew how they felt. He'd seen it too many times, and even separated from their misery by years, he'd sympathized quietly. Turbulence sucked. There was no way around it. And being chased by a bunch of fighters sure as hell doesn't make it easier to weather. Bogies are still with us? The pilot drawled again, still sounding like he ordered tea and hadn't received it yet. They're opening fire. Evasive maneuvers. Hang on. The shuttle banked hard, but Jenks couldn't tell the direction. His entire body tensed up to the action. He felt like his back might break when suddenly they leveled out and continued their descent. The sound around him felt oppressive, from the silence of space to the constant barrage of white noise of engines and wind. Their turrets barked now, their sound having a venue to be heard from. An explosion made Jenks wince, but he let out a sigh when he realized it must have been an enemy. That moment of relaxation made his surprise all the more shocking. A blow struck the shuttle, shearing the back off as surely as if a torch sliced right through. It nearly took the legs from the men in back with it. Mayday, mayday. The pilot still sounded relaxed. Does that dude even have emotions? We are going down. Thrusters are out. Deploying payload. Have a nice trip down, gentlemen. See you on planet side. Shit. Here we go. Jenks saw out of his peripheral vision as the Marines were launched from the ship ejected to avoid whatever fate was in store for their doomed transport. They went out in twos, going down the row toward him, Walsh and Hoffner. When his time came, weightlessness caught him and he turned in place so he faced downward into a bank of clouds. His HUD showed he was still over 30,000 feet up. Christ, I've got to survive for 90 seconds up here? This is fabulous. If they can detect us, we're done. He turned off his electronics, killing everything but the altimeter. The less signature he gave off, the better, and he passed the hint on to the rest of his men before going dark. Now it's up to fate, I guess. The shuttle plunged into the clouds, a fiery metal projectile heading for the surface at a much faster rate of speed than them. It would impact and cause a lot of trauma long before the Marines touched down. I hope the pilot got out of there. We haven't even truly started the mission. This doesn't bode well. Chapter 10 Megan received the order to stand down, but she didn't let her squadron leave the hangar. They lingered near their ships, waiting for the fight outside to end, or a chance to get out there. Each one wore their helmets to listen to the pilot's action report being sent to Giant Command, the Marine Line. As the shuttle made for atmosphere, Megan got an idea. She turned to Mick. When they leave space, their advantage won't mean shit. Mick smirked. You're right. We should get ready. Everyone to your ships? Megan called out and brought Ravente up on her comm. Group commander, we need immediate permission to launch. The captain told you guys to stand down, Ravente replied. I think you remember why. Yes, they have an advantage. In space. Ravente hesitated to respond. Ah, uh, yes, I see your point. Give us clearance, sir. We can keep those assholes off the Marines when they start their descent. The shuttle needs every chance it can get. And you get your chance at a little payback, huh? This time, Megan hesitated. A fringe benefit? You're cleared, Ravente said. 
I'll talk to the captain and let him know what's going on. Thank you. Megan climbed into the cockpit and fired her up. All right, Panther, we haven't fought in Atmo for a while. I trust you all remember the differences. Be careful about too crazy of maneuvers and take down as many of those bastards as you can. We've got a shuttle to protect. She led the way, launching first and banking hard toward the planet. The shuttle already broke atmosphere. The trail of smoke from entry made it easy to see where they were going. The others joined her, forming up as they accelerated to full speed. Catching up wouldn't be a problem, but they had to catch the angle just right, or even their shields wouldn't protect them. This is like before the attack when we were still fighting each other at home. Let's see how often these pricks have dealt with turbulence, or a load of pissed-off pilots out for their blood. Adam didn't even try to argue with Ravente when he got the news. He turned to Gray and let him know what was going on. Privately, he didn't blame the pilots for wanting in on the action, and their reasoning was more than sound. The odds would even out of space, providing they could all get there. I guess we trust them then, Gray replied. Monitor the situation. We shouldn't risk any other pilots. Are they even at full strength? No, they only launched five ships and one of them's borrowed. Gray shook his head. Can't argue with their determination. The ship shook from a heavy blow. Report. Ollie waved his hand over his head. It's okay, sir, that wasn't a shield breach, just a particularly heavy hit from one of their turrets. Durant spoke up. I'm monitoring their power output. The kinetic force is solid, but our shields can hold. We just need to find a way to breach their shields. I can tell you this, only a few Alliance ships in service could withstand an attack like this. We've got a lot of work to do if there are more of these guys out there. Let's hope not, Leonard muttered. Transfer the guns back to me, Redding said. We've escorted the shuttle and are ready to devote all our attention to the enemy vessel. Very good. Adam watched the screen as they altered course, directing themselves straight for the enemy. Their relay cannon seems to only be able to activate for a set period of time, Durant said. That could be an advantage if they're draining power from all the generators, but whoever was clever enough to build such a weapon probably gave the thing its own power station. That way, defenses wouldn't be compromised. But if they wanted to recharge faster, Gray said, wouldn't they want it tapped into the main drive? Safety protocol would defy such a thing. Durant replied, but then again, these guys don't scream safe is something they care about. Let's hope they did it, because when it turns off next time, we should give them all we've got. Missiles too? Adam asked. He hoped to use them and wanted to see how much damage they might cause. If they could even weaken the shields, the turrets could do the rest. They might help, Durant hummed. I'll run a quick simulation. Oh, good. Adam muttered. We've got plenty of time for that. Keep at them, Gray said. Don't let up, even as we formulate a plan. I want them to be on their toes the entire time we're out here. Megan hit the atmosphere at the proposed entry point, but even with an optimal angle, her ship bucked wildly. Oh yeah, I don't miss this kind of thing one bit. She began rattling around even as the shields brightened in front of her, absorbing the brunt of the heat of entry. The entire process would take less than 20 seconds before the air's turbulence would be the only thing to worry about. At least I'll avoid being incinerated before having the chance to fire a shot. I might have overestimated my skills down here. To say I'm rusty might be an understatement. Compensating for the wind and working with it were two different things. Megan used to be good at the latter, but may have to rest on the former. Breaking through the first layer of cloud coverage, she saw the thrusters of the enemy ships up ahead. She accelerated, trying to close some distance when the enemy opened fire. The shuttle tried to dodge aside, pulling off an impressive evasive maneuver, but the blast tore off the backside, ruining the thrusters in the process. God damn it, Megan scowled, willing the fighter to move faster. Men ejected from the vessel, each one becoming a mostly helpless target. Their guns won't help them against the enemy's shields, so we've got to cover them on the way down. Thank God we came out here. We're nearly there, Panther, Megan said. Don't let up on any of these guys. We have to keep up the pressure until they're dead or our guys are safe. 
Can't speak for all of you, but I'd rather not go back to the behemoth without ensuring we take down every single ship down here. I'm moving to engage. Megan focused on the nearest ship, one that dove toward the marines descending toward the surface. She fired a warning shot, grazing the shields. It didn't cause any damage, but the blow forced the pilot to change course and go evasive. As she hoped, the bastard was not particularly skilled, nor used to flying in atmosphere. His maneuver almost looked as if he were flying in slow motion. Megan spun, dropping nearly a hundred feet in altitude to get behind him. Without hesitating, she depressed the trigger. The cockpit warmed up and her weapons let off a series of high-pitched barks as they fired, a wholly unfamiliar sound considering their space operations. The first three hits missed, but she compensated, scoring a direct blow to the fuselage. Shields flared. He attempted to pull up, but the last two shots got through, connecting with his engines. The ship exploded, and wreckage blasted off in every direction as a massive fireball lit up the sky. Splash one, Megan called over the radio. A flash of light caught her attention, and she risked a glance, noting two of the Panther fighters took out another ship. They worked in tandem, leading the enemy to pull up into a hail of gunfire that ripped through the shields enough for the second pilot to score a hit all along the side igniting ordnance. That would be two. Lieutenant Paris Tullifson, the man who took over Leslie's spot as Panther V, made the announcement. He had it out for the enemy perhaps more than anyone, considering. An elevation in number due to death left everyone feeling uncomfortable. They hadn't made it official, and wouldn't until they found another pilot. Megan's scanner warned her of an impending collision, and she climbed, gunning the throttle. The suddenness of the action pressed her into her seat, and she leveled off a moment later when the threat passed her by. A missile dumb-fired. They wanted me to move. But why? What's the point? The answer to her question came a moment later as the other two ships came at her from the side. She spun, going into a full dive into the cloud coverage. Her altimeter became a blur as she raced toward the ground. White mist surrounded her, and all at once broke away to reveal a rocky, mountainous landscape some miles below. I've got both of them on me, Megan called out. Anyone see this? Relax, Mick said. We're on it. Just don't get shot. Megan sighed. Great advice. More shots passed her by, blasts which would eventually make it to the surface and chew up the rocks. She banked hard to the left and tried to shake them off, but at least one of them remained all over her. What I wouldn't give for the ability to spin in place right now. She performed evasive maneuvers, keeping out of easy targeting. Other blips appeared on her scanner, something she saw out of her peripheral vision. The rest of Panther Wing moved in for the kill, flying in a wide formation to blanket the area with the most firepower they could muster. You might want to get ready to dive, Mick said. We're about to unleash on these guys. On your mark, Megan replied. The last thing I'm in the mood for is finding out how unfriendly friendly fire can be. Sync up, Mick called out. And on three. One, two, three. Megan dove as soon as he had the number, just as countless shots lit up the sky. One of the enemy pilots couldn't react quickly enough and got caught in a few blasts. His wings were torn off and fire erupted from his fuselage. He ejected just as his ship began to go down, a parachute opening a moment later. The other one followed Megan, staying hot on her tail. He matched her speed and course, even as she went straight for the nearest mountain. Tapping her computer, she brought up a three-dimensional topographical display of the area. A canyon led through the space, and if she couldn't shake him, maybe she could outfly him. Or crash into an alien rock formation, whichever comes first. Let's see what you've got, buddy. Megan plunged toward the ground and leveled out less than 1,500 feet from the ground, roughly the midpoint of the canyon. As she entered, the rocks on both sides became ominous and oppressive, making her feel boxed in. The map on her HUD showed when to make turns, but having never done it, it might have been more dangerous than all the fights she'd been in combined. Hitting a wall would not afford time for a proper ejection after all. Megan banked softly to the left following the route, and her opponent kept after her, matching her maneuver. He's pretty good, she thought. I'm impressed so far. Let's see if you can handle this, though. 
She noted a taller outcropping of rocks coming up and targeted the base, firing a missile. As the projectile streaked off, she gunned her acceleration, racing to get past the trap she tried to spring. An explosion resounded through the area, and the stones began to crumble. Megan blurred by as they collapsed, falling behind her. The enemy climbed and cleared the hazard before chasing after her again. However, she gained some distance. You're insane, Mick said. We're just about to you. I'd recommend getting out of that rock formation before you become a permanent resident. As soon as you have a lock and can take this guy out. The enemy fired, riddling the walls around her with blasts. Chunks of rock flew everywhere, forcing Megan to climb again to avoid even the smaller obstacles. Her shields might burn through them, but she didn't feel like taking a chance. When she cleared the canyon and approached open air again, her nemesis closed again. Just as he was getting too close for comfort again, a series of shots lit up the sky again, this time from Mick's fighter. He caught the enemy on the nose, making him tumble. The sudden change in momentum, the flipping itself, caused his wings to tear off, and he hit the ground at nearly 300 knots. The fusion core went up a moment later, sending a shockwave that felt like turbulence as Megan fought to compensate for the force. The other pilots joined her, falling into a formation. She realized she was covered in sweat, her pulse racing. It probably started the moment she plunged toward the ground and only just now began to subside. Got any more aerial show tricks you want to show us? Flight Lieutenant David Benning, Panther 3, asked. Because that one was pretty amazing. Thanks. I'll be sticking to the safer side of combat flying if you don't mind. Megan contacted Ravente to let him know what happened. He probably already received a report about the ground team, but she included what they saw and let them know they were on their way back. No casualties this time. Thank God. I'm done losing pilots or ships. Stay down there, Ravente said. If the enemy shuttle takes off, we'll need you there to bring it down. It cannot reach their capital ship, understand? We've got it, Megan said. Okay, we're on standby until the bad guys are dealt with. Keep an eye out for their shuttle. We might have some more work to do today after all. Jenks leveled out as he fell, throwing his arms out to the side and parting his legs. His altimeter suggested he had a while before he'd want to open his chute, especially with the enemy pilots flying around like maniacs. He felt some relief when he saw their own ships chase them off. Most of their fight could be seen from his vantage point, blasts and crazy aerial maneuvers, all cut off when he plunged into the clouds. Turning to his altimeter, he watched it carefully. His scanner suggested he was at least heading toward dry ground, which helped a great deal. The last thing he wanted was to fall into some alien sea. If it happened to only be water, whatever lived in it might need a snack. Being eaten on an alien world was not on the recruitment brochure. Report in, Hoffner's voice filled his helmet. Where is everyone? Still on descent, Jenks replied. Looks like I'm more than halfway down. Others gave similar reports, but a few were already down and had linked up. They were prepared to approach the monastery. Coordinates were transmitted to his scanner, and he tried to aim in that direction. The parachute would make it easier to get close, but they had to hurry. If the enemy got what they wanted and got to their ship, it would be up to the pilots again. I really don't want to give them the glory on this one. Jenks pulled his chute, grabbing the handles to maneuver toward the rendezvous point. His scanner turned up no enemy activity. Friendly blips filled the HUD, but they were scattered about the area each converging on the point. They needed to rally quickly if they wanted to accomplish their mission, but the terrain looked treacherous enough to delay them all. The rocky surface came up quickly, and he pulled his legs up, preparing to land on the most even ground he could find. Touching down, he detached the parachute and dropped in a single motion, rolling forward to a crouching position. With his rifle out, he cleared the area, then hustled toward the rendezvous. Hey, y'all, this is Jenks. I'm on my way, ETA, less than a minute. I'm coming from the south, so don't shoot me. No promises, Hoffner replied. Team, listen up. After the sergeant arrives, I'm changing the rendezvous. We'll converge on the monastery. Check your HUD for where I want you and don't burst in without my order. You've just become backup.
Jenks jogged along some seriously uneven terrain to get up to his people, crunching rock underfoot and negotiating around boulders barring his path. He finally saw one of the marines, and he pinged them all with his computer before approaching. Someone spoke in the comm that he'd arrived. Good, Hoffner said. Move out, now. Keep the formation loose and watch for ambushes. I doubt they can hide their signatures from our scans, but they've already proven to be clever. They didn't have far to go. Less than a five-minute force march. They came around to a path that led directly into the monastery. It was built on a plateau, with brick walls and a high, angled roof. An archway led into the courtyard where a fountain took up the middle of the area. The enemy's shuttle sat right there off to the left, but no one guarded the entryway. Hoffner motioned for two of the marines to approach, to take position on either side of the door. Jenks checked his HUD and found a number of people were inside the building, but only one sat in the shuttle. The engines idled, meaning they planned for a quick extraction. If they got rid of that pilot, they'd have a ride out of there. Captain, why don't we claim the shuttle? Jenks suggested. Send someone in to take the guy out in there and we'll have it ready. Even if the enemy gets out ahead of us, they'll find the doors closed and won't be able to leave. Holland? Ricks? Hoffner called out two men. You guys got it? Yes, sir. We'll get it. Holland cross-trained as a pilot, so he could fill in until their actual driver arrived. Jenks checked and saw he was still almost ten minutes out, a lifetime considering what they were about to do. When things went loud, the entire operation would take less than a few minutes. They'd clear the building or die trying. The two Marines crept through the archway, moving to the lowered ramp in the back of the shuttle. They lifted their rifles, then boarded. Without firing a shot, Ricks called in. Enemy down. We have the shuttle. Hoffner brought the rest of the men together. A quick scan of the building shows multiple entry points. Four of us will go in to clear the place. The rest of you take cover around the courtyard and prepare an ambush in the event they get out before us. Check your fire so we don't take down any civilians. Any questions? No one spoke up. Jenks checked his HUD again to see where Walsh was, and he happened to be one of the guys quite a ways out. He's going to be pissed he missed this action. Those around him were a mixture of their respective units. Two others joined Jenks and Hoffner, who moved in to the first door. Hoffner stood to the left, while the others took position, pressing against the wall and waiting for the go order. They remained on internal comms so their voices wouldn't be heard outside their helmets. Still, they needed to keep their voices down, and Hoffner whispered for them to do a silent breach. Jenks tapped his computer to move the scanner to the left part of his visor. He also decreased the opacity to give himself some more visibility. He didn't need nearly as much data as some of his men, who relied heavily on target detection and soft points and structures. Most of it felt like unnecessary noise to him. The door proved to be unlocked, so they moved inside their weapons leading the way. Scans indicated the largest cluster of people happened to be three rooms away. They engaged the suppressors on their rifles, stepping into the dark hallway. Night vision faded over Jenks's visor so he could easily see the area they were traversing. Modesty was the order of the day. The room was empty except for some empty pots and a couple of bare shelves. Walls seemed to sweat in the area, showing quite a bit of humidity. Jenks wondered fleetingly about the virus that the quarantine talked about. The thought of an illness wiping out a planet creeped him out, and returning to that place seemed crazy. I doubt I'd be able to trust it. Contact, Hoffner muttered. Next room, we've got two guards searching some crates. Let me have point, Jenks said. Marsh and I will take them. Go ahead. Hoffner stepped aside and Jenks joined one of the other Marines pacing inside. Sure enough, two of the enemy were hovering over some crates, their backs to the door. They were bent over and Jenks took aim, nodding to his companion. Their weapons popped, but the suppressors kept them silent enough so no one in the next room would have heard. Both bodies collapsed. They were wearing hazard suits. Looks like they didn't trust the virus thing, but then again, they couldn't have possibly known it burned itself out. The message was still broadcasting when we got here. Wow, whatever they're after must be the alien Holy Grail. Clear, Jenks muttered, 
We're ready to move. Next contingency of people is in what must be a common area. Two doors down. I'm thinking civilians mixed with hostiles. Very likely, Hoffner replied. There are three entrances. We'll secure this one. Jenks and Marsh go to the far side. I need Blake and Killian in here to take the final door. Let's move, people. Once we're in position, we'll do a deep scan and finish this up. Jenks and Marsh moved down the hallway, passing a set of double doors on their right that led into the bigger room. They found their position at the end, having to take a turn in order to arrive there, and once they were there, they leaned against the wall and called back in that they were ready. Killian and Blake took nearly a minute to arrive and position themselves for the action. Jenks took a moment to deep scan the room. Several people were on their knees, hands tied behind their backs. He saw them as blurs through the brick, which effectively blocked out some of the finer details he should have been able to pull. The armed guys moved about, searching what was probably some kind of altar with enough storage to make a ruckus. They were tossing the place, throwing things around. Someone protested their treatment of the stuff, and as soon as they opened their mouth, a guy cuffed them on the side of the head. Marking targets? Hoffner said. Aim high. I'll take out the lights, just as we breach. Drop down as soon as you enter. These guys were trained in the air, but they're not ground troops, or they'd have covered these areas. They're all too focused on their hostages and whatever prize they hope to steal. We'll take advantage. On my go, breach your door and let's end this. Several blips appeared on Jenks' HUD, the enemies Hoffner identified. Perhaps from his vantage, the people were more obvious. Raising the opacity a touch, when he entered, he'd know his targets by a distinct red glow. Civilians would be outlined in green. Taking a deep breath, he prepared himself for the mark. Go! Jenks kicked the door, plunging in with his weapon raised. He fired twice, taking down the first target on his left. Other suppressed shots popped around him, and people started screaming. The civilians dropped from their position on their knees as their captors went down. Only two of them got off any shots. In the end, five men got blown away. A Marine shouted, Clear? Jenks swept the area and concurred. This isn't all of them, Hoffner said. Jenks, you, Marsh, and Killian take the West Wing. Ricks and Blake take the East. We came through that area, so I doubt you'll find anything, but let's be thorough. We've got this area. Jenks hustled off down the way with his two men right behind. They caught something on the scanner up ahead, but just as Jenks was about to call it out, someone opened up on them. The Marines scattered, bursting through the first door for cover. Marsh climbed to his feet and moved toward the door. Hold up, Jenks said on the comm. Sound off. Ass got me in the leg, Marsh replied. I'm good, though, just a graze. I'm good, Killian sounded sleepy. Caught me in the meat. Jenks looked himself over. Utterly shocked, he came away unscathed. Checking the scanner again, the person who fired at them didn't show up. What the hell does this guy have going on? Marsh leaned his weapon out, tilting his head as he did. Firing three shots, they heard a scream. Got him, Marsh said. But I think he's got a buddy. As if to support his statement, a bout of gunfire caught the wall, embedding several rounds in the wood. He sounds pissed, too, Killian added. Jenks dropped prone and crawled to the door, sliding just his rifle out. A small display on the right of his hub looked down the sights with a tiny camera. Even with night vision, it was hard to see the man. But his shape was obvious. However, the target didn't seem violent, at least for the moment. What's going on over there? Please, don't shoot, the person shouted. They're holding me here. I'm not with them. The unfiltered voice was filled with panic. He sounded genuine, but Jenks didn't move. Someone else spoke up a moment later, grunting in that battle language they heard on Durant's planet. A heavy blow struck someone, and the first voice groaned. A body hit the ground, and Jenks saw it. A man not even wearing a hazard suit writhed around in pain. His captor became visible and fired blindly down the hall. Jenks didn't even twitch. The guy's shots all went high. Lifting the rifle, Jenks fired two shots, catching the man in the face. Night vision made the blood splatter look gray as the body dropped. Clear, he muttered. I think the guy trying to surrender needs medical attention. Hell with him, 
Marsh said. He's with them. We should just put him down. Jenks got to his feet. Stow that. We're not wasting prisoners. You two clear the rest of the hall and I'll take care of this. Go. He moved over to the man and flipped him over, checking to see if he'd been shot. Lucky for him, he simply took a heavy blow to the neck. You okay? What's your name? Weon, he muttered, sounding weak. Weon Sortrex. Nice to meet you, I guess. Jenks had to admit the guy didn't act like one of the enemies. First off, he was too cooperative. The other assholes wouldn't talk, even under heavy interrogation. You look like you're going to be all right, as long as this virus really did die off. We're going to get you some aid. You need to stop them. Weon struggled to sit up, but failed. They're after an... an artifact. Krilon is mad. He plans on conquering the galaxy. Taking control of our... our enemy. I'll report that in, Jenks said. But you're out of this stuff. Just relax for now. Believe me, we've got this. He tapped his comm and connected with Hoffner. I have an update you might want to hear. Hoffner let the Marines leave before turning to the first civilian. Who's in charge here? I am, another man said. You have to stop these animals. They're after an ancient artifact, an item which may have started the long war. What is it? We don't exactly know, he replied. Our science hasn't been able to crack it. It's an orb, roughly the size of my head. We know there's technology inside, but we have no way of opening it, and our scans are pointless. So why do they want it? We don't know, the man struggled. Will you get us out of these bonds? In a minute. Where's the item? We hid it in the basement. There's only one way in there, a coded doorway. Directions? West Wing. There's a stairway going down to a door that's locked. If they figure out how to get in, they'll have free access to it and a dozen other treasures. Thanks, we'll keep that in mind. How many of these guys are there? Ten, fifteen, I don't know specifically. Hoffner started to say something else when Jenks reported in, letting him know what they'd just learned. Understood. You're near a basement. The enemy's objective is down there. Get to the door and kill anyone trying to breach. If it's already down, guard it. We'll be right there. What about the civilians? Jenks asked. I'm leaving some company for them. Just get your ass in front of that objective. We're close to finishing this up, but we can't screw up now. Go! Chapter 11 Cannons blasted away at the enemy capital ship, splashing against their shields. Even with Durant's modulation work, they weren't breaking through. The enemy's weapons were in the same situation. They couldn't pierce the behemoth's defenses. Even with missiles and heavy ordnance, neither side could gain an advantage. We need something, Durant, Gray said. Come on, this can't go on forever. Durant tapped away at the console, his hands moving at a near blur. I'm working on it, Captain. I have to admit I'm shocked that they're able to withstand this sort of punishment. Scans do show they're releasing a wild amount of energy, and they are fading. This may be an endurance match. Gray had let them fire missiles, but only one didn't get shot down. It hit Creelon's ship and the shields annihilated it. They moved about each other, circling like large cats ready to do battle in the open plains. There was no leaving this fight. If the behemoth didn't take them out, they'd simply send more people to the surface to steal whatever they were after. Unless our people find it and return it first. Sir, our shuttle has been shot down, Agatha announced. Our pilots have engaged the enemy, and so far all Marines are accounted for. Understood, Ensign, Gray sighed. Another complication. Those men were technically stranded down there for the time being. They'd have to prep another shuttle for extraction, but he left that work up to Ravente and Adam. This fight took all his concentration. He turned to Clea. Any ideas? Insights? I've been scanning the area. Clea replied, and there are some interesting things in this system. Such as? Large masses, the kind Creelon used to mask his vessel back at our previous destination, something which might cover our scan signature. What are you suggesting? A micro-jump. Clea brought the coordinates up on her scan. To the far side of this planet, we'll be out of visual, and they won't be able to scan us. 
For all intents and purposes, we'll have jumped out of the system. Adam looked sharply at them, allowing them to lower their guard and focus on their operation. We'll have to make it look like we've got a reason, Clea replied. Gray nodded. Durant, can you simulate a core breach? Something realistic enough to fool them? Easily. When they fire the relay cannon again, I can make it happen. Good, Gray turned to Adam. Have the hangar load a shuttle up with every bomb they can fit on the thing. Tell them they've got a few minutes. Ollie, how do you feel about some automated flying? I can handle it, sir. But in order to avoid their automated defenses, it'll have to be totally cold and offline. Thrusters only for absolute necessity. Sounds like you'll need to pull off some math, then, Gray replied. Get this ready, and we can end our stalemate. We have to drop the shuttle before jumping through, so let me know the moment everything's loaded. Leonard, lay in the coordinates Clea provided. I hope we're making the right move, but this seems like one of our last options. I intend on making it count. Creelon went through the reports on his screen and couldn't believe what he read. How could the human ship possibly withstand such an assault? He might need the entire fleet to take them on. The fact their shields held and they managed to screen their shuttle down to the surface of the planet shocked him. They even found a good use for their pilots. Tactically speaking, their captain proved shrewd not only to have survived two encounters with the final star, but also to catch up to them so quickly. How? They couldn't have tracked the ship, not that quickly. And no one sent any sort of message from this planet to get help. Ultimately, the answer didn't matter. They were present and wanted blood. Perhaps murdering their pilot was a poor decision after all. They're fighting with quite the gusto. At least the land crew would be able to hold their own. Before his fighters went down, they reported back that the human transport was taken out. That would buy his people some time to find the artifact and get it back to the ship. But they would have to deal with the enemy fighters harassing them the whole way back. If they managed to make it to orbit, it would be a miracle. Yes, they want to destroy us for what we're doing. I'll need to get some more people out there if I expect to get my people and the prize back. My lord, Brillin caught his attention. Their shields are not dropping. We can't get them to go below 80% before they somehow recharge. And they cannot breach ours either, Creelon muttered. We fought ourselves to a standstill. How can I gain an edge? Creelon scowled at the screen just as the relay cannon fired again. Something flared on the screen, a flash of light that filled the bridge with white, then faded. Brillin shouted something incoherent. He stood and gestured to his monitor. My lord, an overload. It seems our weapon reacted with their shields, causing a power surge resulting in system failure. The computer estimates they will be vulnerable in less than 60 seconds. Victory! Is it? Creelon shook his head. He watched the screen, something gnawing at his gut. No, something's wrong. I smell a trick. We can't have been brawling like this, then suddenly cause random damage. What do you want to do? Brillin asked. Fall back. Creelon paused as the behemoth vanished, performing a jump. They fell back? Scans, where are they? Processing? Brillin shook his head. Nothing, sir. They've left the system. Would you bet your life on it? Brillin paused. I, yes, sir. There's nothing out there. But wait. I am picking something up. Creelon stood, pacing closer. He turned to Machin. Move. Get us out of here. Now. Machin slapped the controls and the ship bolted, suddenly moving backwards. They headed for the planet's moon. Brillin brought the scan up on the main screen, a blip which looked like drifting debris. A piece of the Earth ship they left behind? It must be. But I still feel suspicious. It's moving toward us, Creelon muttered. Is that a natural drift pattern? Yes, sir. No deviation in course. Distance to us? It's moving very quickly. Brillin spoke softly. We're half flank speed, Machen added. But we don't have full engine power moving in reverse. It's picking up speed, 
Creelon gestured. Open fire. Take it down. Machin hit something on his console and the relay cannon blasted away, striking the object. A massive explosion erupted, causing a dramatic shockwave that swept over them. The final star shook, tossing Creelon back into his seat. Brillin hit the floor, rolling into one of the consoles. He struck his head and fell still. The lights went out and the screen flickered. Report, Creelon shouted. What's happening? Ordnance explosion, Machin replied. 10,000 kilometers off the bow. Must have been more than 10 bombs to cause such a reaction. Shields are at 20%. No readings on scans. Contact the surface. Find out if we've got what we came for and get medical up here immediately. Creelon looked at Brillen, noting the blood flowing freely from his head. He'd seen enough injuries to know how severe this one was. If he survived, he'd be very lucky, even with help. We have to get this done quickly, or we might all be in the same situation as him. Jenks arrived at the stairs and cursed when he saw the door at the bottom wide open. He reported back to Hoffner before gesturing for his men to follow him. They took the stairs swiftly, pausing to peek in before breaching the hallway. The scanners didn't pick anyone up. Again, some kind of interference with the substance in the walls. Someone was down there, though. He heard noise up ahead. They were looting what equated to the vault of the place. Did they find what they were after? Shots were fired, catching the walls. Jenks went prone, returning fire. Muzzle flashes gave him a target and someone screamed. Boots clapped on the ground as the other targets dashed for cover. He glanced back and saw his men were still with him, both alive even after the quick ambush. Jenks got to his knee and peered through his visor, frowning at how the night vision didn't do much to illuminate the area. He switched the thermal but immediately went back. The area turned gray in that visual, practically blinding him. They advanced with night vision back. The dim area turned green. To the right, an open portal led to a small storage room, but the real prize seemed to be just up ahead. Someone rattled around, rifling through something. I wish I could grenade the damn thing but then I'd probably screw up whatever they're trying to take. Maybe they'd like to surrender. We've got you outnumbered, Jenks called. We've got your shuttle. The whole building's secure. You can't get out of here. An explosion shook the place, and Jenks had to lean on the wall to maintain his footing. Marsh cursed. What the hell was that? Move. Jenks rushed forward, checking the door before hurrying through. Sure enough, the enemy knocked out the center portion of the wall, dust floating in the air. They were on the move, likely with whatever prize they were after. The Marines hustled after them, calling the action in. They're on their way to the courtyard. Get ready. Acknowledged, Holland said. We've got cover at the shuttle. When they show up, they're done. Jenks crawled through the hole and took a right, firing at the first thing he saw moving. It missed, but the person yelped crying out in their strange battle language. They found themselves on a walkway behind the building with a cavern just beyond the rail. Mist hung low, hiding the bottom. They moved swiftly on the slick pavement, taking the stairs three at a time. When they got to the top, someone took a wild shot at them, driving them to take cover. Jenks aimed his weapon around the corner and used his camera, firing multiple times. The ensuing gunfight lasted less than a minute before the enemy continued to flee. They're still coming your way, Holland. Just get them here already, Sarge. We'll get them. The running fight lasted until they reached the courtyard. Four of the enemy remained as they rushed for the shuttle. Jenks and his men moved out of the way, parting and taking cover. Less than ten feet from the ramp, Holland and Ricks opened up, riddling the men with continuous fire. They danced for all of five seconds before collapsing to the ground. A globe rolled away from the one in the lead, large and red, it had no seams or texture, just perfectly smooth. Is that a bomb? Jenks asked, standing at what he hoped was a safe distance. Or is that what they were after? I think we got it, Marsh said. And if you guys were accurate about the number of bad guys you killed, they're all gone. Unless they didn't all have a seat on the way down. Captain Hoffner, Jenks said. We've got the item and the enemy's done. We're clear. Good work, Jenks. Secure the artifact and get ready for evac. I'll inform the ship. 
We'll rendezvous in a few moments. Jenks patted Marsh on the shoulder. Can't believe we made it, man. This was crazy. Could have been worse, Marsh pointed out. Could have been raining. Jenks looked up at the clouds and frowned. If it starts, I'm going to smack you. Police up these bodies, guys. We've got a lot of work to do before we can go home. The bombs took their shields, Ollie shouted. It worked. Sort of. You were hoping for better? Adam asked. They clearly caught on. He's not an idiot, Gray said. But he's not infallible. Running backwards against that little rocket wasn't going to save them. Shooting it might have. They're hailing us, Agatha said. He's made it clear they're jumping in 30 seconds, sir. Enough time for us to get over there with a micro jump, Gray asked. Durant, can we finish them off? Even if we got there, the armor on that thing might withstand a few shots. Probably enough to save them. For now, Gray cursed. Put him on screen, then. Creelon appeared, his face covered in sweat, his bridge dark. He glared at the camera, seething with rage. Nicely played, human. I'm just getting started, Gray replied. Why don't you turn yourself in? You won't get a better offer again. I have other plans. You win this round, but I don't give up. Operational success doesn't always rely on a mission working out. You're wasting a lot of lives. Why don't you help us defeat the enemy rather than create another front? We don't have time to deal with you too. Alas, Creelon shrugged. I guess you'll have to keep looking over your shoulder. Enjoy your win today. The next time we meet, I promise I'll take something from you. Something you care about, as I cared about this. The connection ended, and the view screen returned to an image of deep space. They watched as the final star winked out, jumping to another destination. Gray slapped his hands together and turned away. They were so damn close. We had them. Damn it. He inhaled and let his breath out slowly, forcing his frustration back into his gut. Ollie grunted. I can't believe he got away. You got anything, Leonard? No, nothing. I'm working on it, though. You won't find him, Clea said. I guarantee he'll jump three more times before they get to their destination. We can't track that. Not when we have to take care of the mess here. He's been stopped, Gray said, for now at least. Whatever he wanted down there, we've got. Providing we take it with us, he'll never get it. I suppose we'll move on to the next scheme. You were right about him being a tough customer, Adam said. I'm honestly impressed. As am I, Gray replied. But I guess it doesn't matter for now. We've got a lot of work to do. Agatha, contact Alliance Command and tell them what happened here. Let's get some shuttles down there to extract our people along with the civilians. This place has been compromised, and I doubt anyone's going to be hiding something here anytime soon. Epilogue Gray and Clea entered the sickbay, approaching the cot of Weon Sortrex. He stared up at the ceiling, fluids being pumped into his arm. He seemed distant, almost catatonic, but as they approached, he blinked several times. His skin seemed stretched over his bones, pale and sickly. Whatever he'd been through had a dramatic effect on him. They didn't speak for several moments, just standing in his presence so he might acclimate to the company. Weon swallowed hard, opened his mouth as if to speak, but remained quiet. Clea stepped forward, putting her hand on his arm. He winced, then relaxed, offering her a thin smile. How are you feeling? she asked. I hope you're better. To be out of that monster's hands, Weon shook his head. You have no idea how bad he was. How dangerous. He didn't care about anything. No compassion. No mercy. His disdain for everyone. Especially women. We noticed, Gray replied. We're glad to see you back. We took the item he wanted. Some kind of globe. An artifact of the enemy, Weon said. 
something he thought might give him control over them. Gray's brow raised. Really? Where did he get this information? He didn't see fit to tell me, but he believed it wholeheartedly. Do you think it's possible? Gray asked Clea. That we might have a weapon against them? Clea shook her head. No. If we had such an item, don't you think we would have used it by now? We can show it to Durant, let him study it, but control the enemy? My information I uncovered is our best route to take care of them. Not this. Pipe dream. I have no idea why a man like Creelan would allow himself to believe a myth anyway. He's insane, we answered. But a wily variety of it. Believe me, if you did not kill him, we haven't seen the last of him. We know he has other ships, Gray pointed out. And God knows what else. His people have incredible technology and worse. The training to use it, and the zeal to throw away their lives. You must stop him, we answered. The Alliance has to track him down and finish him off. Believe me, it's better for everyone. We will. Gray patted his shoulder. We'll let you rest now. Don't worry, you'll be home soon enough. In the hallway, Clea sighed. I received a report from Captain Hoffner for you. All our men are aboard. Minor injuries. The civilians have come as well, and every artifact we were storing has been locked away in the cargo bay. We'll be ready to leave the system within the hour. To return home. Have we received word from the Alliance? Clea nodded. They're going to leave the quarantine beacon up for now, but we'll eventually come back. The colonies are all better protected as well, and a full task force is being established to deal with Creelon. He won't be able to hide for long. Oh, he's not hiding. Remaining under the radar, I believe, but not hiding. Gray rubbed his eyes. I hate the fact that we've established a second front, even if they aren't as plentiful, their unpredictability makes them dangerous. We'll research the item we brought on board, gather intel, and take care of our problems as they come. Clea said. I have faith. You've given it to me each time we come out of a fight alive. I'm glad I have a positive influence, Gray smirked. Let's get back to the bridge and get out of here. We've all earned a little rest, don't you think? More than you know, sir. After what we've been through and seen, we deserve a proper holiday. But we won't get one, will we? Gray shook his head. Not yet. Not with what we know and what we can do. Durant's going to make a big difference around here. I hope he sticks around. I doubt you could kick him off at this point. He's getting to do more field research than he's ever done in the past. Good thing he's personable. Gray hit the elevator button. Maybe your people will have finished analyzing your data by the time we get back. Clea followed him on the elevator and watched the number panel above the doors. I hope so. I want to take care of all this properly. It's high time my people found peace. And if it took meeting your people, then I'm all the happier I got to be your liaison. Imagine getting to return to exploration. I've dreamt of it my entire life. I hope we can make that come true, Clea. Gray leaned against the wall and forced his shoulders to relax. For everyone's sake. This is the end of Book 6, but the story continues with Rebellion, Rise of Mankind, Book 7. Keep listening after the credits for a free preview. You have been listening to Rise of Mankind, Publisher's Pack, Books 5 and 6. Produced by Greg Lawrence, Associate Producer Emily Durr. Text Copyright 2017 by John Walker. Production Copyright 2017 by Podium Publishing. All rights reserved.
Prologue Trellin Endall dodged the blow meant for his face and retaliated with a punch to the gut. His opponent grunted, doubling over to offer a perfect target for a follow-up. An uppercut sent the pirate stumbling backwards, collapsing on a table. Glasses shattered and drinks spilled on the floor, but the man didn't get up. Chaos followed. Men and women started brawling, some with cause and others simply because they enjoyed violence. Trellin squared off with a Garen, one of the fringe alliances of the Keelans. They looked much the same, but Garen coloring tended toward darker skin and black hair. Their eyes didn't have irises, making them somewhat unnerving to other races. Most of them were kind-hearted, but this guy packed a mean punch. Trellin blocked his first three punches, but regretted not trying to dodge. A strike to the face made Trellin stumble, and he dropped low, sweeping his attacker. The man hit the ground, his head bouncing on the hardwood. Dazed, he didn't jump back up, but another brawler took his place. Trellin needed to be careful about how he fought. Too much technique was just as bad as too little. Fighting sloppy when he could be so efficient made it possible for a guy like the pirate to get past his defenses and get a face shot. When the next guy came at him, instinct took over and he blocked the attack by grabbing the man's forearm. The follow-up involved dislocating the guy's shoulder, then pounding him in the sternum. As the guy dropped, he didn't even make any sound. He couldn't breathe and his arm wouldn't cooperate. Someone else threw a glass at him, but it missed. He flipped a table in their direction, causing them to stumble. As they tried to regain their footing, Trellin bound forward and worked their body with a number of blows to the sides and stomach. He moved upward, hammering their ribs and finally giving them a variety of shots to the face. To their credit, they didn't move back until the end, when they fell onto the bar where the bartender smashed a bottle of booze over their face. He meant it. A chair slammed into Trellin's back and he spun to face another opponent, this one a thin guy holding the broken pieces of chair like they were a pair of swords. They only remained stationary for a moment before the fight started. Trellin blocked three shots aimed for his head and threw a kick, connecting with the guy's abdomen. The blow sent him backwards into another table where he rolled over it and landed face down. A different fighter trampled him accidentally, falling beside him. Trellin took the opportunity to dash for the door, bursting outside into the light and away from the action. Another brawl, he thought. How many senseless bouts of violence am I going to have to get into to catch the eye of these bastards? Trellin got outside and inhaled a breath of fresh air. The sun was out, beaming down on the little dusty pirate town so far off the beaten path, no one ever bothered to visit it. A failed colony attempt put it on the registry for the Alliance as a waste of time, so the riffraff took over. Temporary shanty towns sprung up all across the galaxy for less. Blood filled his mouth and he spat it out, moving down the street to find a different drinking establishment. He'd been thrown out of nicer and fled worse. Over six months of working the space lanes, robbing civilian crafts and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with military scouts gave him a lean, tough approach to life. Hey. A voice from across the street shouted, but he ignored it. You there, with the orange hair. Trellin fit the description. He favored his mother's coloring, with long orange hair and teal eyes. He sported a beard to help toughen up his overall look. Without it, he lost ten years and held the intimidation value of a pet. Pausing in his step, he turned to look at the person, but as he did, his hand rested on the butt of his gun. What do you want? Trellin asked. To talk to you for a minute. The person addressing him was also a Keelan, though much shorter, standing at less than five six. His black hair was practically shaved, and he had purple eyes. He wore a black uniform with an aged patch that had seen better days. If he'd been military, he left their employ. They'd never allow someone to let themselves look so shabby. I'm listening, for now. Better make it fast. Name's Vil, and I'm hoping you're for hire. What do you want me to do? Trellin narrowed his eyes. I'm not in a good mood, so this better be good. You got a permanent boat? Vil hurried across the street to stand near him. 
as in a regular crew to roll with? Trellin shook his head. Freelancer, I haven't found a group I'm willing to set up with. Been looking for the right cause. These were the words he'd been practicing for a long time. Every job he took on, he made it clear he was on the hunt for a proper cause, something to believe in. He wanted to work with someone that had a vision of the future and provided some sense of purpose. Most laughed at him, but Trellin knew of a particular group looking for the right folks. Those who fit the bill he was after didn't accept applications, though. They either drafted individuals or took on volunteers they approached. Trellin knew they favored efficiency and, quite frankly, an ability to be ruthless. He'd proven that plenty of times. He developed a reputation quickly, but now it needed to pay off. Trellin doubted Vil could help, but he wanted to hear what he had to say. I know what you mean, friend, Vil smiled. Truth is, I've got a gig for you. You're handy with a gun, right? Handle yourself in a fight? You'd think with this bruise on my jaw, you'd be wondering if that were true. Nah, I saw what you did in the bar. That guy you knocked out was a real piece of work. He'll start a brawl with anyone, especially folks he doesn't know. Must have a lot of friends, Trellin quipped. Listen, I've got a ship with a small crew and we're doing a huge job. Bigger than we've ever been given before. If you're interested, we'd love to have you on board. Vil leaned in close. We actually picked up a contract from a notorious group. One I thought never went outside their own ranks. We're going to make a fortune, man. Trellin's heart pounded in his chest, but he didn't let his excitement show. If these were the people he'd been after, then Vil might be able to move him toward his goal after all. It may not be the actual in he wanted, but one more check on the list wouldn't hurt. Still, he had to be cautious. If these people were idiots, they'd potentially ruin his progress. You seem a little enthusiastic, Trellin said. How good are your people? Are they going to be idiots? Cause some kind of trouble? I don't want to get into something where I'll look like a fool for going along with it. Plus, I need some more particulars. How illegal is this? What are my chances of doing time in a slam? Hey, relax. Vil patted his shoulder and Trellin scowled. Er, sorry, we're professionals. Seriously, we've never been caught or taken down by the cops. I promise you. We've got this, and I guarantee you a sweet amount of cash to go along with your troubles. Just, you know, we need your gun. Who do you think you need to kill? We're after Data at a space station, Vil replied. Off the beaten path, but in the heart of one of the Alliance race's home planets. Place has quite a few Marines, and I'm afraid there's a ground-out portion, too. That's why we need the extra help. We go in, drop security on the planet, then download from the computer banks and get the hell out. Let me guess, Trellin said. No witnesses. We just have to wipe the computers, Vil replied. They didn't specify about killing everyone or not, but I'm sure it would be a lot easier than letting them live, am I right? Of course, that would only be on the station. Can't kill everyone on a planet, right? Tell that to the Orion's light, Trellin thought. He cleared his throat before continuing. Have you ever done something like this before? Yeah, we took a high-value target from the Alliance before. Nailed a scout ship while it was in space dock. Vil grinned. We got a fortune in weapons. In fact, as part of your pay, we'll give you one of their high-end pistols and enough magazines for a month. Plus, we'll take care of all expenses. Anything you use on the trip, we'll pick up. Trellin sighed. I want to meet the rest of your crew before I agree to this. They'd better be as good as you say. Listen, I wouldn't accept a job from the Orion's Light without reliable people. Believe me, Vil gestured. Come on, I'll take you to the captain right now. So you're not in charge? Trellin figured as much, but thought he'd poke fun at the guy. What's your role? Requisitions. And I think the captain figures I'm expendable, so he sends me to talk to scary people like you. Vil smiled as if trying to make sure his comment was a joke, but Trellin believed there to be some truth in it. They headed down the street. 
Anyway, I've been working with these guys for a long time, and they're hyper-efficient. You'll see. I'd better. Trellin's pulse raced, and he had to take some calming breaths. This was as close to the Orion's light as he'd come since he began this assignment. If he could catch their notice here, everything he'd done would be worth it. Providing this crew could handle themselves as well as Vil said, he'd definitely take the job. Maybe then he could move on to his real objective of serving with Krelon Arvax and his crusade. Here's to hoping. Please don't represent a bunch of losers, Vil. I need this. More than anything. Trellin boarded the spacecraft, leery of what he might be getting into. Every new job started out with a sense of danger, a worry concerning the people he was committing to work with. They all represented some unknown factor, and he never knew whether they might be totally psychotic or genuine professionals. And still others wanted to roll the people they worked with, stealing whatever they had and leaving them for dead. Or worse, they turned out to be slavers, luring potential cargo into a trap. He'd had to fight his way out of that particular dilemma twice, leaving behind a lot of bodies before escaping. As he paced up the ramp into the cargo area, he quickly scanned the area for threats. Men hung around nearby, but none of them seemed to pay him any attention. They worked, carrying out various duties without so much as looking up. Large boxes were lashed down, secured to thick metal floor plates. The crew didn't seem too big on luxury. The entire area looked utilitarian, essentials only. Trellin admired people who worked lean. It meant they focused on the job and not frivolous, unnecessary luxury. He'd been putting that face forward in every task he took on, working toward what the Orion's light supposedly valued. They were also a group that didn't bother with the finer things, focusing instead on duty. You're going to love our commander, Vil said. Real stickler like you. Totally focused, you know? Whatever, Trellin replied. Are we meeting this guy or what? Just this way. Vil gestured up the stairs and took them two at a time. As they reached the landing, they took a left into an office. We'll meet in here. The hair on the back of Trellin's neck stood up. If someone decided to attack him in the little room, it would be a rough fight. He'd have to grab Vil for cover, then work his way back out, through the cargo area with all those guys. As he recalled, they were definitely armed as well. That would be quite the brawl to get back to freedom. Another door opened and a bald man stepped in wearing utility overalls and a pistol low on his right hip. His tiny green eyes were made even smaller as he scowled. He sized up Trellin for a moment before sitting down. This a new guy you found? He got a rep? His name's Trellin Endall, Vil replied. You've heard of him. He's the freelancer, been working for pirates and the like. I thought he'd be a perfect addition considering how many people we need for this one. I mean, we can't be at every location at the same time, right? You said two crews for each assignment. The captain nodded. My name's Derelict, but you can call me Captain. What have you all done, Trellin? Hit jobs, Trellin replied. Security details, soldier work. I'm better at the violent part of the craft, but I've got some skill with a computer. You'd be better off with a specialist if you need to go beyond running some apps and breaking down some older style defenses. Good to know, Derelict grinned. Got a resume? Do you? Trellin asked. Derelict laughed. Okay, he seems pretty solid. Did you already talk terms? Sure did, Vil replied. We're good to go if you're fine with him. What do you say? Derelict looked at Trellin. You in? I'd like some more details before I fully commit. I know you can't give me too many, but what kind of opposition are we looking at on the surface? Good news, my friend. Hardly any. Derelict stood up and paced. The system's in a state of conflict right now. Those bastards are in the middle of a civil war. Rebels are stirring up trouble, apparently thanks to the Orion's light. I guess insurrection is the way to their heart right now. As a result, they've hired us to hop in and take some important alliance data. Sell it to them. 
Interesting. Trellin turned away, pretending to consider the situation. He'd already made up his mind he'd do it. He might never get so close to the terrorists as this opportunity. When do we head out? Ten hours, and it'll be a pretty fast-paced situation, too. Settle whatever debts you've got before then, because we're out of here with or without you. And I'd rather not think of you as an unfriendly sort for bailing on us. If you're going to commit. I'm in, Trellin said. I just have to go pay my lodging bill and grab my gear. I can be back here in a couple hours. Got a place I can bunk down? Yeah, we've got a full crew module installed. You'll be taken care of. He gestured at Vil. Get the contract ready for when he gets back. I want this as official as we can, given what we do. Trellin needed to get to a computer and fast. He didn't have a lot of time to send any sort of message, and after he boarded the ship with Derelict and his crew, he'd be off the grid entirely. The next ten hours were all he had left, before he hopefully made contact with his intended berth, the Orion's Light. Chapter One Clea on Twofall sat across from Durant in the engineering section as they ran independent scans on the sphere they took from a secret Keelan monastery. Orion's light terrorists murdered countless people to get their hands on this device, and no one really knew what it did. Unfortunately, it proved to be a mystery to the two investigators. The surface was made of a type of metal not registered with any Alliance database. However, they did know that it was incredibly tough. Scans indicated their most powerful cutting torches might melt it, but they did warn anything inside may be damaged, if not outright destroyed. It wasn't emitting any sort of signal, but they were fairly certain it was some kind of technical device. Though an hour into their probing, Durant did suggest it may simply be a bauble, some kind of decorative object the enemy favored. Clea wondered how true that would be. Orion's Light believed the device might somehow make the enemy their allies. Did they want this thing back bad enough they'd be willing to follow a man like Creelon? Doubtful. Then again, they'd seen some pretty strange things since taking to the stars with the behemoth. Even with her experience prior to joining the humans, she'd visited various sectors and never really been involved in the same kind of adventures. Clea rubbed her eyes and checked her chronometer. They would arrive at Alliance headquarters soon, and already she had meetings popping up on her calendar. Most of them were simple debriefings about the colonies and what they found, but one in particular caught her eye. Alliance Floral Design wanted to speak with her, and they set it at the highest priority. Um, that's weird. Mother, maybe? I guess I could be receiving a bouquet or something for coming back, but it doesn't seem likely. My parents tend to be too practical for such a gesture, especially to put it as a priority one. Clea brought up the business on her tablet and noted they were a simple flower shop. Nothing special about them, except they enjoyed a space less than a block from the council building. They must rake in the business. All those businessmen and politicians who end up going home long after they said they'd be there need something for their spouses. Multiple positive reviews blanketed the Nets' appraisal of their services with only two negative experiences. They were each related to business hours, which seemed strange. No business operated so well, even near the government buildings. Maybe they erase what they don't like. It's not necessarily legal, but business owners need all the edge they can get. What are you looking at? Durant asked. We're studying this device, Clea. I feel like we've gone as far as we're going to get with it, Clea replied. Besides, I got a strange meeting request I'm looking into. Oh? Durant moved around to look over her shoulder. Is it a job interview? Clea smirked. No, Durant, though I guess flower arranging might be safer than what we've been up to lately. Unfortunately, I never could differentiate flowers beyond the obvious ones. Tiramines, I know. And Lorndas, I've also got, but beyond those, she shrugged, the rest are just pretty, or smell nice. I'm not a flower person, Durant waved his hand dismissively, 
They're a waste of money, too, if you want me to be perfectly honest. I mean, who pays for something that's essentially already dead to just display it on a countertop? I call it morbid. You don't do it to other living things. You paint a disturbing visual, Clea said. I hope I don't have to educate you on why people find plants soothing. Oh, they're soothing when they're in the ground, Durant pointed at her tablet. Those people cut them and such, like arranging floral corpses for the macabre to enjoy and apologize with. I imagine the true message of giving a bouquet. Look, honey, I've killed several plants for you today. Do you forgive me? Barbaric. Clea rubbed her eyes. Now you're getting ridiculous. She put the cover on her tablet and stood up. I'm going to lock this thing away for delivery to the Alliance before getting ready for what promises to be a very long day. I'm off to coordinate the engineers in our retrofit project for the fighters, Durant grinned. Those Orion's light bastards will be in for quite the surprise when they meet our pilots next time. Are you sure it's not going to take long? The parts on the current inertial dampeners need to be replaced, Durant replied. Once we do that, they'll be ready for the same type of maneuvers we saw, and then some. I've already run them in simulators. While you're in meetings, we'll test one of the ships before doing it to all of them. On-the-fly updates seems pretty risky. We're in war, Durant pointed out. We have to take some chances, but again, we'll make sure we at least get some good test flights in, both on our fighters and the ships aboard the behemoth. Believe me, the flyers are eager to make this work. I'm sure. Clea grabbed the sphere and stuck it in the safe, locking it down. I'll talk to you later. Keep me informed on your progress. I'll relate it to the captain. Of course, Durant waved at her. You'd better hurry. Wouldn't want to keep bureaucracy waiting. Clea groaned as she left. She hadn't anticipated exactly what her promotion meant because she figured she was staying aboard the behemoth. How much could her job change? But whenever they were near the Alliance capital, she knew exactly how much more responsibility she received. The sheer amount of work they wanted out of her felt surprising. They needed briefings on activities, opinions about engagements, updated reports and new information for their knowledge base. The list stretched on and on. It got to the point she looked forward to getting back into deep space with the behemoth. Even a battle would be better than sitting in boardrooms, talking about her activities. Some of them were experiences she'd rather not relive over and over. Their time at the research facility seemed to be a favorite for the historians and battle tacticians, and she'd been in the thick of it. Her knowledge was invaluable. Unfortunately for her, that was also the mission where her sister betrayed them. Clea still didn't know where her sibling had been taken or where she was incarcerated. The trial hadn't happened yet, but she'd be expected to testify when it did. That was quite possibly the most dreaded event on her future docket, and she hoped that a recorded message would be sufficient. The bridge bustled as she stepped inside, having a seat beside Captain Gray Atwell. Most of the other command crew were relief personnel, giving the primaries a chance to rest. Clea checked the reports for anything unusual. Nothing jumped out, so she directed her attention at the view screen, which held a lovely view of her green and blue home world. Plenty of space traffic moved about them, moving to and from the various stations in the solar system. Different races, other participants throughout the Alliance, traveled alongside Keelan ships, and they worked together on various projects. Clea found herself introspective concerning the view. This was what life should have been like. The threat of war looming over them tainted too many feelings, too many careers. Explorers became soldiers and Clea had to wonder if they'd ever be able to make a transition back from a battle-ready state. Even on the verge of possibly ending the conflict with their true enemy, another reared its head. Will we be in a constant state of conflict for the rest of my life? 
Clea rubbed her eyes, fending off the depression her question brought. Orion's light might not be the biggest threat they'd ever faced, but they proved ruthless and resourceful. It may be hard to put them down completely, and who might jump up in their place? Did they constitute another enemy or just a bunch of criminals? The fact they took down Alliance ships and still managed to escape the behemoth gave them some credibility beyond most brigands. There would always be pirates and thieves roaming around, even murderers and flat-out raiders, but people intent on overthrowing the government, they were rare. These anarchists, or insurrectionists, had to be stopped. Soon. You okay? Gray asked, tapping her forearm. Clea nodded. I'm fine, just mentally preparing for all the meetings I'm about to be involved in. I know how you feel. Earth's councilman is all set up now and ready to talk about some things they learned from home. Apparently the new ship is good to go and we're ready to use it. That means we're free to remain out this way for a while longer for mission work. I have a feeling your folks have something for us to do. They'll always have something for us to do, Clea muttered. Even if it ends up being fetch assignments, our commanders are good at tasking people out. As long as it matters, I'm okay with it. Gray settled into his chair, relaxing his muscles. I wonder if they're ready to consider attacking the enemy yet. I hope so, Clea replied. I want to see that to the end, no matter what else happens. I'm kind of annoyed that no one's told me how my code did or if we've even sent anyone yet to see what they discovered. I found all that information, and they patted me on the head and sent me away. I could have helped, Gray. You did, Gray pointed out, and now it's their turn to do their jobs. It's not even about the glory, I just want to make sure. They're doing it right? Clea nodded. Give them the benefit of the doubt. They're professionals. I know, I just... Never mind. I get it. It's hard to let go, but believe me, you have to learn. It's important. Captain? Ensign Agatha White interrupted them from the communications station. She was one of the only primary crew on the bridge at the moment. I've received docking clearance for the space station. They are ready to receive us. Very good, Ensign. Thank you. Gray turned to the pilot, a young lieutenant named Shane Grandin. Take us in and get us secure, Mr. Grandin. By the end of this shift, I'm sure we'll all be either on the planet's surface or enjoying some much-needed time off in the station. Agatha, let the ship know to prepare for docking. We are now officially at safe harbor. Gray brought six marines to escort the strange device they brought back from the monastery. Clea walked alongside him, looking nervous. Considering the lengths Orion's light went through to get the thing, he understood her concern, though he didn't expect problems on the Alliance homeworld. They were met by a contingency of guards and all piled into a military transport. Escorts got them to the council building in less than an hour, where they all piled in and took the device to the tech lab. There, Clea and Gray signed off that they had delivered and finally headed off. Gray checked his calendar and frowned. He had a long day ahead of him, and by the way Clea appeared at hers, she was in the same boat. Gray grinned. See you sometime in the next couple weeks? Don't be sarcastic, Clea replied, also smiling. Though it sure looks that way. I'll be done by dusk. I won't, Gray said. I trust you'll be seeing the family? Clea nodded. For a late meal, yes. What's your plan? Adam's coming down, so I thought I'd show him around. Gray patted her shoulder. Good luck. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye, sir. Gray watched her go before heading toward his first appointment with the Earth Council member. The man had his own office on the 70th floor, and the elevator ride up took almost two minutes. Even after living in a space vessel for days and weeks at a time, Gray felt claustrophobic in the small box. When the doors opened, he stepped out and felt a little wobbly. Earth had some tall buildings, but something about them put him off. It seemed ironic, considering what he did for a living, but somehow his mind differentiated spaceship from tall building. 
Maybe one was mobile and meant to be up high. These buildings, they didn't entirely feel natural to him. He distracted himself by considering what might be on the agenda with the councilman. The man was newly appointed, taking over from the other person who turned out to be temporary. Apparently, Earth sent the first person they could grab, then allowed their actual choice to show up a while later. This one had been an ambassador for a number of years on Earth. His record indicated he had the approval and trust of all the military folks, as well as the civilian politicians. Gray never met him before, never even heard of him, but he felt somewhat ashamed at the fact. He'd supposedly brokered several peace deals with various nations. Something for the history books kids are reading now. Not when I was in school. Two guards stood at the door as he approached, and they saluted when they noticed his uniform. Good afternoon, Captain, the one on the right said. You're expected. Thanks, guys. One of them held up a scanner and ran it over him from head to feet. He's clear. Identification confirmed. Gray smiled. Tight security, huh? How many people come up this far? More than you'd think, the one on the left said. We've had some pretty loony customers wander off that elevator. Don't even know how they managed to find this floor or wait so long to get off. This floor wasn't on the secure registry is why. They'll be making it so only people with special ID cards can even have the elevator stop here. Should make your jobs easier, Gray said. Good luck, huh? Yes, sir. Go on in. Gray entered the room and closed it behind him. He expected a moderately sized office large enough for maybe two or three people, but instead he found a massive suite, which could have been an apartment. The desk sat near the wall-sized windows overlooking the cityscape. A couch was pressed against the wall, and a full bar occupied the opposite side. He had his own bathroom as well. Captain Atwell. The ambassador came from behind the desk to shake his hand. The man must have been in his early sixties, with thick gray hair and a thin beard. He wore a gray suit with red piping and expensive shoes. My name is Ambassador Kyle McRenner. It's an honor to meet you. Likewise, Gray replied. You've got quite the place. A bit ostentatious, I know. McRenner shook his head. Please, have a seat. Can I get you anything? Gray shook his head. I'm fine, sir, thank you. Of course. McRenner sat back at the desk. I've read the report of your latest assignment. Quite amazing. These Orion's light figures are quite the menace, eh? You could say that. I sent my assessment to high command as well. Perfect. I do have news from home. The first vessel is 100% operational. They're working feverishly on the next. Your work with the mine has paid off. We've been able to source all the necessary parts and assistance to get it done. Excellent. Gray leaned back in his seat. I'm curious what you know about the attack on the enemy. Are we planning on taking them out soon? McRenner sucked air through his teeth. Honestly, it's too soon to say. I know that the scout mission has been completed, but I've not been shown their findings. I do believe they've invited you to a briefing, however. I'd also like to say they've requested more of our help, specifically from your ship. I've committed us to continuing work here. High Command was okay with that? Oh, yes, with some small convincing. Now that they have a new ship there, they feel somewhat better, but of course, your experience puts you above them. However, that experience is specifically why you're still out here. In order to finish this fight, there are things that have to happen. One of them will involve dealing with those terrorists, I'm sure. They're formidable. Gray said, believe me. Yes, I've read your report and I completely agree. McRenner shook his head. Sincerely, I don't know how such monsters exist still. I mean, it sounds like a horror story from our own world. Bad people exist everywhere, Gray replied. And we don't corner the market on crazy, that's for sure. Indeed, there's a mail call for your crew, which I'm sure your comm officer is downloading now. 
Such things are sent to major settlements and wait in a queue until they can be properly sent to the ship waiting for them. Should be good, right? Yeah, they need word from home. I'd like to make sure they all get a chance to visit Earth again before we commit to any action against the enemy. Not to be glum, but it may well be our last chance to say goodbye. I'll make absolute sure of it, Captain. You have my word. McRenner went to the bar and poured himself a drink. I'll tell you this, everyone here's been incredibly kind. I've not had an easier time working with foreign dignitaries. They're refined to it here, you see. They've spoken with other cultures and worked through the nuances of different. I've found the Keelans to be amazing, Gray said. I'm impressed by their government and how they handle most things. However, those maniacs who jumped in on us while we were conducting an operation recently, they weren't entirely on board with working together. Even after we told them we had undercover people, their actions jeopardized. Yes, my predecessor gave me your write-up on that. I've lodged the complaint formally, and the military issued an apology, but I trust that's not quite what we were hoping for. I wanted the following sentence to be, We will be more careful in the future, but taking down a major pirate base seemed more important to them. If we win the war because of what we accomplished, those buffoons could have jeopardized it. Gray shrugged. They'll need to learn to trust people so they don't put their foot in it. We warned them off for a reason, and it wasn't because we were bored. Understood. I'll bring it up in the next meeting. McRenner tapped his tablet and brought up a series of charts. Now, we have some financials I'd like to go over with you. Go ahead and bring up the sheet I sent to your account, and we can discuss next steps, what the Alliance is now paying for, and how we're doing overall. My favorite part of the job, Gray thought, letting out a sigh. He complied and prepared himself for an incredibly boring forty-five minutes. Gray and Clea convened with the military council later that afternoon for an update on the intelligence they recovered from enemy territory. Clea couldn't wait to see what they found. They were about to confirm for her whether or not her data was worth anything at all. Had they gone on that hunt for a good reason? Or was it a total red herring? As they sat together at the conference table, Athaday, Kroll to Garin, stepped into the room. His rank put him at the equivalent of an Earth Admiral, and he must have been in his late sixties. He sat across from them and smiled, a gesture that made Clea feel better right away. If the conversation was going to go badly, he'd surely look more somber. Thank you both for coming. We've already given this briefing to the commanders stationed here, but I was told to specifically provide you with the same information. Before we go on, I want to extend my heartfelt appreciation for everything you did. Locating this data has meant a great deal to the Alliance. We look forward to hearing what you have to say, Gray said. I'm glad it panned out. We were worried it might not turn out so positive. Quite the contrary. Not only did we find what we were after, but we uncovered additional information we didn't anticipate. Kroll grinned we discovered a recording from one of our own pieces of technology. It was drifting near the system your coordinates led us to, and it contained the first contact with this culture from our perspective. Clea's eyes widened. Wait, are you saying you know what happened to start the war? Kroll nodded. Yes, and a great deal of information about our enemies as well. We now understand not only what caused the conflict, but how it has been sustained, and why we are stuck in this brawl until the conclusion of it. Some of it may not be entirely shocking, but even confirming suspicions can be disturbing. Shall we begin? Please, Gray gestured. Are we watching the recording? Indeed. Kroll tapped a button on the table and a holographic image of a young woman with black hair appeared. She wore a uniform much like Clea's, but with slight variances. The colors were the same, but the cut was old. Not quite vintage, 
but definitely several generations of fashion back. My name is Arias Kavilis, and I represent the crew of the Distant Horizon. We have made contact with a new race called Devarans, one of extraordinary talent and cleverness. I have never seen such a devotion to professional tasks, and each of these men and women dedicate themselves wholeheartedly to whatever they are assigned to accomplish. This extends to engineering, building, or even the lower professions of janitorial detail and manual labor. Before meeting their leaders, we were allowed to observe their activities and routines. None of them would speak to us, but neither did they shy away from our scrutiny. While they look much like us in that they have the same physical features, they have an odd sense to them, a demeanor I cannot fully explain, something between apathy and severe focus, and they seem totally devoid of emotional responses to outside stimuli, almost as if they do not feel at all. Their architecture differs greatly from ours. They do not favor high buildings, but rather spread out, I saw nothing built over four stories, and even those were somewhat rare. They do, however, build underground, and though we did not see these places in person, scans indicate some structures plunge more than fifteen stories below the surface. The name of their race comes from their religion. The prophet who initially taught the scriptures was a man called Devar, and he supposedly survived encounters with the worst predators on the planet— these trials have gone down in their books as what separates them from common animals, the crucible, if you will. It's one of the reasons we're having a hard time gaining their cooperation. Kroll paused the recording. We've confirmed this message. Things have not changed in all these years. However, they have added something which is never mentioned in this recording. When this expedition made contact, the culture had no space station. Now, our current scans have found a massive structure orbiting the home world and another over their nearest satellite. Do we know the purpose of those? Clea asked. The one near their moon is a fabrication facility. They must be producing their ships there. Though I'm guessing they have more than one, considering the sheer number of them out there. At least we have a name to call them now, Gray said. What about the other one? Staging area for troops and supplies, Kroll said. At least, that's what intelligence stated. Our scans needed to be subtle and could not breach the hull of those places. I see. Gray rubbed his chin. How much anthropology is in the recording? Oh, they go on for a while about that type of thing, Kroll replied. Our enemy seems to have come from a similar place as us. Clea. Have you discussed the theory of precursor races with Gray? The humans have their own theories about it, Clea replied. But yes, we've talked about ours as well. Many believe some other race seeded all of our planets, which explains our similarities and why we are compatible linguistically. After watching the hollow video, we made some assertions about why these people act the way they do. Their planet has all the same types of climates as ours, but their predators are far more... aggressive. Gray's brows lifted. What do you mean? Your planet had large beasts roaming it long before you were born, but they died off, giving way to the rise of humanity. These people did not have the benefit of a million years parting them from such monsters. By our reckoning, there are still predators which eat their civilians alive today. I find it hard to believe they wouldn't have wiped them out, Gray said. Especially with their technology. Intelligence suggests they haven't tried to commit genocide in order to keep their people strong. The threat of death coming from nature gives them an edge. It's why they're so fearless in battle. They've grown up knowing they could die at any moment outside their homes. It's why our people thought they were acting strangely when they watched them work. They simply grow up accepting mortality. What's more to the recording? Clea asked. Kroll moved it forward a bit and started again. Arias picked up at a different point in the story. We spoke to the leaders and discovered a deep religious belief system bordering on total obsession and unhealthy zeal. 
Morality means a great deal to these people, and many activities are considered illegal, punishable by the harshest means. We were allowed to witness a woman who transgressed against their laws be flayed alive by her family, a warning to all of them not to repeat the mistakes. Their list of laws is extensive, and I've uploaded it to our recording. Suffice to say, it took me nearly two hours to get halfway through them, and we were informed we will be held accountable to not breaking them after today. For this reason, we've decided to depart the planet until we can better understand these people, so as to not cause a political issue through some obscure breach of a law. They left? Gray hummed. I'm surprised. Kroll frowned. The part she left out is that nearly every method of punishment for these people involved death, just to highlight some of what they consider criminal behavior. No birth control, honoring elders, obeying a superior, wearing the appropriate clothes, performing duty at the expense of survival, and attending all designated worship, regardless of activity. Clea spoke up. Are they doing that aboard their ships? Do they worship in stages? I don't understand how this works, to be honest. It sounds impractical. And are they killing people on every one of those situations you just described? If you're maimed, you're considered to be useless to the culture, Kroll explained. So, yes, they don't just hurt you. You're going to die, or become beholden to another. They don't have any problems with slavery of their own kind. And we thought Orion's light was bad. Gray said. Kroll nodded. At least they are our own people. We can predict them somewhat since they came from our culture. These fiends are completely alien in their thinking. Their world bred a profound system, and as a result, when their ire was raised, they are bound by divine statement to come after us. What did we do? Clea asked. What happened? Our people made the mistake of sharing our own religious beliefs, Kroll said, or at least theirs in particular. They talked about the precursor theories with their religious leaders and inadvertently roused suspicion. Upon further research, the enemy found us to be moral deviants. The ambassadors were all killed, their ships seized, and the war began. Only we didn't know it. How long between this recording and the first attack? Gray asked. Several generations, Kroll replied. This is where history gets sketchy. Someone made it back from that expedition and was able to bring back the bauble hidden at the monastery. I don't know why all this was kept a secret, to be honest. I suspect they were sent back prior to the destruction of our people, and perhaps they wanted us to stay away because they knew the volatility of the culture might lead to war. You needed a warning, Gray said. Notice that these jerks decided the entire galaxy needed to be cleansed. All people, not just yours. They're not even trying to discover if anyone else follows their beliefs. That may not be true, Kroll replied. We have reason to believe they do probe new cultures before attacking them. If that's the case, then they may have observed your planet, perhaps even destroyed that first fleet trying to leave your solar system. What they discovered from your computer banks may have even been enough to decide you needed to be destroyed. Remember, they need little provocation. Apparently. Gray rubbed his eyes. When do we attack? We're preparing. Kroll looked uneasy. There are some other dilemmas preventing us from bringing the full force of our fleet against them. Believe me, we're working through these problems even as we speak. It's foremost in High Command's mind. I'd love to help, Gray said, if I can. I believe you have another summons, Kroll replied. The both of you. There are some other tasks we need to accomplish. Perhaps you'll be able to help to expedite the completion of these requirements. It would not hurt. Gray nodded. Thank you, Kroll. Can you send us the recording so we can watch it later? Yes, it's in your accounts. The rest is quite long, but you'll see to the end what I said. Their final journal entry is disturbing, because I think they knew they'd crossed the line. They wanted to depart the system, but could not. It's a tragic conclusion, to be sure. 
Lovely. Gray turned to Clea. I have a strange meeting at a florist nearby. I'm thinking of skipping it. Clea's eyes narrowed. I have the same. Kroll grinned. You'll both want to go. It's illuminating. Sincerely, I recommend attending. I believe it's set to high priority. What do you know about it? Gray asked. Enough that you don't want to miss it. Kroll stepped over to the door. Good day to both of you. Clea shrugged. Shall we go see what the flowers are like then? I guess so. Most mysterious moment of floral action I think I'll ever have. Gray paused. And I doubt I'll ever have a chance to say those words together in a sentence again. Come on, Clea. I'll buy you whatever passes for a rose in this place. If you enjoyed this audiobook, let us know. Take a quick moment to rate and review it on Audible, so we know we're bringing you audiobooks you'll love.